Who are you? I beg your pardon? I said, who are you? What are you doing here? My name is Gabriel. I am butler to the Holloway. Gabriel? But you... You can't be. Well, you're... You're dead. <laughs> Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The House That Time Forgot. <laughs> Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Sigmund Miller is The House That Time Forgot. Early evening on a desolate part of the Virginia coast, along a road near the beach comes a car with two people in it. I guess we've done enough looking for today, Eva. Oh, it's really beautiful country around here, dear. Wild and lovely. Mm-hmm. Darling, if we can't find a house, perhaps we should buy some land and build. Well, we'd better start back to town. It's getting dark, and I, I think we're in for a storm. Oh, look, Fred. Hmm? Look at that house we're coming to. Where? Oh, now, isn't it a beauty? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nobody that owns that one would want to sell it. Drive slowly, dear. I'd like to take a good look at it. All right. There's a for sale sign. Yeah? This house for sale. See Mr. Cecil Smith, Westfield, Virginia. Oh, that's interesting. Well, let's drive in there, into the grounds. I'd oh, like we to... can come back tomorrow, Evie. It's really starting to blow up. But it'll only take a minute. I've, I've just got to have a close look. All right, but we're going to get caught in the rain. I'll back in to save time. We'll watch the fenders on that side. All right, dear, I would. Come ahead. Am I clear? Okay, you're all right. Fine, fine. Ah, there's a light in one of the gable windows. Well, I guess somebody's home. It's beautiful, Fred. Simply magnificent. Yeah, the grounds look a little neglected, though. Grounds? Who cares about that? Go ahead and knock. Okay. I wish they'd hurry. We're going to get caught in a storm. Oh, don't worry about it. They don't seem to answer, do they? Try knocking again. Hmm. It's odd. Must be somebody home. We saw a light in the window. Mm. Maybe they can't hear us. Let's try calling them. Oh. Hello there. Hello. <laughs> That's very strange. Yeah, I... What? I hear something. Listen. It's a clock striking. Now, let's, let's try the door. Oh, it's not loud. Uh, what do you think? Uh, well, uh... Let's go in. Mm-hmm. It's a big place, but lovely. Oh, wait a minute. Dear. Anybody home? Well, if there is, they can't hear us or don't want to. Uh, come on, dear. We'll, we'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> place needs fixing up, but it's worth the fixing. Shall we take it? Well, I... Well, I don't know, Eva. We'll talk to the agent in Westfield, and then... Well, we'll see. So you're interested in buying the Holloway house? Yes, Mr. Smith. It's just the kind of house we've been looking for. Uh, It's a fine place, all right. Even got a private inlet to moor a large-sized boat. It's got everything except... uh... Except what, sir? Well, it's only fair that I tell you all its uh, defects. <laughs> what defects, Mr. Smith? You see, Mrs. Jordan, it's kind of hard to put your finger on it. There's something very queer about the house. Huh? Oh. <laughs> you mean it's haunted? <laughs> well, I don't know exactly, Mr. Jordan. No one has seen a ghost there yet. <laughs> well, we we don't mind ghosts, do we, Fred? <laughs> no, no, we don't believe in them, well, Mr. Smith. I, I didn't say it was haunted, but... Well, people say that the house is alive, that that it has a life and a will of its own. A life? 
Well, I don't know what you mean. I've had four caretakers in the Holloway house since I took possession of it, and none of them stayed more than a few days. Well, why did they quit? I don't know. They didn't see any ghosts or apparitions, but they all felt the same way, that, that the house was alive. Every one of them. Oh, well, there must have been something that scared them away. Well... I'd better tell you the whole story. Yes, we'd like to. Please do. Now, the house originally belonged to Richard Holloway. Mm -hmm. Seven years ago, in 1939, Richard and his wife, Diana, went on a short cruise in their yacht, the the Viking Second. That's an interesting name, isn't it? They never came back. Oh? They had two friends visiting them who refused to go with them. The strangest part about it is that these friends warned them that they'd never return alive from the cruise. The Holloways left it. Oh, well, well, how did they know, th- these friends, that the Holloways wouldn't come back? I don't know. Nobody knows. Well, uh, did, did you talk to these friends? No, I never saw them. Uh, I only know about it through John Gabriel. He was the Holloways' butler. Oh. He's been dead for two years now. As a matter of fact, even Gabriel didn't know these friends. He'd never seen them before. Uh, it's a mystery that I've thought about for years, uh, I'm afraid it's going to be a mystery forever. Hmm. Very interesting, but uh, we'd still like to buy the house. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, there was a light shining in one of the windows when we were there yesterday, and we also heard a clock chiming. Mm, That's funny. No one's been inside that house in over a year. Oh? Uh, Eva, perhaps we ought to think this over. Oh, nonsense, darling. You're not going to let some old wives' tail bother you, are you? No, no... But how could a clock still be going if no one's been in that house for a year? Well, there's a life buoy not far from the house. You might have mistaken it for the clock. Now, you see, everything has a logical explanation. Yeah, what about the light in the window? Well, it was probably a reflection from the sun or something. We'd like to take the house, Mr. Smith. Well, if you wanted, I'd be glad to sell it to you. I just thought it fair to tell you all about it, so if anything happens, you can't blame me. Here we are, darling. Our house. Mm, I hope we'll like it. Oh, of course we will. Let's go in. Mm-hmm. Do you have the key, dear? Yes, but we don't need it. The door was open, remember? Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Hey. Huh. It's locked again. Oh, Mr. Smith must have locked it. There we go. There you go, dear. Well, look. Hmm? Darling, everything clean. Dusted. Why, it's spotless. Oh, now, Mr. Smith really is a dear. Hey, it looks lived in, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I told you we'd like it. Uh, I suppose. Uh, hmm, he also put flowers around. It does smell of flowers, roses. But let's look around. Hmm, bright looking kitchen, isn't it, Fred? Yeah. And this wonderful big refrigerator. And it's full of food. No. Fresh food. Oh, that Mr. Smith, why, he thought of everything. Oh, the bedroom is even bigger than I thought. Look at the beds. What? Someone has slept in them. That man Mr. Smith sent to clean the house must have slept in it. Yes, and he apparently slept in both beds. This library. Darling, look at that paneling. Yeah, yeah. It's a very lovely room. Everything is charming. But... But what? Look at the fireplace. Well, what's wrong with the fireplace? Is there is just some half-burnt logs in it? Yes, yeah, just some half-burnt logs. Still <laughs> smoldering. Well, it was the cleaning man. I don't think there was a cleaning man. Now, don't be absurd, Fred. Huh. The clock we heard the first time we were here. Eva, I just can't shake off the feeling that someone is still living here. You're being ridiculous. Well, maybe I am, but I I feel like an intruder. Oh, darling, it's, it's that story Mr. Smith told us about the Holloways and their mysterious friends. It, it, it's got you all keyed up. Yeah, well, I'm going to call Mr. Smith and find out about that cleaning man you think he sent here. Uh, operator. Oh, operator, give me Westfield 403... You're really being a fuss part, Fred. Yeah, we'll see. I'll t- oh, h- hello, Mr. Smith? Yes? Uh, this is Fred Jordan. Oh, hello, Mr. Jordan. How's everything up at Holloway? Oh, everything seems fine. Uh, thanks for having the house cleaned up. Cleaned up? 
I don't understand you. Didn't you send a cleaning man to straighten up the house? No, Mr. Jordan. The house was sold as is. I never sent anyone over. Uh, might interest you to know we found the house in a spotless condition. Cleaned and ready for occupancy. Oh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. I'll be in touch with you later. Night, darling. I'm glad we came out. Yeah, we'd better go back to the house. Oh, now, please don't be upset. There, there must be some logical explanation. Mm. Maybe, maybe somebody took advantage of a boarded-up house and was living in it rent-free. I'd like to correct you, dear. Someone is still living in it besides ourselves. Sometimes, Fred, you get very ridiculous. Mm, maybe. Let's go back inside. Look. What? There's a fire burning in the fireplace. Well, now, what's wrong with that? I haven't touched this fireplace since we got here. You didn't? Look. The table is set for tea. Did you do this? No, I... I, I didn't. Oof. The teapot is hot. Somebody... Somebody must be here hiding. If they are, I'll... I'll find them. Come on. I, I don't understand it. I, I just... Cellar to attic and there's no one here. But it's incredible. Someone is living here and we can't see them. It, it, it doesn't make sense. There's somebody here right now. Right in this room. It sounds crazy, but I know it. Fred. What? The clock. What about it? It it just struck midnight, and it's it's only ten o'clock. A house that is deserted, except for invisible tenants, and a clock that is running backwards. Has it just struck twelve for murder at midnight? <laughs> To Murder at Midnight and The House That Time Forgot. Fred. Mm. Fred, wake up. Huh? Get up. Huh? Uh, what? What is it, dear? What's the matter? Look out there, out the window. Why? Get up and take a look. Oh. At what? That boat out there in the inlet? It must have put in while we were sleepy. Can't you read the name, dear? Huh? It's the Viking Second. The Viking Second? Yes. Wasn't that the Holloway's yacht? The one that never came back? That's what Mr. Smith said. Uh, either Mr. Smith is a fantastic liar or something very fantastic is happening to us. Perhaps the Holloway's have finally come back. After seven oh, years? It doesn't make sense. None of it. Yeah, that's putting it mildly. Darling, we... We ought to take a close look at the boat. You don't sound very enthusiastic about it, but... Yes, I suppose we ought to. Whoever's on it might be able to tell us something. The plank is down. Mm. Somebody must have come off the boat. Well, they couldn't have, dear. At least they didn't come up to the house. Well, let's... Let's go up and see. Hmm? All right. No one on deck. Uh, anyone here? No answer. Maybe they're down below. They must be. I'd rather not go down there. Oh, we've got to find out. Let's uh, let's both go down together. All right. You keep right behind me. Oh, don't worry, dear. I will. <laughs> Here's the stateroom. Oh, that's... There's nobody here either. Anybody here? No one. At least... Yeah, but the beds are still warm. Somebody just left the stateroom a little while ago. This is, 
It seems so. Let's get out of here, Eva. I've got a peculiar feeling down my spine. It, it, it is chilly. We'd better go back to the house. Lights are on in the living room. Did you put them on? Just one of the lamps, a floor lamp. Well, all the ceiling lights are lit. I can see that, dear. Let's go in. Here. The door is locked. We didn't even close it when we went out. No. I remember. We left it open. Good evening. Who are you? I beg your pardon. I said, who are you? I'm John Gabriel, butler to the Holloways. Gabriel? Huh? That's right, ma'am. Whom do you wish to see? Oh, we don't want to see anyone. We, we live here. I'm afraid you're mistaken, sir. The Holloways live here, have been living here for years. But this is our house. We bought it. And, and, and the Holloways are dead. Dead? Yes. I'm afraid someone has misinformed you. Oh, listen, this is like a nightmare. Look here, Gabriel, or whoever you really are. We bought this house from Cecil Smith, a real estate agent in Westfield. He's not the kind of a man who plays practical jokes. No, he's not. He's a very sober man indeed. He told us you were dead, too. As you can see, madam, I'm very much alive. Oh, the... This is crazy. We'd better talk to the people who call themselves the Holloways. Perhaps you should. They'll be in any minute. Please come in, won't you? Will you excuse me if I close the windows? We're going to have a storm. Perfectly all right. Would you care for some tea? Yeah, look here, Gabriel. We've been waiting an hour for Mr. Holloway and his wife. They haven't shown up, and I don't think they will. Now, just what is your game? Would you care for some tea, Mrs. Jordan? No, thank you. Did you hear what I said? Yes, sir, I did. As soon as Mr. and Mrs. Holloway arrive, I'm sure you'll be convinced of your error. They should be here any minute since they plan to leave tonight on a cruise. Oh, this is mad. Fantastic. Uh, ah, they come. Just this the storm, Gabriel. Oh, hello. I don't believe I know you. This is Mr. and Mrs. Jordan, Mr. and Mrs. Holloway. Oh, I'm glad to meet you, Mrs. Jordan. Mr. Jordan. Well, thank you. Are you Richard Holloway? Yes. I can't believe it. It's all terribly confusing, Mr. Holloway. These people claim that this is their house. What? That they bought it from Cecil Smith. They also claim that you, Mrs. Holloway, and myself are dead. Somebody's playing some kind of a joke on them. I'd say it was a very unpleasant joke, Dick. We've been living here for years and years, Mr. and Mrs. Jordan. Oh, uh, before I forget, Gabriel, uh, get our suitcases aboard the yacht, will you? We'll be leaving in a few minutes. Yes, sir, right away. Fred, do you suppose that maybe we're dreaming this? Well, if we are, we're dreaming it together. I'm sorry, I don't know how this happened to you. Uh, perhaps you'd better stay here for the night. There's plenty of room. And we'd be delighted to have you. Uh, would you mind if I called Mr. Smith? Oh, please do. The phone's right there on the table. I know, thanks. Operator, operator, let me have Westfield 403. Never. Hello, Mr. Smith? That's right. Uh, this is Mr. Jordan. Who? Uh, Fred Jordan. Remember, you sold me the Holloway house? The Holloway house? Yes. You must be mistaken. I never sold it. That property's not for sale. What are you talking about? Who is this? Listen, Mr. Smith, you know very well who I am. You won't get away with this. I'll have you brought into court now. I never heard of you in my life. You must be crazy. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. He, he hung up. What did he say? Well, he said he never sold the house and he'd never even heard of me. You must have been taken in by someone who posed as Mrs. Smith. That's really a shame. You have to be very careful these days. We'd be glad to have you stay here until you find other quarters. Well, I... As a matter of fact, you can stay for a few days until we get back. We're taking a trip on our boat. Perhaps you'll be able to get it all straightened out in the morning. I, I, I just don't understand it. The Mr. Smith we had dealings with wasn't a crook. I know he wasn't. Well, that was my feeling, too, but I... You're not going out to sea in this kind of weather. Oh, we don't mind a little rain. My husband's a very good sailor, Mrs. Jordan. He can handle the Viking second in any kind of weather. It sounds like a gale coming up. No, we like them. Exciting. Well, it's dangerous to set out in this weather. It's very dangerous. Oh, now, don't worry about us. We don't drown easily. Oh, darling, we'd better get started. Oh, yes, yes. I, I'm all set. Uh, are the suitcases aboard? Yes, uh, Gabriel took them. Uh, uh, something's wrong with your grandfather clock. It, it only struck eight times. Uh, yes, it's correct. Now, my watch says eight o'clock, too. Well, how can that be? It's, it's after midnight. <laughs> you really are mixed up, Mr. Jordan. It's I, only eight o'clock. Well, my watch says one thirty. Uh, well, so does mine. I'm afraid ours is right, Mrs. Jordan. It's very old, but very accurate. Of course, there's a legend about it. 
The story is that it will sometimes go backwards in time. Has... Has that ever happened? <laughs> no. No, it's only a story. It's never gone anything but forward, like any other clock. But it's a nice story. Isn't it? Yes. Yes, delightful. <laughs> but might even be true. Mrs. Holloway. Yes? Oh... What is today's date? What? I believe it's September 10th. What, what year? Uh, 1939, of course. 1939? Yes, yes, of course, Fred. Uh, Mrs. Holloway, I'd, I'd like to ask you and Mr. Holloway something. Yes? Please, please, don't go out on this trip you're planning. Why not? Because if you do, I, I don't think you'll ever come back. What? What a terrible thing to say. Please, Mrs. Holloway, please. I don't know what's wrong with you two. You came in here with a strange story about owning my house, and now you tell us we're never going to come back. She's right. You won't come back. You'll pardon me for saying so, Mr. Jordan, but I think you're both crazy. I don't care what you think, but please don't go. Why, Mrs. Jordan? I have a hunch about it. We don't believe in hunches. Well, it's more than a hunch, Mr. Holloway. I know you're not coming if back. If you'll excuse us, I think we'd better get started. Come along, darling. I'm ready. I've put everything on board. Is there anything else, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, just take care of our guests. So that they're comfortable. Goodbye, Gabriel. Goodbye. A pleasant voyage. Make yourself at home and we'll be back, despite your hunches. Oh, you must go, please. Oh, well, it's gone. If you wish, you can occupy the master bedroom. I'll go up and make it ready for you. Was there anything else you wished, Mr. Jordan, ma'am? Uh, no, Gabriel. Just go to bed. We'll we'll sit here for a while. It's rather late, sir. Nearly midnight. By your clock, Gabriel, but it, it seems to have stopped. So it has. It needs rewinding. It's going now. Yes, Seems to be ticking rather fast. Something's wrong. It never did that before. Fred. Something's happening. The lights. Switch them on, Fred. As soon as I find the switch. So what, what happened? I, I don't know. Maybe the storm, lightning. Where's Gabriel? Oh. Gabriel. Gabriel. Oh, never mind, dear. Can, can't you find the switch? Uh, yeah. Here it is. Oh. Fred! Fred! All, all that dust. Like the first time we saw the house. Telling us this. It is this. No one had been here for years. Where's Gabriel? There. There is no Gabriel. We're back in 1946, and that means he's dead. You mean the clock did go backwards? Something else. You understand, too, now, don't you? We were the friends that Mr. Smith told us about, the mysterious friends that urged the Holloways not to go on that trip. Yes. Fred. What? The clock has stopped. Well, it needs rewinding. No, 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 don't touch it. We, we won't wind that clock again, ever. A house without tenants, except for the dead, and the clock that runs backward in time. If it was your clock, would you wind it? Or are you afraid it would keep you up nights while you waited for it to strike twelve for... Murder! again when death comes out of the past, out of time gone by, 
and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The Jordans, husband and wife, were played by Vinton Hayworth and Elsie Hitz. With music by Bert Berman, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. This is a time of mystery, a time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour. The sixth button. Sleep does not come easily to the harbor. Even at two in the morning, there is a restlessness fretting the black ships and the green water. The whistles still blow, but their sound is melancholy and weary. The lights along the shore begin to blink their good nights. In one of the harbor's darkening taverns, sleep will be forgotten for some time. Its solitary customer, an ancient sea captain, rests heavily against the bar. Within him burns a tale, and he will not rest till it is told. Mm. Two o'clock. Well, it's getting laid, barkeep. You'll be wanting to close. I'm open till three. Well, my ship doesn't weigh anchor till then. We both have time. Yeah. You're sure you want to hear the story? Story? Sure. Why not? Another glass, then. Right. Can you join me? I don't mind. <clears throat> well, as I say, the land's no place for a man of the sea. Captain Jeremiah Stebbin should have known that. And he should have known there wasn't a crueler man anywhere in the world than Harvey Adams. Captain Stebbins treated Harvey and his wife, Paula, as if they were his own children. He took them in and shared his home with them. But that wasn't enough for Harvey. Oh, no. Harvey knew something about Jeremiah Stebbins' money. And that gave him the idea. The idea that became a mania, a disease. And the disease infected Paula, too. Harvey, is he? Let's get started, Paula. We've got to get out of here fast. Did everything go all right? Be quiet, Paula. Hurry. Well, it's over. Went as smoothly as clockwork. Just like we planned. It's funny, I don't feel the least bit nervous now. Do you? I'm frightened, Harvey. Hey, it'll wear off. You know, the moment I laid his hat and stick on the riverbank, a great feeling of peace came over me. It seemed as if I was stepping into a new world. And that's what it's going to be for us, Paula. A new world. He was good to us, Harvey. Yes, yes, of course he was. But think how much better he's going to be to us this way. Now, 
There's the bridge ahead. All right. No cars behind us. Good. All right, now, slow down. Well, here goes the wrench out the window. There. Long may it rest at the bottom of the river. All right, now, back to the house. We've got to be there before Mrs. Wellers returns. What if we made a mistake? There's been no mistake, Paula. I'm just as sure of that as I'm sure that Captain Stebbins is dead and lying at the bottom of the river. As attorney for the late Jeremiah Stebbins, and in accordance with the instructions of the deceased, I have called together you, his beneficiaries, for the reading of his last will and testament. They've found the body, Mr. Rand? Uh, No, Mr. Adams, not yet. However, the police informed me that Captain Stebbins has been officially declared a suicide. Oh, I can't believe he's gone, Mrs. Adams. I can't believe it. Mrs. Wellers, please. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You may begin, Mr. Rand. Uh, <clears throat> I, Jeremiah Stebbins, being of sound mind and disposing memory, do hereby make my last will and testament. To Agnes Wellers, my housekeeper, for whose constant devotion and kind care I have been ever thankful... I was only I... too happy to do whatever I could. You know that, Mrs. Adams. I know, Mrs. Wellers. And he knew, too. Of course he did, Mrs. Wellers. Oh, Mr. Adams, I'll miss him so. We all will. Now, now pull yourself together. (laughs) All right, Mr. Rand. Uh, Yes. To Agnes Wellers, my housekeeper, for whose constant devotion and kind care I have been ever thankful, I hereby bequeath the sum of $25,000. In addition, it is my will and desire that Agnes Wellers be permitted to reside in my house, in the quarters which have been her home, for so long as she may desire to remain there. To Paula and Harvey Adams, who have been my close and trustworthy friends and who have filled my life with bountiful happiness, I bequeath all my property and my remaining monies, which total $250,000. Why, how kind of him. We were nothing to him, really, but he treated us like a father would. Uh, There's more, another provision. It is my will that this legacy shall be transmitted to Paula and Harvey Adams six months from the date of the reading of this, my last will and testament provided that the following terms are fulfilled. And in the event that these terms are not accomplished, I hereby will that my entire estate shall go to Agnes Weller. What, sir? Shall I go over it? No. Never mind. Continue. During the period prior to the transmittal of the legacy, Paula and Harvey Adams shall deliver to my appointed attorney each month one of the six brass buttons from my sea jacket. Brass buttons? That's what it says, Mr. Adams. Each month, one of the six brass buttons from my sea jacket. Why, I don't believe it. Harvey. Why, it's a trick. The will wasn't that way when I... When what, Mr. Adams? Well, I I mean, it's preposterous. Captain Stebbins wouldn't do that to us. Do what? Why, it's it's ridiculous. Brass buttons from his sea jacket. Mr. Adams, this is Captain Stebbins' bona fide will. Those are the terms. You must comply with them. It shouldn't be very difficult, should it? Why, no, I... I guess not, I... I'm sorry, Mr. Rand. It it was just a little unexpected. You shall have the buttons. All six of them. Sir. Yes, Mrs. Butters. Sir, the day that Captain Stebbins took his life. Yes. The day they say he took his life. He was wearing the sea jacket with the six brass buttons. Although Jeremiah Stebbins is officially listed as a suicide, there are a few questions I must ask. Just routine. I certainly, Inspector, we understand. And Mrs. Wellers. Yes, sir. According to your former employer's will, Mrs. Wellers, and the fact that Captain Stebbins' body has not been found as yet, there is an excellent chance, isn't there, of your becoming the sole beneficiary of the Stebbins estate? Oh, I don't want the money. Captain Stebbins meant it for Mr. Adams and his wife. Yes, so it appears, but in case the buttons aren't delivered... Oh, don't. Don't say things like that. Better, please. She's very upset. I merely said, Mrs. Adams, there is a chance of her getting the money. But you make it look as if I... As if you what, Mrs. Wellers? Well, sir, as if I... Oh, Mr. Adams, make him stop. Please, make him stop. The inspector doesn't mean anything. Inspector... We've had a trying day, all of us. Mrs. Wellers, my wife, and I have suffered a great loss. As far as I can see, there's nothing you can accomplish by your questions. No? No. You've upset this poor woman enough. I must ask you to leave. 
I hardly expected anyone to get so excited over a few routine questions, since it's quite obvious who will receive Captain Stebbins' legacy. All this, Paula. All this and all his money will be hers if we don't find those buttons. But Harvey, she said he was wearing the jacket. Paula, that jacket is someplace in this house. I know it. Did you look where I told you? Yes. We'll never find it. I'll search through the attic. Captain Stebbins knew what we were going to do with him. That's why... Stop it, Paula. Stebbins was just an eccentric old sailor. We'll play his game of treasure hunt, Paula. And we'll win. It's not in the attic. Did you try in the cellar again? Yes. Paula, the hothouse. Why didn't I think of it before? Of course, the hothouse. It wasn't there? No. But we'll find that jacket and those six buttons if we have to tear this house apart from top to bottom. This closet. I can't open it. What? I think it's locked. Here, let me try it. It is locked, Paula. I think we've come to the end of our treasure hunt. I'll open this door. Mr. Uh, Adams. My room. What's happened? What are you doing here? Mrs. Wellers, unlock this door. But you have no right to come in my room this way. If Captain Stebbins were alive... He's not alive. He's dead. And this is my house now. If you don't unlock this door, I'll call the police. Villa, I'm not one to cause any trouble, Mr. Adams. Well, then unlock it. Here's the key, sir. That's better. Paula, it's not in here. I told you, Mr. Adams, he was wearing that sea jacket with the buttons the day he died. Paula, are you going to sit here all night sewing? Harvey, do you think Mrs. Weller suspects us? Of course not. She'd have gone to the police long ago. Maybe we'd better get out of this house. Now. Maybe we'd better get out of this city. Get out of this house. <laughs> That's rich. In three more days, the first month will be up, Paula. Then we'll have to get out. Because of six ridiculous brass buttons. This house, everything will be hers in just three more days. Yes, just three more days. Yes, she will almost sound relieved. Relieved? Yes, Harvey, it's better this way. Better? To lose everything... To work, to plan, and be left with nothing. Oh, we can start all over start again. Start over again with what? We have each other. Each other. That's great. Paula, for heaven's sake, stop that sewing. Put it away. All right, Harvey. Harvey. What's the matter? My sewing box. What is it? There. In the box. In the box. Paula. We found the first button from Captain Stebbins' sea jacket. <laughs> darkened tavern along the waterfront, a sea captain leans heavily against the bar. He and the bartender talk while the waterfront noises gradually fade and the harbor lights around them one by one are shut. He tells the story of a murder and of a will. The murder of a sea captain like himself and a will which demands that the beneficiaries deliver to the captain's lawyer six buttons from the captain's sea jacket. Let us enter the tavern to hear the captain continue his strange story. Well, barkeep, Paula and Harvey Adams found the first of Captain Stebbins' six brass buttons. The buttons that meant the difference between a fortune and poverty. Yeah, so you said that the button was in the sewing box. Now, how did it get there? Should I go on with the story? Sure, sure, go ahead. Well, as I said, the first button turned up. Only five more to go. And things were looking a little brighter for Harvey. But it was different with Paula. Very different. (laughs) 
Please, please, Harvey. Let's go away. We can't stay in this house another day. We're not leaving. Captain Stebbins brought that button here. Stop that nonsense, Paula. He's come back from the dead to punish us. Harvey, this house is cursed. We've got to get out of here before it's too late. Shut up, Paula. Do you want Wellers to hear us? She knows we killed him. Paula. They all know. I told you to stop it. <gasps> Harvey. Stupid, hysterical fool. You'll ruin everything. That button didn't fall out of thin air, Paula. Somebody is trying to frighten us. All we've got to do is keep our nerve. If we play our cards right, we can't lose, Paula. We can't lose. <laughs> Paula, I'm going out. Did you hear me, Paula? I said I'm going out. All right, Harvey. Don't leave this room till I get back. And keep away from Wellers, understand? Yes. Did my pop coat come back from the cleaners? It's in the closet. Paula. When did this coat come back? Yesterday. Who put it in the closet? I did. Well, look at it. Look. Harvey. It's been sewn on. The second brass button. He did it. He's come back again. From the dead. The second button. Here it is, Mr. Rand. Hmm, you're early this month. Yes, I... I didn't want to keep you waiting. Please. Round trip, ma'am. One way. Hurry. Please hurry. Paula. Paula, stop. Oh, Harvey. You can't run away from me. I won't let you. Come along. I warned you, Paula, not to leave the house. I can't stay there, Harvey. Please let me go away. Please. Let you go away. Do you think I'm crazy? I've got to keep my eye on you, Paula. For all I know, you may be behind this button business. Oh, Harvey. I said you may be. Or it could be Wellers or that lawyer, Rand. I don't trust any of you. I'm taking no chances. You're going back to the house, Paula. And if you try this again... Pardon me, madam. Here, you drop your change purse. I'll take it, thanks. Don't be so careless, Paula. Here. But that's not mine. Not yours. Uh, Say you, this doesn't belong... It's disappeared in the crowd. I wonder whose it is. Maybe there's an identification inside. Paula, look. In the purse. Throw it away, Harvey. Please. You fool, Paula. Do you know what this means? The third brass button. She's sleeping now. Will she be all right, Doctor? I'd say she's on the verge of a complete mental collapse. Oh? I suggest you take her away immediately. A few months in the country will bring her about, I'm sure. Yes, but that's not possible. I mean, not right now. I have important business to attend to. I can offer no other advice. If you keep your wife in this house, Mr. Adams, you are doing so at the risk of her sanity. <laughs> got to pull yourself together, Paula. Do you hear me? Captain Stebbins will come back. He'll come back to this house again. It's cursed. I've got to get out of here. I've got to... No, you're staying in bed. Lie down. I can't. I can't stay here. Please let me go. Please. Stop it, Paula. (laughs) You're not leaving yet. And stop that crying. (laughs) Just when there's a chance, just when things are working out the way we planned, this has to happen. I don't want the money. I don't want this house. Well, I do. And I'm going to get it. Nothing's going to stop me. Nothing. It's time for your medicine, Paula. At least it'll keep you quiet for a while. Where is it, Miss Traw? Ah, here's the box. Paula, stop that infernal weeping. Here, take one of these. Paula. The fourth button. In the box. Oh, I told you, Harvey, he'd come back again. You wouldn't believe me, would you? I told you he'd come back again from the river. (laughs) 
Hello? Mr. Adams? Yes? Mr. Rand. Oh, yes, Mr. Rand. I've been waiting for you. The fifth button is due today. Yes, I know. Are you bringing it down? I'm afraid I can't wait any longer in my office here. I'm due home for dinner. I'm leaving now. Well, I... I have until midnight. You'll have your fifth button, Mr. Rand. Don't worry about it. Then I'll see you before midnight. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Mr. Adams, yes. here's a package for you. It was just delivered. Who brought it? Well, messenger, just a moment ago. Who was he? Well, I don't know. Sir. All right, all right, Mrs. Wellers, that's all. Oh, thank you, sir. Yes. The fifth button. The fifth button. Here it is, Mr. Rand. I'm sorry to have interrupted your dinner. It's quite all right. Well, Mr. Adams, a month from today, you'll be a very rich man, providing you have that sixth button. Sixth button. That and come, Paul, I've been tricked. Yes, Harvey, you've been tricked by a dead man. Thirty minutes to go. In just thirty minutes, the deadline will be reached. I'll lose everything. You won't get that sixth button, Harvey. You'll never... Shut up, you crazy fool. That button will turn up yet, Paul. It'll be too late then. You'll never get that money, Harvey. Captain Stebbins doesn't want you to have it. Don't you know that? No. It's not Captain Stebbins. It's you, Paula. You don't want me to have it. Paula, where is that sixth button? I don't know, Harvey. Captain Stebbins knows. Stop that nonsense. Where is that sixth button? You're hiding it from me. No, Harvey. I'm not hiding it. You're lying. Tell me where it is. Don't. You're hurting my throat. Are you going to tell me where that button is? I don't know. You're lying, Paula. Tell me where you hid that sixth button. I'll kill you. Tell me. Tell me. You know where it is, Paula. Tell me. Do you hear me? Tell me. Paula. Paula. I've killed you. I've killed you. Thirteenth precinct, Sergeant Watkins. I I just killed my wife. What's that? My name is Harvey Adams. I killed my wife. You what? I I killed her because I loved her. I loved her very much. Everything I did was for her, and now she's dead, and I'm here alone. You. Hello. Hello. I'm not alone. Not alone. You can't fool me. I know what you are. You're a ghost. But you can't frighten me. You're dead, Captain Stebbins. I killed you. You've come here to frighten me, but but you can't. Do you hear me? I'm not afraid of you. Yes, but Paula was. You, you did it, Captain Stebbins. You made me kill her, and now you've come to... No. No, oh, don't come near me. Stay away from me. No. No, I don't want it. Take it away, it's cursed. I, I don't want the button. I, I don't want it. Take it away. Take it away. And when the police arrived, Barkeep, they found Harvey Adams, alone, cringing in a corner, stark, staring mad. Well, that's enough to drive anybody crazy, seeing the ghost of the man you killed. Hmm. It wasn't a ghost. Huh? Oh, now, hold on. You mean Captain Stebbins wasn't really dead? It's an old saying, men of the sea drown hard. Harvey Adams would have done well to know that. 
His wrench never killed the captain. The water revived the old man, and he returned from the dead for justice. For justice? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see. But who are you? Now, you're not going to tell me you're... Uh, Captain Stevens? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Barkeep, my ship will be weighing anchor. I'll be getting along. As I say, the land's no place for a man of the sea. Shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. Present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, students of the mystic marvels of manifold murder. <laughs> this is your host. Extending a cordial invitation to step through the creaking door of the inner sanctum, where we probe deep into the dark and cavernous depths of men's souls to see what makes them kill. Mm -hmm. Our clinic here is the whole vast world of crime. And you who listen in may hear us dissect our characters at a safe distance. And unless your nerves are strung, you'd better take my advice and... uh, Keep your distance. (laughs) Why, Mr. Host, that's not the kind of advice to give, folks. It sounds unfriendly. Well, what would you suggest, Mary? Well, give them some sort of friendly advice. Like pointing out to them the extra delight they'll get from a cheering cup of Lipton tea. Then go on to tell them why Lipton's is so downright delicious. Tell them that the reason is Lipton's brisk flavor. And don't forget to mention that brisk is the tea expert's own word for the spirited, full-bodied flavor of Lipton's. So refreshing and so zestful. Explain that Lipton's brisk flavor is never flat, but always lively and, and satisfying. And in closing, remind them to try Lipton's soon, because in every cup of Lipton's there's extra enjoyment. And now that's the kind of advice you should give, folks. Well, Mary, you seem to have given it to them already. So we can go ahead and get launched on Skeleton Bay. That's the title of tonight's story. An original radio play by Emil Tepperman. It's about a lady novelist, a writer of mystery stories. It opens at a swanky hotel with private cabins situated on a storm-swept rock-bound coast. The story itself is all about... Mm -hmm. You guessed it. Murder. And here's Betty Lou Gerson as Carol Winter, the lady novelist, who will give us a blow-by-blow description. I'll tell you first about the night I met Michael Barrett. It was in August at Skeleton Bay. I'd come to the hotel supposedly for a rest. That was what I kept telling myself. But in reality, I didn't know why I'd come here. Skeleton Bay. I'd seen the name advertised months ago. Since then, it kept hammering, hammering, hammering at the inside of my brain. Like the voice of implacable things commanding. 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 Because I didn't like crowds, the hotel manager had given me a cabin near the beach all to myself. It was the middle of the night, but I couldn't sleep. The wind came in from the ocean, howling like a hungry beast across the shoals. And the pounding of the surf mingled with the angry, baffled growl of the sea. I sat at the window in the dark, 
staring out at the beach. I was restless, excited. It was then I saw the signal. It was just a winking little light a few yards away on the beach. Someone was blinking a flashlight on and off, on and off. I was able to make out the figure of a man in boots and a leather jacket. He was signaling toward the hotel. But to whom? I had the answer in a moment. A man moved past my window, going down toward the light. He had his collar turned up against the wind. His hat brim pulled low. But I knew who it was. Mr. Field. The small, furtive man who'd come up on the train with me. The two men met. Barely a stone's throw from my window. I could hardly see them huddled closely together. This was excitement. Mystery, intrigue. The stimulation I wanted and needed. I had to know what was going on. I threw on a raincoat, opened the cabin door. The wind swept my hair in a streamer, and the spray stung my face as I hurried down the beach. My blood began to race. My heart to pound. For those two men were not engaged in any conference. They were locked in struggle. It was a deadly silent struggle with only a grunt now and then. I saw the flashing gleam of a knife. But I couldn't tell who had the weapon. The tall man in the leather jacket or the furtive Mr. Field. And then... Then I saw the blade plunge home into the throat of the furtive Mr. Field. I felt a sudden surge of wild elation. This was murder. I had witnessed murder. The tall man let the body of Mr. Field slide down to the sand. Then he looked up and saw me. He stood there with a bloody knife in his hand and we looked at each other. Who are you? I'm Carola Winter. I have this cabin here, number five. You saw me kill him? Yes, I saw you. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to help you dispose of the body. He told me his name was Michael Barrett. He lived on the opposite side of the bay in the house high up on the cliff. It won't be so easy to get rid of the body. If I had the boat, I could take him out and drop him over, but it's too rough tonight. If there was some place to hide him for a day, I could come across in the boat tomorrow night. You can hide him in the closet in my cabin. Nobody will look there. Better lock the closet door. Yes, of course. You sure nobody will come snooping here? Nobody comes here but the maid. All right. I'll be back tomorrow night with a boat. Did you pick up the knife? Yeah. Got it in my pocket. Well, I guess that's all. Good night, Carola. Good night, Michael. All night I sat up alone with the locked closet door between me and the staring, sightless body of Mr. Field. At breakfast the next morning, they'd already discovered the disappearance. And the Mr. maid says his bed wasn't slept in at all. Oh, Think he could have committed suicide in the ocean. You oh, just I hurried through my man. breakfast listening to the gossip all around me. Yes, no, in broad daylight, I... I hardly believe the thing had really happened last night. I didn't know the hotel manager thinks it might be murder. What? I heard him phoning for the police. The police? I hadn't counted on that. Anything wrong, my dear? You look sick. I do feel a bit dizzy. I think I'll get some fresh air. Oh, poor dear. It must be quite a shock to her. She came up on the train with Mr. Field, you know. Out in the open air, I let the wind cool my fevered face as I hurried down toward the beach. It was only 9.30 in the morning. A whole day, a whole evening before Michael could come for the body. And the police would be around all day investigating, snooping. And all the time, Mr. Field would be sitting in my closet, staring blankly out of his sightless eyes. When I reached my cabin, I put a hand on the doorknob. Suddenly, I, I went cold all over. The door was unlocked. I... Stood still as a statue, listening. Yes. yes. There was someone inside. Someone moving around. I only had my handbag. I had a pistol in it. I always carried it for protection. But my handbag was inside on the dresser. Slowly, slowly I pressed the door open. Half inch, an inch. And then the door creaked. Is that you, Miss Winter? The maid. It was only the maid, of course. She'd be making up the bed. Why hadn't I thought of that? Miss Winter? 
Is that you? Yes, it's I. What are you doing in that closet with those keys? Why, they're just my pass keys, Miss Winter. I was just going to tidy up the closet. I didn't ask you to do anything to the closet. Well, but that's part of the job, Miss Winter. I'm supposed to do that in all the rooms. Well, you leave this one alone. Keep away from that closet, do you hear? Yes, Miss Winter. But I was only trying to help. I want your help. I'll ask for it. Now, please leave it at once. Just as you say, Miss Winter. I'm sorry if I did anything wrong. Did she suspect anything? I hadn't liked her tone. Why? Why had I been so sharp with her? Now she'd surely think there was something in the closet. Something she shouldn't see. At lunchtime, I didn't want to leave the cabin. I sat at the window. And I could almost feel the sightless eyes of Mr. Field staring at me through the closet door. Someone at the door. Who? Who? Just a minute. Miss Winter, Miss Carola Winter. Yes, I'm Miss Winter. I'm sorry to trouble you, Miss Winter. I'm Detective Sergeant Smith from headquarters. Uh, may I come in for a moment? Oh, yes, please do. What can I do for you, Sergeant Smith? Uh, we're out here investigating this field business. He uh, hasn't turned up yet. Well, I'm sure he will in time. Well, I wish I could be so sure, Miss Winter. What do you mean? We've gone through his room... Found some mighty queer things. Queer things? Yeah, it seems this Mr. Fields is in some sort of racket. There's a good chance he may have been murdered. Well, you don't say. I uh, understand you came up on a train with him. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah. Did you uh, have any conversation with him on the train? Mm, no, none at all. Uh-huh. Uh... You're the Carol of Winter who writes the mystery novels, aren't you? <laughs> the same. Yes, I've read every one of them. They're darn good, Miss Winter. Why, thank you. Uh, do you think you'll get a plot out of this? Uh, I mean, Mr. Field. Why, uh, I can't tell yet. I wish you'd keep me posted on developments in case it does turn out to have a plot. Well, I sure will, Miss Winter. Uh, by the way, we found this picture among the papers in Field's room. I'm, I'm showing it to everybody around in case they might recognize it. It's an old newspaper item, about ten years old. Can't figure out why he was carrying it around. It's about a guy named Wycliffe. It's wanted for murder in Canada. Here, take a look at it. I felt the blood racing in my veins, pounding at my wrists. The picture of the man named Wycliffe, who was wanted for murder in Canada, it was a picture of Michael Barrett. as if Michael Barrett is a lucky guy with a beautiful woman ready to commit murder for him. Mm -hmm. But what'll he do when she runs out of victims and begins looking at him with a calculating eye? <laughs> as for Carola, she sinned heavily because murder is the greatest sin. Yes, if you ask me, she'd better hope for a depression, then all wages will go down, including the wages of sin. <laughs> well, I, I never knew that murder and economics were related, Mr. Host. Oh, definitely, Mary. Take the high cost of living, for instance. Why, those prices are murder. <laughs> oh, yes, Mr. Host, it is difficult when the cost of living starts to climb. But then, so often, the things that really add up to good living are just simple, inexpensive pleasures. Like that piping hot cup of Lipton tea that many of us find waiting when we come down to breakfast each morning. As you read the morning paper and sip that cheery cup of Lipton's, the whole world seems brighter. It's simply wonderful the way that lively, spirited Lipton tea gets you off to a fresh start. For Lipton's brisk flavor gives you all the natural zest of tea at its best. Gives you extra delight, extra satisfaction. So remember this, folks. At breakfast time, dinner time, or any other time when you want a grand, refreshing drink, pour yourself a cup of Lipton tea. And now, let's get back to the rock-bound coast of Skeleton Bay and see how Carola entertains the grisly guest in her closet. I don't remember now how I got rid of that Detective Smith. 
I, I told him I'd never seen the man in the picture and sent him away. The day was interminable. From my window, I could see the guests moving about the beach. But none of them went in swimming. The weather was too rough. I wondered if Michael would be able to bring the boat over tonight. If not, how much longer could I sit guard over Mr. Field in the closet? Now and then, I'd see Detective Smith poking around on the beach. And then, without warning, he was standing over the very spot where Michael had stabbed Mr. Field. I watched him bend down and examine something. Was there a telltale drop of blood there? Did Smith know that was the murder spot? I saw him frown. Then he stood up, walked quickly away. I had to know what it was he'd seen there. I slipped on a coat, went out. Started toward the spot on the beach. Are you somewhere, oh. Miss Winter? Oh, it's you, Detective. Uh, going anywhere in particular? Uh, no, no, I was just going up to the hotel for dinner. It's almost dinner time, you know. Oh, fine, I'll walk up with you if you don't mind. Not at all. Hey, can I help you? I'll take your arm there. <laughs> Thank you. The sand is so soft. Yes, it's still wet. We had high tide last night. Oh, uh, um, Miss Winter. Yes? You a sound sleeper? What? Why do you ask? Well, I just thought maybe you might have heard something last night. Like a fight or something. Fight? Yes, yes. I was just looking at the sand back there, down near your cabin. It's all messed up, stamped around. What's that got to do with me? Oh, nothing at all. Except I think there was a fight there last night. Maybe that's where Mr. Field was killed. You... You think Mr. Field was murdered? It's beginning to look more and more like it, Miss Winter. Somehow, I, I don't know how I managed to get through with the dinner. I hurried back to the cabin stopped at the door, shocked and unbelieving. There was a light inside. Someone was in there. This time, I had my handbag with me. I took the pistol out. Once more, I inched the door open. It happened. The thing I feared. The closet door was open. And there was the maid, stooping over the body of Mr. Field. What are you doing there? The body. It's Mr. Field. You killed him. Suppose I did. What are you doing with that gun? What do you think? No! The wind was high. And the weather was rough. And fortunately, no one heard the shot. I pushed her body into the closet next to the body of Mr. Field. And closed the door. Now, now I was a murderer, too. Who, who is it? Let me in, Carla, quick. Oh, yes, yes. Michael, Michael, I thought you were coming. It's been a terrible day. What happened? Come here, I'll show you. Is he still in there? <laughs> See for yourself. Great Scott. Got a woman. Who is she? The maid. She opened the closet while I was out. You killed her? Yes, Michael. I, I had to kill her. There are detectives at the hotel looking for Mr. Field. Mm. I suppose if I was smart, I'd kill you too. And there'd be no one to talk. Yes, Michael. That would be smart. Go ahead. Kill me. If you can. <laughs> I knew he couldn't kill me because I'd seen it in his eyes. We were two of a kind, both wild, both reckless, both eager for the thrill of danger. He, too, wanted to be like the wind. We'd both been brought together here by some force stronger than either of us. And we loved each other. Carol, darling. Michael. No more now, Michael. We have work to do. Yes. I'll take them down to the boat. I'll help you. We carried Mr. Field and the maid down to the boat. Uh, I'll 
take them out away and dump them. And after that, Michael? After that? Then I'm going home. To your house on the cliff on the other side of the bay? Yes, Carola. Michael, take me with you. What? Take me with you to your house up there on the cliff. I'm sorry. I can't. You, you can't? Why can't you? There isn't anything I can tell you. What are you hiding up there in the house on the cliff? You mustn't ask. Please, Carola, you mustn't ask. Why, you're married. You have a wife up there. No. Then what? I can't tell you. But you... You're going away. Leaving me forever. Not forever, Carola. Go back to the city. I'll come to you soon. <laughs> I returned to the city and waited. I waited a week, a month. But Michael Barrett did not come. I wrote to him, but there was no answer. And then one evening, I saw him. I was returning home in a taxi and I saw him, standing across the street looking up at my window. He saw me get out of the cab. He turned and started to hurry away. Michael! Michael! Michael, don't go away! Michael! Michael, why did you try to run away? Don't you know? Well, you're afraid. Yeah, let's call it that. But you love me, Michael, don't you? Carola, it's no good. There's nothing but ruin for both of us if I stay. We'll be together forever. It's impossible. I won't let you go back to that house on the cliff. I don't care what it is you're hiding up there. I won't let you go back. Goodbye, Carol. Wait. I'm going. Better forget about this. Don't go yet, Mr. Whitecliffe. So you know about that, too. I saw the old newspaper clipping Mr. Field carried. I see. Why are you looking at me like that? Do you know why I killed Mr. Field? Because it tried to blackmail me about that old murder. But Michael, dear, I'm a good deal smarter than Mr. Field. You see, I write mystery novels. I know how to handle such things. What do you mean? Wouldn't do you any good to kill me. I've written out all about you. Your real name and about that old murder in Canada. It would be found if I should ever be killed. Oh. Michael, darling, I'm blackmailing you. There's only one thing I want from you. Your love. It shouldn't be so hard for you to meet my terms. All right, Carla. You win. We'll be married tonight. Soon after we were married, Michael began going out evenings. Once, sometimes twice a week. Staying out all night. He'd return late the next day. When I asked where he'd been, his temper would flare up into something terrible. I stopped asking. But I couldn't rest. I had to know where he went. One evening, I followed him. He boarded a train for Skeleton Bay. At Skeleton Bay, he set out to walk from the station. And I followed him. It was no longer summer. Trees were bare and the night was forbidding. I kept behind him when he skirted the bay to the narrow road that led up toward his house high on the cliff. It was a small stone house, and the wind whistled around it, against it, and above it. I stole to one of the windows. It was barred, like a prison. Carefully, I raised my head above the sill, peered into a lighted room. Michael was there, with a woman. For the first time in my life, I knew the meaning of frustration, jealousy. Michael told me he wasn't married, but this woman... I'd helped him to do murder. I'd killed for him. I'd lied to that detective for him. And all the while, this was the secret he'd been keeping from me. I opened my handbag. I took out the pistol. I looked into the room again. The woman was alone now. Michael was gone. So you came <gasps> up after all, Carola. Michael, you, you sneaked out. You knew I was here. I'm sorry you saw through that window, Carola. Is that your secret? That woman? Part of it, but it's the part you mustn't know. But I do know it now. That's why I've got to kill you, Carola. That knife. You still got that knife? Yes, Carola. Well, I've got this, Mike. Ah! 
He fell at my feet. And I looked down and watched him die. Now I knew why I'd really come to Skeleton Bay that first day. It was for this. To kill Michael Barrett. So he's dead. <laughs> at last. You've killed him. You. The woman in the house. You. You saw me kill him? Yes, I saw you. What are you going to do about it? Help you dispose of the body, of course. Help me dispose of the body? Well, those were the very words I'd said to Michael Barrett down there on the beach. Now this woman was saying them to me. Who, who are you? I'm Elizabeth Wycliffe. I'm Michael's sister. Sister? And you want to help me dispose of his body? See the bars on those windows? Yes. I've been a prisoner in this house for ten years. You what? Michael killed the man I was going to marry ten years ago in Canada. He murdered him. But, but this house, the, this prison... Michael brought me here. He's kept me a prisoner. Because he knew if I got free, I'd tell the world he was a murderer. That's the secret. The secret he wouldn't even tell me. I shot her. Yes, I killed her too. There outside the house and she fell beside Michael. And I rolled both bodies over the cliff. Down into the sea. This is the end of my book. The best mystery novel I've ever written. I know that in writing it, I deliver myself into the hands of the law. But I can't stop. I can't help myself. So now, I'm finished. I will mail it to my publisher and wait for Detective Sergeant Smith to come and get me. It looks as if Carola's mystery novel will earn a lot of money after she's executed. Yes, but I'd say it's tainted money. Hmm? Why tainted? Because she'll be dead and a ghost can't own money. So taint hers. <laughs> the trouble with Carola was that her conscience was too little and too late. It told her not to commit murder after she'd done it. Well, that's certainly too late, Mr. Holt. Oh, yes, Mary, especially for her victims. And now, what's on your mind? Well, Mr. Host, right here, I'd like to say a word to our listeners on behalf of our veterans. You know, friends, ex-servicemen are returning to civilian jobs with a lot to offer their employers. They've had valuable training and experience in highly specialized service jobs. Many of them were able to keep up with their civilian jobs and learn new trades through special correspondence courses. And they're coming home fully equipped to do the same fine job as civilians that they did in the services. So let's give them every employment opportunity to put their increased skill to work. <laughs> And so, friends, we take our leave of lovely Carola Winter. She would have been better off if she'd remembered that the pen is mightier than the sword. Because the sword is leading her right back to the pen anyhow. <laughs> oh, yes, and remember, friends, when you go on a vacation, always insist on plenty of closet space. Yes, you never know what unexpected guests might drop in or drop dead. <laughs> By the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Death in the Limelight by A.E. Martin. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup will bring you another Inner Sanctum mystery directed by Hyman Brown. It's about a young chemist who discovers the secret of perpetual life. But he made the mistake of getting involved with death. <laughs> so... Until next Tuesday, good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
<laughs> Here's a swell dish, folks, that's easy to make and mighty easy to take. Lipton's Noodle Soup. You can prepare it in a jiffy, and the whole family will love its delicious chickeny tasting broth so full of tender golden noodles. Lipton's Noodle Soup has all the fresh-cooked, homemade flavor of grandmother's noodle soup. Yet it's economical. It costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. So get Lipton's Noodle Soup Mix tomorrow. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, Mystery Theater, brought to you in part by True Value Hardware, your store of first choice. I'm E.G. Marshall. The world, it is said, has changed over the centuries, but people have not. Perhaps this is because all too often the human heart is more intent on seeking its own pleasure, satisfying its own selfish needs, than giving thought to others. But there is innocence, too, and love and selflessness. And it is the interplay of these good and evil forces that form the warp and woof of the strange and horrifying tale I bring you now. Listen. Oh, Murray, I tell you, it was Chris. I talked to him. Chris is alive. Andrea, Chris is dead. No. Whoever is buried in that grave, it isn't Chris. <laughs> mystery drama, My Sister, Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Paul Hecht and Beatrice Strait. Come with me now to a cemetery near New York City. It is late afternoon. An afternoon of gloom and drizzle and cold, damp fog. Two women, half shrouded in the fog, walk amongst headstones that rise like white bones in the gray of the afternoon. They are sisters, these two. Andrea and Sybil Carter. And they are walking toward a certain grave. Really, Andrea? It seems to me we could have skipped visiting Chris's grave today. You needn't have come if you didn't want to, Sybil. When we buried our brother two weeks ago, I vowed to visit him every day. That's what I'm doing. But you can't go on doing this the rest of your life. Even Murray has asked you to be reasonable about it. Yes, come once a week, he says, or once a month. Well, you know what that would lead to. Coming not at all. No. I love Chris more than anyone else in the world, and I'm... Who's that? What? Someone... A man standing beside Chris's grave. You can just make him out in the fog. I don't see... Oh, yes. A man standing with his head bent as, as if he were praying. Shh. He's raising his head. He's turning towards us. He... Sybil. Oh, Sybil, my God. My God, it's Chris. Oh, Andrea, don't be silly. It couldn't possibly be. <laughs> Andrea! Oh, Murray, come in. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't come the minute I got your call, Sybil. Oh, that's all right, Murray. I know how busy your law practice keeps you. <laughs> your estate, you mean, yours and Andrea's. Chris's death has raised all sorts of tax problems. I'm afraid his death has raised more problems than that. Yeah? 
Yeah, what is this all about? I told you on the phone. You didn't really tell me what I thought I heard. Andrea is convinced she saw Chris. I saw him today in the cemetery, standing beside his own grave. Oh, come on, Sybil. What kind of nonsense is... Murray, please. I'm telling you the truth. Where is Andrea? In her bedroom, sleeping. Dr. Swanson gave her a strong sedative. Murray, she was in such a state, so hysterical. Look, let me get this straight. You and she went to Chris's grave this afternoon? Yes. We were walking toward the grave when we noticed a man standing beside it. And there was a man? Oh, yes. I saw him, too. He was standing beside the grave with his head bent. As if he was saying a prayer or meditating or something. I had just said I wondered who he could be when he raised his head and turned towards us. That was when Andrea started to scream. It's Chris, it's Chris. And then she just fainted. Went out cold. Who was the man? I don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? You didn't see his face? You didn't talk to him? It was a foggy day, Murray. It's been foggy all day and out there at the cemetery it was very foggy. I could barely see his face. And so, if it comes to that, neither could Andrea. Well, this is the strangest thing I've ever... Tell me, has Andrea had any other brainstorms like this one? Well, has she? Well, Murray, I... Now, look, sweetie, I'm your attorney, yours and Andrea's. If something not quite right is happening, you can tell me. In fact, you'd better tell me. Oh, Murray. You're more than just our lawyer, you know that. It's no secret that Andrea's in love with you and... <laughs> And that I am, too. And that I'm in love with both of you and can't make up my mind between you. But what has that to do with it? Oh, she'll pull herself together sooner or later and straighten out. Chris's death was a terrible blow to her, that's all. It was a blow to you, too, wasn't it? More than a blow, Murray. A puzzle. I still can't figure out how he could have fallen over a railing nearly chest high. Eighteen stories to the street below. Frankly, I keep wondering about that, too. But about Andrea now... Murray, the truth is she's been acting very strangely. What do you mean, strangely? Well, imagining things. Like Chris this afternoon and... Well, a few days we went shopping downtown and I took the Bentley. When we went back to the parking lot to get it, Andrea looked shocked when the attendant brought it around. Why shocked? Well, she swore up and down that we'd driven into town in the Jaguar. (laughs) <laughs> That's crazy. Murray, please don't say that. Don't even use that word. Something even stranger happened last night. What? Well, we'd had dinner here in the apartment. And Andrea said she was going to walk down to the corner to mail a letter and get a breath of fresh air. I stayed at the table having another cup of coffee. Well, when she came back from mailing the letter... You couldn't have gotten much fresh air in that short a time. Fresh air? What are you talking about? What is all this? What's all what? Well, the table. The food, the dirty dishes. What do you think it is? I'm asking you. What is this? Oh, it's what's usually left after two people have had dinner. What two people? Oh, Andrea, come on now. Will you answer me? What do you want me to say? We had dinner. You went out to mail a letter and get a breath of... Andrea, what's the matter? We did not have dinner here. We didn't. We had it at Delahanty's. See, just like we used the Jag instead of the Bentley the other day. Now, what kind of a crack is that? No crack, Andrea, no crack. All I'm saying is you're imagining things again. I did not imagine the Jaguar. I am not imagining this. You and I had dinner at Del Delahanty's, not here. In that case, Andrea, where have you just come from? Come from? You went out to mail a letter and get a breath of fresh air, you said. You just came back. You just now walked through the door. If that doesn't prove... You're forgetting the earring. Earring? What earring? Here, look. You can see for yourself I've only got one earring on. Well, you must have dropped it when you... That's exactly what I said less than 15 minutes ago. When we got home from Delahanty's and we're getting out of the car, I said, Sib, I've lost an earring. One that's from that jade pair that Murray gave me for my birthday. I said I wanted to search the car. And that's what I've been doing. I haven't been out mailing any letters. I've been searching in the car for that jade earring. Damn it, Sybil. Don't look at me as if I've lost my senses. You know, 
I'm beginning to be afraid you have. I tell you, Sybil. If Sibyl, we had dinner at Delahanty's, what is all this food and these plates and everything else doing on this table? I don't know. Well, darling, I do. We had dinner here. No. I'm, I'm certain we couldn't have. What are you going to do? I'm going to call Del Delahanty. He saw us there tonight. He came over to our table and chatted with us. We'll soon see whether we dined there or we didn't. Andrea, dear, please. You're simply going to embarrass yourself. Della Hattie's. Oh, Del, is that you? Yes, who's this? Andrea Carter, Del. Nice to hear from you, Miss Carter. Calling for a reservation? What? Oh, we're pretty full up, Miss Carter, but I'm sure I can arrange something if Del... you... Del... Yeah? Del, uh, my sister and I, didn't we have dinner at your place tonight? You put me on, Miss Carter. We didn't dine there tonight? If you did, I didn't see you. Thank you, Del. He says we weren't there tonight. Darling, we weren't. Then I did imagine it all. Afraid you did, yes. But it was all so real. Oh, Sybil. Sybil, I'm going out of my mind. And I had a real rough time with her then, too. Believe me, Murray. She was simply beside herself. Yeah. A jaguar, this business of Della Hattie's. And now today, imagining she saw Chris at his own grave. Murray. You don't think she's... Well, you know. I don't know. Grief hits some people like a sledgehammer. Belts them so hard they never recover. Trouble is... Yes? Trouble is... <laughs> Andrea isn't that kind of people. Well, Mr. Redmond. Hello, Dal. Nice to have a future New York DA at my bar again. <laughs> That'll be the day. <laughs> that I make a district attorney, I mean. Uh, me? I'd bet on it. You drink okay? Perfect. Long time no see. You've been busy, I guess, eh? Uh, very. You too. I see Della Handy's is just as crowded as ever. I got no complaints. Carriage trade mostly. People that wouldn't go anywhere else but Della Handy's to dine and dance or just have a drink at a bar. Or gamble. How is that? Gambling does go on in the back room, doesn't it? Where'd you get an idea like that, Mr. Redmond? Oh, I have ways. I'm going to help you win your bet and become DA someday. I got to keep on top of things, wouldn't you say, Dal? Yeah. Well, nice having you with us again, Mr. Redmond. Hope to see more of you. Yeah. Um, before you go, Dell. Yeah? A friend of mine, a lady friend, mentioned she thought she'd lost an earring here one night. An earring? Yeah, a jade earring. Would you know something about it, maybe? No, but we keep a lost and found box right behind the bar. Eddie... Uh, give me the lost and found box, will you? It was lost here, Mr. Redmond, and we picked it up. It's sure to be. Well, thanks, Eddie. There we are. I see. Gold cigarette lighter. <laughs> Look at them rings of dames. Leave them in the powder room. Money clip. Oh, here. Huh. An earring. This what you're looking for, Mr. Redmond? Yeah. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm looking for, Dell. <laughs> well, hey, I'd, I'd look on your face. You look like you found a lot more than an earring. I have, Dell. I have. Murray Redman has indeed found more than just Andrea Carter's earring. He has also found that she didn't imagine dining at Delahanty's. Nor then, in all likelihood, did she imagine driving into town in the Jaguar... The Jaguar, which unaccountably turned into a Bentley. But as for imagining or not imagining her dead brother standing beside his own grave, well, we'll get closer to the answer to that when I return in a few moments with Act Two. told that the proper study of man is man. Personally, I prefer to study women. 
Whether I did or not, I'm sure that had I been handsome young attorney Murray Redden, unable to decide which of two wealthy sisters I wanted to marry, I'd have been absolutely intrigued by the curious circumstances which now seemed to attend them. I'm not sure, however, that I'd have adopted Murray's direct approach. Sybil is either trying to drive you crazy, Andrea, or she's setting you up for commitment to a sanitarium. I can't believe this, Murray. Here's the earring to prove it. But isn't it possible that somebody else lost an earring at Delahanty's? That the duplicate of mine. Okay, okay. It isn't. Oh, Murray, I can't believe that. What you're saying is you don't want to believe it. I don't either, but facts are facts. You and Sybil did have dinner at Delahanty's last night. She arranged things to make it look as if you dined here. And face it, Andrea, if you hadn't lost the earring and I hadn't picked it up at Delahanty's right at this minute, you'd think you were going off your rocker. And frankly, so would I. Well, it was clever of you to check for the earring at Dell's. Well, I'm a pretty smart fellow, you know. <laughs> smart enough, anyhow, to smell a rat when I come across it. Like this dinner business or the car nonsense or Chris standing beside his own grave. Yeah, and I might as well tell you now, Andrea, I don't believe Chris's death was accidental. Murray. No one could have fallen over that railing. Or fallen off accidentally, yeah. If he'd been sitting on the railing. Even taken his own life, if it comes to that. No, personally, I think he was pushed. Murray. Do you realize you're accusing Sybil of murder? I do. <gasps> and of trying to make it look as if I'm crazy. Yeah. Well, why? Why would she do anything like that? Do you really want me to answer that? No. I suppose not. If what you say is true, and it isn't, the answer could be that Sybil wanted to get control of all our money. And me. You? To lay it on the line, Andrea, she's in love with me. So am I. <laughs> what else is new? Well, there you have it. With you out of the way, Sybil would have, or think she'd have, a clear field. I... I just don't know what to say or do. Well, the thing to do... At least for the moment, is simply, well, simply to play along. You see, what I want is to get enough evidence against Sybil to nail the truth and her to the wall. You know, I, I'm simply dumbfounded. Oh, it can't be true, Murray. It simply can't. We all have more than one side or sides we usually conceal. Yes, I know. I, but, oh. What's the matter, Andrea? What is it? That painting on the wall there. Yeah, what about it? Well, you've seen it before. Look at it. I'm looking at it. So what? Three children playing on a lawn. There were always four. Four, four kids? I mean, are you sure? Well, I'm positive. There were two boys and two girls, and now there are two girls, but only one boy. Murray, this isn't another of Sybil's... Well, we'll uh... soon find out. Let's just have a close look at the painting. Well? No. No, I don't see... Wait a minute. Sure. Oh, man, what a skillful job. Skillful? Yeah, of painting out the figure of the second boy. Here, here, see for yourself. <laughs> You'd never know that figure had been painted out if you didn't look closely, very closely. <gasps> you, you see? Well, yes. My God, it is then that Sybil is... I'm afraid so, Andrea. However you look at it, Sybil is guilty. Guilty as sin. All I've got to do is prove it. You get the hell out of my office, Redmond, or I'll throw you out. Cool it, Dell. Just cool it. Cool it? You come in here and call me crooked, accuse me of pulling some kind of fraud, and then tell me to cool it? All right, let's say I advise you to cool it. Look at this. The earring you picked up here last night... What about it? It belongs to Andrea Carter. It's one of a pair I gave her. She lost it out there in the restaurant while she was having dinner with her sister. The dinner you said never took place. I said? Andrea phoned you last night to ask if she and Sybil had dinner here. You said they hadn't. You lied, Dell. Now, why did you lie, huh? Okay. Okay, so I played a little joke. Somehow it doesn't strike me so funny. I'll tell you what does, though. Why you and Sybil Carter teamed up to play this little uh, joke on Andrea. Teamed up? Me and Sybil Carter? What else? Look, Dell, take a lawyer's advice. 
Open up. Spill everything. And do it now. Cop a plea? Like that? Something like that. Chris. Chris Carter. The brother. Yeah. He was into me for over 12 grand. He gambled like it was going out of style and always lost. Go on. So he falls off the terrace of their apartment and gets killed. Mm -hmm. I'm out 12 grand. I call up the Carters and I get the civil dame on the phone. I tell her how I'm out a dozen big ones and she tells me to drop dead. Oh. But the next day, she shows up here and says she'll pay the dough if I'll help her play a, a little joke on her sister. Pretty expensive joke, wouldn't you say? I didn't say anything. If she's willing to get me off the pad for 12 grand, I'm willing to help her play her joke. So where's the harm in that? Who gets hurt? Worse than hurt, Dell. Somebody could get dead. Real dead. Dell broke down and told you the whole story. Just like that? It surprised even me. I guess he's not as tough as he looks. More act. Fact is, though, that uh, that earring of yours stopped him cold. I had him dead to rights, and he knew it. Murray. Yeah? I want to face Sybil with this. Face her right now. Uh Uh-uh. She's bound to try another trick, and probably soon. Mm -hmm. And that could be the one that hangs her. If it weren't for you. Oh, Murray. (laughs) I'd be out of my mind. I'd be stark raving mad this minute. No, you wouldn't. No, you're too level-headed for that. (sighs) Well, forewarned is forearmed. You know what Sybil's up to? We both do. So she can't win, Andrea. Murray, when this is over, let's get married. I couldn't make up my mind which one of you I wanted for a wife, but I guess I can now. Andrea, I definitely can now. Yeah. Oh, of course, Marcia. Send her in. Oh, come in, Sybil. Come in. I know I'm interrupting you. It's something important. <laughs> you are, but you're worth it. Here, sit down. Thank you. How's Andrea? She's my reason for being here, Murray. Well, what do you want to tell me? Murray, I'm worried about Andrea. Terribly worried. You mean her nervous attacks? Well, they're more than that, I'm afraid. What you call nervous attacks seem more like delusions to me. I'm beginning to think that she is on the verge of insanity. Has something else happened? Yes. There's a picture on the wall of the living room. A painting of three children playing on a lawn. Yeah? Andrea swears that there were four children in the picture, not just three. Or were there? Four children in the picture, I mean. Well, of course not. There were always three? Well, yes. You don't sound too sure. What I'm trying to say is... Well, I couldn't swear in a court of law that there were always three children in the painting. Well, you know how we look at things after a while without really seeing them. What I am saying is that if there are three children in the painting now, then there must have always been three, not four. Makes sense. Which Andrea's saying that there were four doesn't. Hmm. That combined with everything else that's happened since Chris died, has got me worried. It's something to worry about. So what I came to ask you, do you think I ought to get her to consult a psychiatrist? Might be a good idea. Would there be any danger in it? Danger? Well, I mean, if she went to a psychiatrist and he discovered that she was seriously ill, I mean, really insane, would she be committed or something like that? Well, it depends. On what? First of all, whether she was dangerous to herself, others. If he felt that she was, he'd certainly recommend placing her in a sanitarium where she could be cared for and perhaps in time cured. If that was to happen, if he made that decision, you'd have to sign papers of commitment. Oh. Would you? I don't suppose I'd have any choice, would I? Oh, there's always a choice. Another thing. If anything like that were to happen, what about the estate? Uh, You know as well as I do, Sybil, that you'd be in complete control. Well, no, I didn't know. Your father's will divided his fortune equally among the three of you. You, Andrea, Chris. You and Andrea came into Chris's share when he died several weeks ago. 
If you signed papers certifying Andrea as insane, she would be declared incompetent to handle her affairs and, as next of kin, you'd take over for her. You didn't know that? As I said, I... I don't know much, if anything, about these things. That's why I came to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now you know... Uh... Oh, uh, sorry, excuse me, Sybil. Uh, yes, Marcia. Oh, yeah, put her through. Marie! Marie! Come quickly, please! Andrea, what is it? Marie, we are wrong. All wrong. It isn't Sybil. She's not playing tricks. Marie! I am going out of my mind. What happened? I can't talk. I can't talk. Marie! Yeah. Please, God! Andrea, where are you? Okay, I'm on my way. Andrea, you've got to get control of yourself. What is it, dear? What happened? I went to the cemetery to visit Chris's grave. Yeah, yeah, I know that. A man. A man was standing beside the grave like the other day, Sybil. Yes, dear, yes. And like the other day, as I walked towards the grave, he lifted his head and looked straight at me. It was Chris. Honey, the man we saw the other day wasn't Chris. And neither was this one. It was Chris. The way you sound, you, you sound as if you actually believe. I do believe it was Chris. He talked to me. He what? He said... As I came towards him, he held out his arms to me and he said... He said... Hi, sis. Thanks for coming. And it was his voice? His voice. His face. Oh, Murray, I tell you, it was Chris. It was Chris to the life. Well, if you're shocked, think how shocked Murray Redmond must have been. His entire theory that Sybil is trying to have Andrea committed out the window, just like that. On the other hand, Chris couldn't be standing by his own grave. Could he? Perhaps we'll find out when I return shortly with Act Three. It is almost axiomatic that at those moments in life when we are absolutely sure we are right, something happens that shocks us with the knowledge that we are absolutely wrong. Assuredly, that is what has just happened to Andrea Carter and Murray Redmond. Convinced that beyond a shadow of a doubt, Andrea's sister, Sybil, is trying to set her up for commitment to an asylum, they are stunned to realize that this may not be the case at all. <laughs> But, Andrea, what you're saying is impossible. It couldn't have happened. Oh, I tell you, it did, it did, it did, it Murray, did. I'm going to phone Dr. Swanson. Okay. I'm sure you'll come right over. Come on, Andrea, what is the meaning of this? What? Chris is dead. You couldn't have met him at the grave. You couldn't have talked to him. Murray, Murray, please believe me. It happened. It was Chris. It's incredible, inconceivable. You say you talked with him? What did you talk about? What did you say? He's... Hi, sis. Thanks for coming. And you? For a few minutes, I couldn't say anything. All I could do was just stare at him. And he looked at me and he said, Trust me, sis. I'll explain everything in time. I just wanted you to know that I'm alive. And then what happened? And then he said he was going to leave me then. But that I'd see him again soon. And he kissed me on the cheek. Kissed you? Yes. Then he began to walk away, and I started after him, but he turned, and then he said, No, no, don't follow me. You'll understand in time. And I, I let him go. I let him walk out of my life again. I can't believe any of this. I can't believe it either, but it happened. Oh, Murray, what does it mean? This can't be one of Sybil's tricks. The man I talked to was my brother. I don't know who we buried in that grave, but it couldn't have been Chris. It was. It couldn't. I was there. I was there when they closed the casket. I was one of the pallbearers. Oh, Dr. Swanson's on his way over. How are you feeling, Andrea? Uh, 
I'll be all right. Would you like a drink now? Oh, yes. I could use one, Sybil. Murray? Yeah, yeah, I could too. Uh, double, please. Murray. Chris can't be alive, and yet... Murray, we are going to have to open the casket. Oh, no. Sybil's right. Oh, no. I've got a court order this afternoon. Don't look so horrified, Andrea. You don't have to be there. Oh, but yes, I do. Oh, Andrea, why? Because I know what you're thinking. Both of you now. You're thinking I'm out of my mind. I don't. You must. What I've told you is crazy. Well, I want to be there when you open that grave and see for yourself the proof that I'm sane. Or... Or what, dear? Mad! Stark mad! All right, gently, boys. Gently. Open her up now, Mr. Redmond. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can't look. Uh, that's all right, Sybil. Uh, look, why don't you just go, go over there under the trees? You don't have to look either, Andrea. I must. I must. Stay there, Sybil. Sybil, don't come here. Don't look. Marjorie, Marjorie. All right, close it up, boys. Close it up. Mr. Coffin, who's in there? Is it? Yes, yes, it's Chris. <laughs> and for the last time, Andrea, I do not think you're crazy. You're as sane as I am. Then, my meeting with Chris and talking to him, it was a trick. Yes. But... How could it have been done? How could Sybil have managed it? I don't know. Now, you said that Sybil is clever. I'd say she's diabolically clever. Uh, Andrea, I brought this along. I I want you to take it, and I want you to keep it near you. A gun? Uh, yeah. Murray, I, I'm scared to death of guns. I, I, I couldn't even touch that now, thing. Now, listen to me. There's no question in my mind now that Chris's death was not accidental. Sybil... He was pushed off that terrace out there. I'm sure of it. I'm equally sure that Sybil may try to kill you. Oh, no. It's a possibility. Oh. Her plan to have you committed is not working out. Not as fast as she'd like to. I'm trying to stay just one jump ahead of her. It seems to me she just might try to kill you and make it look like an accident. Like with Chris? Yes. So here. Take it. Oh, but Take I... it. And keep it near you at all times. You understand? At all times. Oh, sorry, Andrea. I hope I didn't wake you. Oh, no. Just resting, Sybil. You want something? Well, yes. I thought we might talk. About what? Andrea, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. About you... And I think you ought to see a psychiatrist. Oh, so does Murray. Anyhow, he doesn't think it would be a bad idea. You've discussed it with Murray, have Definitely. you? I love you. Murray loves you. It was only natural I should go to him for advice. You are lying, and you know it. What are you talking about? You are either trying to drive me out of my mind or trying to make it look as if I am so that you can have me committed. Andrea! Everything that's happened to me since Chris's death, which was no accident, Sybil, you killed him. I... Everything that's happened since then. Every strange, incredible thing. That business with the cars, the dinner bit, the painting with only three children in it instead of four. Oh, yes. And even my meeting with Chris... Chris, in the flesh, I don't know how you manage that. But it's all been arranged. Every single thing arranged by you. Why should I do such things to To you? get control of the money that we share jointly. To get Murray for your husband. You are out of your mind. To think that I would do anything so vicious, so depraved. Yes, vicious and depraved. You. And when I realized it, when I could no longer hide it from myself and had to face it. That my sister, the sister I loved devotedly, had murdered our brother, Andrea, and was now tricking me into thinking I was going out of my head. When I realized that, Sybil, I didn't want to live anymore. I wanted to die. Oh, Andrea, I wanted dearest. to die. <laughs> what are you doing? 
Murray gave me this gun to protect myself with against you. I told him I was scared of guns. I'm afraid even to touch them. <laughs> but I didn't tell him why. I didn't tell him I was afraid I'd use it on myself. I know, I know. Yes, I can't go on living, Sybil. <laughs> All that meant anything to me is gone. Chris is dead. You've turned on me. You want me dead and out of the way so that you could have the money and Murray. Oh, oh, right then. You shall have what you want now. Give me that gun. It's gone. Give me your bike and you know. Give it. Murray? This is Andrea. Yes, Andrea. Murray? I've just killed Sybil. Shall we go now, Andrea? Andrea, dear, the, the, the funeral's over. So is my life. They're both down there now, <laughs> side by side, under the ground. Chris and Sybil. Come on. It's cold. You're shivering. Come on now. All right. <laughs> I never thought when I vowed to visit Chris's grave every day, I never thought that in a few short weeks we'd be visiting Sybil. What's the matter? Why have you stopped? Someone coming towards us on the path. Look, they're under the trees. What? God, it looks like... It looks like... Sybil! You're imagining things. No, no, look, it's a woman. You can see her clearly now. Sybil's clothes, the blue suit that she wore. The Sybil's hat. Murray! It is! It can't be, but it is Sybil. <gasps> Why, Andrea? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? I came to visit Chris. Murray! Murray! Easy, Andrea. Murray! Oh, dear, there's no one here but us. You're imagining things. I'm not, I'm not. Sybil? Sybil, it is you, isn't it? Of course. You're dead. You're dead. Dead? I'm very much alive, as you can see. I killed you. Shot you to death. My God. We just... Buried you. Come on now, Andrea. I want you home. I'll get you a sedative. She, she, she's there, I tell you. I don't see anyone. I do, I do. Heaven help me. I'm mad. I'm out of my mind. Oh, Murray, Murray. Help me. I've done a terrible thing and I'm being punished. But you've got to help me. Save me. Terrible thing? What terrible thing, Andrea? I killed Sybil deliberately. I m murdered her, Murray. I murdered her. It's just as I murdered Chris. You? I pushed him off the terrace to his death. I shot Sybil to make it look like an accident. Oh, I knew if I pointed the gun at my head, she'd try to take it away from me. The tricks and all that happened... Sybil wasn't playing the tricks. I was. You, Andrea? You played those tricks? You hear, Murray? You hear? I'm listening, Andrea. No, no. You heard Sybil. Sybil. There is no Sybil oh, here. Forgive me, Chris. Forgive me, Sybil. Forgive me. Of course. But why did you do all this? 
to make it look as if you were trying to get me out of the way. When all the time I was planning to do away with you. <laughs> it was all a trick. It was nothing but a trick. Yes, a trick that backfired, I'm afraid. Backfired on you, Andrea. What? what? You heard me correctly. You've been fooled. Fooled by your own trick. I don't understand. I don't... Un- Tell her, Sybil. She... She is? Standing there? Yes, Andrea. I am. And very much alive. What? How? Huh? Oh, Murray. You tell her. I can't. Andrea, you went too far. You overreached yourself. Your story about meeting Chris clinched things for me. Oh. It was impossible. Either you had to be insane and I knew you weren't, or you had to be lying. And that was when I decided to force your hand and <laughs> use a few tricks of my own. Oh, what about the gun you gave me? It contained what? blanks. Oh. I took Sybil into my confidence. I had to, and <laughs> she played her part very well. I'm sorry, Andrea, but you did bring it on yourself. Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> All right, Andrea. Let's go. No. What? I don't want to go home with you. I'm too ashamed. Please. I don't want to go home. We're not going home, Andrea. We're going to the police. As I said at the outset, the world changes, but people do not. There are those who believe this planet we inhabit is a school A school where we are sent by God, by providence, what you will, to learn to be better. Experience, of course, is the teacher. A harsh teacher, but an effective one. I think you'll want to know that Sybil Carter is now Mrs. Murray Redmond. And they are very happily married. Andrea is living quietly and comfortably in a sanitarium. For as it turned out, strangely enough, this woman who pretended that her sister was trying to drive her mad really was. Our cast included Beatrice Strait, Paul Hecht, Marion Seldes, and George Petrie. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. about this world of ours, and ever in search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. The Creaking Door. Manufacturers of State Express 3.5's Filter King cigarettes take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. Good evening, friends of 
of the creaking door. The creaking door is open. So do, Captain. Feeling the chill of these winter's evenings. Wait until you've been with us a little while. You'll freeze with fear. <laughs> Get three fives. Get the taste. Three fives by State Express. Get the taste of international success. The taste that's uniquely three fives. Only when no expense is spared in its making can a cigarette taste so right, so smooth, so satisfying. Three fives. Get the taste. The taste that State Express created for you. The taste that has made Three Fives the king-size cigarette of international success. Get Three Fives. Get the taste. caretaker and the ashen-faced trembling young man make an odd pair as they stand by an open grave under the pale moon. In the grave itself is a coffin. The lid has been prized open and inside the corpse of a middle-aged man. The caretaker warns, Oh, I've heard of that black slot, you... Read about grave robbers. I never thought I'd come across one. Here, I've sent for the cops, young man. Don't you try no rough stuff. I'm a match for you any day. But you don't understand. Hey. I tried to save his life and now it's too late. Hey, don't you give me that. This fellow was given a decent Christian burial. You desecrated... Desecrated, you say? Isn't it desecration to bury a man while he's still alive? Hey, hey, what you talking about? You don't think people go around being buried alive these days, do you? I don't know what to make of you. Eh? I watched you this afternoon. I, I thought you looked a bit uh, peculiar. I don't know what you was doing at a pauper's burial. You shouldn't have had a pauper's burial. You shouldn't have been buried at all. I could have saved him. Eh, you better think up a good story. Something told me that you was up to no good. No, no, no. Don't you try no rough stuff. I've already warned you. I watched you. The police are on their way. Breaking open a coffin like that, eh? I knew you was up to something, but I never thought... It's because... Could... Hey. Because I let him get buried alive and I was ashamed. Let him get buried alive for a measly 50 pounds. Now he's dead. Hey, you come out of a loony bin or something. Now that I've had a bit of look at you, you, you don't look like no grave robber. I'm not... Listen. What's he to you, this fellow we buried today, eh? Nothing. Except I'm responsible for his death. I touched him. He, he's cold. Cold as death. He, he's only been in the ground a few hours. They don't stay cold like that. Sometimes we get an exhumation order. We have to dig him up, see? He, you'd be surprised how warm they get. He is dead, isn't he? I mean, I brought this piece of mirror with me. There's no breath. Look. <laughs> I don't have to look. He's been in the municipal morgue for two days. He's given a pauper's burial. Now then, what's it all about, young man? I want to go home. He was dead all right when they buried him. But not when the ambulance took him to the morgue. You see, I know. You know? Oh, is he a relative of yours? I never knew he existed until two days ago. I've been trapping the streets looking for work. I didn't want to go home. If you could call that one-room bedsitter, let and I occupy a home. It was still ringing in my ears, the things she shouted at me as I left them. I've come to the end of my tether. I've pawned everything. Look, look, even the wedding ring you slipped on my finger in the church. What did he say? And all thy worldly goods. Huh. That's a laugh. You were going to share all your worldly goods, were you? Well, if you don't get some money or a job, I'm walking out on you, do you hear? I'm walking out on you and I'll go and live with my sister. At least I'll get some warmth and three square meals a day. Oh, don't say that, Lil. Was it my fault that I fell sick? That I'm not allowed to work in the factory anymore? I've tried, Lil. I really have. Everywhere I go, they look at me and say, no vacancies. Not my fault either. 
I'll warn you, Joe Harris. I can't take much more of this. I know, honey, I know. I'll, I'll get something today. Really, I will. I promise. It was a promise I couldn't keep. Pounding the pavement. Watching the dislike and fear in the eyes of the well-fed as they said, No, thank you. Fear that one day they might become like me. And then I saw him. I was cutting through Duke's Lane. Nothing on either side except a huge big wall. He was a short, fat little man. Our steps were loud in the quiet thoroughfare. Are you all right? It can't be. It, it's gone out. Don't seem to be any breathing. I wonder who he is. Let's see. It must have something in his pocket. Wally. Clammy. Who's all this money? But must be 50 quid here at least. Poor swine. What good is his money now? I, I better call a cop. If you don't get some money or a job, I'm walking out on you, do you hear? I'm walking out. There's nothing anybody can do for this poor swine. I'll find him soon enough. I'll... What does the guard do in a case like this? Beat it, you fool. Beat it with the first decent money you've had in months. Somebody will find him. Run. Leo. Right, Leo. Two five-pound notes, 31 pound notes, and the rest in ten bob notes. Oh. It all adds up, adds up very nicely. Fifty quid in all. Oh, Joe, honey. Hi. How did you get this money? You didn't go and do anything silly, did you? Such as what? Rubber bank? I wouldn't know how to start. But how did you get it? You'll never believe it. Remember I told you that when I was in the sanatorium, there was a fellow there with the same lung trouble named Ted Brown? Yes. Well, uh, I'll lend him a quid. You lent him a quid? Well, I was... Well, I was still drawing my wages, wasn't I? We didn't know that the doctor wouldn't let me go back to the factory. It wasn't so bad then. All right, all right. What about this Ted Brown? Well, I'll meet him in the street, see? Says he'd been looking for me everywhere. Wanted to repay me the quid. Go on. Well, we goes into a pub to have a drink. Uh, there was a bookie there, and Ted said he'd had a hot tip for the double. It won, Neil. Fifty smackers. Oh, Joe. Fifty smackers. Oh, I love you. Lil went to get some groceries and a couple of bottles of beer. I sat on the bed and had a further look at the wallet. Having taken the money out, I thought it would be empty. There were two pockets, both with plastic windows. The first held a card which said, Harold Maxted, 26 Fairley Street, Ormsey. And then I looked at the second plastic window. There were strange words printed on a white card. It said, I am not dead. I'm subject to a form of cataleptic illness which may appear to cause death. If I'm found, notify Dr. Alfred Miller, Hornsey, 6641. Oh. No, it can't be. Not dead. Cataleptic. What have I done? What have I done? That they'll think he's... Oh, no. Telephone up. I must telephone. But Leo, she'll wonder where I've gone up. I've given her all my money. Yeah, all right. Oh, thank you for this. Here, suck these bottles from me, will you? Joe? What is it? What time is it, darling? I don't know. The pub was just opening, just after six, I should say. Why? Give me ten bomb to get me change. I need some silver. I have to telephone. I won't be long, love. What is it? Well, I've, I've just got to telephone someone. You're not going gambling, are you? You haven't got the bug. You're not betting on tomorrow's races or anything like that, are you, Joe? There are all those bills to be paid. I know, love, I know. No, I'm not gambling, but I need it, please. I'll be back in a little while. It, it's just that... Please, Lil. All right. Here you are. Joe! It's all right, love. Would I be too late with the phone call? 
Would they bury this poor guy, Maxted, not knowing he was a cataleptic, thinking he was dead? This would be the number of the doctor's consulting room where he's passed out. Can I speak to Dr. Miller, please? Uh, Dr. Miller's gone abroad. Well, he's been away for the last six weeks. Abroad? Oh, no. Have you taken over his practice, sir? No, I'm not a medical man. But if you're in need of a doctor, there must be plenty. Uh, no, no, isn't that... You don't know which hospital Dr. Miller was at? I'm afraid I can't help you. I must go. My wife's shouting. The dinner's on the table. I'm sorry. Thank you. And then another thought seared my brain. A hole in the ground. A long wooden box and the man being buried. Being buried alive. And a shovel. Heaping earth on the wooden boards. Next head. Next head. There must be a max in a telephone directory. There was. Fourteen max Everyone alive and bad-tempered. No, I have no relatives who suffer from a cataleptic illness. There are plenty of other Maxes in the book, try them. I have. You're Mr. Zachariah Maxted. You're the last on the list. Well, I can't help you. What now? Do I go along to the police and say, Look, I stole a man's wallet. Somebody might be shoving him in six foot of earth. What do I do? I decided to sleep on it. Sleep. <laughs> That's a laugh. Oh, that... Very alive. Love you, Lou. Love you. Please. Pinching wallet. <laughs> They're putting me in a wooden box. And it's your fault, Joe Addis. I'm struggling for breath. They're going to bury me. Bury me deep. But not deep enough, Jerry. Get me out of this or I'll make you suffer here on earth and in the beyond. Get three fives. Get the taste. Three Fives by State Express. Get the taste of international success. The taste that's uniquely Three Fives. Only when no expense is spared in its making can a cigarette taste so right, so smooth, so satisfying. Three Fives. Get the taste. The taste that State Express created for you. The taste that has made Three Fives the king-size cigarette of international success. Get three fives. Get the taste. Better do something about it pretty soon. Otherwise, the poor, unfortunate, cataleptic gentleman will be stiff with the cold. But let us see what he does do. Do? I didn't know what to do. It was less than six hours since I saw that chap Paul. Maybe he's still there. Maybe if I go back to Duke's Lane, he'll still be lying there. Sorry, Anya. I didn't want to wake you up. It's middle of the night. Where are you going? I won't be long. No, Joe, you're not going anywhere. I thought you'd been acting strange. Oh, Joe, I know I've nagged you and threatened you, but it was only because you were getting so down, so beaten. I love you, Joe. Oh, I don't want you to be doing anything that will put you in prison. Uh, it isn't that at all. Well, what is it? All right, Lil, I'll, I'll tell you. 
And then you'll see why I have to go. And so I told her. Told her the whole story of how I robbed a man I thought was dead. A corpse would have no use for the 50 quid in his wallet. So you see, I've got to find him. Or find out where they've taken him. But they'll think he's dead, Liz. Joe. Joe. Somebody will have found him by now. He's probably lying in bed fast asleep. People who have these sort of fits soon recover. No, they don't. After I found all the maxes I could, I went into the Hornsby Library and I looked it up. Unless they get assistance, they can stay that way for days. By then, they'll, they'll bury him. And you know what that makes me? A murderer. I'm letting a man die for 50 quid. Oh, no, Joe. Why don't you phone the police station? Why don't you phone the Hornsby police station? Tell them the... Oh, no, Joe. You... Uh, no, you can't do that. They'll call you a thief and put you away. Look, I'm getting dressed. I'm coming with you. Where did you say it was? Give it Joe, let's pray he's still there. Well, that might be worse. He might have died for lack of attention. Let's pray someone saw him and they took him to hospital and they realised he wasn't... wasn't dead. He's a copper. Uh, it's a bit nippy this time of the morning, isn't it? Going off night work, are you? What? Yeah, that's right. Oh, there was a little commotion in, in Duke's Lane a few hours ago, so, so my friend Phyllis told me. And that something happened in Duke's Lane. Oh, yes, yes. Just before I came on duty. The postman saw a bloke lying in the lane here. Dropped dead. Dead? They sure he's dead? So the police surgeon said. Why? Know anything about it? No. No, we don't know anything about it. It was just that... Well, we wondered if it was anybody we knew, that's all. Oh. Well, I believe they've identified him all right. If you nip round to the station, they may be able to tell you. Oh, I don't think it's anybody we know. Oh, come on, love. It's too cold to stand here chatting. Let's go off to bed. You too, married? Yes. <laughs> you should have been in bed ages ago. Good night. Or rather, good morning. Let's go to the police station. Maybe. No, Joe, no. You have to explain about the wallet. Besides, this policeman doesn't really know. Please come home. But, Lil... It's no good, Joe. We're going home. Come on. <laughs> Coffee, Joe. No, thanks. Look, it's no good. We've got to go to the police. We committed murder. It's two days now. I didn't sleep a wink all night last night. Kept having nightmares. Hearing Max Ted's voice pounding in my brain. Pounding my brain. Telling me to save him before it's too late. You're the only one that can save me, yes? They're burying me this afternoon. They're putting me in a coffin and they're going to cover me with earth. If you allow this to happen to me, you're a murderer, Joe Alice. A murderer, do you hear? You'll be punished. 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 He kept saying I'd be punished. But you said yourself it's only a nightmare. All right, don't you go. I will. I'll say that I know... What was his name? Maxted. Harold Maxter. I'll say I know him and he's a cataleptic. That's it. I'll go there right away. Excuse me. Hello. Aren't you the young lady I saw down Duke's Lane the other night? Yes, that's right. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. You know we were talking about someone who dropped dead that afternoon. Well, were you able to identify him? Yes, we were able to identify him all right. Why? He's a cataleptic. He's not really dead, you know. Oh, don't be funny. I've got the card here. They're burying him this afternoon. He's in the Ornsey mortuary. Cardiac failure. This is the release for the body for him to be buried. Signed by the police surgeon, Dr. Herbert Spencer. He may have been a cataleptic. I don't know about that. But he died of heart failure. Being buried in a pauper's grave at Ornsey Cemetery, three o'clock this afternoon. Didn't die of heart failure, indeed. <laughs> Not dead. Oh, well, maybe I'm being a bit silly. Thank you, Constable. Good night. Surely it's the death certificate was signed by the police surgeon. Oh, what did that copper know about cataleptics? Had the doctor known he was a cataleptic? I'm going to stop the burial. You can't, Joe, you can't. Won't you tell the police about that wallet? Where are you going, Joe? I don't know. Get drunk. I don't know anything anymore. Even my glass of beer went sour in my mouth. I bought it with blood money. The blood that had was mixed in. I left the pub and walked. So they were burying him in a pauper's grave, were they? I didn't ask my feet to move towards the cemetery. It seemed as though they didn't belong to me. 
They were burying him as I got there. The minister, the grave digger, and an old man. Obviously the caretaker, plus a police sergeant. I wanted to shout, don't. Don't put him in that grave. He's not a corpse, he's alive. Couldn't. Those three stripes and a copper sleeve seemed to represent a number of years I might get for stealing and for withholding information. I ran from the cemetery as though I were running from the vengeance of Maxted himself. Hello, Jack. They buried him in the last one. I saw them do it. A cheap wooden coffin. <laughs> or maybe it's a good thing the coffin was a cheap one. Maybe the death watch beetle got it in. Maybe there are holes in it. Maybe the poor swine will be able to breathe. Fifty measly nicker. Fifty rotten pounds. And I, I've turned myself into a murderer. But you, Lilith, they'll nab you too. They'll say you were part of the conspiracy. What have I done to you? What have I done to us? Nothing, Joe. All right, so you pinched his wallet when we were both starving. No one can have you up for... for murder? Well, it's beside the point now, isn't it, Lil? He's down there struggling for breath, isn't he? He won't be struggling for long. I don't know anything about cataleptics, but... You can't be nailed inside a coffin underneath six foot of earth for long. Look out the window, Lily. It's got dark already. It's winter, Joe. I know the grave, Lil. I'm going back. But Joe. You're not going to stop me, Lil. I'm going back and I'm going to get him out of that grave. Please, Lil, I've got to. All right, Joe. I'll come with you. Oh, no, no. I couldn't bear that. I've got to do this on my own. Suppose, supposing he's too heavy for you. You're not strong, Joe. It's a pauper's grave, Lil. They didn't take much trouble with him. With a wire pulper and all that money in his wallet. That makes it worse, doesn't he? Maybe they couldn't raise his relatives. What with his doctor gone away and everything. Here, Lil, get me that hammer out of the drawer. It's got that thing at the end for taking nails out. And, and that piece of mirror. All right. Here. Yeah. I hope you're right. But you know what you're doing. It's the only way, Lil. The only way. So here I am, isn't it? It's too late. He's dead, all right. Blow me, young man. I wouldn't be in your shoes, not for nothing. Hey, hey just a minute. Uh, what did you say this bloke's name is? Maxted. Harold Maxted. Oh, no, it's not. What? Uh, this bloke's name is Sidney Fraser. Are you sure it's the same bloke? Positive. No, it's the same bloke. His accusing face follows me around, sleeping and waking. Oh, you young man, yeah. Come and have a look with me. We don't give them much of a tombstone, these paupers. Uh, there you are. Sidney Fraser. Born February the 6th, 1920. Died December 4th, 1967. Well, I've told you everything. They've given him the wrong name. Uh, you better tell that to the police constable. Oh, I'm sorry about this young man, I warned you. Uh, I thought I was too old to tackle you on my own. When you started opening that grave, I... Ran to the cemetery office and phoned the police. Oh, well, it's almost a relief in a way. Oh, hello. What's going on here? Oh, it's you again. Your missus was in the police station this morning with some nonsense about... Oh, digging up a grave, are you? Oh, there's something fishy going on. When I told my sergeant that your wife came in and said we were burying someone who was a cataleptic and not dead, he nearly strangled me. So I should have taken full particulars. So I ought to charge you both with causing a public nuisance. This fellow, Sidney Fraser, has had our trouble for years. Huh? Sometimes an ordinary hospital had the pleasure of his company. More often than not, it was a prison hospital. Our police sergeant warned him that he hadn't got long to live. And your wife comes in with a cock and bull story about being him alive. As if we didn't know him. <laughs> Sidney Fraser. In his day, he was the finest pickpocket in Hornsey. Pickpocket? Uh -uh. Why, only the other day we had a complaint from Mr. Maxted that someone had stolen his wallet. Huh. Bloke jostled him at a bus stop and then started running. <laughs> from his description, we knew it was Sid. <laughs> he picked Maxted's pocket. He wasn't a cataleptic. He was a pickpocket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. you better pull yourself together. Uh, what are you doing here and why is this grave open? Oh, oh that's all right, Constable. Our young friend here got a bit mixed up to I opened the grave to show him he was mistaken. Then why did you ring the police saying there was a suspicious character lurking in the cemetery? Well, seems I was mistaken, that's all, Constable. In fact, we were both mistaken. 
Weren't we, young man? Hey. <laughs> Pink pocket. <laughs> Cat <laughs> should have told Joe Harris that lifting wallets from cataleptic gentlemen is a most grave offense. In fact, it is likely to incur a most stiff penalty. <laughs> of international success. The taste that's uniquely three fives. Only when no expense is spared in its making can a cigarette taste so right, so smooth, so satisfying. Three fives. Get the taste. The taste that State Express created for you. The taste that has made three fives the king-size cigarette of international success. Get three fives. Get the taste. This is your host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? Through the creaking door. Of course. <laughs> the manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present The Creaking Door Cows bedded down for the night. Yeah. Oh, Hank, come over here a minute, would you? Sure. Something wrong? Yeah. Cow here seems to have hurt herself. It's like a barbed wire cut. Let's have a look. Yeah, you're right. It does look like barbed wire. There's no barbed wire where this animal's been. Oh, wire like that on your property, Mr. Fuller, is over south of the road. Yeah, that's right. This animal hasn't been in the south pastures for months. She's one of the animals I'm keeping up near the barn, grooming for the stock show next month. Yeah, I I know she is. You haven't let her get out accidentally, have you, Hank? Me? Why, no, Mr. Fuller. You sure, Hank? Yes, sir. You said you want all animals you brought in off the range kept inside the wooden fences. <laughs> You're the boss. I wouldn't let any of them near any barbed wire. It's mighty funny. Can't figure out no other way she could have hurt her leg like that. Me neither. They're pretty bad, too. Deep. Yeah, it is. I'll never be able to show her with a leg like this. Sure too bad, Mr. Fuller. She's a nice animal, too. Yeah, one of the best. 
was counting on her boosting my score at the show. Say, you don't suppose McCarty could have done it, do you? McCarty? Sure. He's pretty hard hit for good show animals this year. Had to sell off quite a few to pay his mortgage and meet the taxes. I know, but McCarg's always been a good friend of mine. He wouldn't do a thing like that. Well, he might. If he thought it might help him at stock show, he needs that prize money pretty bad. But McCarg's a stock raiser from way back. He couldn't hurt a prize animal if he had to. Funny thing what some men will do for money, Mr. Fuller. Look, Hank. I won't have you talking like that. Well, I was just saying that... McCarg's a good friend of mine. I've done him several favors lately. He wouldn't repay me by injuring one of my animals. Well, all I know is she couldn't have cut her leg like that around the corral. Looks to me like it was done purposely. Here, better clean out that cut and wrap it up. Yeah. Fetch me that disinfectant and some of those clean rags from the chest, Hank. Sure. Here's some right over here. Hmm? In the stall? Yeah, here on this shelf. What are they doing here? Well, I, I don't know. Well, this bottle's always kept in the chest at the end of the barn. Marsh, have you been treating this animal? No, I... I mean, uh, I didn't know she was hurt till you told me. Some other animal then? No, of course not. Didn't you inspect them all tonight? Yeah, I did. This is the only cow that's hurt. But what's this disinfectant and these clean rags doing here? Well, I... I just don't know, Mr. Fuller. I put that bottle away myself last week. I treated a horse. I haven't used it since. I haven't used it more than a month, I guess. Somebody did injure this animal, then tried to treat it here in its stall. He must have been frightened away before he could use the medicine. But who would purposely cut its leg and then try to treat it? I don't know. No. Neither do I. Wait a minute. Huh? What's this? Look. Look here. What? It's a short link of barbed wire. With blood on it. I had you right. It was hidden under the straw. I just happened to pick it up with my foot. Must have been in that last load of straw we brought in. She must have laid down on it and cut her leg. Uh, not that deep. Hank, there's been dirty work around here. Here, hold these rags. Fix up this leg. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Easy now, girl. Yeah, just take it easy. You better stand back, Hank. She's about to get a little excited. You did this. I don't deny it. Yes, I injured the animal. I hid the barbed wire beneath the straw and this gun, too, to make it handy. Hank. And I put the disinfectant here in the stall... So you'd work on the cut, and I'd have you right here where I want you. Hank, why? 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 You mean you don't know? I certainly don't. Because you won't give Martha what she wants. Martha? Your wife, Mrs. Fuller. Won't well, give her what she wants. Divorce. Divorce? Now, oh, stop your pretending. Why, she's never asked me for a divorce. She has a dozen times. What makes you think so? She told me. Told you. I told you to stop pretending. You know she wants to marry me. What? Don't act so amazed. <laughs> I am amazed. I'm glad to know about this. You've known about it for a long time. And I assure you that I haven't. It's no good acting that way, Mr. Fuller. You've had a lot of fun, haven't you? Letting me go on like this? Working for you for peanuts? Calling you Mr.? Doing all your dirty work around the farm. You've been well paid. I've never asked you to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. Well, I'm putting an end to all of it right now. Hank, give me that gun. Not on your life. You can't shoot me in cold blood. They'll get you. Not me. They'll never know. When they find me with a bullet in me, Hank... They'll never find a bullet in you. They'll never bother to look for one. Don't you remember this cow? Take a good look at her. You remember last fall when McCard's shotgun accidentally went off near her? How she almost trampled him to death? Hank, no. One shot, fella, through your heart. By the time that animal's hoofs have done their work... No, Marsh, no. They'll never recognize you when they pull you out of a stall. You can't do that. They'll never bother to look for a bullet. Listen to me, Hank. They'll think your gun went off accidentally. And the animal trampled you to death. Give me that gun, Hank. And the farm will be Martha's and mine. Give it to me, Hank. Keep back. Give it to me. Keep back, I say. Take this. Oh! Help me! My eyes. You blinded me. Take it easy, you yellow pup. Your eyes will be all right. Water! Water, get me some water! My eyes are stinging. They'll be all right. Come on with me. I can't see 
Yes. Here, this way. What are you going to do? I'm going to take you to the well and bathe your eyes. You're, you're not going to kill me. Careful. Here's the barn door. I... I didn't know what I was doing, Mr. Fuller. Easy now. I... I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't want to kill you. You only missed killing me by a hair's breadth. Oh. I was out of my head. My eyes. We'll talk about that later. Where are we? Where are you taking me? Over to the well. Mr. Fuller, what in the name of heaven are you going to do to me? I'm going to wash out your eyes. Come on now. Yes. Water. Easy now. No, don't rub them. Keep your hands away from your filthy face. But I can't stand this pain. You'll be all right in a minute. I can't stand it. I tell you, I can't stand it. Marsh. Let go of me. You're taking me off to leave me someplace to die. Stop it. Stop it. Now you're trying to kill me. No, I'm not trying to kill you. You are. I know you are. Don't be a fool. I'm blind. Sure. Sure, this is your chance. Chance to get rid of me. Well, you're not going to do it. Hank, for the love of heaven, listen to me. No. I'm only taking you to the well. Throw me in, huh? You want to throw me in? I want to wash out those eyes. No. You don't care about me. All you want is a chance to do away with me. No, you rat. I'm only trying to help you. Let go, let go my arm. Let go my arm. No, you're staying with me. I won't do it. I won't be led like an animal to the slaughter. Let go of me. Stop it. Let go of my arm. We're almost to the well now. Oh. No. Oh. No. Oh. No. My eyes. No water will fix them up. I'm not going near that well. That disinfectant will burn those eye tissues if you don't get it washed out of them. I won't. You're going to throw me in. I won't go near that well. Hank. I go. I won't go near it. I won't go near it. Hank. No. Oh. Oh. I. Now. Oh. Get up on your feet. Come over to the well and get your eyes washed out. Oh. Now keep your head. Oh, my eyes. Here now. You bend over this water trough. Come on, bend lower. Mr. Fuller. Come on now. Get plenty of this cold water into your eyes. That's like it. A little more. Here, use this cloth. Soak it with water. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Lucky that was just a mild disinfectant. Won't bother you any. Put that up to your eyes. That's it. Now, you open your eyes? I don't know. Well, try. Yeah. Feel better? Uh huh. Burns easing up. Yeah, let's see him. Yeah. I just inflamed a little. I'll be all right. I go into the house and bathe them in warm water now. You... You didn't have to help me. Skip it. Come on. Wait a minute. What's that noise? The New York plane. What's she so low for? I don't know. She's too low. What's wrong with her? Good Lord. She's on fire. On fire? Yes. A mass of flames. What? Fire! Falling. Stephen. Falling. Stephen. Falling. Falling. Wake up. Falling. She exploded in midair and now she's falling. Stephen. <laughs> Martha. Oh, heaven, Stephen, you've been having a nightmare. I've been asleep. You were screaming at the top of your lungs about something falling. The plane. Plane? The night plane to New York. What about it? She was low. Too low. She was in flames. Exploded in midair. Oh, you were dreaming. The plane did go over just as you began to scream in your sleep. Oh, let's see the clock. Yes. She goes over at the same time each night. And she was extra low tonight. The motors were awfully loud. Close. Yes. But there was no explosion. A dream. Yet so real. Oh, you better go back to sleep, dear. But that wasn't all of the dream. Oh, you can tell me all about it in the morning, oh, dear. Oh, that wasn't all. Stephen. Where are you going? To Hank's room. Why? Oh, where's that other slipper? Yeah. 
Here. Stephen, what's wrong, dear? That's what I want to know. Stephen? Hank. Hank, open up. Hank. He's not in here. The bed's not slept in. Stephen, what in the world's wrong with you? Hank's gone. Gone? He hadn't been in his bed. No. Did he tell you he was going anyplace? No. That dream. It couldn't be true. Was it... Was it about him? Yeah. About him. We were together in the prize stock barn, bedding down the animals. One of the prize cows had cut her leg. We couldn't understand it because she hadn't been near any of the pastures with barbed wire. I was bringing Hank up here to bathe his eyes just as the plane was flying over. She was too low, and she caught fire. There was that awful explosion. Oh, but it was all a dream. Come on, we'll see. Stephen. I'm going out to the barn. Come along if you wish. Something tells me that it was more than just a dream. <laughs> Stephen, this is so foolish. I I tell you, it was just a dream. Here. Will you hold this lantern? Oh, but you need your sleep, dear. Get this door. I'll take it now. All right. Come on. Uh, here's the stall. You bring the flashlight? Here. Here, take the lantern. Tom found it. What's wrong? The battery burned out? Oh. There. Martha, look. Stephen. There on her leg. A deep cut. Fresh cut. It needs attention. Martha. It's identical to the injury in my dream. Oh, Stephen, surely. It is, Martha. Oh, she just cut herself yesterday and you didn't know. Oh. I always examine the prize stock in their stalls every night. Martha, this animal was in perfect condition when we went to bed. Oh, but Stephen. Wait a minute. What in the world are you doing? I'm looking through this straw, but... By heavens, look! A short length of barbed wire. Bloody barbed wire. Stephen. Just like the dream. The very same. There should be something else. Yes, here. Look! A gun. Hidden here in the straw. Here where he put it. Who? Hank Marsh, of course. Who else? Oh, no, Stephen. Yes. And look. There, on the top of the feed box. A bottle of disinfectant. Some clean rags. Oh, but Stephen, you... Just like the dream. Every bit of it is just like the dream. But you couldn't have dreamed all that. A hidden barbed wire. A cut on the cow's leg. The hidden gun. The medicine. All the same. Stephen. And this cow... She's the one that almost trampled McHarg to death last fall when his shotgun accidentally went off. But surely you don't think Henry Marsh planned to kill you. Yes, he planned it. He worked it out carefully. Very carefully. But now his plan's no good because of that dream. No, Stephen, he couldn't have. Yes. And in my dream, I saw how it was all going to work out. It was shown how I could save myself by throwing the disinfectant into his eyes. I tell you, there's some other explanation. Then a plane. It did fly over low tonight, you said? Yes. Then it must have caught on fire. It must have exploded. But it couldn't have. I didn't hear a thing except the motors. You heard me screaming about it in my dream. Yes, but you... Well, you must have been so intent upon what I was saying that you didn't hear the noise of the explosion. Oh, no, that's impossible. It was over south of the road. Here, give me that lantern. Stephen, you... Go back to the house. I'm going to look for that wreckage. Stephen? Not a sign of anything out there in the field. I called the airport. They checked the plane. 
that passed over Sheldon some time ago. That's miles from here toward New York. Safe? Yes. There couldn't be a mistake? No. The plane that passed over here while you were dreaming is almost in New York now. I can't understand it. All the rest of the dream was true. All but the part about the plane. No, just a dream. The other things. The injury to the cow, the wire, the gun. Didn't you say you lost your gun several months ago? Yes, yes, I did. Well, you must have dropped it in the straw when you stored it in the barn. It and the wire were thrown into the cow's stall purely by accident. But the injury... Stephen, both of us know how easily and mysteriously cows can injure their legs. And the disinfectant. Oh, you simply left it in there in the stall and forgot about it. No, I couldn't have... Well, are you going to open it, Stephen? It's unlocked. Come in. Hank. Golly. Golly, I'm glad you're up, Mr. Fuller. Henry. It's late. You you haven't been in your bed tonight. I forgot to tell you I was going to town. Now, Mr. Fuller, well, that cow in stall 13, she's cut her leg. Henry, I... Well, I just happened to look at it. Looked in, found the barn door open, and... Why? What's the matter, Mr. Fuller? Say, why do you look at me like that? Stephen. You want me to come out to the barn, Hank? Why? Why, yes. That cow's leg's pretty bad. A barbed wire cut? You... You know about it? And isn't the wire lying beneath the straw of the stall right now? Mr. Fuller, huh? And isn't this the gun you hid under the straw? How'd you find that? Oh, Stephen. So, it is true. You plan to kill me. No. Plan for the animal to trample me and mutilate me. No, no. Plan to marry Martha and get my farm. Oh, no, Stephen, no, you're wrong. No, I'm not wrong. You planned it together. Only my dreams spoiled your plans. Well, now you can be together. Stephen, no. Put that gun down. Well, I'm going to send you. You can burn together. No, Stephen, no, no. <laughs> taking off. Why don't they get this thing into the air? I've been hiding all day, waiting for darkness. Waiting here to take this plane to New York. (laughs) New York. They won't find me there. (laughs) No. They're not going to find me there. I've been waiting. Waiting. (sighs) Taking off. Yeah. I'll be in New York soon. You can unfasten your safety belt now, Mr. Fuller. Huh? You know me? Yes. We always have a list of all the passengers. Let's see, um, you're going to New York. Uh, New York? Yes. Taking a little weekend trip. Just up and left the farm for a weekend. Decided I needed a vacation. Vacations are good for a person. Yeah. I decided I needed a little rest. So here I am. (laughs) Funny thing. I dreamed about this plane last night. Yeah. He always passes over my farm about midnight. Dreamed last night that she was flying exceptionally low. <laughs> Funny, too, because she generally gained uh, quite a bit of altitude by the time she gets over my place. 
It was a queer dream. Thought I was standing out back of my house, and she went over just a little before the barn tops, and then she caught on fire and exploded. Exploded right there in midair, right over my farm. <laughs> uh, I guess we all have funny dreams sometimes. Uh, this one was sure real. Uh, look. There's my farm down there now. See? Had a red light put on my windmill so it could be seen at night. And look how close it seemed. How close? Too close. We're flying too low. I said we're flying too low. Look, just above the barn tops, just like the dream. Just like the dream. No, it can't be that. Look out the window. Flames. What are the motors on fire? What are the motors on fire? We're flying too low. You have heard The Edge of the Shadow, tonight's original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop, originating in the studios of WKY. Ben Morris was heard as Stephen Fuller, Eleanor Corrin was Martha Fuller, Muir Height played Hank Marsh, and Georgiana Cook was the stewardess. Next Friday at this time, listen to the 22nd in this series of dark fantasy adventures created for you by Scott Bishop, a weird and pulse-pounding tale of terror. Harare, which relates how an angered witch doctor of the Ecuador jungle brews a bitter, deadly poison to use against a strange and heartless enemy. This program came to you from Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Lights out for the devil and Mr. O. done so, turn off your lights, fasten your safety belts, and off we go on a holiday titled Gravestone. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Hey, <laughs> that was swell. Now let's go to town. St. Louis woman with her diamond ring Kicking that man oh, around no. no, stop that, Kay. What's the matter? Am I scaring the horse? Oh, it seems like a sacrilege singing a song like that out here. This beautiful, clean snow and blue sky. Well, what's wrong with a hot song to keep us warm? If you think the St. Louis blues is going to dirty up the snow, you ought to hear Frankie and Johnny the way I sing it. Oh, stop it, Kay. You're not funny at all. Why can't you enjoy the fresh air without that cabaret sort of thing? Oh, just an old-fashioned gal, eh, Florence? How about you, Edna? Don't you like my songs either? You haven't said anything for the last five minutes. Well, I, I haven't been listening to you to tell the truth. I love to watch the snow sort of flow along under the sleigh. When you say that, gal, smile. Gosh, did you ever see more snow in your life? The man at the hotel said it had been snowing on and off up here for two weeks. I think coming out here to the country is the best thing we three have done since we started rooming together. Hogging in the snow is terribly healthy. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. The healthier I get, the worse I feel. <laughs> Crazy idiot. She does say the funniest things, doesn't she? I always say that Kay ought to... Whoa! Hallelujah, we're here. Is this as far as we go, driver? That's right, miss. Can't go no further down this road account of the drift. Oh, my goodness. The drifts are too deep for a horse. How can we walk through them? I second the motion. Well, you young ladies don't have to worry none so long as you keep going down the valley over there. Snow ain't piled up that way all the way to Ma Jenkins. Oh, well, that's marvelous. Come on, girls. Let's get started. So long. Take care of yourselves, girls. Come on, Edna. Goodbye, so Edna. Listen to the snow talking at us. It's very dry snow. 
Our feet rub particles of it together, and the Ooh. friction makes a sound. It's kind of scary, yeah. isn't it? What? Well, oh, I don't know. It's just mm. as if the snow was sort of trying to talk to mm. us. I mean, as if it was angry at our trespassing. Hey, don't tell me we're trespassing. I don't want any country squire taking any pot shots at my uh, constitutional amendment with rock salt. No, thank you. Oh, don't talk nonsense, Kay. We're not trespassing. Why, this path through the valley here over to Mrs. Jenkins' house is the favorite hike of everyone who comes up this way during the winter. What's Mrs. Jenkins got anyway that makes people walk their feet off? <laughs> Wait until you taste her cooking. Eat. Oh, boy, let's go. It's awfully quiet out here, isn't it? Oh, that's the glory of it. I've had the roar of the subway in my ears so long. Okay, don't walk so fast. Come on, look what I found. Oh, come on, Edna. Oh, please. Let me take your arm. I'm getting out of breath. Well, take it easy. There's no hurry. <sighs> well, what is it, Kay? Look, through the circle of trees here. Look what I discovered. Well, isn't that interesting? It's a sort of a natural amphitheater. Sure. Say, who was this guy, Daniel Boone? What's an amphitheater? Well, that, that means an oval circling place with rising tiers of seats. It's, you know, like that place we went to for the horse show. Oh. Back in the times of the Greeks, they had outdoor theaters. Well, and, listen to the professor. And they used of places just like this, where the ground sloped up and made a sort of a natural arena or stage below. Theater! That's an idea. Sit down, gals, and I'll give you a special performance of the K Follies. <laughs> it's awful snowy here, isn't it? I'll trample it down with my spring dance. Welcome, sweet spring. <laughs> Isn't she a nut dancing in the snow? If I had that girl's energy. Oh, she's really da, graceful, da, isn't she? Da, da, I'll bet if she went on the stage... Kay! Kay! Kay, oh. did you hurt yourself? Oh, did I land on my dignity. Here, give me a hand. Here, I'll help you. There you are. Oh, did I take a flop? Did you hurt yourself badly? I'll live. What in the world did I trip over? Oh, no wonder... Look at that rock under the snow. No wonder I did a nosedive. Oh, my gee. goodness. The rock's like that all over. Oh. A person could break their neck if they... Girls. What's the matter? What is it? Kay, the rock you tripped over. It... It's not a rock. What are you talking about? Of course it's a rock. Well, yes, but it's something... Something more than that. It's a tombstone. <laughs> tombstone? Oh, no, it, it can't be. It's for yourself. It says... Here lies buried the remains of one who, restless in life... Stop! Don't read anymore. Stop! And and all these other stones laying flat on the ground. They're tombstones, too? Yes. Whew, what a place to pick to dance. Oh! What's the matter, Edna? What did you scream for? Kay, you, you danced on the grave. What? You danced on the grave. I saw you. I saw you do it. You danced on the grave. Okay. Edna, stop it. Stop it. Oh, what's come into her? Edna, stop that. Edna, Edna, stop for heaven's sake. Control yourself. Okay. Okay, I'm so sorry for you. You danced on a grave. For heaven's sake, stop talking like that. Sure, I danced on a grave. Well, yes, of course she did. It was perfectly accidental. And what if it wasn't? What of it? The poltergeist. The what? Edna Hanson, what are you talking about? What's that word you just used? Poltergeist. Okay, what have you done? You superstitious little fool. If you don't stop talking that way, I'm going to slap your face. What's the matter with you? I didn't do anything. You walked on the grave. You danced on the grave. Oh, Edna, be sensible. We all walked on graves, but it was purely accidental. Yeah. We had no intention of desecrating them. It doesn't matter, I tell you. It doesn't matter. The poltergeist. He'll come. I know he will. Oh, what the you? She's crazy. Edna, what are you talking about? What's the poltergeist? What are you so frightened about? My father, he told me. If you walk on a grave, if you dance on a grave, the poltergeist. Poltergeist what? What is a poltergeist? An evil spirit. It comes out of the grave. It kills. It destroys. It'll kill us. It'll kill us all. Stop it. Throw things at oh, me. Please, yes. lay off that. Me. 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 But it won't get me. I'll run Edna, away. come back oh, here. Away. She's gone insane. I'll get her. Edna. Okay, catch her. Edna. Edna, don't run away. Nothing will hurt you. Nothing. Oh, Edna, look out. <laughs> Kay. Kay, what happened? That stone. It hit Edna. Edna. Edna, open your eyes. Blood. Blood all over her face. Kay, who threw that stone? Who threw it? I don't know. It came from the graveyard. Let's take a moment before we go on with our The Devil and Mr. O's story of gravestone and listen to a message. Say, folks, next time... We return you to The Devil and Mr. O's story of... Gravestone. Oh. <laughs> now, girls, take it easy. 
easy. Take it easy. Oh, Doctor, she won't die. <laughs> Tell me she won't die. No, no, of course not. And you're sure that her skull isn't fractured? Oh, absolutely not. Maybe a little concussion, that's all. Well, it's almost five. Our train. Can we get someone to help us carry her down to the station so we can get her on board? Board? I'm telling you that little friend of yours shouldn't be moved out of bed for a week. If you do, well, it might be just too bad. Oh, Flo, what'll we do? Uh, you go home, Kay. I'll stay with her. Oh, no, you won't. I'm not leaving you here alone in this godforsaken place. If you stay, I stay too, Kay. Please be sensible. Why should we all lose our jobs when you... If you'll know... excuse me, you ladies, I've got to be on my way. Oh, yes, of course, Doctor. Is there anything more you can do for Edna, Doctor? Any medicine or something? Nope, I've done all I can do. She's sleeping comfortable now. Uh, miss? Yes, Doctor? The constable's sick too, you know, and he's sort of depending on me to keep things straight. Now, uh, just how did you say that little friend of yours got hurt? Well, it was just the way we explained, Doctor. That rock came flying and... Yes, yes, I know, but who threw the rock? We... we don't know. What? That's true, Doctor. We don't know. But somebody threw it. You can't change facts. Somebody threw the rock that cracked her head. For heaven's sakes, old man, you don't think we did it? No, I miss, I didn't. excited. Doctor, you've got to believe us. It happened just the way we said. All at once, that rock came flying through the air from the direction of the graveyard. It struck Edna, and, and we just didn't see who threw it. All right, if that's your story. Well, you better stay in your rooms here. I mean, you better not be leaving until the constable's on his feet and has a chance to talk with you. I'll be back in a few hours and see how the girl is. He doesn't believe us. What difference does it make? We know what we saw. But what did we see? She was running. She She fell. Hey, well, let's not fool ourselves. There was no one there to throw that rock. There must have been. But there wasn't. Stop saying that! Aren't you brave enough to face facts? There wasn't any place for anyone to hide. I saw that stone. It seemed to come down out of the air. So slowly. Florence, if you don't stop talking like that... I remember what... What Edna said? It throws things. Stop looking at me like that. You're giving me the jitters. She said the poltergeist throws things. Spirit of evil. Florence, Rob, have you gone crazy, too? Why should we laugh at things like that? What right have we got to laugh? How do we know there aren't powers we can't see or understand? Powers of evil that revenge and insult, just like an evil man. Kay, how do we know? What are you talking like that for? What are you trying to scare me for? You, you're supposed to be the most intelligent one of us all. You with your college degrees. Sure, sure, I danced on the grave. But the dead are dead and they can't revenge a thing. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of anything. I tell you, it's not... What? It's Edna. Come on. Edna, we're coming to you. Don't be afraid. We're coming. Open the door, Florence. It's not locked. Duck, it won't... Here, let me. Edna, what is it? What? Ah! Edna, what? (gasps) On your head. Oh... Oh, oh, oh. Hey, what's going on here? I run a decent place and I don't want you... <gasps> oh. The girl on the bed. Her head. It's crushed flat. In by a rock. God in heaven. It's not a rock. It's a tombstone. (laughs) I... I wish I could cry. But I haven't got any more tears. Oh, Edna. Edna. Florence, darling, please. You'll kill yourself if you keep on like that. Oh, this horrible night would only end. It was my fault. Mine. I was the one who got her out here. She didn't want to go. She hates the country. 
But I made her come. I made her. No. No, you're not the one to blame. I am. I danced on the grave. But she was so good. So sweet. Oh, why does it have to be Edna? Why? You're right. It wasn't right for it to be her, was it? Oh, no. I did it, not her. I did it. I danced on the grave. I danced on the grave. You can't deny what you see with your own eyes. But I tell you, Doc, nobody could have carried that tombstone up the steps without me seeing him, could they? But there it is, ain't it? Yeah, there it is. Either somebody's playing a terrible joke or... or... You don't have to say it, Doc. I know. That's just the trouble. You don't know, and I don't know, and nobody knows. Yeah, and... and that tombstone. Well, what about the tombstone? I... I ain't quite sure, but that's a tombstone out of the old burying grounds up at the bend. You're crazy. No, I ain't either. Well, that place is a good three miles from here. Yeah. I know. Who could have carted a heavy stone like that for three miles? Yeah. Who? Stop looking like that, you flap-eared old fool. Human hands carried that stone in here and killed that girl? Sure. Yeah, the constable will find out who did it the minute he's on his feet again. You wait and see. No, he won't, Doc. You're smarter than me and all that, but... No, this time you're wrong. There ain't nobody that takes in breath and leaves out breath like you and me. Or the constable's gonna find out who killed that girl. You know that, Doc. No, stop talking. I wish the constable was here and this night was over. It's been a terrible night. Terrible. Terrible clock. Ticking. Ticking. Yeah, I know. I've been sitting here listening to it. I can't stand it anymore. I'll stop it. Why bother with it? Come on to bed, Kay. Please. There's no use sitting there. It won't help her. Yeah. Nothing can help her. But maybe I can help you. Me? It was my fault. Mine. I was the reason it happened. It killed her and it'll kill you and me too unless I stop. No, don't say that. It's true. But why should you be hurt? I'm to blame, not you. Listen, Flo. I'll go out there. There? Out there to the graveyard. What? I'll talk to her. Hey. I'll, I'll tell her I didn't mean to do it. No. But I didn't know where I was dancing. Please. Maybe somehow it'll hear, listen to me, and, and then it won't hurt oh, you. Oh, no, no. I won't let you go out there. It'll kill but you. Florence. It'll kill you, too. Oh, no, no, I'll hold you. You can't go. You can't. All right. Come on to bed, Kay, please. In the morning, in the morning, things will be different. But it won't. Nothing will hurt us. And then they're right outside the door. They won't let anything get at us. Oh, please, Kay, please come to bed. Yeah. We'll... We'll pray. Pray? I... I don't exactly know how. Just say anything. Anything. Like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. No, you. If I should die... Before I wake, I pray the Lord, my soul, to take. Kay? Kay, are you asleep? I can't sleep anymore. Kay, tomorrow, I mean when it gets light and everything, do you think people will believe us? Do you think so, Kay? Uh, I'm not quite sure what happened. I always used to be so sure about things. And now I... Kay? Kay, where are you? Kay, where... The window. She went out the window. She's gone out there. To the graveyard. To talk to it. Okay, why did you go? Why did you go? I'll go out there, too. We should be so frightened out there alone. I'll go, too. 
I'll go to you. Oh, so cold. Hand. Snow so sharp. Cutting my legs. Oh, why did you go out there, Kay? Why did you? I've got to find you. Wind. Oh, why doesn't the wind stop? Blow, blow, thou winter wind. Thou art not so unkind as... <laughs> oh, I've got to find you, kid. I've got to find you. It's snowing. I love snow. And I didn't like snow. Where are you, Kitty? Where are you? I lost my way. I lost the road. Where are you, Kitty? Kitty, where are Coming to you, Kay. We'll talk to it. We'll talk to it together. We'll tell it we didn't mean any harm, won't we, Kay? Won't we? Poor Edna. We can't help her, Kay. We can't help Edna. But I'm coming to help you, Kay. I'm coming. I'm coming. Yes, I hear you. I hear you. I'm coming, darling. I'm coming to help. I'm coming to help you. I'm coming, I'm coming. I hear you. I hear you calling my name. I hear you. Yes. Yes, I hear you. I hear you. Where are you? Where are you? This way, Hooper. They must have come this way. <laughs> Climbing out the window like that in the middle of the night. They must have gone crazy, the both of them. Well, let's not worry about that now. We've got to find them. Uh, here, give me that lantern. What is it, Doc? What have you found? A shoe. One of the girl's shoes. My gosh, stuck in the snow. We're going the right way. Come on, move fast. <laughs> We've got to get to them. Doc, look at this. What is it? Over there. Ain't these footprints? Yes. Yes. Yes, that's right. Footprint. Hello, up ahead. Hello. Doc, we're... We're getting pretty close to the old burying grounds. Well? Maybe... Oh, look here, Doc. Let's not be fools. Let's wait till morning. What? Let those frightened girls freeze to death? Get along. But, Doc, I... You uh, come uh, with me or the whole town will know what a yellow-livered no-good you are. All right. All right. You don't have to get so sore, Doc. Hello? Hello? Anybody up there? Hello? Doc. Doc, look. What? There they are. Up ahead. Glory be, they're alive. The both of them. Come on, Doc. Doc, look at them. That's the burying ground up there. And they're dancing. Dancing on the graves. What? They must be out of their heads. Come on, we've got to stop them. Doc! Doc, wait for me. Oh, Doc, it... It's Doc again. Where are they, Doc? Where are the girls? Have they... Have they stopped dancing? Yes. They've stopped dancing. Did... Did they ever dance? What are you talking about, Doc? We saw them. We saw them dancing in this place with our own eyes. Did we? The moonlight. Here it comes again. See with your eyes again. Oh, Oh, no. Both of the girls froze stiff to the ground, each with her head 
crushed by a tombstone. This is Mr. O. R. Jobler. Can such things happen? Well, mischievous, revengeful spirits doing all that sort of thing? In Africa once, I saw a native chief's home where rocks and pans and everything else were flying through the air, and no one was in the room. No one. I, too, have only questions, no answers, except about our next story, after a short message from your station. This is Mr. O again. Our next play in the series is titled Ancestor, and it's a ghost story, pure and simple. A girl is being held captive by criminals, and as she tries to... <laughs> but that's next time. It is later than you think. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Marquis of Death. Are you coming, baby? Yes, Andre. Where are you? Right along the riverbank. Oh, yes, I, I see you. Where is he? Over oh, here. Everett. Don't worry. He is alive. What happened to him? I will show you. Let me light a match. Take a look at his throat, monsieur. Three little red marks. That is correct, mon ami. The mark of the vampire bat. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Marquis of Death. My brother went with me to Milo in the southern part of France. For while I wrote my novel, he was to rest. The doctors in the States had told him to take a complete six months rest. I knew of no better place in which to do it. It was a warm evening in June when it began, this tale I tell. A warm evening, cooled by the soft breath of a summer's breeze. Everett, my brother, had gone for a walk. Monsieur André de Cour, the son of the mayor of Milo, had dropped in for a glass of wine. Another glass, Andre? Uh, one more, and that is all. And how are you coming with your novel, mon ami? Mm, I haven't even started, Andre. You've only been here two weeks, you know. What's the matter? Why do you wait so long to begin? Well, you whine, Andre. Ah, I think pleasure. you. Oh, I can't explain it, Andre. It just can't get started. I thought I had a good plot when I came over here, but the more I think about it, the less I like it. Then you do not know what you will write about? No. I hope you'll not think it presumptuous of me, monsieur. But I know the story you could write. Oh? I shall tell it to you. Have you ever heard of those they call the undead, les morts qui vivent? The undead? Doesn't that refer to someone who lives even after death? Oui, but in a very certain way, mon ami. One who lives after death by feeding upon the blood of the living. A woman who was known as the Marquise de la Maupart. The name rings a bell somewhere in my memory, but I can't quite place it. It should, mon vieux. Many stories have been written of the frequent appearances she's made since her death. Since her death? Oui. I myself saw her one night, many years ago, when I was just a lad. I shall never forget the sight of her. Why? Was she so terrible to behold? Oh, quite the contrary. She was the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. Shall I tell you about her? Oh, yes. Mettez-vous à votre aise, for it is a fairly long tale. 150 years ago, this part of France was the personal property of the Marquis de la Maupart. The Marquis was a kind man, 
who cared for his people as much as they cared for him. He was a lonely man, the Marquis, but he entrusted himself with his people and this way forgot his loneliness. When he was almost 45, he married her. No one knew how she came to this province, nor when she arrived. Immediately, the Marquis began paying attention to her, and in a short while, they were married. It was after the marriage that the Marquis began to change. She seemed to bring out in him everything that was bad. One night, there came to this province an unknown carriage drawn by four old black horses. Get off! Get off now! The driver whipped the horses and called out harshly to them. Those who saw the carriage said the driver had the eyes of a madman. The carriage raced along the road, stopping finally when it came to the Chateau Maupart. No one got out of the carriage, but the driver jumped down and made his way into the chateau. The driver claimed to be the father of the Marquise, and that she must return home with him for a while. And indeed, the Marquise upheld his story. I must go with him, my husband. But it will not be for long. And so... She went with the black-caped man with the terrifying black eyes. One month to the day she left, she returned. And the same man threw off the carriage. Get up! Get up now! And the Marquis de la Maupart rode inside. They arrived in the dead of night. We are here, my daughter. As I see. You have what I have promised you. As long as time exists, so shall you exist. Others may die, but you will live forever. Remember that at night, when the sky is dark and the moon is high in the heavens, then you shall walk the earth where others sleep. Then you may strike them down. The Marquise went into the chateau, and the carriage and man disappeared, and were never seen again. It was after her return that the Marquise developed an aversion to sunlight. By day she would sleep, and when the sun had set, she would wake and live while others slept. The Marquis soon died, and he was laid to rest. And one by one, the servants died. And those that were left ran away, saying that she had caused their deaths. And they said that the mark on her neck she had when she returned to the Chateau Maupart had been caused by a vampire. And that she too had become one of the dead who live. Les morts qui vivent. Is that all of the story? No, mais non, mon ami. It captures your interest, I see. Yes, go on. The Marquise disappeared shortly after that, but occasionally the villagers would see her, and some lived to tell about it. What do you mean? Many they found dead. Those who were brave enough to go abroad at night, dead with the triple puncture of the vampire bat on their throats. You don't actually believe that, do you? Oui, I do. But Andre, you don't expect I me... I tell you, I saw her, mon ami. When I was younger, I didn't believe the tale. Another lad and I had gone over to the chateau to play around the ruins. It became quite late, and the sun set in the west. Suddenly, she was there, in back of me, standing there in a black gown, with her raven tresses falling down over her shoulders, her skin the color of pale ivory, and her eyes looking through me, holding me in a trance by their power. Ah, oh, no. I shall never forget her, mon ami. She must be beautiful, the way you describe her. Words cannot do justice to her. By the way, where's your brother? Oh, he said he was going for a walk along the river. Which way? North or south? Well, I don't know. Why? Because the ruins of the Chateau Maupart stand north of Milo on the river. No one ever walks there on alone at night. You really expect me to believe that story? I would if I were you, monsieur. The Marquise walks along the bank of the town river at night. 
if your brother is walking north toward the chateau, he is apt to meet her. And that meeting, monsieur, could very well result in his death. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Marquise of Death. We sat there in the gathering darkness. Andre Lacour had just told me a story I found difficult to believe. Yet he sat there sipping his wine. And a look in his face told me that he believed it. Believe me, mon ami, if your brother is walking north along the banks of the town, he is apt to meet the Marquise. And that meeting could very well result in his death. You really do believe the story, don't you? But of course I do. And I would advise you to believe it too, mon ami. What do you think I should do? Go searching for him. Alone? I shall go with you, monsieur. All right. Venez avec moi. Come with me. Together we shall go to the bank of the town. Perhaps we may not find him. But if we do, he will be a victim of les morts qui vivent. Of the dead who live. If he walked the other way. Then we shall have made the trip for nothing, but at least we'll know. Shall I try calling him? Oui. Everett! Everett! He's around here. You should have heard that. He might not be able to hear you, monsieur. Maybe we ought to split up. A good idea, but do not go far. Stay within voice of each other. All right. You go south. I'll go north. We meet again here in ten minutes. Ten minutes. Au revoir. See you later. I watched him walk off. It was getting quite dark when I started down the river. It couldn't have been more than three minutes from the time we parted. When she stepped out from behind the tree. Bonsoir, monsieur. Uh, good evening. Are you looking for someone? How did you know? I heard you calling to him. Have you seen anybody around here? No one, monsieur. What are you doing down here? I am walking, monsieur. You live around here? Near the chateau, monsieur. The chateau? Oui. But what are you staring, monsieur? Your eyes. Davy! Davy! What? Your friend. He is calling to you, monsieur. A bientôt. Davy, I found him! Where are you? The of the river north. A bientôt. Yes, Andre. Where are you? Right along the riverbank. Yes. Yes, I see you. Where is he? Over here. Everett. Don't worry, he's alive. What happened to him? I will show you. Let me light a match. Take a look at his throat, monsieur. Three little red marks. And that is correct, mon ami. The mark of the vampire bat. <laughs> You shall know how your brother is in a few minutes, mon ami. Stop wearing holes in your carpets. I saw someone out there, Andre. Out where? By the river. Oh? Who was it? A woman. A woman? Yes. What did she look like? I don't know. It was pretty dark. She stayed there. She's bringing Ev back here. Did she talk to you? Yes. What did she say? Well, she said she was out walking, that she lived near the chateau. You know, her eyes, they were the only things I could really see clearly. They seemed to burn and shine in the darkness. I felt like I was being hypnotized, and then you called me. That snapped me out of it. Then you have met the Marquise of Death, mon ami. And had I not called you when I did, you would not be alive to tell about it. Did you say anything else? Yes. She said, Abianto, two or three times. You know what that means, do you not? Something like, I'll see you again soon, isn't that it? Me. Oui. And she means that, monsieur. She will see you again. Oh, the doctor's coming. Yes. Perhaps he can tell us how badly your brother has been hurt. How is he, doctor? He is in a narrow escape. You are his brother? Yes. He will need blood transfusions. He has lost a great deal of blood. And do you think we should take him to the hospital? We cannot do that, Monsieur Gaumont. Oh, why not? This is a very delicate matter. The people of Milo will not allow it. What do you mean, Dr. Moreau? It, uh, you tell him, Andre. Uh, oui, doctor. 
What he means, David, is that she will follow your brother wherever he goes. The doctor cannot take the risk of bringing him to the hospital. The danger to the other patients would be too great. You can't, your... I shall bring it back here, Monsieur Gaumont. All right. He was walking down by the river, was he not? Oui, Monsieur Gaumont and I went after him. We found him just in time. Those three marks on his throat. You know what they are, monsieur? The marks of the vampire bat. The mark of the Marquise of Death. Why hasn't anything been done to stop her? Because we cannot find her, monsieur. And besides, the townspeople are afraid to go after her. If they went out in sufficient numbers, They've tried that before, mon ami. When the sun shines, they've gone out and searched for our resting place. For she lies helpless during the rain of the sun. They've searched all day, and yet they've not found it. Mm. And those unlucky ones who stayed after dark, some of them went to join those she had claimed earlier. That's why they do not go out after her, mon ami. They are afraid, and with good reason. What do they do? There are protective measures, Monsieur Gaumont. Garlic, the cross, things which the dead who live fear. Uh, but it's getting late. I shall return as quickly as I can. <laughs> what was that? It sounded like a window breaking. Came from upstairs. Come on. Good to your game, conscious. I doubt it. Then what broke the window? Uh, we'll see right now. Look out! What was it? The dead who live. The vampire bat. What was it doing here? Let me see. He's all right, isn't he? No, Monsieur Gaumont. He is not all right. He will not need the transfusion now. Your brother is dead. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Marquise of Death. Three of us, Andre Lacour, Dr. Moreau, and myself stood there, staring out the broken window after the thing that had flown out. My brother lay in the bed, eyes open, seeing nothing. He will not need the transfusion now. Your brother is dead. What? That is correct. Remember what Andre said about her returning? Well, she did. She came back before we could do anything for him. Now, it is too late. To stand here and calmly say that he's dead. You accept it for a fact, but you don't propose to do anything about it. What can we do, mon ami? We can go find her. We can destroy her. Oh, others have tried before you, Monsieur Gaumont, with no success. I don't care. I'm going out there, even if I have to go alone. You cannot go out there alone. But I am. And you're not going to stop me. I shall go with you, mon ami. And I, monsieur, I shall go with you, too. What about him? He will be all right, Monsieur Gaumont. There is nothing more. She can do to him. Before we started out, the doctor insisted on picking up some things. Eventually, we were ready, and we started out into the blackness of the night. You have everything? Oh, yes. All right, let us go. Well, where shall we begin, doctor? In the ruins of the chateau, Andre. Why don't you bring all those things, Dr. Moreau? The wooden stake, the crosses. If we find the Mokkevig, the dead who live, we shall have need for the things we have brought. We must stay close together. Yes. Close enough so that we can always talk to each other. Yes. No matter what happens, we must not become separated. Now we all have a long departure. A what? A flashlight, mon ami. What are we to look for? A trail. A footpath worn smooth by the years of returning to her resting place. I've been thinking since we started out tonight. And that, I am sure, is the only way we can find her. At either end of the path. There we shall find the resting place of the Marquise of Death. Let's begin. We. Oui. Uh, I will take the center, André. Uh, you take the left. All right. Monsieur Gaumont, you take the right. All right. We will circle the chateau at varying lengths from it. Look not only for the path, but for the presence of each of us. So that she cannot destroy us singly. All right, let us go. Right. Bonne chance, monsieur. Oh, chance. Good luck. That is far enough, monsieur Gaumont. Right. Look for the footpath. Oui. Bonsoir, monsieur. We meet again. What? Silence. Where did you come from? I have been following you, monsieur. You're... 
so beautiful. My eyes. Look at my eyes. Your eyes. And I come close to you. Like this, monsieur. So close. Davy! Doctor, look! Hold up your cross, David! Your cross! A bientôt, monsieur. David! David, are you all right? Are you all right, monsieur Gorbon? I... What happened? Let, let me see your neck, monsieur. Is he all right? Oui. She did not touch him. All of a sudden, she was here beside me. She told me to look into her eyes. I couldn't help myself. And then... And I seem to be going to sleep. It is a good thing André looked back and saw you, Monsieur Gamar. We will reach you just in time. We will have to stay together, the three of us. We cannot split up. Oui. You're standing right there, right where... Look. Where? Right there. It's a path. You have found it. What should we do? I look the path, Mr. Raymond. Let us go. This path, it... It's away from the chateau. Always before we search near the chateau. The woods get heavy up ahead, Doctor. And she cannot harm us as long as we stay together. Put the cross around your neck, Monsieur Gaumont. As Andre and I have done. Right. Had you worn it there before, she would not have come near you. Now, the woods begin here. Uh, let us go slowly, then. The path is well hidden. We. Oui. No wonder we have missed it so many times before. Look. Up ahead. A huh? cave. The path leads into a cave. Then that must be a resting place. Let us go quickly. Uh, be careful. You'll be around here somewhere. It's getting close to morning. The sky is lightning. Oh, the better for us, Mr. Gamor. She will be powerless when the sun rises. This is the cave. Let us go inside. Shine your lamp to pass your head of us. I see something. Up ahead. Looks like a coffin. It's a coffin, monsieur. Aye, she will be returning soon. The sun will rise in a short while. She must return here to sleep through the day. Ah, to the other side, into the shadows. Panic out. She comes. There was a bed up there. Then suddenly it changed into a beautiful woman. the Marquis de Le Maupart. The terrible toll of death she has taken through the years is now ended. She has crossed the barrier from which there is no return. Milo has been freed from the curse of the Marquis of Death. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental.
No. No, stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour. A corpse there was. Will you listen to me? I- I've got to tell it to someone, and, well, I guess you've heard a lot of strange stories. I'm Catherine Holland. It all started about a year after I'd come to work for Martin Reed and Stephen Corey as the housekeeper. Oh, we'd have such fun, the three of us. Martin was forever making me promise that I'd be with them always. Always. I didn't know how long that could be. (laughs) You're you're only joking, huh, Kathy? You wouldn't leave us. You'll stay with us always, won't you? Not if you keep doing that, Martin. Oh, oh, you'll get used to it, Kathy. Oh, but cutting your own name on a tombstone, it's its positively morbid. I don't see that. If a cobbler can make his own shoes, then surely a stone cutter can make his own monument. Well, that's true. But... After all, a man must do something with his spare time. And you, Stephen, of all people, have no right to scoff at me. Imagine a cemetery caretaker who wanders through the graveyard day and night, talking to the dead. If the people I met outside the cemetery, my dear Martin, were as interesting as the people I meet inside, perhaps I wouldn't. Since there are only neighbors along this godforsaken road, and since I must get away from you occasionally... Now look here, enough is enough. (laughs) Are we going to let her boss us around, Martin? You nearly 60 and me twice her age? That's right. And you're 42, aren't you, Steve? Yep. You know, I think for your next birthday, I'll start on a nice marble headstone for you. Okay, I quit. I resign. Oh, no, no, don't say that, Kathy. We need you, Stephen and I. Always before, our housekeepers were stout and rheumatic. You're so young. It was like all at once having the shades pulled up and the windows opened when you came. You won't leave us, will you, Kathy? No, I won't leave you, Martin. You promise? I do. If you promise to take your medicine. No. No, I told you, Kathy. I don't believe in that quack doctor. There's nothing wrong with my heart. Oh, Martin, don't be stubborn. It's not a matter of being stubborn. I know I'm perfectly all right. How about those attacks you've had? They were indigestion. You don't want to take that medicine because you and the doc have been enemies for years. You won't give them the satisfaction of treating you, even if it means... Please, Kathy. Don't you think I'm old enough to know my own mind? But Kathy's right, Martin. You should take your medicine. Oh, now you start. I'm going for a walk. I'll go with you. I don't want company. Now he's mad. Oh, don't take it to heart. He'll get over it. I wish he hadn't gone out in this weather. Yeah. I think it's getting worse. I'll go call him back. Stephen, what's that noise? I don't know. It was just outside the house. Cedar Street. That last flash of lightning struck it. There seems to be... Kathy! What? Move away from the door so I can see two... No, Kathy, please. Stay in here a minute. I'll go out. Oh, I'll go with you. I... I think I... I think I see something beside the cedar. Come on, Kathy. Stephen, it can't be. Yes, Kathy. It's Martin. He's dead. The tree? It didn't touch him. He died from the shock of it falling so close. It was hot for Strange, The last tombstone he ever carved was his own. We buried Martin the next evening. There weren't many mourners. We lived too far from town to be well acquainted. At last, the few who'd come went away, 
and left Stephen and me alone at the grave. They've all gone. Your eyes are all red, Kathy. Do you suppose he likes where we buried him? Right across the road from the house? I'm sure he does. He can sort of watch us from here if he gets lonely. It won't be us much longer, Stephen. What do you mean? Well, I... I can't stay here with just you. It isn't proper. Kathy, you know I wouldn't... Oh, I know, but what'll people think? I don't care about people. They're not important. Well, they are to me. I have a good reputation, Stephen, and I don't Kathy, intend... Kathy, don't leave me. Oh, but I must. Losing Martin was unbearable, but if I lost you, I... I'd have nothing left. I'm sorry, Stephen. There'd be but... no one to care if I live or die. If you go, I'll be all alone. You'll find another housekeeper. Housekeeper? Oh, Kathy, dearest, don't be such a little fool. I'm not a fool. You are if you can't see how much I love you. You love me? Oh, no. How could I help it? You're sweet and fresh and lovely. And I never knew before what joy it was to... to watch a woman. Anything you do, the way you walk and laugh, even the way you get angry. It's beautiful. Oh, keep away from me. I don't know what's come over you. I was content just having you about the house, being near you, but now... Oh, my darling, you mustn't go away. Oh, please don't look at me like that. Please, Stephen. Dearest, let's get married. I'll make you happy. No, I I don't love you. Don't touch me. Oh, I, I like you a lot. I'm very fond of you, but... Well, it's, it's not love. I could never love you. Why, Kathy? I'll make you a good husband. Oh, no, Stephen, no. You, you're twice my age. But I'd worship you, Kathy, dearest. Oh, to quit bawling Kathy, dearest, at me like a lost lamb. <laughs> I'm going to the house and pack my things. I won't let you go. You belong to me. I don't belong to anyone. If you don't get out of my way, I'll throw this rock at you. There's someone else. You love someone else. No, no, Stephen. I just don't love you. Don't come near me. I'll throw it. I swear. Kathy, no! I told you I would, didn't I? Why couldn't you believe me? Well, get up. Stephen. He was lying on his back, motionless. I bent over him and... Oh, his face. The rocket caught him between the eyes. I couldn't think. I, I, I was terrified. I only knew that Stephen was dead. That I had killed him. A murderess, that's what everybody would say. They'd put me on trial, all those faces, gaping at me like I wasn't human, and then they'd... No. Had to get out of here. The road passed the graveyard. If I followed it, I'd reach the main highway. I'd run. I'd run so fast, no one would catch me. It was dark. The body wouldn't be found till morning. By then, I'd be far away. Had to keep moving. Had to. Where could I go? Where could I hide? Flying down the road for hours and hours. Till my legs were numb and my heart tearing and my chest deafening me with its thunder. No, that wasn't my heart. It was a car. They were looking for me. Somehow they'd found Stephen already. Oh, it was getting nearer and nearer. I slipped behind a tree. <laughs> Oh, the only ones who might have seen me. They'll forget they even passed this way once they're safe at home. <laughs> safe at home. Suddenly I realized what a fool I'd been. I couldn't escape a police dragnet by running away. They'd never stop looking for me. The best place to hide was at home. Why, of course... I'd gone back to the house from the funeral and straight to bed. Stephen had decided to stay at the grave a while longer. Everyone in town knew he liked to wander through the cemetery, and especially tonight, with Martin just buried. He... he must have caught a prowler, and the man had thrown a rock at him. That's how it happened. <laughs> I felt perfectly calm. I turned around and started back. The sky had been cloudy all evening, but as I walked up the road toward home, it cleared. I remember how lovely the moonlight looked, spilling down the steps of the house. I started to climb them. 
suddenly I, I had an impelling desire to see Stephen's body. Oh, I tried to fight it, but the thought of him, cold and crumpled, lying like some cast-off doll in an attic, hypnotized me. I went down the stairs and started across the road. He had been lying at the foot of Martin's grave, I remembered. From where I was, I couldn't make out the body. Well, that wasn't right. The old man was buried directly across from the house. I should be able to see Stephen. I slipped through the gate. Hurried to where the corpse had lain. It was gone. There wasn't a trace of it. I dropped to my hands and knees, searching about the new mound of earth for some proof that it hadn't all been a nightmare, that I'd really killed Stephen. There wasn't anything. No matted grass where the blood should have dried. Nothing fallen from his pockets. Not even the stone with which I'd struck him. And it was so quiet. So deathly quiet. With the moon whitewashing Martin's headstone. And the one next to it... The one next to it. But there hadn't been any grave there before. And this one was fresh. As fresh as Martin's. I slowly raised my eyes and looked at the tombstone. Stephen Corey, born May 9th, 1901. Died April 20th. 1944. Why, I'd... I'd know that carving anywhere. Martin was dead. But Martin had made that gravestone. Kathy stands in the moonlight, staring at the grave plaque of Stephen Corey, a plaque identical with the one Martin had made for himself before he died. And yet, how could Martin have carved that headstone? He had not made one for Stephen before he died. I knew that. Still, Stephen had been buried, and the date on the monument was right. Oh, I felt the answer, but I pushed it back away from my mind. It couldn't be true that Martin had kept his promise even now and had carved the stone. And that these dead who were Stephen's friends had buried him. Had he loved me so, he wouldn't make me pay for what I'd done. Did he plead with them to cover him so I'd not be found out? I didn't know. I was paralyzed with fright. I had to get out of here back to the house before I lost my sanity. <laughs> I don't know how long I lay there, cowering in my bed. At last, the darkness of the night closed in about me, and I slept. But then, out of the darkness, the doorbell rang. Sharp sound, a streak of fear over my flesh. The police had come. Stephen's grave had been discovered. I had to go to the door. Are you Catherine Holland? I'm Estelle Bailey, Martin's sister. Oh, yes, I should have known. Uh, come in, Mrs. Bailey. Stephen sent me a telegram this afternoon about Martin's death, and I took the first train out here. I'm sorry if I woke you. Oh, that's quite all right. Come in. I know it's been a long trip. Perhaps I can fix you a bite to eat? No, thank you. I'd like you to take me to see the grave right away. Martin's grave? Now? Oh, Miss Holland, I hadn't seen Martin for nine years. I'm ashamed of that, and I want to rectify it now as soon as I can. If you won't take me, perhaps Mr. Corey will. Oh, he's not here. He's in town. Well, I'll wait up till he comes in. Oh, you'll wait a long time. I don't understand. Oh, uh, Stephen was quite shocked by your brother's death, you know, and, well, he felt he had to get away from this house, so, well, he mightn't be back tonight. But if he went into town, why didn't he meet me at the station as he wrote he would? Well, I don't know. <laughs> 
every moment she sat there, she'd think more and more about Stephen's absence. I had to distract her the only way I could. I had to take the chance that she wouldn't notice that other headstone. But if she did notice it, I would have to kill her too. But just then, something happened to spare us both. Oh, good heavens. Oh, look, it's raining again. Yes, the moon's gone in. It's pitch black outside. Then there's no use going into the cemetery, I suppose. I'm afraid not, Mrs. Bailey. What a shame. Finally, she went upstairs. I waited until I knew she slept. Then I took a spade and crept across to the cemetery. It was wet and cold, but I didn't notice the weather. (laughs) For I had a scheme. (laughs) A very clever scheme. I was going to dig up someone else's headstone as well as Stephen's and switch the two. I couldn't disguise his new-made grave, but at least I'd conceal who was buried there. It was just before dawn when I slipped back to the house. Mrs. Bailey woke me about eight, and together we went into the cemetery. I came up level with the graves, and... Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. Why, I'd switched them last night. Stephen Corey, born May 9th, 1901. Died April 20th, 1944. His headstone. Exactly where it had been before. But I had dug it up. There were blisters on my hands to prove it. Mrs. Bailey, had she noticed? No. She'd gone right to her brother's grave and stood staring at it, wiping away the tears. I'm very glad of one thing, Miss Holland, that Martin is buried a little apart from everyone else. He liked to be alone most of the time, you know. Even in death, he would prefer solitude and being isolated from all the others. Solitude? Isolated from all the others? But Stephen was lying right by his side. She couldn't see Stephen's headstone. It was incredible, but it was true. Come, Miss Holland, it's raining. We might as well go now. I'll take the early train back to the city. After she'd gone, the house was empty, yet full of a screaming silence. And I sat looking out at the grayness of the lonesome day. Had there really been a grave at all? Growing inside me was a grim fascination to see. The mud sucked at my shoes. Through the dusk, I walked determinedly toward that spot where the headstone stood. I slipped through the fence. Then I was standing beside the tree, leaning against it. For I couldn't believe what I saw. There, beside the others, stood a third headstone. And stretching almost at my feet, a freshly dug grave. Even before I crept forward to see, I knew what the plaque would say. Catherine Holland, born June 7th, 1923, dead April 21st, 1945. Tonight, April 21st, that was tonight, and I was still alive. Martin, listen to me wherever you are. I said I'd be with you always, but you can't force me to follow you. You can't force me to follow you. Tears filled my eyes. I took hold of a hateful stone and tried to flatten it into the ground. Tried to... And through the tears, I I saw the dark bruises on my hands. Bruises on my hands, but well, it wasn't possible that... I touched one of the dark splotches. It rubbed away. Then the truth went through my mind. I fell to my knees. The letters, the letters I thought were carved into the stone. They too were blurred. I drew my finger along my name. It was lettered in black crayon. Thick archaic lettering. Darker toward the middle than at the edges. Giving the illusion of depth. Giving the illusion of being cut into the stone. Then that's how Stephen's headstone was made. That's how I stood up. Yes, fell over me like a cold, wet sheet. 
Behind this adventure was a human being. A being like myself. Then I saw the thing in the grass, sending a tiny sparkle toward the dust-filled sky, and greedily I picked it up. A copper-colored metal cap from an eyebrow pencil. So that was how the letters had been drawn. That was how this thing had happened. Then I knew who had done it. And even before I turned to look, I knew she was standing there, staring at me, unmoving, a thin smile on her lips, her eyebrows thin too, penciled on with surety and deafness. Turn around, Miss Holland. I see you have guessed the truth. It was you. You killed him. But do you think my conscience will hurt me as yours does? Would it make your death any easier to know you didn't kill Stephen Corey? I don't understand you. I'm telling you the truth. I came into the cemetery just as the last visitor left, and I saw you throw the rocket, Corey. I saw you run for the road. You hadn't killed him, Miss Holland. He was only unconscious. But I made sure he was dead before I buried him. Then you dug the grave here. That spade in your hand. Will serve a double purpose. I shall kill you with it. Just as you murdered Corey. Why? Why did you kill him? Because Martin had willed all the family property to Corey, with the provision that when he died, it would return to me. I knew if his body weren't discovered, they'd think you and he had run away together. Then I'd have to wait for him to be declared legally dead. And so you put up the plaque. I felt sure I could persuade the county coroner to file a death certificate quietly. Then I'd show my lawyer the grave, show him that Corey, too, was dead. But you came back, so I have to kill you, too. Now you know the truth. Your time has come. That spade, Mrs. Bailey. It's for you, Miss Holland. Stay back from me. Stay back. I'm going to kill you. I'm not afraid, Mrs. Bailey. You're real. I can fight you. This will be your grave, and I shall bury you in it. Give me that spade. Give it to me. Go here. This is Bailey. Uh, my eyes were crowded with flashes of blackness. I lay on the ground, feeling the cold, wet earth against my cheek. Without warning, it had happened. One wall of the grave gave way, and she lost her balance and fell forward into the gaping hole. Dirt from the mound began rolling down, clods of it covering the edges of her long skirt. And she lay still, silenced, at the bottom of the grave. A few wet clods of earth were still slowly tumbling down, as if they had an intelligence of their own, an intelligence that told them to bury the dead. Bury the dead. For she was dead, and she had died instantly. Her neck twisted beneath her loosened, flowing hair that hid the hideous sight of her eyebrows, thin and long. Her neck was broken, and she lay in the grave she had meant for me. Perhaps, now I've told it, I can forget the horror of what's happened. But not soon, not soon... One way Martin was right. In my brain, he and Stephen will be with me always. Shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour.
theater of the air. if you're going to get to the store on time this morning. I'm hurrying. Oh, you know, Paul, I think I'm going to like this little town. No, oh, I couldn't bear the thought of moving here when you first told me you had bought out the drugstore in a little jerkwater town. I think we'll be happy here, honey. Oh, imagine finding a dear little house like this, all furnished. Why, it's nicer than anything we could get in the city. And the rent's so reasonable. How did you ever happen to locate it, Paul? Well, Mr. Rogers, a banker here in town, owns it. it belonged to some member of his family. They've gone away or something, so he rented it to me. Now, I've got to go, honey. All right. Will you be home for lunch? I'll call you on the phone if I can get away. Okay. Oh, listen here. You must be careful about leaving lights on in the house all night. When you came to our room after listening to the radio last night, you left three lights on in the living room. What? No, I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, but I tell you, I didn't, Margaret. Our neighbors in small towns might think it very strange if they saw lights burning at all hours of night. Besides, we can't burn up money right now, Paul. Just getting started in this new business now. I don't know what you're talking about. I know I turned off the lights before I came to bed last night. I'm afraid you're getting absent-minded, honey. Because three lamps were burning when I got up this morning. Well, I won't argue with you. I gotta go now. All right. Oh. Don't get too absent-minded, dear. You might mix the wrong prescriptions for people. What? Well, look. Well, there goes the milkman right past the house. I told him to leave milk and cream every morning. I must have forgotten. Call him in. Paul. All right, I will. Oh, let me see. What should I do first this morning? Oh, I love this little house. It's going to be grand living here. Oh, that must be the milkman. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Won't you come in? Uh, thank you, ma'am. I guess you forgot about me this morning. I want milk and cream every day. Uh, yes, ma'am. I didn't forget about you exactly. I thought maybe you would be moving out already, so I didn't stop. Moving out? Why... <laughs> Why, we just moved in the day before yesterday. Uh, yes, ma'am, I know. But that's about as long as anybody stays in this house. I don't see what you mean. I just figured I wouldn't leave any milk for you because you might move away in a hurry and I might not get any pay. Oh, we aren't in the habit of moving out of places in the nighttime. I still don't see what you mean. And the last folks that moved in here about four months ago, they got out in the night and in a hurry, too. Strange. What for? Well, if you haven't found out yet, you soon will. Found out what? This house. There's something in it. Queer things go on here. Things that frighten folks half out of their wits. Yes? Well, what is it? What is it that's strange? Well, no one knows, ma'am. But they say the house is haunted. Oh, is it one of the superstitions of this little town? I don't know, ma'am. But most folks here in town know it's true. It... Should I leave a quart of milk, ma'am? Uh, yes, and a pint of cream every morning, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, here, I'll pay you for the week. Then you won't be afraid that I'll run off and you won't get your money. Here you are. Is this the right amount? That's right, ma'am. Oh, someone at the door. Pardon me. It's your next-door neighbor, ma'am. i seen her coming across the backyard. Oh, thank you. None of my neighbors have called as yet. Uh, good morning. Good morning, you're Mrs. Liveston, aren't you? Yes, I am. Won't you come in? Oh, yes, although I can't stay long. Uh, I'll be going, ma'am. Oh, yes, and don't forget to stop every morning. Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am, I, I will. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, ma'am. Well, so you've moved in here to stay, have you? And your husband bought out the drugstore. Oh, it's too bad old Mr. Green had to die. He was such a good druggist, and I depended on him, so... Um, he picks up the most marvelous remedy for my rheumatism. But, uh, and I always say these new doctors mean well, but they don't know the old-fashioned remedies the old men did. Oh, no, sir. Oh, won't you come in the living room and sit down? Uh, no, if you don't mind, I'll stay right here in the kitchen. Not that I'm afraid in this house in the daytime, mind you, but... Well, I like to be right near a door where I can get out in a hurry. Uh... 
Uh, Mrs. Dutton, will you please tell me what this mystery is all about? The milkman was trying to tell me something about him, but... Uh, he... Now, that's just what I thought. I said to my man last night, I said, like it not, Seth Rogers. He's the banker who owns this house. Oh, yeah. I said, I'll bet you dollars to donuts he didn't tell you folks a thing about it. Now, isn't that the limit? Oh, what is it? Tell me all about it. Well, there are no two ways about it. This house is haunted. Huh? You don't mean to tell me that a, a lovely new house like this is branded with any old-fashioned oh, belief it's like true. that? All right. Sometimes I actually get so frightened right next door to it that I threatened to move out of the neighborhood. I said only last week that if I heard any more stories about it, I'd have to get out. Oh, for goodness sake, tell me what it is. I don't want to live in ignorance of what's wrong with my own oh, house. Is. That's what it is. Oh, it's a tragic story. A very tragic story. Yeah. Well, tell me. Well, this house was built for Mr. Rogers' daughter. He gave it to her for a wedding present. Oh, I remember as well as if it were yesterday. She was such a beautiful girl. And her husband. Oh, my, but he was handsome. They lived here in this house? Yes, but only for four weeks, mind you. Just four weeks in this lovely little house. How long ago was it? Just three years ago, last October. Oh. My, it was a terrible thing. Oh, what happened to them? Well, as I say, they'd only been married four weeks when one day he went out hunting. How well I remember that day. I was the first one over here when I heard about the accident. To him, you mean? Yes. Oh, my. To think that a couple so much in love should come to such a tragic end. Well, as I say, I was the first one over here. I even got here before Mr. Rogers came to tell his daughter about it. I had to break the news to her. Something had happened to her husband, you mean? Some other hunter shot him accidentally. Killed him outright. Oh. Oh, how terrible. Terrible is no word for it. And wait, you haven't heard the worst part of the story. Two weeks afterwards, that poor girl, that lovely bride, who was a bride no more, killed herself. Oh, no. Yes, she did. Threw herself in the river. Drowned. Oh, what a tragic thing. Oh, her poor little body. They never recovered it, though they dragged the river for days and days. Well, it's a terrible thing, Mrs. Dutton, but I don't see what it has to do with this house being haunted. Oh, wait, I'm coming to that. You see, for six months after they died, it was closed up tight. Mr. Rogers never came near it. I came over and sorted out her clothes and personal things for him. He wouldn't step inside. Then I guess he decided to rent it. It was all furnished and everything. Oh, it's so nice even now. Four different families have tried to live in it since then. But they all moved away in a hurry. They claim they heard things walking at night. In this house? Yes, walking all over it. Ah, tragedy struck it too soon. And the ghost of those young people come back to walk on the earth they were forced to leave. Have you ever heard them walking? No. And I don't want to. I heard nothing last night. But you will. You mark my words. <laughs> oh, oh, great heavens. What is that? Sounded like something in the living room. I'll go see. Something certainly did fall. What? Why, look. There's this beautiful vase that's set on the mantel. Oh, what a shame. It's broken in a thousand pieces. Not a car going by on the street to jar it. Not a thing. Oh, I tell you, they're beginning to walk in the daytime. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. They haunt the house in the daytime now. Oh, let me out of here. Paul. Paul, wake up. Hmm? Turn on the light. What? what is it? What do you say? Wake up. Turn on the light. I'm right there beside you. What's the matter? Listen. There's someone walking up in the attic. I don't hear anything. Wake up and listen, you will. You hear it? Uh, I hear a noise. Someone walking, I tell you. I can hear it plain as day. Oh, turn on the light. Yeah. Now do you feel better when you can see? I don't think I hear it now. Well, I suppose whatever it was knew we turned on the lights and scampered away. Honey, I'm ashamed of you. You let that neighbor of yours get you all upset. Oh, no, I haven't. I'm certain I heard someone walking upstairs. Well, it's stopped now. What do you say we go back to sleep? Well, let's sleep with the light on. No, nonsense. Go on back to sleep and forget it. All right. I'll try. 
May I uh, turn off the light then? Yes, go ahead. There. Now you calm your fears. Go back to sleep. Oh, I know you think it sounded silly. Of course I do. You can't scare me. There are such things as ghosts, you know. Where? In books? In life. Ah, you're silly. Paul. Listen, Paul. There it is again. Don't you hear it? I do hear a noise. It's someone walking right up over our heads. Paul, you've got to go up in the attic and see what it is. Oh, all right, all right, I will, just to satisfy you. But I know it isn't anything. Just the wind rattling something up there. Wind doesn't make the sound of footsteps. Oh, hurry, Paul. You want it to get me? I want you to find out what it is. Well, where's my robe? I'm beginning to see why people moved out of this house. How could they stay here with this strange walking over them? You uh, want to come with me? No, I'll stay here. What's that? Oh, it's Paul walking up the attic stairs. Oh, I've got myself in a nice state of nerves. Now, if that's Paul, it, it sounds exactly like the walking before he went up there. in the cupboard is smashed on the floor. Oh, of all things. All these lovely dishes broken. What, oh, what could cause it? My golly, if this isn't the limit. Oh, what could cause it, Paul? Was there someone up in the attic? No. No, no, there wasn't. But, Margaret. Yes? I don't want to get you frightened. No, now. tell me. What did you see? Well, it wasn't exactly what I saw. Well, in a way, it was, too. There was something, wasn't there? As I was climbing the stairs to the attic, I don't know what it was, but I had the queerest sensation, as if something brushed my shoulder. I could feel it, almost see it. It was as if I were blind and yet could sense someone or something trying to move stealthily past me. Oh, Paul. Oh, dear, the house is haunted there. I don't know. But if it is, and something did pass me on the stairs, it came down here in the kitchen and threw all these dishes on the floor. <clears throat> Let's get out. I'm going to talk to Mr. Rogers in the morning. I can't believe it yet. But there certainly is something going on here. I know it. I know it. I heard them walking long before you did. And the vase on the mantel this morning, it broke too. Keep calm, honey. We'll find out what it is. Right now, if you can find a cup that isn't broken, I'll have a gallon of black coffee. (laughs) What can the trouble in the house Paul and Margaret have rented be? eh? Who is moving about in their house in the dark of night? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. (laughs) And now, the hermit again. (laughs) It is the next morning, and we find Paul in the office of Mr. Rogers. Listen. (laughs) Uh, It's all right, Mr. Livestone. You're welcome to move out. I'll refund your month's rent. I don't want to do that, Mr. Rogers. You stayed a night longer than anyone else who's rented the house. I don't blame you for going. You haven't ever stayed there, have you? No. I presume you know the story of my daughter and my son-in-law. Yes, I do. I don't want to bring it all up for you again. It's all right. It's with me all the time. What I started to say was, I can't bring myself to go in the house. I built it for my little girl. I couldn't go into it. Ever. What I'd like to ask you is, do you take any stock in the story about the house being haunted? I don't know. All I've heard is from the people who've rented it. They say so. But you don't believe it, do you? I don't know. There might be some truth in it. Yet you've never investigated? Oh, I think you understand. I can't visit that house. But maybe if you came and stayed in it, we could clear the matter up. Won't you come over to the house and stay with my wife and me tonight? Well, I... Please. We'll feel a lot better... We want to live in the house if possible. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll try and forget my sorrow. I'll go there to the house tonight and stay with you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. If there is anything, we'll find it. But I don't want the house all torn to pieces. Oh, no, sir. We won't do that. I hate to lose the property. But if it's true that there is something wrong, I may have to burn the house down. That would be a shame. My wife likes the house. We'd like to stay there. Well, I'll be over tonight. Maybe we can straighten it out forever.
Good evening. Oh, Mrs. Dutton, come right in. Suppose you're surprised to see me. I didn't think myself that I'd ever come into this house at night. Well, now you're here, won't you take off your things and sit down? I just wore this shawl. I'll keep it over my shoulders. Isn't that Mr. Rogers' car out in front? Yes, it is. I don't think of that. I never expected he'd come to this house. Never. Is there something wrong? Something more than usual, I mean? Well, not... Not exactly. It must be something very strange that would bring him to this house. He never set foot inside it since the death of his daughter, you know. So I understand. But he very kindly consented to do so after my husband went and talked to him. What about? Well, we like the house very well, and we'd like to stay here if we can. Has anything else happened since the day I was over? We did hear some strange sounds. I knew it. I knew it. Then you've gone right on living here. How can you do it? Why, I'm sure I... Where's Mr. Rogers gone? Oh, he and Paul are looking through the house. They've gone down the basement now, I think. Searching? What for? For oh, nothing definite. What could they find? Things that haunt houses that couldn't be seen. Well, you know how much better anyone feels after they've searched all through a house which frightens them. <gasps> oh. oh, my heavens. Look. Look. Where? What do you mean? Can't you see? Look at that chair. What? Look at it. Why, it's rocking. Oh, of course it's rocking. All by itself. Oh, they, they must have jarred it while they were down in the basement. Oh, no. It's spirits rocking that chair. I know it. Whatever is in this house that haunts this place, it's after someone. Or it wants something. I know it. Oh, it's rocking again. All by itself. Oh, help! Help! What is it? Yes, what, what's happened? Oh, Mr. Rogers, it's you. Oh, I'm glad you've come. But now you may stop whatever it is in this house. What is it, Mrs. Dutton? See that chair there? It started to rock all by itself. Did it, Margaret? Well, it, yes, it did. I thought perhaps it was because you jarred the floor while you were down in no. the basement. Oh, it was spirits, I know it. Oh, my nerves. My nerves are all unstrung. I've got to go home. Right now. Right now. Well... She really was frightened, wasn't she? Of course, if it did really move of its own accord, it would frighten anyone. I can't make it out. We haven't seen a thing. It isn't that there's anything in the house that hurt you, Mr. Rogers. It's only this constant moving of things in the house. And in the nighttime, someone or something moving in the attic. We haven't seen anything either. I don't think we shall. I shall have to admit I'm still at a loss to account for it, though. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll retire to my room for the night. But I promise you, I shall stay awake. And if there is anything, we'll find it. Well, I can hear it tonight, all right, Margaret. Was it the sound you heard? Yes, that's it. Should we call Mr. Rogers? No, let him hear it for himself. Then we'll be certain it isn't a product of our own minds. How could it be a product of our own minds? There's certainly something moving about in the attic. Someone, something walking. You're right, it is. Oh, is it yes? It's Mr. Rogers. Just a minute. I think I heard what you've been referring to. The sound of something moving in the attic. Yes, Mr. Rogers, we just heard it too. Shall we go up there? Yes, I guess we better... I can't make it out. I'm going to. All right. Will your robe be warm enough? Yes, I'm all right. Then let's go right away. Oh, wait. There aren't any lights in the attic. I'll take a flashlight. Why, the attic was wired for electricity. I guess the bulbs have been taken out then. Because I couldn't get any light the other night when I went up there. Listen. I hear it again. Do you? It sounds as if whatever it is was moving faster, walking more rapidly. Are we all ready now? Yes, I am. Of course. We won't see a thing. All these weird things happen and we never see a thing. Here are the stairs. Watch out now. Don't fall on anyone. I hate to admit it. I'm so scared my heart is pounding like a trip hammer. I know. I went cold all over when I heard the sound of walking while I was in my room. The light should turn on right here. Guess they don't work. We can see pretty well with this flashlight. Yeah, you see, not a thing. Totally deserted. We can't peer into the corners very well. Wait, I'll stand up in this chair. Maybe the light bulb has come loose. Maybe I can fix it. 
I can almost reach it. Here, I'll give you a boost. Now I've got it. Yes, it is loose. There. Now turn on the switch. Yes. Oh, there. That's fine. Now we can see better. But there isn't anything to see. Isn't it the queerest thing? Did you feel anything pass you on the stairs this time, Paul? No. Did you, Mr. Rogers? Pass me on the stairs? No. Well, neither did I. And if there is anything in this house, it should still be right here in this attic. Do you mind if we tear things to pieces up here and search thoroughly, Mr. Rogers? I don't know what there is to search for, but go right ahead. I hate to disturb my girl's things that were left here in the attic. But we might as well, I guess. I just thought it might be an animal or a bat or something living up here. We may find it. Well, that wouldn't account for the dishes breaking, Paul, or the chair rocking. This is just a pile of bedding, isn't it? Yes, I guess so. Oh, look. Look at this big trunk. What's in it, Mr. Rogers? Oh, that... that trunk, why, it was one my wife and I first took to Europe with us. My little girl used it for her trousseau, I guess. Uh, I think it's locked. Maybe I can open it. Stuck, I guess. It's rusty. Oh, oh, there. It's opening. Paul. Paul. I'm here. Paul. Oh, Paul. Margaret. Margaret, what is it? Don't look. Don't look at the body. What? What? Great heavens. What is it? It's a body, Mr. Rogers. A woman's body. What? Let me look at it. Great heavens. It, it's the body of my daughter. The body of my daughter. Margaret is much better, Mr. Rogers. I'm glad to hear she's getting along all right. It was a terrible shock for her. And for you, Mr. Rogers. Yes, it was. So much I can't even think or reason it out. You know how it happened? Yes, we found the bottle of poison in the bottom of the trunk. She crawled away in there and died. Believe me, my, my heart aches for you. But at least now I can give my little girl a decent burial. Mr. Livestone, I'm convinced there was something that moved about in the house. Aren't you? Yes, I am. Either the spirit of my daughter walked in that house, or that of her husband trying to tell us that the body of my little girl was there. We haven't heard or seen anything strange for the last three nights. No, and you won't. The spirits will rest easy now. They'll rest easy. <laughs> the wandering spirit was set free. No more. <laughs> Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host at the squeaking door again. Just um, slither in and let me dispel your weariness with a bit of eeriness, hmm? <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. No, please. Don't sit in that chair. I'm uh, saving it for rigor mortis to set in. <laughs> oh, dear. I see this is going to be one of those nights when my favorite character gets killed. Yes, Mary. But don't scream blue murder because this is a corpse of a different color. <laughs> well, if it's going to be that kind of a story, I'd better tell folks about something cheerful first. Yes, I mean Lipton tea. Lipton's is such a friendly, welcome drink. 
And that's because of its brisk flavor. Now, that word brisk is important. It means that Lipton tea always tastes fresh and, and full-bodied, tangy and vigorous. It's never flat or wishy-washy. That's the reason why Lipton seems to make good food taste better and why Lipton tea is the perfect beverage to serve on your entertaining friends. So even if you're not a regular tea drinker, you should try Lipton's. That brisk flavor makes all the difference in the world. And now let's leave the world, uh, temporarily, of course. Tonight's story is called The Lonely Sleep. It's an original radio play by Christopher Mayo, who scribbled it during a nightmare. And our star is Carl Swenson, who plays the role of Archie Gold. Murder is a specter which nudges all of us, anywhere. Most of us will never murder, but can any of us say we never will? Certainly Archie Gold, 30-ish, bald and mild-mannered, never thought he would murder. Archie was the window display man for Greg's department store. At night, the store is a fantastic nightmare of eerie shadows, covered showcases, cavernous depths, and dank, stale odors, with only his own hollow footsteps for sound, because windows are dressed at night. It's night now, and Archie's busy in his storeroom, crating his favorite mannequin for shipment to the mannequin factory. Being a lonely man, he talks to the mannequin. And being in love with Esther Newman of the store's accounting office, he naturally calls his favorite mannequin, Esther. You've been very mean to me, Esther. The last time I asked you to go out with me, you snickered at me. That's not nice. That's why I had to do this to you. Archie tucked Esther's smooth pink torso into a crate. There. Perfect fit, darling. Perfect. Then Archie wrapped Esther's slim legs and arms in excelsior, tucked them into another crate. So you wouldn't put your arms around me, darling. Well, you won't get another chance. Then Archie picked up Esther's pretty head and placed it on his workbench. Oh, Esther. I'm so lonely. Why don't people talk to me? Why can't I be popular? But what's wrong with me? Why don't you go out with me? What Archie never dreamed was that the real Esther Newman was at that moment slamming the last of her monthly report books closed, flicking off the light, and starting out of the finance office toward the rear door of the store. Oh, Esther, I want to tell you. She's stopped by Archie's half-open door when she hears his voice. But, uh, no, listen to me, Esther, darling. I am making enough money here to buy us a little place over in Jersey. See, all my life, I wanted to love someone like you. You're so beautiful. You will marry me, won't you, darling? Why, Archie, yeah. go. Uh, <laughs> Sitting there proposing to a dummy. And the dummy's name is Esther. What a coincidence. Uh, <laughs> Esther, you, uh, you worked late. I, I didn't know. Uh, no. I mean, yes, yes, I, I give the mannequins names. It's sort of a game. Yeah, a game. That, that's it. Well, they don't talk back anyhow. No, they don't talk back. But they're sort of kind. They smile at me. And see, I'm I'm lonely. Mm -hmm. I work all night. And Esther, will, will you go out with me Sunday night? Mm -hmm. Please. Just just dinner and, and the movies. Are could... you kidding? Why don't you ask your dummy friend? Hey, say what a swell idea. She won't eat much. You can maybe get her into the movies for half price and... When you kiss her goodnight, Archie, she won't slap your face. <laughs> Why are you looking at me that way? You shouldn't laugh. You, you're crazy. You're trying to scare me. <laughs> yes, that, that's it. No, you're not. You are crazy. Don't come near her. Archie. You shouldn't laugh. Archie, don't. You shouldn't laugh. My turn to laugh. See? My... My turn. <laughs> you shouldn't laugh. People... 
Shouldn't laugh when you're lonely. You see, the specter of murder had nudged Archie, and he's obeyed. This was no mannequin at his feet. This was a woman, warm, beautiful, and dead. Then, being scared and lonelier than ever, Archie talked to his mannequins again. This time to Frank, painted and rouged and handsome in Greg's bargain 2950 tweed suit. You heard her laughing at me, Frank. I, I, I just couldn't stand her laughing at me again. If you look at her, Frank, you'd think she was asleep. Her neck's broken. See, what am I going to do with her? I, I got to think. Got to hide her. Got to dress the front window, too. The window. Sale of cozy kitten mattresses starts tomorrow. It's a big sale. Sleep on a cozy kitten. I've got it, Frank. The window. I'll put her in the window. On a cozy kitten mattress. And nobody will know. And then tomorrow night... So Archie used some pancake makeup, bringing life to Esther's sallowing cheeks and purple lips. He placed her dead weight on a hard truck. He rolled her to the lighted window. An hour later, Esther's corpse, covered with gleaming white sheets and sleazy satin quilts, smiled in peaceful bliss at the empty street. Archie found his work well done. Nothing more to do now. Just wait. I gotta go home. And wait. That's a good window. You look very pretty in bed, Esther. I've been watching you, young fella. Yeah. Saw you do the whole thing. I... What's the matter? I scare you? <laughs> no, no, officer. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't know. Yeah, I've been in the doorway across the street watching you. A lot of work to make up one of them windows, ain't there? Yeah. You saw me do the whole window, you mean? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh. So I put the mattresses in, make the bed, put the signs in, then fix the lights. Then you put the girl in the bed and fix her face up. Yeah, it's a nice job. Yeah. <laughs> Say, mm. you look bad, son. Yeah. Anything wrong? You sick? Huh? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just tired. All through for the night? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw. Uh, good night, officer. Good night, young fella, and don't worry about your girlfriend. I'll keep an eye on her every night. <laughs> so Archie went home, as you or I might have done. And because he'd been too busy setting his little post-mortem stage, the impact of his crime began to seep through only as he neared his rooming house. Maybe the girl in the doorway he passed started him thinking because she laughed. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> Just a girl and her date. She can't blame Archie for hurrying. You would have thought it was Esther, too. Archie hurried. He hurried to the rooming house. He raced up the steps. He had to get to his room, get in and close the door to the world. Close the door. That's it. They can't laugh at me here. They won't find me here. This is my room. I... <sighs> Nerves. Stupid running like that. I've got to act normal. Sure, just, just like nothing happened. I, I couldn't help it. She made me do it. No, forget about it. Why, Archie I... Gold... No. 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 You, you can't laugh now. You're, you're... I'm dead, Archie. Yes, in a way. I'm in Greg's department store. Window. I don't believe in ghosts. It's... It's just my mind. My... My imagination. That's right, Archie. You're too clever to believe in ghosts. I'm not a ghost, Archie. I'm in your mind. I'm part of you now. Part of you. Get out! Get out! I'll drag you out! Oh, no, Archie. You can't. Unless... Unless? Unless, Archie. Unless you replace me with someone else. 
Yes. Yes. That might do it. Someone else. Another girl. See? That's how a murderer thinks. Oh, yes, yes. You do the same thing. Archie never thought he would murder. Now he's ready to do it again. Get rid of his conscience to get rid of a voice. Archie lit a cigarette. He poured himself some milk. Ignoring the laughter in his brain as he pushed the machine. <laughs> Look at your hands, Archie. Look at them. <laughs> oh, crooked and hard and clutchy. Oh. Like they were on my throat. No, oh, shut up! <laughs> Archie threw himself on the bed and jammed the pillow against his ears and fell into a dream worse than reality. Uh, 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 hello? Huh? Archie Gold? Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, this is Archie Gold. Uh, this is Mr. Greg Archie. I know this is your time to sleep, but it's important that you get down here right away. Uh, is anything wrong, Mr. Gregg? I can't tell you over the phone. Come down here. Goodbye. All right, Mr. Gregg. After he'd shaved and dressed, Archie felt a little better. After all, if they'd discovered anything, Mr. Gregg wouldn't have called. He'd have sent the police. Feeling of confidence stayed with him until he stood across the street from Gregg's. He lost it then. It dropped with a sickening pain about his heart and a dry pinching about his lips. People were standing three deep in front of his window display. And he caught sight of a policeman's cab following Mr. Gregg's bald head into the store. Well, were you thinking of going window shopping tomorrow? Hmm? <laughs> Want to be popular? There have lots of people crowding about you on the uh, sidewalk side of a plate glass window. Want to be a mannequin? <laughs> Look up Archie Gold. He's the mannequin doer. <laughs> well, all I can say is I'm glad that murderer is about to be caught. Why, Mary, don't talk that way. It was really kind of Archie to put her on the mattress. She was so sleepy. In fact, she was dead to the world. <laughs> yes, the one to feel sorry for is Archie. Why, the poor fellow's shivering. Why don't you make him a cup of uh, Lipton a tea? Hmm? <laughs> Lipton's is too good for him. And besides, he's probably too scared to taste the difference between Lipton's and ordinary teas. Yes, folks, Lipton tea is different. In the language of tea experts, Lipton's has a brisk flavor. And when they use that, use that word brisk, B-R-I-S-K, they mean that Lipton tea tastes Tangy and spirited, really full-bodied. It's never flat or weak. So get acquainted with that brisk flavor. Well, you just don't know how good tea can be till you know how good Lipton's is. Well, let's see how good Archie's alibi is. Remember Archie, the lonely little man who dresses Greg's department store windows at night? He just couldn't stand being spurned by Esther Newman any longer. She laughed at him when he asked for a date, and now... Esther is a lifeless mannequin advertising the restful qualities of cozy kitten mattresses in the window display. And Archie enters the store to see what's in store for him. Uh, uh Mr. Uh, Gregg, I'm, uh... Archie Gold, come in, come in. Close the door. Sit down. My uh, boy, you know Miss Newman and our bookkeeping department? Yes, sir. I knew her, but I'd, I'd, I'd like a chance... Now you're to going work. to get a chance, my boy. Before leaving on a week's vacation, Miss Newman completed our annual report. Miss Newman is on vacation? Yes, yes, yes. Which isn't important. A report shows we sold 16 cozy kitten mattresses in one year. Well, that's not many, is it, sir? It's terrible. We were stuck with 1,500 of them. Just a minute now. Jenkins. Jenkins. Yes, Mr. Gregg? How many mattresses have you sold now? 802, sir. You hear that, Gold? Yes, sir. 802 mattresses in a couple of hours. And your window display did that. My boy, you're a genius. Uh, Mr. Gregg, I... I've no, got no, 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 no. I know just what you're going to say. 
Any man who has the imagination to put a woman dummy asleep in a window. And such a dummy. So, so peaceful. How much are we paying you, Archie? Thirty-six forty-seven a week, sir. Starting today, it's seventy-two ninety-four. And a private office, and you're the head window display manager of my three stores. Ha! Stunned you, huh? Everything I've always wanted. What's more? I've had pictures taken of that window with the crowds, and the paper promised to run it in tonight's edition. With your name. Good? Yes, sir. I, I want you to know, sir, I, I appreciate it oh, all. Oh, but... nonsense. Greg knows a bargain. Now go home to bed again, or take tonight off. Oh, no, no. I, uh, I, I have work to do. Ah, got more good ideas? Good, good. Uh, m- Mr. Gregg. Yes, my boy. If, uh, if the mattresses are selling so well, we won't need the display. I, I can take it out to... Oh, oh, nonsense. Don't touch it. We'll run this sale for two weeks. I just ordered 1,500 more mattresses. Success and popularity was sweet to Archie's taste. But Archie knew a corpse, no matter how beautiful, cannot survive the sun beating through glass for long. And Archie knew that. It was a wretched rainy night. Greg's department store had long since closed its doors. The night belonged again to Archie. Now he had a nasty job to do. He drew the curtains across the big window. In case the officer was watching again... Esther was just a mannequin now, a mannequin of flesh and bones, but a mannequin. And Archie spoke to his mannequin. You've had a hard day, Esther, darling, haven't you? Well, it's all over now. You never did anything for me alive. Dead, you brought me success. Now I've got to send you away. You're stiff and cold, Esther. And you can't laugh now, can you? Esther couldn't laugh. And Archie opened the crates which contained the mannequin he had originally planned to ship. With a few simple tools and lots of work, he made Esther, the real Esther, conform to his original shipment. A torso. A pair of head. Yeah. Who? who? Oh, that's, that's the alley door. Somebody's there. Up, maybe I've, I've got, got, got to act natural. After all, she's well hidden. Uh, Could I come in? Please, I'm so wet and tired. A girl. It's a girl. Yes, yes, uh, uh, come in. Uh, get out of that rain. Thanks. Why, you poor kid, you're soaked. Come into the workshop. I've got a heater in there. Gosh, thanks. She was sent to me. Someone to take Esther's place. Feel better now? Yeah, lots better. You're very kind. How did you happen to pick this door to knock at? Well, the alley seemed a good place to get out of the wind. It started to rain and I saw your light. Oh, I see. And you're broke. Yeah. It's the usual story. I came to town from Philly to get a job. Job was there, all right, but the boss wasn't on the level. Well, don't you have a home? A parents or a husband, I mean? Uh-uh. Oh, that's no. a shame. Um, look, uh, stay stay right there now. I, I'll, I'll be right uh, back. You're, you're not uh, leaving me, are you? No, no, I'm going to get a blanket to, to put across your shoulders. I'll be right back. Of course he'd be right back. Wasn't this just what he needed? Another mannequin to satisfy Esther's voice? made sense. The second time, it's easier. It always is. Don't move, May. Huh? I'll put it across your shoulders. All right. You're a very lonely man, aren't you, Mr. Gold? Yeah. How do you know that? Because I like you. How does that prove I'm lonely? I like lonely people. Why? Because I'm terribly lonely myself. I I got some coffee in the thermos here. I'll I'll get you some. I like it here. I like to look at the mannequins, especially that handsome one there. What do you call him? What do you mean, call him? Well, you must talk to them. I would. You're wonderful. You understand. 
Yeah, I, I do. I do talk to him. His name's Frank. Uh, Frank, meet May. May, this is Frank. Hello, Frank. I'm sleepy, Frank. Oh, May. Why did you come tonight? Why couldn't you have come two nights ago? Uh, are you, you're sleepy? Mm-hmm. I'm warm and sleepy. Uh, look, I have three hours before my window has to be finished, and I have an errand that'll take me about an hour. You, you climb into the bed in the window and... and... <laughs> People will see me in the window. No, no, the, the curtains are drawn. I'll... I'll wake you when I get back. All right. Looks like the kind of bed I could sleep on forever. <laughs> Ever. Doesn't always work out the way you plan it, see? Archie didn't want to murder Esther, but he did. Archie wants to murder May, but he'd rather not. Well, Archie drew the satin quilts over May. She smiled, closed her eyes with a murmured thanks, and was asleep. Archie knew now he loved her, that he must never listen to her speak again. While Archie carried the crates containing Esther's remains into the station wagon in the alley, a little man with a sad, droopy face and a derby hat argued with the night captain of the local police station. I tell you, I know what I'm talking about. I, I stopped at Greg's window four times today. I, I know a corpse when I see one. Well, I saw that window, too. That's a dummy in that bed. I know a dummy when I see one. I don't doubt that, Captain. You've had more experience with dummies than I have, but I've had more experience with corpses than you have. That's, that's a dead girl in the bed. Now, what makes you so sure? I've been an undertaker for 40 years. My name is Huzak. My establishment is down the block from Greg's store on 10th Street. Mm, okay, we'll check. Uh, operator, get me Mr. Greg. Yeah, Greg's department store. Of course it is home. What else at this hour? Archie had a plan. Excitement gripped him. But that habit of years was strong, and he talked to Esther as he piled her... Three coffins into the station wagon in the alley. Don't you worry, Esther. In a half hour, you'll be at the bottom of the river. You shouldn't have laughed, Esther. Then, I'll come back to me. Sure. Archie had a plan, all right. But it didn't include the little old undertaker who knew a corpse when he saw one. Or an angry, sleepy Mr. Gregg. For a confused... We're right then coming to a stop in front of the store. This is an outrage, a preposterous, fantastic farce. Getting me down here in the middle of the night. Prove I have a corpse in my window. I know, Mr. Gregg. I feel silly about it myself, but Mr. Huzak here seems so sure. The curtains are drawn in front of the window. We'll have to go inside. Oh. In a minute, you're all going to look very silly. There. Does that look like a corpse? No. You're right. It's not a corpse. It isn't a dummy either. She's alive. And breathing. There's something queer here. I'm going to look around outside. Archie! Archie, go! Archie! Archie! Archie didn't hear himself being caged. But at the entrance of the alley, he saw the police car in front and he heard the police captain shouting from the sidewalk. That was when Archie decided it was better to be lonely. The lonelier, the better. They found out. That's the police. They said they found out. Hey! Hey, you! Ah! Now. Got to. They won't catch me. They won't. Got the lights, Fred. I gotta go through. Faster. Faster. Why can't it go faster? The, the truck. Turn right. Turn right. No one ever heard Archie's last words. They bubbled through his torn throat as he lay in the glass-smashed window through which he'd crashed. No one. I'm... I'm... so lonely. May. So lonely. Well, Greg? 
Greg. Here's your Archie Gold. Bet those crates will be interesting. Uh, awful. Awful. Yeah. Quite a mess. No one was cruel enough to point out a gruesome bit of grisly humor. The lonely little man who'd spent so much time in display windows had created his final masterpiece. Archie had decorated his last window in Husack's funeral parlor. The lesson we learned from tonight's story is that murder doesn't pay. It's a losing business. Murderers are always in the uh, red. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's strenuous work, too. You, you're bound to find yourself a little stiff. <laughs> Mr. Host, I did not like that story. Well, neither did I, Mary. Imagine the cozy kitten mattress company pulling a smart advertising stunt like that on Lipton's time and for free. <laughs> now, that's not what I mean at all. And if you're worried about Lipton's, let me assure you that Lipton's is the largest selling brand of tea in the whole world. That's the kind of popularity that really counts. And folks, if you'll just once try Lipton tea, I think you'll be convinced, too. Well, I have to run along now, folks. Got some shopping to do in Greg's department store. What? Oh, I know it's late, but, um, you see... Archie and I shop at night to uh, avoid the shrouds, you know. (laughs) By the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery Novel is Puzzle for Wantons by Patrick Quentin. Oh, and here's a special announcement. Next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about a man whose dreams always come true. All he has to do is to dream that somebody's being murdered and... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Enough to keep you awake, isn't it? <laughs> oh, until we meet again next Tuesday, you uh, you dream of me and I'll dream of you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now it's time to close the squeaking door, so good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Here's a grand way to begin a meal. Serve Lipton's noodle soup. Lipton's takes no time to prepare, and yet it has a real fresh cooked chickeny flavor. Yes, it tastes just like the chicken noodle soup you'd make right in your own kitchen. And Lipton's is economical, too. It costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. So, folks, don't forget to serve Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, Mystery Theater, brought to you in part... By True Value Hardware, your store of first choice. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the theater of the mind, where on the unlimited stage of your imagination, we'll play out a drama of terror. Terror for three people who might be called babes in the wood. It's a frightening thing to lose your way, and even more terrifying if you're lost in an unfamiliar forest with nothing to give you a sense of direction. And that's where we find two escaped convicts. Hank Farley and Will Chase, fugitives from an army stockade, together with Hank's wife, Dolly, who tried to help them escape. But being lost is only a part of their problem. Well, whatever it was, it's gone. But it's still out there, somewhere. What are we going to do? I, I, 
I think we ought to stay here. Till we starve? We've got to keep moving. But Hank's leg... Okay, look, I figure it's about early afternoon. Let's wait till the heat of the day passes. Give Hank's leg a rest and then go on when it's cooler. But if we can't find our way out before dark... Then we spend another night in these woods. With that? That thing out there? That and... God knows what else. Our mystery drama, Escape, Escape, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Terry Keene and Robert Dryden. KSL, Salt Lake City. Welcome to a rainy August night in Louisiana. The lights of an army camp shine dimly through the sheet of water that falls from the cold black sky. Little rivers run in gullies across the deserted muddy compound of the stockade. All is quiet except for the rain. And then... Get down! Get down! They'll see us! We'll never make the fair. Shut up and do what I tell you. Let's go back. That'll really be the end of us. We killed one guard already. No, we're going to go down trying. This rain's on our side. The searchlights don't shine as far. But we've got to get across that whole compound. The next time the lights sweep past, we follow. Just behind. Now, get ready. We won't be able to find the hole in the fence in this rain. We'll worry about that when we get to the fence. Now, hold on. Here comes the light now. Stay just behind it. Ready? Go! Oh, oh. I can't go any faster! We've got to beat that next swing of the light. How much farther? I can't tell in this rain. The light's coming this way again. Faster! Here. Here's the fence. Hank, the light! I got more shots left. Now, keep your fingers crossed. Bullseye! I hit the light! Come on! Be along this fence. Yeah. Charlie said the hole would be right next to the fourth post. Yeah. It's damn rain. It's helped that it hasn't. Here's the hole. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all right. You go first. Hurry. Right. I made it. Watch your right side. There's a barb. Yeah. No! Oh! oh, my hip! I told you to watch it. Yeah. Oh, that hurts. Did you walk? Yeah, of course I can walk. It's not that bad. All right, come on. Oh, I sure hope Dolly's there with the car. She'll be there. She sure. better be. Yeah. Oh. We don't know the woods or the roads around here. Uh, Hank, uh, are you sure you know which way to go? No, no, I'm not sure. What am I, a miracle man? Uh, I'm as scared as you are, but we got to keep going. Charlie said head straight away from the fence for a mile and a half to the road. The trees block a lot of the rain. Yeah. We'll get there. <laughs> There's a clearing. It must be the road. Yeah. Oh, that looks like a car, Hank. Huh? It's too dark to be sure. Keep moving. It is a car, Hank. Uh, it's Dolly. She found the spot okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a convertible. I told you Dolly wouldn't let us down. Oh. 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 Hank, you made it. Oh, bless you, <laughs> Dolly, for being here. Oh. Okay, well, get in the back. Oh. Thank God you made it, Hank. Oh, I have missed you so. Time for that later, doll. All right, come on, get going. Oh, hey, man, you sure are a mess. Yeah, yeah we had to crawl through the mud. Yeah. yeah. Hey, where are we heading? Well, first to Masonville. We pick up the interstate there. I had a heck of a time finding my way in here. The rain didn't help either. It helped us back the stockade. Ah. What's the matter? Oh, I... I ripped myself crawling through the fence. Is it bad? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. I haven't had a chance to look at it. Well, maybe we should stop in Masonville. Huh? Are you crazy? Oh, you'll be all right. We don't dare stop. He's right. We'll keep going. Oh, but... Uh, what's the matter? I just went past the road I'm supposed to take. You sure? Yeah, I'm positive. I turned right at the white sign coming in. So I'm supposed to turn left going out. 
Carl. They can't argue with you. One mile on this road. And then right at the cemetery. Now what? I know this was the road. But we should have come to the cemetery a long time ago. We probably missed it in the rain. Maybe we should go back. Yeah, we'll have to. That cemetery's my only guidepost. We're on dirt now. The roads coming in here are all paved. Oh, maybe we ought to stop and wait till daylight. Hey, hey, there's a light up ahead. Let's ask. What are you, dummy? What do you think we are, tourists? They've had an alert out for us for an hour. Well, look, maybe I should ask. You two stay in the car. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. It might not be so bad. It's isolated out here. Maybe they haven't heard about us. And even if they have, it doesn't make any difference. What are you talking about? We're going to spend the night in that house. What? No use wandering around getting lost in the rain. We're all going in and help ourselves to their hospitality. What do you want? Uh, our car broke down. Can we use your phone? Oh, uh, what happened to you? Uh, haven't you ever seen mud before? Uh, well, come on in. Uh. This is very kind of you, uh, Mrs. Is... Call me Granny Good. That's how I'm called. Uh, we're on our way to Masonville, Granny. Can we call a service station? Oh, well, here's the phone. I don't know if Amos had come out this late. Oh, we don't mind waiting. I'll just... Oh, my phone! What did you do that for? You just got some unexpected overnight company, and we don't want to be disturbed. Oh, you've got some... Shut man. up. You got a radio? Of course I got a radio. Oh. Oh, now I know what you want. Shut up. You're, you're the prisoners that escaped from the army camp. Oh, it didn't take them long to announce it. They said you killed a guard. Hank... You didn't. We had to. Oh, murderers. Get out of my house. Get out. You just shut up, old lady. You murderers, you'll not stay in my house. Uh, Hank, an old woman. Oh, you'll be sorry for that, murderer. Shut up, I said. Get us some food. You'll be sorry. Hank, why are you acting like this? Leave me alone. He's on edge, Dolly. We all are the... Past couple of hours haven't been any picnics. Yeah. You know? What is it? You, your hip again? Yeah, yeah, I. Uh, well, here. Uh, here, sit down, sit down. Okay. Uh, look, could we have some warm water and bandages? My husband's been hurt. You expect me to nurse him? No, I just asked. Not you, but... for a murderer. Let him suffer. Get the bandages. Hank. Oh. All right, I'll get you some water. But don't think you scared me into it. Come on, Hank. Now, relax, okay? Uh, Coming here was your idea, Hank. We got no other choice. We'll stay till daylight and then get moving. Yeah, water and a bandage, and don't ask for anything more. How about some food? I don't have any food. Yeah? What's in that pot on the fire? Snakes and snails and puppy dog tails. <laughs> you want some, sonny boy? Don't get funny with me. Hey, look. Oh, lady, we're going to stay here till morning, so just get used to the idea, huh? Well, look around. Yeah. See if there's anything we can use and find some food, no matter what she says. Hank, sit still. I'll uh, fix your leg. Now, just a Granny. minute. Granny. Uh, the gun again. Why? Why do you want to frighten me? Barge in and treat me like this. I, I know you're escaped murderers. Why don't you just go and leave me alone? Hey, well, did you find anything? Ah, uh, nothing much. There's a storeroom back here full of empty bottles, every size and shape. Oh. Oh, so Granny likes to put up her own, huh? <laughs> Where are the full bottles, Granny? Hmm? I don't know what you're talking about. Where's your booze? I could use a drink right now. There's no liquor here. Find it, Will. Right. No, no, don't open that cabinet. Open it, Will. No, no, please. It's locked. Open it. Oh, please, don't, don't. Get away from there. Hey, look at that. Money. It's mine. Stacks and stacks of money. Just laying there. 
Ah, that is something we can use. No, no. Don't you dare touch that. There's no hurry. We'll pack it up when we're ready to leave. All right, come on, Will. Wash up and Dolly will find us something to drink. And eat. You want some more salad? No, oh, no. No, thanks. Me neither. Hey, wasn't a bad meal. Yeah, <laughs> better than that garbage at the Army prison, eh, Hank? <laughs> I knew that old hag would soften up. Eh. Look at her snoozing over there by the fire with her cauldrons and her cats. <laughs> <laughs> All she needs is a black pointed hat. Yeah. You know, I could use some sleep myself. It'll take turns. Mm. There's nothing that old hag can do, but we better not take chances. She might run for help. Yeah. It's still pouring rain, though. I wouldn't stop her. She knows the way around here. Well, look, I'll stay up. I'm too nervous to sleep anyway. I don't like the way that. One cat keeps staring at us. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's bugging me, too. What are you two trying to do? Spook us all? I'll just be glad when we're out of here. Hank, why don't we leave now? Granny will tell us how to get to the main road into Masonville just to get rid of us. No way. She could get us really lost or direct us right back to the army base. Now, we'll wait for daylight. She's waking up. Uh, uh, So what? Uh, I'm going to sleep. Uh, You're all still here. Yeah. I thought you'd be gone by now. I told Rimba to send you away. Who's Rimba? My best friend. (laughs) Aren't you, Rimba? (laughs) (laughs) Well, maybe he didn't get the message. It's that cat that's been staring at us. Send them away, Rimba. You have the power. Send them away. Hank? Hank, I'm frightened. Uh, Keep that cat away from us. Go ahead, Rimba. We've been hospitable long enough. Send them away. If that cat comes any closer, I... Hey! Rimba! Rimba! You've killed Rimba! That cat was mad. It was a tough. You killed Rimba. Now you'll pay. Murderers. You hit me. You steal my money. Eat my food. You kill my cat. Oh, you'll pay. With your lives. You have no more chances left. Hank, I'm scared to death. She's going crazy. She's throwing things on the fire. Oh, what can she do? That cat was going to... Fire first. And then the ash... Golden powder from the sash. Powder mixed with basil green. Mandrake root and things unseen. Now a grain into the fire to test fulfillment of desire. It blew up. What's going on, Hank? I don't know. She's putting on some show. Look, I don't like it. We've got to get out of here. Killers of my faithful friend... On thee, the hate of hell descend. Now, once again, into the fire. Complete fulfillment of desire. No! No! I can't breathe. Get out of here. No, it was smoke. How can we get out of here? I can't see anything. Uh, uh, hey, Dolly! Uh, uh, where are you? I'm suffocating! I'm over Dolly. here! Hey, hey! Where? Where are you? Dolly! Uh, 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 Dolly! <laughs> That's one way of getting rid of unexpected and unwanted company. Smoke them out. And Granny is certainly within her rights when nothing but brutal treatment rewarded her hospitality. We'll see how our notorious trio makes out when I return shortly with Act Two. The Evening Team on 1160 KSL Information Radio. We return now to the rather bizarre scene at the cottage of old Granny Good. 
After being terrorized by her very rude and ungrateful guests, she struck back by filling the cottage with smoke from a powder she threw into the fire. And at this moment, her unexpected company is making a hasty retreat. <coughs> oh, hey! Hey, come over here! Uh, I, I, see you. I can just make you out! We found the door! Hurry up! The smoke's getting worse! Okay! Okay! Let's go! Oh, I can breathe. Hi, keep, keep running. Well, get to the car. Hey, hey. The rain stopped. Oh. But it's so dark. No. I can't see either of you. Oh, well, that's the way it is in the woods at night. The car ought to be right over here. We parked close to the cottage. Oh, I can't. I can't see it. Look. We can't see the lights in the cottage anymore. Did we run that far? No. It didn't seem like it. Oh. Let's double back. Oh. Hank. Hank, please, do you know which way we're going? Yeah, back the way we came. Oh. We gotta get to the car. But Hank, we... Oh. Oh. What happened? I walked into a tree. I can't see a... Dead thing. You got any matches? No, have you? Uh, no. Well, come on, we'll fill our way. Yeah. We can walk around in circles in this dark. Oh, we gotta wait for morning. That old woman's probably on her way to the police right now. How? Oh. On her broom? Ah, uh, she couldn't get anywhere tonight. Will's right. We'll bed down here and wait till daylight. Bed down? On this wet ground? Okay, okay, okay. Let's relax. We can't walk around in circles. We'll have to make out as best we can right here. Yeah. It's not cold. Rain stopped. We'll just have to stay here till daylight. Then we'll see the cottage and get out of here. Hank? You awake? Yeah getting light. Oh, yeah, yeah. You better get moving. Dolly. Mm. You all right, honey? Oh. Oh, I'm so stiff. Uh, you'll feel better once we get going. Hey. Uh, Dolly. Look. What? Where's the cottage? It's gone. Well, we... We couldn't have wandered that far away from it. Well, we did. We thought we were heading back for it in the dark. Instead, we were walking away from it. What direction should we go? Well, uh, if we keep moving, we got to come to a road sometime. Maybe the dirt road we came in on. Okay. Hey, look, look. That, that looks like a path up ahead. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the undergrowth isn't as thick up there. Well, uh, path's got to lead somewhere. What do we do? We we go right or left, huh? Uh, left. It seems to go up. Yeah, yeah. Maybe if we get to higher ground, we'll see the cottage. Okay, we, we go left. Yeah. Hank, suppose we can't find our way out of here. We don't have any water, any food. Don't think like that, Dolly. We'll get out of here. We couldn't have come all that far from the cottage last night. We stopped walking after a few minutes. The cottage and that dirt road have to be close. Yeah. But we may still be walking away from them. Oh, Hank. Hank, please, I gotta rest. Yeah, okay. We'll stop for a while. Oh. My leg's bothering me, too. I'm dying of thirst. We all are. It's so blasted hot, too, and still. Hank? Huh? Do you notice something? Like what? There's no sound. Yeah, you're right. I mean, not a rustle. No birds. Come to think of it, I... I haven't seen any animals either, like a squirrel or chipmunk or anything. It's unnatural. Ah, it's the heat. I just wish we could could find some water. 
Well, look, uh, you, you two stay here. Maybe I can scout around. No, 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 no. No, we got to stick together. Well, sitting here isn't going to find us any water. Relax, will you? Dolly's tired. Well, so am I. But unless we keep going... We'll go and Dolly's right. All right, just stop it. Stop it. I'm okay. Will's right. We ought to keep going. Hey, look. Look at that tree over there. Huh? Where? To the left. No branches, just flowers at the top. If I wasn't so miserable, they would be almost beautiful. It's uh, probably a vine, like the bougainvilleas in California. When I was in L.A. one time... Hey, hey, up ahead. It's a clearing. Oh, thank God. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe we can get our bearings if we get out of this undergrowth. Hey, come on. Yeah, yeah, maybe there's a pond or a stream or something. Look at... Wow. Look at the size of that rock. That's bigger than a house. Uh, and white. It's like a whole hill collapsed into a pile of white boulders. Look, I'm gonna... I'm gonna try and scale this one. Maybe I can get a clue about where we are. Be careful. It's not too bad. I can get a footing. Look, looks like about 30 feet up. It's a solid rock. Not a branch or a blade of grass. See anything? Not yet. I'm going higher. Ah, uh, take it easy. Wow. What a sight. What is it? Hundreds of these things. It's, it's like a desert of white boulders. Far as you can see. A uh, dead end? There's some funny looking trees in the distance and... Hey, yeah! It looks like a road. A road? How far? Well, it's hard to judge from here, but... Oh, maybe two miles? We'll have to cross over these rocks. Are you sure it's a road? Wait a second. Yeah, I'm sure. It, oh. it is. Uh, it, it's a paved road running straight along the line of trees. Good. Okay, come on down. Oh, Hank, Hank, we're finally getting out of yeah, here. Yeah, 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 but let's not waste any time. How much farther? Oh. We're almost to the road. You can see the line of trees. His legs killing me. You know, I... I think it's infected. I've got to have some water. It's not far now. Uh, We're coming out of the rocks now. Okay, where's the road? I don't know. It was along here. I, I, I saw it. And nothing. Nothing but more jungle. We're back in the woods. I know there was a road. You thought you saw a road, you damn idiot! Look, that was a mirage! We come all this way for a mirage! Well, how was I to know? Oh, God, we're lost! We're lost, Jack! We're lost! Shut up, Dolly! <laughs> we're gonna die here, I know it! We're never gonna find Stop out. it, will you? <laughs> okay. All right, we all gotta rest now. The heat's getting to us. <laughs> And I can't go another step on this leg without some rest. Oh, well, that's just great. What are we going to have to do, carry you? You're going to have to carry me if I don't get some water. Now, now, look, we've been pushing for hours. Let's try to calm down. All right, we're lost, but... Shh, what? What? Listen, listen. What is it? What would someone be doing making a sound like that? Whoever it is probably won't know about us. We can ask him how to get out of here. He's got to know how he got in. Sounds like he's clearing brush. He's coming closer. <laughs> what is that? Oh, my God! <laughs> it looks like an ant! Like a, a giant ant! Oh, Hank! 
It's as big as I. All right, get back, get back, get back under these rocks. It hasn't seen us. I'm going to be sick. Oh, hang down, <laughs> down, down and quiet. Oh, oh, my leg is hanging. Uh, it can't be an ant. Well, you saw it. But I don't believe it. What's it doing now? Hey, it looks, looks like it's eating a plant. Oh, what are we going to do? Pray it doesn't try to eat us. It could. Stop it. Stop it. I can't stand it. Hey, you shut up. I think it's seen us. I heard it. Yeah, it's waving those things on its head. It's, it's trying to find out where we are. Don't anybody move a muscle. It'll stop moving. We're just dreaming this. They can't be ants that big. Shh. I, I think it's part of this. I can't look. It's, it's moving this way. It's moving. We, we can't fight it. We, we, we gotta get back under those boulders. They, they form a natural cave back there. Yeah, well, I can't make it fast on this way. You've got to. Take uh, his arm, Dolly. Oh, I can't move. Uh, okay. I, I'll make I it on my own. Move. I can't move. Hey, Will, help her. I'll drag myself. It's attacking. No. No, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Here, here, here. Give me a hand, Nate. I'm not, I'm not going to make it. Save Dolly. You'll make it. I'll get, I'll get you in here. Dolly's all right. Hey, if a thing that big stings you, you're dead. Hey, no, no, it can't reach us in here. Oh, oh, we're okay now. Oh, it can't. It can't be real. It can't be real. Oh, that was oh, straight out of a nightmare. I got chills all over. I, I, I can't stop shaking. Oh, so it is, Hank. Has it... Gone? No, no. It might be trying to find another way in. Oh, no, no. Oh, gosh, that's, that's an ugly thing. Oh, it's, it, it's moving away. Back into the woods. Oh, oh, thank heaven. How could an ant get to be that size? I mean, this isn't Mars. It's Louisiana. What do you... Hey. Maybe it's mechanical. What? What do you mean, mechanical? Well, some kind of vehicle the Army's been testing. Re remote controlled, maybe. Oh, we've been walking in this heat for hours. No sleep, no food, no water. We could be imagining anything. It tried to attack us. I was no vehicle. Well, then how do you explain an ant as big as a lion? I don't know. Well, whatever it was, it's... It's gone. But it's still out there. Somewhere. What else, indeed? Could there really be an ant as big as a lion? There are such things as mutations, we're told... I'd certainly hate to have one of them show up at one of my picnics. But if that's any indication of what lies ahead in this strange Louisiana wood, it won't be any picnic for Hank, Will, and Dolly when we return shortly with Act Three. KSL, Salt Lake City. No escape goes unpursued. And at the moment, while Hank, Will, and Dolly are considering their predicament, their pursuers are hot on the trail. Let's return to Granny Good's cottage as a car bearing the word sheriff on its doors winds its way up the road and then suddenly stops. Something wrong, Sheriff? Yeah. That car by Granny Good's cottage, it's got out-of-state plates. Don't see many of them around here. Uh, let's walk the rest of the way. Keep your gun handy. Harley and Chase were on foot when they left the stockade. 
Well, they could have been picked up by somebody. Hi, Roy. Hi, Granny. Everything all right here? No, it ain't. I just got finished burying Rimba, my favorite cat. Whose car? Uh, that belongs to the fellas I think you're, you're looking for. They've been here. Uh, they were here. They're gone now. Without their car? Oh, uh, Granny, this here is Major Thomas from the Army base where those two fellas escaped from. He's investigating. How do, Major? Hello, Miss Good. Uh, you say they were here and then left without their car, is that right? Last night, a few hours after they came, and good riddance, and nothing but murderers, they, they killed my cat, my rimba, and they hit me, tried to steal my money. Yeah, well, now, if they didn't take their car, where'd they go? I don't know. It was pouring rain. They they run out into the woods. They're the girl with them. She drove the getaway car. Well, she said she was the wife of one of them. Yep, Hank Farley's wife. Chase wasn't married. Oh, well, come on in out of the heat. I, I have lemonade ready. All right, tell us what happened last night, Granny. Well, Roy, they they bust in here around 10 o'clock. Oh, they traveled fast. First alarm went out at 9. They were all covered with mud. But I'd heard it on the radio. I knew who they were. And they pulled the phone out of the wall. But what made them leave? How'd they run into strange woods they didn't know? Oh, it beats me. Oh, here's your lemonade, Major. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Roy. Oh, thank you. Major, I don't think you're ever going to find them. Those woods out there, one wrong step and you're lost forever. I don't think we ought to wait any longer. I'm not moving from here. Not while that thing is out there. Golly, it's gone. Gone where? If we go into the woods again, it'll find us. Well, we can't stay here forever. we got to keep trying. Oh. Well, we'll, we'll keep out of the woods for a while. Look down there. It's like a sandy path along the edge of the forest. Yeah. But let's follow that. Okay. No. No, Dolly, we've got to. Hank, I'm afraid. Once we get going, you'll feel better. It's sitting around here imagining things that's getting to us. Come on. Come on, I'll help you. Uh, oh, I guess I don't have any choice. Oh, I am so thirsty. How's that leg, Hank? Oh, boy, it hurts like the uh, devil. But I don't have any choice either. Is anything out there? No. Not a sound either. Okay. Let's go. You know, it seems to be getting lighter. Hey, we're coming to something. What do you mean, coming to something? Well, uh, another <laughs> clearing, maybe. Well, the sand strip's getting wider. Look, it's it's like a desert. They have deserts in Louisiana. Well, what do you call that? There's, there's nothing but more sand up ahead. Oh, it's better than jungle. Well, what do you think? <sighs> Shall we go across? We don't know what's on the other side. Well, we don't know what's behind us, either. I'm going to move up a bit. See if there's anything to give us a bearing. Sand's deeper here. You sink in over your ankles. Well, be careful. See anything? Yeah. Hey, what's uh, the matter? I, I, I don't know. It, it's as though something hit me, but there's nothing here. Well, <laughs> you all right? Well, I will be when I find out what... The... Wait, Hank, this is the damnedest thing. What is it? It's a force field of some kind. What do you mean? A force field? Look, we're, we're standing here. Now, now walk straight ahead, uh, slowly. Okay. Ah! Uh, it knocks you back. Stay back, Dolly. Don't worry. Now I'm convinced of it. We're wandering around an army testing ground. This is another one of their experiments. 
Is there a way, a way around it? Uh, somewhere, probably. Yeah, but where? You can actually reach out and touch it. it, it it's like feeling your way along an invisible wall. You know what this means? We're right back in prison again. Our only escape is into the waiting hands of Major Thomas. We'll have to go back. Go back? To where? Well, hold up a second. Look off there to the left. Nothing but sky. I think the land drops away at the edge of the woods. Well, let's, let's find out. Maybe we can... Maybe we can get a bearing, huh? Oh, Hank. Hank, I'm so tired. I can't keep going. Okay, honey, okay. <gasps> Sit here for a few minutes. Uh, Will and I want to check out that cliff. Uh, hey, we're... We're high, all right. Nothing but space out there. Don't, don't go so close to the edge. Look, there, look down there, will you? Did you ever see anything like it? No. The strangest looking plants I've ever seen. It's... It's not like the woods anymore. Yeah, tall, spindly things and flowers. Don't make sense. Look at this. Look at this thing. Over here. Ah! What is oh, no. what is oh, no. oh, hang on. Oh. I'm sliding. What's happened? I can't stop. I Will, oh, Will's going down the cliff. What can we do? Oh. There's no way to stop it. Oh, 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 hey, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> He's grabbed hold of a plant. Hey, Will! Are you all right? He can't hear you. He seems okay. He's pulling himself up on the plant. Hank! Look! Oh, my God! The plant's crushing him. It's closing around him. Oh. It can't be! Oh, Hank, do something, do something. The plant is swallowing him. Never gonna get out of this place. I know that. We can't get out. Dolly. <laughs> Dolly, please don't let go. We're not in Louisiana. We're in hell. <laughs> when I was a little girl, I used to have bad dreams about hell. My mama would say, Dolly, if you're not a good girl, the devil will get you. And you'll go to that place. Stop it, And I'd Dolly. go to bed and I Stop. would think about hell. And I'd... I'd dream about it. Oh, God. <laughs> now I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Oh, honey, honey. Oh, oh, Mama. Can I have a drink of water, Mama? I promise I won't call again, Mama. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Dolly. It's so dark. And I'm so thirsty. Mama, don't make me get out of bed. <laughs> oh, please. Water. I hear water. It's water. Dolly. Dolly, don't go out there. It's water. It's dripping off that big leaf. <laughs> it's water at last. Dolly! Come back here! Dolly! <laughs> Dolly! It's after the water, too! It's the end! Hey, help me! Help me! I, I, I can't! I can't! I can't move! Dolly! Dolly! <laughs> Dolly! Dolly! Well, thank you for the lemonade, Mr. Good, and the information. I'll have Fred and Tony up here in about 20 minutes. Oh, whatever you think best. And I'll get the phone company out to fix your phone before dark. You can't be without that. Oh, I'd appreciate it, Roy. All right, we'll be in touch, Granny. <laughs> Uh, Major, are you married? Why, yes, I am. Oh, well, then I'd be most happy if you'd take this to your wife. A little token of my appreciation. Why, it's very beautiful. Uh, well, it's a terrarium. 
I see you've been admiring it. <laughs> Granny's terrariums are famous around these parts, Major. <laughs> Everybody buys them. My wife's got one with a plant that eats meat. <laughs> That's the Venus flytrap. There's one in this glass, too. Well, thank you very much. My wife will really enjoy it. <laughs> My pleasure. Oh, something wrong, Major? Uh, I thought I saw something moving in there. Oh, well, it might be an ant. Sometimes they're in the earth when I plant them. It does no harm. <laughs> well, uh, thank you again, Miss Good, and uh, don't worry. We'll get those men. <laughs> well... You never know. You might be closer than you think. Well, after all, this is the age of miniaturization. And even witches have to keep up with the times. It appears that Granny Good reduced her problem to the smallest common denominator and arrived had a satisfactory solution. It also strikes me as a convenient way to lose weight or avoid a bill collector. Unless, of course, one goes too far and finds himself reduced to nothing. I'll be back shortly. <laughs> Hank, Will, and Dolly might well have heeded a popular saying before tampering with Granny Good. Never underestimate the power of a woman, particularly one with lots of cats and a cauldron bubbling over the fire. We'll be stirring up some more suspense and terror for you on our next Mystery Theater tale. So do join us again. Our cast included Terry Keene, Robert Dryden, Bob Caliban, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. And now, the Mole Mystery Theater, presented by M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skin. Good evening. This is Jeffrey Barnes, welcoming you to the program that presents the best in mystery and detective fiction. Tonight's play is a modern melodrama with the emphasis upon terror and suspense. It's entitled The Creeper, and is the story of a mysterious killer of that name, an unknown madman who terrifies an entire city by a series of murders. And just who is The Creeper? Well, answering that question is the challenge of tonight's play. And Joseph Ruscole, the author, has cleverly fashioned a story deliberately designed to fool you. So be on your guard. You've had fair warning. Oh, gee, Mr. Barnes, I'm scared before we even get started. Oh, and say, that reminds me. Men, if just the thought of shaving gives you the willies because you have wiry, hard-to-cut whiskers or tender skin, try this. Shave with Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream. Yes, sir, with Mole, it's smooth. So smooth. It's slick. So slick. It's a smooth, smooth, slick, slick shave you get with M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless cream for tender skins. That's right. Mole is the shaving cream that's heavier, the cream that's especially good for a wiry, hard-to-cut beard or a tender skin. 
Because Mole is heavier, it not only softens your whiskers, it stands them up straighter and your razor clips them off clean as a whistle. So you shave faster, closer, easier, and you shave painlessly with Mole, the heavier brushless cream for tender skins. Mole. And now for tonight's Mole mystery, The Creeper. In the kitchenette of a New York apartment, a man and his wife listened to a morning news broadcast. New York. The unknown killer called the Creeper has struck again, adding a third female corpse to his toe. Virginia Peters, a comely waitress, was found strangled to death in her third floor apartment early this morning while her radio blared. As in the previous murders, a note was found scrawled on the wall with the victim's lipstick and the plea, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Police insist... Why'd you turn it off? How awful. How awful. And in this very neighborhood. Let's hear the rest. It intrigues me. Oh, you. Don't go turning that radio on against Steve Grant. I've heard enough. Go out of my mind, for heaven's sake. That's it. That's a good, solid clue. What is? For heaven's sake. How many men ever use that expression? Oh, shut up. Okay, Mrs. Grant. Pass the biscuits, my little pigeon. Pass the biscuits. Eat, eat, eat. Three women in three days murdered in cold blood by a mad fiend right here in the Heights. I'm too sick to go out, too scared to stay in. The locks broke. And he sits there eating, eating, past the biscuits. There's nothing wrong with my appetite, my love. Well, of course. That's what costs you your job on the police force. Why, <laughs> well, when I even think of it. Some men drink to escape. I eat. Escape what? What? An ugly tongue, a beautiful face, and a roving eye. In short, a wife. ha, <laughs> ha. You're starting that again. You and your crazy jealousy. Maybe that's the creeper's way of escaping, too, Georgia. No. Oh, shut up. Go ahead and get a divorce. Go ahead. Can I help it if men look at me? I don't know why you come home at all. Where do you go? What do you do with yourself? Where were you this morning, and why'd you come back anyway? To eat. <laughs> Someday I'll lose my appetite for that, too. When I do, my dear... There'll be no escape. Well, I'm off again. Kiss? <sighs> Still using stage lipstick. I'll wipe it off. How many times must I tell you? You're married now, remember? Oh, Steve, wait. Yeah? At least go buy me my medicine. Sorry, no time. Oh, don't leave me here alone. Stay home this afternoon. Please. I'm afraid. Ah, don't be silly, pet. Nothing will happen to you. You've a doorman here, an elevator boy, Mrs. Stone across the hall, a phone. You're safe enough. Oh, but the night lock, it doesn't work. Well, now you can't lock me out anymore. Well, something's happened to it since last night. It doesn't catch. Well, get a new one. Well, I can't get a locksman. I've tried all morning. Oh, oh Steve, please. Ah. Oh, all right. If I want to phone you, where will you be? Out. Goodbye, my dear. Take care of your cold. <laughs> Well, 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 Steve Grant, huh? Well, if it isn't old Pearly Chase. You, you got thrown off the force, Steve. Yeah, you got thrown off the news, Pearly. You heard wrong. I wasn't fired. I was just warned. Well, I wasn't fired either. Just suspended for three days. I eat too much. That's my trouble. I drink too much. Here you're living up at the Heights, Steve. Yeah. That's funny. Me too. Here you're married now to a beautiful and lovely young... With admiration. <laughs> I can say that again. Used to be on the stage, you know. Yeah, I think I knew her. Wasn't her stage name Georgia Dixon? Oh, that's her. I love that wench, but... Ah, women. How does a guy handle them? Maybe the creeper has the right method. <laughs> Thank you for taking the words right out of my mouth. Who is the creeper, Steve? Any angles? You tell me and I'll split the reward with you. <laughs> 
Uh, there's one thing, though, and I don't think even the police have put it together yet. Yeah? In all three cases, just before the creepers struck, the door locks had already been tampered with. I'll say. Yeah. You got a theory? Well, sure. I mean, uh, take that note on the wall. For heaven's sake. In every case, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Right. Now, what man uses an expression like that? The long and short of it is this. The creeper is a woman. <laughs> a ruse. Just like the height of the message from the floor is a ruse. Six feet. And yet I'll lay you odds. The creeper's no more than a guy your height, say, or mine. Five nine, just like us, you and me. Only, uh, crazy. How do you figure that? How do I figure lots of things? <laughs> How do I know where the creeper's gonna strike next? You do? Certain. The creeper's not so smart, he's just crazy. You play along crazy, see, and you won't jump ahead of him. That's the trouble with the police, why they're up a tree. You expect logical clues from a madman? No. You play along crazy, make out you're the creeper. What's your compulsion? Go ahead, let's see. All right. The victims are all redheads, every one. You've noticed that, of course. Three and three days. Now that you're they all lived in the Heights, right? Agnes Martin, Jane Krutzky, Selma Davis. Right. What was the number of the apartment in each case? <laughs> Agnes lived in 1A. Jane, 2B. Selma, 3C. Don't ask me the why or the wherefore. Don't ask me the logic. Just play along crazy. You see what I mean? See where he's going to strike next? Mm. Oh, get what The you... next victim of the creeper lives in the Heights. She's a redhead. A night lock's been tampered with. She's going to get hers today. And her apartment number is 4D. Well, why are you staring at me? You don't like my arithmetic? Why are you staring? My wife's a redhead, Pearly. We live in the Heights. And our apartment number is... <laughs> ah, you're just a boozy reporter. <laughs> Your uh, apartment number? 4D, I told you. Uh, 4D, of course. <laughs> I'll, I'll have it delivered. I was busy admiring your lipstick, Mrs. Grant. I've nothing like it in stock. Uh, 4D, I should have guessed it anyway. Why? Well, a face is a number, believe me. Since you've moved into the neighborhood, Mrs. Grant, for me, it has a... It has a special number, like Double Dandy Delicious Dream, 4Ds. You see? <laughs> ha, ha. I'll bet you tell that to every customer, female. I'm a ladies' man, like the creeper? Huh? Uh, oh, what did I say? Well, what's going on in this block? Uh, raw nerves, you, you can't joke. The, the creeper, the creeper, that's all I hear all day. It's mass hysteria. Oh, there ain't such an animal. You, you don't think so? I assure you, Mrs. Grant, it is a fairy tale. For circulation of the tabloids. I'll send you a prescription up for the boy. Oh, no, no, I'll, I'll just wait here for it. Well, it'll take some time. You should go right home and stay there if you're getting over the flu, believe me. I'll deliver it myself. It'll be a pleasure. Oh, no, 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 I'll wait. I, I may not go right back. I don't want to be there all alone. I, I'm afraid. Oh, very well. Uh, suit yourself. Uh, have a seat. For heaven's sake, stop me before I feel more. What? I cannot control myself. <coughs> Wait! That creeper's note I had reference to. I'll set you very gentle. Wait, Mrs. Grant, your prescription! Mrs. <coughs> Grant! Oh, Mrs. Grant! Oh. Oh. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Stone. What's your hurry, dear? Oh, I, I, I just got such a scare. I, since all these awful murders in this neighborhood... Yes, isn't it terrible? You're walking home? Huh, I guess so. I'll go with you. It's good we live in the same house. At least if I had a double lock. But the night one doesn't work. I can't get a locksmith. They're all so busy. But don't you worry. We'll stay together this afternoon till our husbands come home. Think of it. We've never visited, though we live right across the hall from each other. Isn't that like a big city, for heaven's sake? Or would you rather I dropped in on you? Well, I... And make it yours, then. Isn't it terrible, the ghastly things they're saying, the theories? One doesn't know what to expect next. You believe the latest? The latest? That maybe it's a woman, the creeper. A woman? Can you beat it? I can't imagine how in the world the police figured that, for heaven's sake, can you? Well, I... 
I don't know. I, I was just thinking of something my husband said. Though I can see we're a married woman now. If her husband was faithless, say, or perhaps only weak. No will of his own against a vile, cheap thing in skirts. And if the wife, say, was merely getting at those female homebreakers. Well, I can understand such a theory. Because you take my husband now. Mm. You've met Mr. Stone, haven't you? Hmm. Why, Mrs. Grant, why on earth are you staring at me like that, for heaven's sake? Well, I don't feel well. I must get home at once. I feel faint. But Mrs. Grant, for heaven's sake. <laughs> As the curtain falls on Act One of tonight's Mole Mystery, the big question is, is the creeper a man or a woman? Come to think of it, a man wouldn't use the expression, for heaven's sake, would he, Dan? Well, no, Mr. Barnes, but there are times when he might say a lot worse. For instance, sometimes he's apt to say something like, gee... Uh Uh-oh, watch your language. Well, I was only going to say, jeepers, I'd rather face a firing squad than shave. And say, man, if that's the way you feel about your morning shave, chances are you've got wiry whiskers or a tender skin. So try Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skins, and get a shave that's smooth as a waltz. Yes, Mole is a heavier cream. The cream that not only softens your whiskers, but holds them up like a blade of grass and lets your razor mow them down easily. With Mole, you shave faster, closer, easier, and you shave painlessly. Try it, and see if you don't say, it's smooth, so smooth, it's slick, so slick. It's a smooth, smooth, slick, slick shave you get with M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skins. Mole. And now back to Jeffrey Barnes and Act Two of The Creeper. Georgia Grant is in terror that she is to be the next victim of a mad killer known as the Creeper. She suspects everyone she meets, both men and women. Now, in panic, she dashes through the streets, unnerved after an encounter with a neighbor, Mrs. Stone. Good afternoon, ma'am. Out shopping? Oh, I, you're the new doorman, huh? Yeah, just relieving Charlie. Uh, nice weather out. Uh, help you with your packages? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, let me ring the elevator for you. No, you don't have to trouble. Oh, no trouble, ma'am. There. Apartment 4D, huh? Oh, yes. How'd you know? <laughs> Doesn't take long. Going up? Oh, yes, yes. Up and down, up and down. The ups and downs of life, that's me. I'm a living milkshake, Mrs. Grant. Ah. Uh Uh-uh. What's wrong, Jimmy? Stuck. (laughs) Imagine getting stuck between the second and third with a production like you. Get going, sonny. Do you want me to report you? (laughs) Okay, okay. Can't you take a joke? Maybe I, uh... I misconstrued that smile you always give me. Maybe you shouldn't ought to smile that way. Fourth floor. Let me out. (laughs) If I drop in later, would you be more receptive? Oh, oh, thank goodness it'll last. I must have gone out of my mind. Key. Where's my key? This darn lock. This darn lock. Is the locksmith in yet? Well, I want to know how soon I can get my lock changed. Yes, of course I left my order. Hello, Georgia. <gasps> Don't you, you foolish me. You want the whole house to hear? Hey, that's better. What are you doing here? 
I'm playing along crazy. What are you talking about? How'd you get in here? <laughs> Alias Pearly Valentine. Take it easy. You haven't a thing to worry about. I've come to protect you. Give me the phone. Hello? Never mind about the lock, thank you. Well, yeah, long time no see, Georgia. What do you want, Pearly? Me? <laughs> a headline. Your husband wants, too. He wants I should keep an eye on you. What's that? Sure. You didn't think Steve and I were acquainted, did you? Yeah, from way back. Just met him at a bar. I don't believe you. What do you mean, keep an eye on me? Oh, just in case the creeper. <laughs> You've heard of the character? You're mad. You've always been mad, Pearly Chase. Where is he? Why should he send you? Why should he think the creeper will come here? What are you doing here? I told you, playing along crazy. Got a drink? You're drunk now and you're getting right out of here. You're nothing but a no-good rummy. And you're nothing but a no-good... Ah, you finish it. When I took to drink, it was to drown you out, and you know it. I'm still a rum pot, Angel, which means I haven't got rid of you yet. Get out. You little two-timing redhead. You're all the same, you redhead. Why, you... You haven't changed, have you? Even a wedding ring can't do that to you. Oh, come on. Don't play the innocent. My business is snooping. I make a living at it. Between drinks. <laughs> so your new motto's love thy neighbor, huh? Mr. Stone across the hall? Poor dumb Steve. Why, you dirty... <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, darling. Just play along with me while I play along crazy. Sit down. That's <clears throat> it, just like we're expecting company. Oh, I must be crazy doing this. Why wait here for the creeper? Why not a hundred other streets, a thousand other apartments, a million other dames? Because I'm riding my hunch, that's why. Let's have some music. Don't just sit. Let's have some music. Turn on the radio. Let's dance. That's it. Now let's dance. Give me your arm. Let's dance. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, just like old times, huh? Around and around, just like my brain. Why are you trembling? I still love you, you little fool. Come on, ask me why. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, you lovely redhead. I could kill you and you deserve it. With the radio on, you could scream and nobody would hear. I could put my hand on your throat like this, see? And I could strangle <laughs> you. Early, don't! Why are you... Why are you crying? Stop it! I'm here to protect you. Stop crying. Cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it. I can't stand it. I never could! Okay, okay, you want me to leave? You want me to leave? All right, I will. It's your funeral. What am I saving you for anyway? Where's my head? In a few minutes, there'll be a knock or a ring or the door will just open, see? And you'll be lying in a pool of blood just like the other three. Goodbye, my worth. Let's give my regards to the creeper. That look in his eyes. Like a madman's. What if he comes back? He wants to kill me. He wants to kill me. Someone wants to kill me. Like the other three. A pool of blood. Like the other three. Like the other three. Any minute now, there'll be a knock. A ring. <gasps> This is Jeffrey Barnes again. In just a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of The Creeper. Thousands of people who suffer the social and business handicap of dandruff are discovering that the way to combat it effectively is with double dandrine. 
You see, double dandrine is unlike many hair preparations available today. For such products really do no more to fight a common type of dandruff than plain water does. That is, they simply wash loose dandruff away. But double dandrine actually combats this dandruff by killing the germs that many outstanding authorities contend are its cause. And double dandrine kills these germs on contact. Now, a special ingredient named Alzan is the reason for double dandrine's amazing effectiveness. Alzan is an active antiseptic so remarkably efficient, many hospitals use it. And of all hair preparations, only double dandrine has it. So try double dandrine and see if you don't agree that most ordinary hair preparations can't compare with its dandruff-combating effectiveness. If you're not satisfied, return the empty bottle and get your money back. Buy Double Dandrine at your druggist's. Yes? This is the doorman, Mrs. Grant. Yes? The druggist is here with the medicine. Shall I let him come up? The medicine? Why, sure, let him... Oh. Now, don't let that man up. Want me to bring it up? No, no. No, I'm perfectly all right. I don't need it, you hear? Don't you dare come up. Don't anyone. Locksmith? Oh, please. Please, I must have a change right away. My lock. My door lock. Yes, this is Mrs. Grant. Yes, I do want it, of course. Anyone can get in here, anyone. They want to murder me, but I don't know who. It's the creeper. You'll come right away? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, but hurry, please. Hurry, I'll go out of my mind. Oh, 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 oh thank the Lord. What if he doesn't come in time? Like the other three. A pool of blood. Any minute now. There'll be a knock. Or a ring. <laughs> Who's there? It's me, dear, Mrs. Stone. Oh. What do you want? Why, I've been worried about you. Are you ill? No. No, I'm all right, Mrs. Stone. I'm feeling fine. Open up, dear. Don't you want me to keep you company? No. No, thank you. I was just... Stop it! Oh, let me in, silly. No, no, no. Go away. I'm going to sleep. Go away. You hear me? Go away. Hello. Oh, Georgia. You all right? Oh, Steve, Steve. I've been so frantic. It's so good to hear your voice. Where are you? At headquarters. Coming right home. Sweetheart, is anything wrong? You sound... Oh, not now. Not when I hear you, Steve. I, I don't know what came over me all day. I've, I've been imagining things. So silly, my nerves. Forgive me for this morning, darling. I, I wasn't myself. My job had me down, but now everything's... Oh, of course. Okay. Forgive me, Steve. I've been bad, bad, wicked. Oh, if you know what I've gone through today. The most dreadful state. And then that... Oh, Steve, did you send someone here today? Early chase? And you did. To keep you company. Isn't he still with you? I know. I, I just got rid of him. I wish you hadn't. He's an all right guy, smart reporter. Lives in the neighborhood, too. Honey, I know it sounds cockeyed. I mean, Burley's theory, but I was a bit worried when I got to thinking, so... Listen, Georgia, don't let anyone in the house till I get home. Oh, I won't, Steve. Not anyone, do you hear? Not anyone. Oh, oh, wait, Steve. Locksmith. Hello. Oh, wait, Steve. It's... Oh, thank goodness at last. Now I can breathe easy. Just a minute, dear. Hello, Georgia. Georgia, hello. Hi. Hello. Georgia. Oh, thank goodness Georgia, you've come. Please step in. It's the lock on this door hello. I want. Uh, just a moment. My husband's on the phone. Steve. Something else I wanted to... Oh, it's all right. Everything's all right now, Steve. You needn't worry. Didn't I just hear you talking to someone? Was that someone at the door? It was no one, Steve. Just Mr. Frank, the locksmith. Oh, what a load of... locksmith, Georgia, listen. Listen, Georgia, that's what I was going to tell you. What is it? The police are on a new trail. They think maybe a locksmith. Georgia, you listening? It may be that the creeper's a locksmith. (laughs) Get him out, quick. What nice lipstick you use, Mrs. Grant. Hello? 
Hurry. Catch me before I kill more. For heaven's sake. Hello, city desk. Pearly Chase. Now shut up and listen. On that creeper story I just gave you, I had this dope. The reward for his capture goes to the elevator boy. He heard Georgia Grant scream and called a cop. The creeper was shot running from the building. Yeah, it's ironical, isn't it? Imagine the locksmith was the killer. The one man Georgia thought would protect you. What an ending to a lovely, lovely redhead. <laughs> Now, this is Jeffrey Barnes bringing down the final curtain on tonight's presentation of The Creeper. Join us again next week when we present a hard-boiled crime story entitled Spanish Blood and written by one of the greatest names in detective fiction, Raymond Chandler. Mr. Chandler is known to all of you as the writer of the recent hit movie, Murder, My Sweet. So don't miss a real hard-hitting, hard-boiled melodrama next week when we present Raymond Chandler's Spanish blood. The original music for the Mole Mystery Theater is composed and conducted by Alexander Sandler. The Creeper was written by Joseph Ruskol, and Charlotte Manson was featured in tonight's program. This is Dan Seymour saying good night until next Friday at this same time when the Mystery Theater presents Spanish Blood. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Too sure about that, Wentworth. What do you mean? Don't forget that skeleton there. He was once a man, too. Until he was trapped in here. Or murdered. What of it? Oh, nothing. Nothing except... <coughs> Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Line is Dead. <laughs> of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story by Faith Blau is The Line is Dead. The gash in the green lawn of Brookside Memorial Park awaits the body of Albert Lockridge, scientist and explorer. There are few who have followed him to his last resting place, for Albert Lockridge was not one who was prodigal with his affection. And so beside the yawning grave stands his wife, Lenore. Albert. Finishing the short service, the minister says, And so, unto dust, you are now committed. <laughs> you may lower the casket. 
strong hands grasp the straps attached to the coffin. The pulleys sing their discordant dirge. A strange melody heard over the soft weeping of Lenore Lockridge. Suddenly... Listen, Mr. Lockridge. Knocking in the coffin. Albert. Albert, we hear you. We know you're alive. Raise the casket. Raise the casket. Yes, sir. All right, isn't he, Dr. George? He seems to be, but... But uh, what? Well, you can't blame me if I'm a little hesitant in giving my opinion. You mean you're not sure that he'll... That he will? Yes. Oh. After all, Mrs. Lockridge, my position is a little awkward. I signed the death certificate feeling certain that your husband was dead. And now I'm naturally reluctant to predict just what course his convalescence will take. I think I understand. The only thing that really matters is that my husband's lying in his bed at home and not in the cold, black earth of Brookside. Isn't that true? Well, you're a very sensible woman. Albert will get better. Uh, probably. But we'll have to watch his heart. His heart? Uh, these strange spells when his heart seems to stop, uh, when I thought it had stopped. Each attack is an added strain. But the strain of regaining consciousness in the coffin, he withstood that with even a, when even a healthy person might not have. Well, he's a hard person to kill. Oh, thank goodness for that. Well, this time it was a pretty close call. If he'd come to even ten minutes later, Mrs. Lockridge, no one would have ever known. <laughs> Albert, the doctor says you'll be fine if you'll only rest. I, I, I can't rest. I've got to ask you a question. Dear, you've been through so much, too much for any one person, so save any questions you may. No, this question can't wait. That sealed envelope, Lenore, the one on my desk. The one I'm supposed to read after, after your, your... Yes, yes, after I'm dead. Lenore? No, no, you haven't read it, have you? No. No, Albert. I plan to read it after after the funeral, just as you told me to. Sure? You haven't read it? Of course. Get it for me. I want to see it for myself. Albert, no, you've so little strength. But I must know. You will. I must know now. Because if you read it, I don't want to live. Albert, I swear, I swear I haven't. Please believe me. You saw it? No. Look at me. You can see I'm telling the truth. Look at me. Yes. Yes, I think you are telling the truth. Lockridge, another few days, and we'll have you out of that wheelchair. Sometimes I wonder why you go to all this trouble with me, Doctor. It's my job. Yes, but there's so many people who really enjoy life and yet die. Twice now I've been pronounced dead, only to return to life almost reluctantly. Reluctantly? Yes. <laughs> you tried awfully hard to get out of the coffin. <laughs> <laughs> the sheer horror of being buried alive. I've always been terrified of it. Uh, since uh, childhood? Yes. My nurse locked me in a closet whenever I misbehaved. I always thought I'd be left to die there. Oh, it's it's not the fact of being death that bothers me. It's uh, it's the fear of being buried alive. It's the choking, the futility of crying out. Yes, it would be a horrible way to die, but... Excuse me, Doctor. There's a Mr. Burton here to see you, Mr. Lockridge. Good. Show him in, Nurse. Uh, nurse. Take our patient out on the sun porch. I'll send his visitor there. Mr. Lockridge? Sit down, Mr. Burton. Thank you. Nurse, if you don't mind. Not at all. If you need me, just call. Now, Mr. Burton, 
As I understand your business... I'm a telephone engineer specializing in special types of telephone systems. Yes. But perhaps you've read about me in the paper. Yeah. I sure I have. You're the guy who came back from the grave. Yes, I'm the guy who came back from the grave. And it strikes me, Mr. Burton, that an occasion might again arise when I might want to do the same thing. That's why I called you. Come again? Sometime, a doctor again may pronounce me dead. Perhaps I will be. Perhaps I won't. And if I'm not, I'd like to feel that I could call for help. I don't get it. Mr. Burton, in case it should happen again, I'd like you to install a private telephone from this house to my grave. You must promise to keep the phone installed and in working condition for a year after I'm buried. A year? Darling, that doesn't make any sense. With a stop and go, heart of mine doesn't make any sense either. But, Albert, a year. The first time, my heart stopped for six hours. The next time, nearly two days. Who can tell? Well, a week, a month, perhaps. I think I'm asking very little. Well, then think of me, darling. Think of waiting day in and day out for the ring of that telephone. Think of the jumping at every stray bell, at every noise. Darling, you're condemning me to a slow death, like like being in a grave above ground. I still think my request is a modest one. And the least that a wife who loved her husband would do for him. Albert, don't start that again. After all, I shall be in my grave. Perhaps, perhaps I shall be waiting, too, waiting for help that will never come. Will you please stop this morbid talk? Nothing else seems to be on your mind lately. Besides, it's terribly late, almost midnight. When death comes to a man slowly, he gets time to think about it. Too much time. Stop it, please. It seems to me that you are only too anxious to get rid of me. Albert, how can you even think such a thing after... I've been a good wife, haven't I? Yes, but you might have made Oliver Wentworth an even better one. Albert, please, please don't bring that up again. What would have happened if Oliver had come back from that expedition? I don't know. You would have married him, wouldn't you? Perhaps. I don't know. How can you say that? You were engaged to him, weren't you? An engagement doesn't always mean marriage. You did intend to marry him, didn't you? Of course I did. What of it? You know I intended to. And you only changed your mind because he was killed. That's why you turned towards me. Well... I was nothing in your life. You were very sweet to me, Albert, then. I could see that you loved me in your peculiar way. I, I, I appreciated everything you did for me. Appreciate. Oh, Albert, why dig, dig, dig looking for a sore spot? It's not fair to me or to you. I was nothing in your life, was I? As long as Oliver was alive. What are you trying to prove? All the time we've spent together, I've played second fiddle to Oliver Wentworth. Look, Albert Lockridge, when we married, I said I'd put all thoughts of Oliver out of my mind. Well, I've done it. At least... At least? At least what? You mean you've tried, but you couldn't. I knew it. I knew it. You've never loved me. He's always been in your heart. What are you talking about? You just said it. If I had died, you would never have given me another thought. But all the time, here, in my own house, he's been living his own memory, haunting you, haunting us. I can't go on like this. This just can't go on. I've struggled with him long enough. He's got to go. No matter what I have to do to crush his memory, I've got to kill it. I've got... Uh, Albert. Uh, uh, Lenore. What is it? Uh, Lenore, help me, help me. There's a chair in my heart. I've got you. Now, slowly. Slowly. I, I don't think... I can make it. Of course you can. Of course you can. You've got to. All right, yeah. I... <laughs> Doctor, are you sure? Absolutely, Mrs. Lockridge. And this time, the two heart specialists agree with me. But, Doctor, in view of what happened before... We've tried to take that into consideration. But even so... Well, can't you postpone signing the certificate? I'm sorry, Mrs. Lockridge. My colleagues and I all agree that your husband is dead. There can be no delay. Very well, Doctor. Thank you for everything. Goodbye, Mrs. Lockridge. Goodbye, Doctor. Hello? Mr. Burton? This is Mrs. Lockridge speaking. My husband died yesterday. He's to be buried tomorrow at Brookside. Will you please 
be there as he desired to install a telephone in his grave. A man who was afraid, not of death, but of being buried alive. A telephone to a sealed grave and the great beyond. Will we hear from Albert Lockridge again before the clock strikes 12 for... Murder! And now, back to Murder at Midnight and The Line is Dead. One, one minute. Oh, Dr. George. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Lockley. It's awfully nice of you to call. I was worried about you. Oh, I'm all right. I'm fine. I couldn't come to the funeral. I tried to phone you, but... The phone's uh, disconnected. So they said. And so I came over. I rang the bell several times. No answer either. Finally, I knocked. I've had the doorbell disconnected, too. You mustn't cut yourself off from the world like this, Mrs. Lockley. Believe me, doctor, that's not my intention. As long as I stand guard at this telephone, I want to be sure that the only bell that ever rings in this house is the one that tells me that Albert's not dead, that he's still alive there in his coffin, that he needs help. You're really going through with this? He asked me to. It doesn't seem too much. You're only deluding yourself, Mrs. Lockridge, believe me. Waiting this way is only a perverse and completely futile sort of morning. I know you can't understand. I can't. But I do know that this morbid watch will only deepen your grief prevent you from making any kind of adjustment to his death. What difference does it make? You're a young woman, Mrs. Lockridge. You have a whole life ahead of you. All the more reason for spending some of it as he wanted me to. Doctor, my husband was not the sort of person who inspired affection. I know. But in his odd, sometimes unaccountable way, he did love me. Now that he's gone, no one on earth holds any fond memories of him but me. A heavy responsibility, Mrs. Lockridge. Still, uh, you must take care of yourself. I will, Doctor. Assume that he is dead. Warn him, as you will, but don't live in a state of suspended animation. For instance, if he's left a will, don't put off reading it. There are some papers which I was supposed to read after his death. They're in a sealed envelope in his desk. So read them. Uh, read them immediately. No, not yet. Uh, you should. Perhaps they'll contain some message of comfort. Uh, get the envelope now. Not now, Dr. George, but very soon. Just a moment. Yes? Oh. Oh. Lenore. Oh, no. No, I can't. It is. I know I shouldn't have come just like this without warning. But I thought... I've always thought... That I was dead. Yes, I know. That's what Albert told me, and you, you never came back. No. Why? It's a long story, Lenore. A story you ought to hear. You know that Albert died yesterday? I know. That's why I came. Why didn't you come sooner when he was alive? Were you afraid to meet him? I was afraid to meet you. Me? Why, Albert? By the time I returned, you and Albert were already married. But even so, we both would have waited. I wonder. You see, I knew you thought I was dead. No good would have come of such a meeting. But now, now everything is different. Different? Yes, of course. I loved you then. I love you now. Oliver. I've come back for you. Oliver, you don't understand. How, how can I even... Think of such things today. Lenore, I had to come. I've waited so long. I couldn't wait a day longer. Can't you see? It's useless even to think about that now. He may still be alive. I know. No, it's not right just because you do. Not today. I was afraid you'd think so. Lenore, I wanted to avoid this, but... Now I see I must tell you. Lenore... Neither of us knew Albert Lockridge. After all, Oliver, I've lived with him. I still don't think you ever really knew him. I never did, even though I worked with him for many years. That is, until the day we stood in the great hall of the old Aztec temple. The 
temple we found on that last expedition. The one from which I was not supposed to come back from. We were trying to find a door to an inner chamber. There must be an opening here somewhere, Wentworth. Whenever he has a temple ever found, there was always a room near the altar. You used to keep ceremonial objects. I know, I know. Now, wait a hmm? That sounds like a little hollow here. Now, what about that slab on the floor? What about it? I think that it might... It certainly sounds different. Well, if I were an Aztec priest, and I stepped on it like this... What... Went with the door. We found the door. Solid stone. And still working after all these centuries. Let's take a look inside. You got the flashlight? Yes, take the hammer. Right. Oh, it's not very pretty. Uh, it is a human skeleton, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Probably trapped in here and left to die. Ugly death. Look, Lockridge. Those dishes. Hmm, swing the flashlight over. Gold. Solid gold. There are more over here. Look, stacks of them. What's them? We found the treasure. Now, now, wait a minute, Lockridge. Let's get this straight. In the first place, I don't think we'd be let out of the country with these gold plates. How about we, we can melt them down and smuggle them out? Melt them down? Now, these things are priceless. Besides, the university sent us here. The gold belongs to anyone that's there. No one ever has to know. Oh, yes, they do, because I'll tell them. Huh? Huh. It's all very well for you to play the heroic fool. You've everything you want. Hey, what the devil do you mean? You know perfectly well. You've got all the money you need. Besides, you have Lenore. What's she got to do with it? You do have Lenore, haven't you? Well, you act as if I took her from you. You were afraid of me. Oh, Lockridge, don't be an idiot. Lenore would no more look at you. Oh, than wouldn't she? She'd marry me if you went in the way. I know it. Oh, you fool. She's just being friendly to you because I asked her. We'll see. If you weren't around... But I am around. And as far as the gold plates are concerned... I said we'll see. After all, that skeleton there, he was once a man, too. Until he was trapped in here. What of it? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Nothing except... <laughs> I was there in the dark. Flashlight, the gold plates gone. Left there to die. Trapped behind a stone door. Oh, no. No. When Albert Lockridge closed that door in his heart, in his twisted brain, there was only one intention. Murder. How did you get out? By luck more than anything else. I had the hammer and I knew where the stone latch was. I started chipping away at it. This day, I don't know how long it took me, but when I finally got out, I was a sick man, exhausted. And by the time I was well enough to travel, come home here, you were already married. And he told me that you'd been killed by natives. Of course, that was a lie, but... Oliver, I still can't believe that your story is completely true either. But why? A man who's been the victim of an attempted murder would see that the murderer was punished. You didn't. Didn't even try to. Oh, Lenore, how could I? He was your husband. Well, why should that? Could I brand you as the wife of a murderer? Loving you as I did, as I do? I had to wait. But now let's forget this horrible past. I can't, no matter how I feel I can't. After all, there's no proof. Lenore, don't you believe me? It's not me? just that. Don't you see? At any moment, the telephone may ring, telling me that he's alive. If I knew your story were true, perhaps I'd feel differently, but... Well, my place is here. I must stay here. No, no, please. If you feel any love for me at all... Will you go, Oliver? Please. If that's what you wish. Yes, Lenore. I'll go. But remember, I love you. I don't know why it should matter now, but I still hope you told the truth, Oliver, for then. The papers in the sealed envelope. I promised Dr. George I'd read them. Oh, 
Lenore, there are many things on my mind as I sit writing this last word to you. Many things which no human mind should have to bear without telling another. As I look over my life, I know now it has been an empty mind. I've never had a straightforward human emotion and acted on it. My work has been a sort of shadow play which gave my hollow existence an outward tinge of reality. No friend has really touched me, for I cannot be reached. I married you more out of perverse vanity than love. And yet, perhaps because of your loyalty, some spark of love has been kindled in me. Bear this in mind when you go out to the garden. For there, underneath the sundial, you will find a treasure of gold <laughs> which should take care of you when I cannot. I had intended to use this gold myself, but I could not because it might incriminate me in the murder of Oliver oh, Wentworth. People, People might, might ask it. questions, but you... <gasps> the murder of Oliver Wentworth. Then his, sto his story was true. Oliver! Oh, Oliver! <laughs> Oliver! Gone. Well, he can't have gone far, and if I hurry... Oliver! Oliver! Oliver, I'm coming! I'm coming! Telephone ringing, ringing in an empty house. A man who is not dead, lying in his coffin, fighting for breath and waiting, waiting for an answer that will not come. A bidding payment for murder at midnight. <laughs> of Mr. and Mrs. Albert Lockridge were played by Mr. and Mrs. Raymond Edward Johnson with music by Charles Paul. Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept the great sealed book, in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. 
Hear all tales of every kind. Tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of two scoundrels who would stop at nothing for money. A tale called The Ghost Makers. the tale, The Ghost Makers, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. It is an autumn afternoon in the ancient New England village of Wilton. In an old stone house a mile from the town, Agatha Wainwright is serving tea to her nephew Ned, and a little man Ned is introduced as Professor Piedmont, a friend who has come to spend a few weeks with them while he works on a book to be called... Old graveyards of New England. Uh, so this is your graveyard, friend Ned. Uh, he looks like a man who'd be happy staring at tombstones. They make a fascinating study, Miss Wainwright. Well, I'll take your word for it, Professor Piedmont. For myself, I'd rather read about them in a book. The professor not only writes books, Auntie, but he's also an expert on psychic phenomena. Psychic phenomena, eh? Oh, you mean ghosts. Hmm. Foolish fiddle-faddle dreamed up by silly people without the brains to know better. Ah, but Miss Wainwright, I assure you, you are wrong. Oh, nonsense. When a person's dead, he's dead. And I see anything I'm willing to call a ghost, I'll know I'm crazy and I'll admit it. Why, Auntie, this very house is supposed to be haunted. You know that. Oh, rubbish. This is a perfectly normal house. I've lived here a month and I haven't heard so much as a board squeak. Ah, but Miss Wainwright, that may be only because you're new to the house and not yet sensitized. It takes time to become aware of occult influences. Oh, stuff and nonsense. Who started all this talk about ghosts, anyway? Here, here now let's have some tea and no more talk about ghosts. Well, Ned, now that we're alone, suppose you tell me a little more than you put in your letter. I'm still not sure why you sent for me. All right, Professor. This is the gist of it. Three months ago, Aunt Agatha's brother died, leaving her in a state of $400,000. Mm. And I'm Auntie's only living relative. I see. Yes, light begins to dawn. No, wait. My uncle arranged his will so that Aunt Agatha gets only the interest, about 20000 a year, and this house to live in. On her death, the entire estate goes to charity. I'm cut off without a penny. I see your uncle didn't like you, Ned. <laughs> a shrewd man. Very shrewd. Yes, he was making sure I couldn't get my hands on any of it. But that's where you come in. Hmm? If Aunt Agatha were to become, uh, oh, shall we say, ill, mentally ill... <laughs> so that she was incompetent to administer the estate, you mean? Exactly. If Aunt Agatha were to lose her mind through shock or fright... Who but me, her only relative, would be the logical one to administer the estate for her? You would, then. Then you'd have the whole income for as long as she lived. Yes, and part of the principle, too. I know ways to manage it. But I've got to get my hands on some of it before the end of the year. I'm sunk. I owe a little money, about 25000 If I don't get it quickly, well, the people I owe it to are rather short-tempered. I understand. 
Yes, Nate, I remember when I knew you in Chicago. You liked to gamble, didn't you? But that's your affair. Personally, I prefer to stick to my own profession, creating ghosts. Yes, I've heard of some of your jobs, Professor, and some of the ghosts you've created to order. Yes, I pride myself on having a unique occupation, Ned. I believe I'm the only ghost maker there is. And the ghosts I've created have been effective, too. (laughs) So I understand. (laughs) Now, what I want you to do is this. I want Auntie frightened to the point where she... Yes, yes, I understand. Well, Ned, it's going to be difficult. She's a tough-minded woman. Hard to scare. Hard to uh, drive insane. It's got to be done. Got to get my hands on the estate. If you succeed, Professor, there's $5,000 in it for you. Hmm? All right, Ned. I'll try. It won't be easy, but she may crack suddenly when the time comes. That type does, you know. Good. That's settled, then. You brought everything you're apt to need? All my apparatus and gadgets are in my trunk. They'll be here tomorrow. I'm not altogether sure I like this job, Ned. I hope you're not going to turn moral on me, Professor. No, 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 no. There's something about this place that disturbs me, though. You know, I am psychic at times... Not altogether a faker. (laughs) Next you'll be scaring yourself with your own stories. As we were driving past that old cemetery this afternoon, I suddenly felt a premonition and a chill. The kind of chill you're supposed to feel when you go near the place you'll someday be buried. Oh, it was just the wind. Uh, We'll have to get you some red flannels. Here. Here's something that'll give you your courage back. Drink it down. (sighs) Ah... Yeah, that does me good. <laughs> of all the different kinds of spirits, I prefer those in bottles. <laughs> I thought you'd like it. Now, let's go downstairs again. We won't talk about ghosts anymore tonight. But tomorrow night, <laughs> who knows what may come knocking at Aunt Agatha's door. <laughs> <laughs> And now to continue the story as it is written in the sealed book. The following evening, Ned and the professor joined Aunt Agatha by the fireplace where she sat knitting. Outside, a cold winter wind blew. Oh, listen to that wind. We may be in for a storm. Uh, We're in for an early winter, that's what. The first snow will fall any day now. It's good to have a fireplace to sit by when the wind blows like that. Here's the cider and donuts, ma'am. Very well, Emmy. Bring it right in. Ah, cider and donuts. Just what we need on a night like this. Will you have a glass, Mr. Ned? Oh, yes. Thank you, Emmy. Will you have some cider, Professor Piedmont? Professor, Emmy's trying to give you some cider. Uh, Oh, excuse me. I was listening. Thought I heard someone knocking on the front door. Someone knocking? Well, there is someone there. 
Well, they can't be very anxious to get in if that's all the noise they can make. Shall I go see who it is, Miss Agatha? Yes, yes, girl, go see. Though I can't imagine who'd be calling at this hour of the night. Sounded like someone who didn't expect to get in anyway. A timid child, or maybe a ghost. Yes? Yes, who is it? Well? There wasn't anyone there. No one there. Of course there was. Someone knocked, didn't they? But I opened the door and there wasn't anyone there. Then who was knocking? Answer me that. I don't know. But it wasn't anyone... Anyone you can see. Emmy, I'll stand for no foolishness now. No, ma'am. But just the same, there's nobody at the door. Someone's playing tricks on us and I'm going to see who it is. I'll come with you. You won't find anybody there. Well, we'll see. Well, what is it? What do you... There isn't anyone here. No, but there was. They slipped away into the bushes. That's what they did. Yes, yes, of course. Some small boys playing tricks, I suppose. If I catch them, I'll tan their hides. Who was it, Miss Wainwright? Just some boys playing tricks, Professor. That's all it could have been. Come on, Professor. Drink your cider. Uh, What? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Professor, you look like a man who was listening to something then. What was it? Oh, no, no, I assure Uh, you, I... I'm too old not to know when a man is lying, Professor Piedmont. What were you listening to? To tell the truth, I thought I heard voices. What kind of voices? Far away voices, crying something I couldn't make out. I bet it was just the flames in the fireplace. I'm sure it was. (laughs) Of course, that's all it was. (laughs) Well, what do you say we all turn in? This New England air makes me sleepy. Hmm. Knocks at the door when there's nobody there. Voices. Yes, it's high time we were all in bed instead of sitting around here imagining such nonsensical things. Highly pleased with their first effort in creating ghosts that didn't exist, Ned and Professor Piedmont went to bed. But before they retired, they held a brief, low-voiced conference in Ned's room. Well, Professor, that door-knocking act was all right. You did it very nicely. Yes, Ned. An ordinary length of black thread run through a crack in the window sash and attach the door-knocker can create a very satisfactory ghost indeed. Now tell me, (laughs) what comes next on the program? Well, we can't work too fast. Tomorrow, the hired girl, Emmy, will spread the story of tonight's happenings. The whole town will start talking about it. Good. And then? And tomorrow night, nothing happens. Your Aunt Emmy is reassured. But tomorrow, I'll be busy. I noticed today there's an old hollow tree in the woods about a hundred feet from the house. Mm, what about it? I'll run wires to it, hiding them under the leaves, and install a small loudspeaker in it. I'll conceal the microphone and batteries behind the drapes in the living room. (laughs) I see. So two nights from now, we'll hear ghostly voices, eh? (laughs) Exactly. They'll accompany the ghostly knocks on the door. But that won't be all. (laughs) There'll be other surprises on the program. (laughs) Professor, remind me to tell you sometime that you're about as unpleasant an old rascal as I've ever met. (laughs) (laughs) The next evening, Agatha Wainwright listened nervously for a repetition of the ghostly knocks. But nothing happened, and she regained her composure. The evening following that, however, as she and Ned and the professor sat in the living room around the fire... Uh, Nine o'clock. The evening may just be starting in New York, but here in Wilton, it's bedtime. Hmm, seems to be someone at the door. So there is. Shall I go? No, Emmy can answer the door. She does little enough to earn her money. Emmy? Emmy? Yes, Miss Agatha? There's someone at the door. See who it is, please. Why, must I, Miss Agatha? Must you, indeed. Answer the door, Emmy. I'd... I'd rather not, ma'am. Emmy, see who is at the door. Yes, Miss Agatha. I'm going. Who is it? There's no one there. There's no one there again. Emmy, get control of yourself. But I tell you, there's no one there. Then it's someone playing tricks. That's all you hear, Emmy. Yes. Yes, Miss Agatha, I hear. But I don't believe it. Go to your room. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, Miss Agatha. But there wasn't anyone there. I hope I'm not going to have to discharge that girl. Shall I go this time, Auntie? No, Ned. Let 
the rascals play their tricks, whoever they are. They'll soon stop when they see we pay no attention. I wonder if I could see them from the window. Maybe we could trap them if we were to go quietly out the back door and slip around to the front. What was that? Someone calling. Really? I don't hear anyone. It's someone calling to us to let him in. Strange. I can't hear it. You must have heard it, Ned. It was perfectly plain. There are some voices certain people can hear and others can't. If there's someone calling, we'd better take a look. Come on, Eddie. We'll see what goes on. Who's there? Show yourself, whoever you are. The yard's perfectly empty. No. There isn't a soul in sight. Both the knocking and the voices seem to have stopped. Perhaps we ought to search the yard and... <clears throat> and Agatha, look. Eh? Gone at the edge of the trees. Lights. Three balls of light moving around just above the ground. Really? Three spheres of light? And dear me, luminous spheres are common manifestations of spiritual presences. Oh, nonsense. And... They're just two will-o'-the-wisps, that's all. Whatever they are, we're going to see. Come on, Professor. If it's a trick, we'll soon know. Oh, yes, Ned. Uh, wait for me. Don't scare them away. I want to see what they look like. Ned! Ned, they're rising. They're floating away by the trees. And Agatha. Annie, are you all right? Shall I get a doctor for you? What do, do you... I want with a doctor? I'm all right. I'm an old fool carrying on like that. Just because of some will of the wisps or whatever it was. I, I shan't do it again, I promise you. You need not be ashamed, Miss Wainwright. Unless I'm much mistaken, we've witnessed a psychic visitation of a kind unsurpassed in my suspense. No oh, stuff and nonsense, Professor. You may believe in spirits, but I don't. I never have believed in ghosts, and I'm not going to stop now. It was just that it was, well, unexpected. In the days that followed, Ned Wainwright and Professor Piedmont found it impossible to shake Agatha Wainwright's iron nerves. Emmy, the hired girl, resigned in terror. But Agatha remained seemingly unmoved. Resolutely, she ignored the ghostly knocks, voices, and footsteps that Professor Piedmont's ingenuity devised. The whole town buzzed with tales of her haunted house, but she refused to pay any attention to them. After a month had gone by, Ned was ready to admit defeat. Well, Professor, you're a washout. And Agatha hasn't turned a hair at your ghost. No, Ned, I told you it might take a long time. She's a very strong-minded woman. Believe me, anyone else would have cracked by now. Well, she hasn't, and she's not going to. I still say it may happen all at once. She's nervous and distraught. She doesn't sleep well. Every evening she sits listening for ghostly voices, though she won't admit it. But she's made up her mind not to believe in ghosts. And I'm afraid she never will. Well, what do you suggest? It's the middle of December. I've got to get my hands on her money by the end of the year, and I'm sunk. We must play our last card. You. Me? What do you mean? She's fond of you. You're her only relative. What are you getting at? How would she feel if you, her only relative, were to die and come back here as a ghost? I don't follow you. My plan is simple. We'll say goodbye to your aunt and drive off as if we were going away. Then, secretly in the night, we'll return to the house. Yes? And then what? We'll see to it that she receives a phone call from a friend of mine in Boston. He'll announce to your aunt that you and I have been in an automobile accident, and that we've been killed. Oh, I see. Yes, I begin to understand. Uh, immediately after the phone call, we'll knock. She'll come to the door and see us standing there. And having just heard that we're both dead... Exactly. And if that doesn't work, Ned, we are defeated. But it'll be a strong mind indeed that can withstand such a shock... A strong mind indeed.
And now to continue the story, as it is written in the sealed book. Two days later, Ned and Professor Piedmont said goodbye to Agatha and drove away. It was starting to snow as they left, so they made their way by a roundabout route to an isolated roadhouse, and there they spent the day waiting. After darkness had fallen, they started back towards Aunt Agatha's house. By now, there was snow feet deep on the road, and the cold blast of the north wind made even the heated interior of the car uncomfortable. I'll be dead when this is over, Ned. The thermometer must be down to zero. Yes, at least. Well, we're almost there. We'll drive up to within a hundred yards of the house and wait in the car with the heater on. What time did you arrange to have that phone call made from Boston? At nine o'clock, exactly. We want to knock the instant after she gets it. Right. Isn't that our turn there? I think so. This snow makes it so hard to see that... Professor, look out. We're going up the road. Look out. Ned! Ned! Are you hurt? Uh, my ankle. I'll be out of here. <clears throat> Come on. Uh, hurry, Ned. I smell gasoline. The car may catch on fire. All right. Help me onto the road. Yes, yes. <clears throat> what happened? We skidded down a ten-foot bank and turned completely over. Well, if you'd watched where you were going, it wouldn't have happened. I couldn't tell. There was ice under the snow. No, but never mind that. We've got to get to shelter. And I think my ankle's broken. Yes, I can't step on it. Yes, you can lean on me. But where are we? A quarter of a mile from Aunt Agatha's. There isn't another house within a mile. Then come on, we've got to get there quick. Lean on me. Help all you can. If we don't get there soon, we'll freeze to death. An hour later, numb with cold and scarcely able to struggle on, Ned and Professor Piedmont staggered up to Agatha Wainwright's house. The windows all had heavy wooden shutters over them, shutters they themselves had helped Agatha put in place to keep out anything that might come knocking at the door in the night. But through the small pane of glass in the front door, light showed as they stumbled thankfully up the steps. Kevin, we're here. We couldn't have gone another hundred yards. Oh, no, I, I'm almost frozen. We've got to get inside. Yes. Here, help me. All right. Uh, one more step. Uh, there. Uh, Ned, the phone call from Boston. What time is it now? Time? Like, it's nine. Nine o'clock exactly. And knock quickly. We've got to get inside before that phone call comes. Inside, Agatha Wainwright heard the knocking. But before she could go to the door, the telephone rang and she answered it first. Hello? Yes, this is Wilton, 317. Boston, calling long distance? Yes, I'll hold on. Just a minute. Hello? Yes, this is Miss Wainwright speaking. The Boston General Hospital. My nephew Ned. What is it? What's happened to him? Oh, dead. An automobile accident. Both of them killed? No. Oh, no. Yes, yes, I'm all right. Thank you for letting me know. I'll come in the morning. Ned? Killed. Oh, no. No, no, he can't be. It's Ned. Let me in. Let me in. Ned. Ned's dead. He's been killed. Let me in, please, Aunt Agatha. It's Ned. Let me in. No. Ned's dead. Ned's dead. Let us in. Let us in. No. You can't be Ned. Ned was killed. He's dead. Aunt Agatha, please. It must be Ned's ghost. The professor was right. There are ghosts. It's Ned's ghost out there. Agatha! Oh, please, get that out here! Please, let me in! No! No, you can't come in! You're a ghost! You're Ned's ghost! You can't come in! I won't let a ghost in here! I won't! The next morning, 
Ned and Professor Piedmont were found frozen to death beside the house, where they made a vain effort to pry open the heavy wooden shutters that covered the window. You see, Agatha never did let them in. She knew better than to open the door to ghosts. the tale we tell next time. This one? Ah, yes. Why, this is amazing. It's a tale of murder. Queer, unexpected, fiendish murder. Murder of a very different and unusual kind. A tale such as you've never heard before. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Seal Book. The Seal Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. Strange Wills. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Lorene Tuttle and John Brown with Howard Culver and an all star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We cannot attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is Warren William bringing you the story of The Girl from Shadowland. But first, a word from your announcer. From Shadowland, with Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. This honorable probate court is now in session. Be seated, please. You may call the first case, Mr. Clerk. The probate case of Lucifer Nikolai, deceased. If the court please, I would like to mention very briefly the background of this, well, unusual matter. 
You may proceed, Mr. O'Connell. Lucifer Nikolai, perhaps I should say Professor Lucifer Nikolai, deceased, left a last will and a testament which I wish to bring to the attention of this honorable court. Has the estate of the late professor been inventoried? Yes, Your Honor. The entire estate is of no monetary value. It consists of a diary. The diary of Professor Lucifer Nikolai. Perhaps the diary has sentimental value. To whom was it left? If the court please, the deceased has no heirs, no next of kin. He left his diary, in his own words, to a world of fools and skeptics. Have you read the diary, Mr. O'Connell? Unfortunately, I have. In your opinion, has it any practical value or scientific data that may prove of value to humanity? That, Your Honor, I am not in a position to answer. This much I can say, however. Professor Lucifer Nikolai was either the greatest scientist of all time, or he succeeds Ananias as the king of liars. <laughs> With the uh, court's permission... I would like to read the diary of the late Professor Nikolai. And at the conclusion thereof, let the court determine what should be done with this only asset of the late Professor's estate. Very well. You may proceed, Mr. O'Connell. The diary of the late Professor begins on the fifth day of May, 1941. His first entry reads as follows. For the last ten years, I have been preparing myself for this, the greatest scientific experiment the world has ever known. Man has conquered the present, pierced the future, and I, yes, I shall uncover the past. It's a scientific fact that every act that has occurred on this earth since the beginning of time has been permanently photographed on light waves. These waves, as we know, travel at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. If then it is possible for science to make the mind travel at a faster rate of speed, it can catch up and pass these light waves, which have been present since the very creation of life. The dark ages of history shall be pierced, and man's concept of life shall be shaken unto its very foundations. For ten years I have been experimenting with electrical impulses that will separate the mind from the body and direct it at incredible speed into the shadowland of the past. I am now ready. This day I shall choose the shut subject for my experiment. And uh, how old are you, young lady? I'm 21, sir. You stated you are an orphan? Yes, for as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. Alice, uh, your application says that you like to read, that you have a good imagination. Oh, yes, sir, that's right. I do like to read. Oh, all sorts of books. And I like to imagine that I... Yes, I know. You are the beautiful girl who falls in love with the hero. Hmm? Yes. <laughs> yes. But not always, Professor. Once I imagined that I visited the moon... And then, when I read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, I was... A whale, no doubt. <laughs> oh, no, Professor. Oh, no. I was a mermaid. A beautiful mermaid. Mm. Well, Alice, where I'm going to send you will make all these other places seem like a, a trip on the subway. Oh, Professor, I love to travel. And you shall, too, young lady. In fact, at a speed that you never believed possible. No one ever dreamed it possible. You shall travel at the speed of almost 500,000 miles per second. 500,000 miles a second? Oh, that sounds awfully fast, Professor. <laughs> I didn't know they made planes that could this go that... This won't be on a plane, Alice. No? Why well, else could anyone go that fast? You shall see, Alice. You shall see. <laughs> The next entry is dated June 12, 1941. It reads, I am ready for my first experiment into Shadowland. My home in this desolate part of the state has been transformed into an electrical workshop. Alice is calm, at ease. I have given her a sedative to rest her nerves before she takes off on her first journey. I do not want her to go too far, only back to the Middle Ages. Yes, yeah, only back to the Middle Ages. Now, Alice, don't be frightened with all this electrical equipment. It's, uh, well, it's like a spaceship, ready to take you away. 
looks scary. Now, walk over here with me to this chair. Mm. Uh, careful not to trip on any of the wires. Oh, oh yes, Professor. Now, sit down, please. Mm. I want to tell you what's going to happen so that you won't be frightened. Oh? Alice, I am going to separate your mind from your body. Separate my mind from my body? Oh, Professor, no, no. I'm going to send your mind out into space. You're going to see things and go places that no living human being has ever been before. Will I come back, Professor? Oh, of course you will. In fact, really, you'll never leave this room. Only your mind will make the trip. And while you're gone, your mind will talk to me through your lips. Where am I going, Professor? You're going back to the early Middle Ages, Alice. Back to... Back to the early Middle Ages? Well, how, how oh, can I go there? Don't worry about that. That's my job. I want you to tell me everything you see. Everything. Alice, if our experiment works, next time I shall send you back even further. Back to the glamorous days of Antony and Cleopatra. Oh. You shall float down the Nile in a silken barge. Oh, I would adore seeing her. Cleopatra, the most beautiful of all women. But the thought frightens me. Oh, don't be frightened, Alice, please. Believe me, you will be safe. Now then, if you're ready, sit back and relax. Professor? Yes, Alice? This looks just like a picture of an electric chair I saw once in a newspaper. What is it? This is known as electromagnetic radiation. It will shock the mind loose from the body and send it flying into light. These waves of light which we will pass will recreate, even down to the minutest detail, the events of the past. But how will when I... When I shut off the dynamo, your mind will stop its journey and remain stationary on a certain light wave. According to my calculations, that light wave should be one from the Middle Ages. After you have seen and told me everything, I shall start the dynamo and bring you safely back. Do you understand? All I know is that I'm going somewhere awfully fast. And that wherever you go, no one of today has ever been. All right, I shall start the electricity. Oh. Look into my eyes, Alice. Look. Look. You're tired. So sleepy. Mm. You cannot hold your eyes open another moment. They're closing. Closing. Mm. Your head is nodding. You're asleep. Mm. Asleep. Mm. Yes, you're asleep. And ready to travel on your mm. first journey to Shadowland. Now I press a button, and your mind, it is off on a long journey. What will happen to it? We shall soon know. Yes, we shall soon know. Twelve hundred, nine hundred, seven hundred, six hundred. There, it's far enough. I shall stop between the years five and six hundred. Now, now we're ready to learn the first secret from the dark past. Speak, Alice. Speak. Where are you? What do you see? Hurry, hurry. I must bring you back soon. There's but little time. She has long, beautiful yellow golden hair. Her dress is long and flowing. Her eyes are blue and smiling. She is so beautiful. So beautiful. There was a man upon a horse. A white horse. His face is covered with a visor. His body is concealed in a coat of mail. He's riding up to where she is sitting. Seest thou well, my dearest Guinevere? Aye, my king and master. From this hilltop I can see the justing ground from end to end. And even more. And even more, my queen? There's not else but forest and glen. Oh, I can clearly see the brave knights of the round table in shining armor astride their steeds. See, Arthur, beloved, how they cast their glances upward. They're anxiously waiting for their beloved king and leader to join them. I shall join them anon. Arthur, against whom dost thou ride this day? Charles of Melton, a splendid knight and an able horseman. Tis said he is the justing champion of the lowlands. Then, my lord... Be on guard, or my king and master may perchance find himself unhorsed. King Arthur unhorsed? Ah, oh, thou jokest, Guinevere. Truly thy tongue dost wag in a manner uncontrolled. 
By my yellow beard, I swear that the seat of Charles of Melton will feel the greensward in the very first rush. And I shall make fair wager with thee. Wager? What have I to wager, my lord, but the great love I bear thee? I wager a kiss against a kiss. That ye shall hear the multitudes below cry out the name of their king in final token of victory. A kiss against a kiss. Tis done, my lord. I shall accept the wager. Might I offer thee a flower from my hair in token of early victory? Wait. Here it is. A flower plucked from hair of gold. Tis well. Tis well. Victory is now a certainty. Oh, purse thy lips, beloved. I shall return to feast upon their honey. Farewell, Guinevere. Farewell. Arthur. Yes, beloved. I shall purse my lips in eager readiness, whether it be victory or defeat. Picture fading. I'm going tired. Tired. Wait, Alice. I shall bring you back. Yes, I shall bring you back. But we have won, Alice. For the first time since creation, we know how to pierce the veil of Shadowland. All the secrets of the past are ours. I shall show these idiots what a mastermind can do. Yes, I shall show them. Part two of The Girl from Shadowland in just a moment. But first, a brief message from your announcer. Back to The Girl from Shadowland with Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. Professor Nikolai's diary continues. November 3rd, 1941. The last few months have been spent in improving the electrical impulses of my equipment in order to bring even greater cosmic speed to the journey which Alice will soon take. Everything is ready for this new experiment. Alice has rested and has regained the youthful appearance which she lost after her last trip. For I know now that only youth can withstand the rigors of these journeys into Shadowland. At four o'clock, she comes into my laboratory. She is anxious now to begin her trip. She's had a strange look in her eyes that bothers me. Lately, she's been losing interest in worldly matters and speaks only of her experiences in the mystic realm of Shadowland. I wonder what will happen to her this trip. Please hurry, Professor. Please hurry. I've waited so long to go back. Just a moment, Alice. Just a moment. And then you shall be off. Off on a tremendous new adventure. Will I see the lovely lady with the golden hair? The one who is called Guinevere? No, no, Alice. But you shall see something far more interesting. Much, much older. You shall see one of the secrets of civilization. You shall see if my calculations are correct... The building of the Great Pyramid. What? Well, that's in Egypt, isn't it, Professor? Yes, you're right, Egypt. But the Egypt of over 5,000 years ago. 
5,000 years ago. Think of it, Alice. Oh. You shall actually witness the building of this phenomenon of man. One of his greatest miracles. Each 5,000 years ago. Oh, how wonderful. Yes. There we are. Relax, please. That's it. Now then, look at me. Into my eyes. You're tired. So tired. Mm -hmm. Close your eyes, Alice. Close mm -hmm. them. Oh, so slowly. You see, you can't open them now. Because you're sleepy. Sleepy. So sleepy. And now you're going away for a little while. Going out into Shadowland. Your own Shadowland. That no one has ever visited. I shall turn on the current. Slowly at first. So slowly. I must not hurt your precious mind. Now I increase the volume. Very, very carefully. And now the shock. I press this little button. Your mind is freed. Freed from your tired body. You're now on your way to Shadowland. 18th century. 14th. 10th. 7th. 3rd. 1000 B.C. 2000 B.C. You're nearing the end of your journey just a while longer. 3000. Yes, you're there. I shall stop the motor. I can't stop it. I can't stop it. 6,000. 14,000. 60,000. 90. 200. 250,000. 250,000 B.C. 250,000 years before Christ. What will she see? What will she see? Speak to me, Alice. What do you see? I see a man. But he's not really a man. His body is covered with fur. He looks like an ape. There's steam. Steam everywhere. It's a swamp. The man walks on his hands and his feet... And now he's standing up and looking over the steaming swamp. He carries a huge club in his furry hand. <gasps> he hears something. He's hiding behind a large fern. There's a strange creature coming out of the swamp. It looks like a snake, but it has fat, short legs. Its tongue darts out as though it senses the presence of this, this, this ape man. Its tail is huge. So long I can't see all of it. It swings from side to side, knocking over plants and trees. This, this reptile's eyes are small, red, terrifying. Now this ape-like man has stepped out into the open. He is facing this horrible creature. He's raising his club. The ape man struck the creature on the head. It looks stunned. It has raised up its body. It's looking down on the ape man. His eyes are red. Flaming red. Ugly. It's trying to grasp the ape man between his short, powerful legs. The ape man is backing away. Now he's circling the animal. Oh, he's tripped. He's fallen. He has his huge feet on the ape man's body. It's going to crush him. But wait. Wait. The ape man has escaped. He's on his feet. He's circling again. He's... Now... He stuck the creature again on the head. He's raining clothes on his body. The huge animal is stunned. The ape man yells. The beast has fallen on his side. The ape man is staggering. His fur is covered with blood. He's walking carefully up to the head of this jungle creature. He touches it with his foot. The creature is dead. The ape man cries out in victory. He has won. I'm bringing Alice back. I'm greatly worried and perturbed. A change is taking place in her. The forehead is receding. And the contour of her head seems to be changing. I see a slight fuzz appearing on her face and arms. Her eyes seem to be receding into her head. They're growing smaller. Or, or maybe 
Maybe I'm losing my mind. I'm afraid I, I've left her too long in the outer darkness. In just a few more minutes, she will return. Just a few more minutes. Alice, just a few more minutes, and you shall be back. She's still changing in physical appearance. Her shoulders and neck are completely covered with soft fur. What is happening? What is happening? I must write quickly in order that posterity and science will know what is taking place and that I have succeeded in this, the greatest scientific experiment of all time. I have rediscovered the past. I therefore control the future. The world is mine. I am the master of creation. Oh, oh she's back. She's back. Perhaps I was not too late after all. No, no, it can't be. Alice, Alice, stay there. Don't break your straps. No, no, don't come near me. I'll save you. I'll save you. No, Alice, no, you fool. The world is ours. We are masters of destiny. No, no, no. And that, if the court please, is the last entry in this weird fantasy that Professor Lucifer Nikolai left to posterity and the world. Well, Mr. Connell, I must say it's rather an unusual, terrifying legacy. But um, what is your answer to this ending? Of course, the man was mad. Is that not your opinion as well? <laughs> well, Your Honor, considering that there's no proof of what actually took place, in fact, no proof that there ever was even a girl named Alice... The answer must be that the professor was actually mad. However, I personally examined the laboratory. I interviewed the neighbors. I took down the sworn statement of George Montgomery, who was the first to enter the laboratory after he heard the doctor scream. My son and I heard a terrible scream from this man's house as we were driving by, and, and we ran in. The door to the room where he had all of this electrical equipment was locked, and, and we had to break it down. Door's locked, son. I'll have to break it in. Here, Dad, let me help. I don't know what we heard in here. It sounded like murder. Here, take this cane. Come on, let's go. Okay, Dad. It came from in here. Hey, wait. Wait, I'll, I'll open the door. Okay. Good heavens. Looks like a cyclone struck. Dad, Dad, look. There's a man lying over there under the window. He's dead. Dead as a mackerel. Look at those welts on his neck, strangled. And those marks look as though the hands were huge and strong. Gee, Dad, look. All this machinery in here, it's all tipped over and broken. Yes. I've heard that the dead man was a scientist of some kind or other. Never let anyone come in. Well, I'd better telephone the police. Say, Dad. Yes, son? Did you see anyone in this room when we first came in? See anyone in the room? What do you mean? Well, gee, I thought... Well, maybe not. Speak up, son. Tell me what you saw. Oh, ga gosh, Dad, I, I thought I saw a big gorilla step out the window just as we came in. Honest, I did, Dad, honest. Of course, Mr. O'Connell, this was just the imagination of a boy. There was no gorilla, was there? But there might have been, Your Honor. You see... One of the gorillas from Slade Circus escaped just three days prior to this unusual incident. But I was informed that it was recaptured about two weeks later and is now back with the circus. They claim that it was a young female, the pet of the circus, and utterly harmless. So the professor might have been killed by the gorilla. Or by Alice. I see. Well, what is your opinion in the matter of Professor Nikolai's diary, Mr. O'Connell? I suggest, if the court please... And that because nothing contained therein has any substantiation in fact, that the said diary be turned over to the medical branch of State College for further study and contemplation by their psychiatric experts. Warren William will be back in just a moment. But first, here is a word from your announcer.
And here again is Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. Is there any doubt in your minds but what the late Professor Lucifer Nikolai was mad? Well, <laughs> there isn't any in mine. No, sir. I want to sleep nights. Next week, I have a story to tell you that to say is different is putting it mildly. An emerald prospector down in Colombia saw a picture in an old magazine which he found in the jungle. It was a girl's picture, but more, it was the picture of Patsy Bubbles Moran, queen of burlesque. Well, our old prospector then and there decided to leave his emerald mine to this charming and alluring girl. And uh, did she take the emerald mine? Well, <laughs> as Grant took Richmond, so did Bubbles Moran ahead for Columbia. But what happened after her she arrived is another matter. We call this unusual story, Emeralds Come High. This is Warren William, inviting you to be with us again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and directed by Robert Webster Light. Names, places, and events have been changed so that no reflection can fall on any person or persons, living or dead. This is a Telaways feature produced in Hollywood. tonight are Mr. John Sutton, who appears as a young English doctor, Jim Norwood, who knew a great deal more than he admitted concerning the strange events which we are about to relate, and Mr. George Zuko, who plays the village curate, the Reverend Arthur Morley. Our story, and it bears none but a coincidental resemblance to H.G. Wells' famous short novel, The Invisible Man, is by John Dixon Carr, and is called The Man Without a Body. Tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series of tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with a man without a body and the performances of John Sutton and George Zuko. We again hope to keep you in... Suspense. A lonely beach of low white sand hills edged by the surf of the North Sea. And back from the beach, drowsing as it has drowsed for ten centuries, lies the village of Aldbridge in Suffolk. There is the seawall now defaced by air raid shelters. And there are the rolling grain fields, the thatched white cottages, the spire of St. Luke's Church above the oak trees, ancient and bell-haunted, lost among hedgerows. This village could never cause consternation in London newspaper offices. And yet, on that warm night nearly four years ago... This time it's really happened. A man without a body, completely invisible. Toby boy. Come about. Look at this dispatch. Reign of terror in Suffolk Village. Has another of H.G. Wells' romances come true? An invisible man? I can't believe it. Uh, what's the matter with that village? Are they all gone scatty? Mr. George Wellman, builder, states that as he was returning home along the main road from Bury St. Edmunds... He distinctly saw a man's hat without any head under it. 
moving towards him about six feet above the ground. Oh, George, must have been full of beer. We can't use this story. Copy, boy! Even more surprising evidence was given by the Reverend Arthur Morley, vicar of St. Luke's Church. Who? The parson? You don't think he was full of beer? One question above all agitates the village. Who is Professor Ansmith? Who is this elderly American, said to be an inventor, who has settled at Aldridge and leased a part of the house belonging to the local doctor? Out of some terrifying workshop, to strike like a maniac, where least expected, has there at last emerged... A real, invisible man? The Church of St. Luke, Aldridge, on that same Sunday evening. The evening service is over now, though an echo of bells still lingers. In the vestry at the rear of the church, where white surplices hang like ghosts, the Reverend Arthur Morley sits with his daughter Janice. It is a stone room of painted windows, now many colored in the sunset. And here, as the drowsy summer light turns to dusk, Janice, I don't believe it. I know, Father. I saw it with my own eyes, yet I don't believe it. You don't think we were dreaming, do you? No, Father. We weren't dreaming. If this goes on, the whole village will be in a frenzy. And what can I do? We could go to Professor Ansmith and ask him straight out. Ask him whether he's responsible for these... Yes. I wonder, Janice. A man isn't hurting anybody, you know. You couldn't ask for a quieter person or a better neighbor. And yet... What's that? Father, you are upset. It's only Mr. Emmett coming down from the belfry. Emmett? Oh, yes, of course. Is that you, Mr. Emmett? Uh, it's me, all right, sir. And very much in the flesh. Did, <coughs> did you think I was the invisible man? Mr. Emmett, I forbid you to mention that subject. Uh, very good, sir. But there's others begging your pardon that do mention it. Oh, yes, yes, forgive me. I spoke too sharply. Oh, that's all right, sir. No arm done, no bones broken. Mind you not that I hold with this talk about invisible men. It ain't natural, I say. It ain't hardly Christian. I'm a greengrocer by trade, and I believe in what I can weigh and feel and... Uh... What's the matter, Mr. Emmett? Is anything wrong? Excuse me, sir. And you too, miss. Do you see anybody in this room except us? No. Of course not. Why? Because I, I could have sworn something brushed past me just now. You're imagining things, Mr. Emmett. Yes, sir, I, I dare say, There's but, nobody uh... hidden in the belfry tower, I hope. No, sir. I had a look-see. And what's more, there's not going to be anybody up there once I've locked the door. Now, let the blighter try and get in. Oh, please, Mr. Emmett. And you too, Father. You're talking about this invisible man as though, as though he actually existed. There's something funny going on, miss. You can't deny that. No, none of us can deny it. And what's more, sir, it's getting pretty dark in here. Hadn't you and Miss Janice better get along to the vicarage while I lock up? No, we can't go just yet, Miss Reynolds. We're expecting Dr. Norwood. Dr. Jim Norwood, sir? What does he say about all this? Oh, you might ask him yourself, Miss Reynolds. I think that's probably him now. Come in. The vestry door's not locked. Oh, hello, Padre. Hello, Janice. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, hello, Jim. You seem a good deal out of breath. Oh, I am out of breath, Janice. Because there's blue blazes to pay down in the village. Not more trouble. Yes, I'm afraid so. They're holding a mass meeting at the Coach and Horses, and they're ready to murder Professor Ann Smith. If this invisible man cuts any more capers, we may see a real old-fashioned lynching in an English village. Now, look here, my boy. This has got to stop. I know that, Padre, but how are we going to stop it? Sit down there, Jim, across the table for me. Yes, sir. First of all, what do you know about this Professor Ann Smith? Nothing, sir. Nothing at all. But you've been part of your house to him. Oh, my dear Padre, that house is twice as big as I can possibly manage. I was only too glad to get a tenant. He gave you references, I imagine? Yes, but I didn't bother to check him. He's a quiet old boy. Pays his rent on the dot. Never does anything except read and go for long walks. Are you quite sure of that, Jim? The village has war nerves, that's all. With the camouflage aerodrome in the neighborhood, they're apt to imagine anything. True, perhaps, but... Uh... That talk about dynamos humming in the old boy's room and blue lights flashing is rubbish out of a sensational film. They imagine the whole thing. Finally, this crazy story about an invisible man playing the gramophone. Why, it's that's... It's not a crazy story, Jim. Janice and I saw it happen. You what? Last night, about half past nine, Janice and I were out for a walk in the lane that runs past your house. On the way, we met Willie Kendrick, and he joined us. Well, sir? Listen, Jim. 
On that side of the house, there's a little square room with two windows and no furniture except a round table and a couple of chairs. Do you know the one we mean? Yes, of course. Professor Ann Smith uses it. What about the room? It wasn't quite blackout time. The windows were up. The curtains weren't drawn. And the room was brightly lighted. On the table stood an old-fashioned gramophone with a horn and a crank handle. Beside it lay a pair of white cotton gloves, like... like gardener's gloves. The gramophone was playing away for dear life, but there was nobody in the room. Janice thought that was a bit odd, a gramophone going full tilt with nobody there, and called my attention to it. Just then, the gramophone started to run down. We could hear the record slow and go off key. As it did so... Well, sir, go on. As it did so, those white gloves got up off the table. Got up off the table? Got up off the table, took hold of the gramophone, and wound it up again. <laughs> Mr. Ellis, what on earth are you doing? Uh, uh, I dropped some candlesticks. So I see. Please pick them up again. Yes. Padre, are you serious? Perfectly serious. A pair of gloves without any hands inside them? Yes. But what did they do exactly? The left hand glove steadied the gramophone. The right hand glove wound it up. Then they both hung in the air, beating time to the music. It should have been funny. I can only assure you it was not funny. Oh, what happened then? Oh, Jim, it was horrible. Willie Kendrick let out a yell and ran down the lane between the apple trees as though the devil were after him. I can't say I blame him. Father well, and I just stood there and, and... Stared is the word, my dear. Yes, stared. I can't forget any of it. The three-legged table and the whirling record and the blue flowers on the wallpaper. But there was nobody there. We could see past the table and under the table and all over the room. And there was nobody there. Except the man without any body. Confound the man without any body. Father... Suppose it is true. As a clergyman, my dear, I prefer to remain agnostic. This thing's a trick. Yes, but how's it done, and why? That's the whole point, Jim. What worries me is the effect on our people here. We call ourselves intelligent, and yet, look at us. Even Mr. Emmett there. Hey, hey, what's that about me, sir? A few minutes ago, you thought something brushed past you when you were coming down the stairs from the bell tower. Now, oh, didn't you? Well, uh, yes, sir. You see what I mean, Jim? But I didn't really think so, sir. Not really. It was imagination, just like the doctor said. Because I searched that tower. I locked the door after it. Exactly. But the mere force of suggestion, nothing more, might lead you to believe. That's not suggestion, Father. Sir. Oh, that's my Bible. There's nobody in that belfry. Bells can't ring by themselves, old man. There's somebody pulling the rope up there, and we're going to find out who it is. Now, one moment, all of you. Well, what's wrong, Padre? You're as white as a ghost. This blasphemous mockery, it seems, extends even to the church. Very well. You will stay with Janice, my boy. Emmett and I will collar this invisible man. Now, why can't I go, too? I don't believe in this, but I should prefer to have someone with Janice. You're not afraid, Mr. Emmett? If, if it's alive, sir, I'm not afraid of it. And if it's dead, well... Well, you're not afraid of it. The tower door's open, sir. I'm ready. Don't do it, Father. Don't go. You can't help them, Janice. Sit down here. Take it easy. Jim Norwood, what's wrong with you? Wrong with me? You've got an odd look, too. And the light's fading. And the surplices look like ghosts. And in another minute, that bell will drive me mad. Suppose he has got in. Who? The invisible man. Oh, don't talk rot. As there are sounds that the ear cannot hear, so there are colors that the eye cannot see. I read that somewhere. He hasn't hurt anybody yet. But suppose he turns nasty and does hurt somebody. He can't hurt anybody. How do you know? Janice, listen to me. Take my hand. Oh, but Jim... Jim... I want to tell you a few things you won't understand. I don't ask you to understand. I just ask you to remember. Well, what is it? The first is a question. If you were a government official and wanted to find an expert on camouflage, where would you go? An expert on camouflage? Yes. And the second point is this. I studied medicine in Germany. Oh, I know that, but that's One quite... night on a bet, I hid backstage at the Winter Garden Theater in Berlin. I saw the whole show from backstage and... And I learned a great deal. Jim Norwood, what on earth are you talking George about? George Wellman and I have talked the whole thing over. In a way, Janice, there is an invisible man. I can tell you who he is and how he works. But there's no danger, do you understand? There's no danger at all. Jim, what 
was there. I don't know. You do know. I can see it in your face. You do know. I think somebody's fallen. Fallen? From the top of the belfry. Oh, father! Stay here, Janet. You can't do any good. Let go of my arm. I'm going up. No, you're not. I didn't think what the danger might be. Besides, there's somebody coming down the stairs now. Stay just where you are and don't move until... Oh, Father. Father, are you all right? Steady, sir. Take it easy now. I'm perfectly all right, yes. But you'd better go into the churchyard and see to Emmy. He... he fell? No, Janice, he did not fall. He was thrown. Oh. Thrown? By whom? There's no time to argue now. You're a doctor. Go out and see to him. Well, is he in... I don't know. Go. Yes, sir. For I will work a deed in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. Janice, this is incredible. Why? You heard the bell ring. I saw it ring. Without anybody there? I was as close to that bell as I am to you now. No hand held the rope. There were no strings or wires or any tricks to make it move. Yet it clanged back and forth alone in the tower. And I thought I heard someone laugh. Laugh? Oh, don't take that too seriously. We were both overwrought and the noise of the bell was deafening. What about Mr. Emmett? Emmett yelled some words I couldn't hear and lunged for the bell. Then something caught him. Something caught him and gave him a sledgehammer blow in the back. That bell is nothing but open arches. You heard him scream. I saw his face just before he went over. Lock the door to the tower, Father. Lock it. I can't lock it. Emmett has the key. But why should I lock it? Because he's still in there. He? He hadn't done any harm before, but he's done harm now. There's no telling what might happen if he gets loose. You mean? I mean Professor Ansmith's protege, whoever he is. The man without a body. Under the red sunset, some quarter of a mile away, a grass-carpeted lane winds between rows of apple trees. The lane is dusky. Though lights shine into it from the windows of a large stone house. Dr. Norwood's house beyond the apple trees. Up and down. Up and down a shadowy figure is pacing. An elderly figure. Dejected figure. Tall and frail as a shadow among shadows. Muttering to itself. Shaking its head. Now and then raising one fist in bewilderment or anguish. Sometimes the light gleams on large spectacles and a kindly mouth. Up and down. Endlessly up and down, cried Professor Ansmith. I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. How can I convince them that I'm not guilty? Who's there? I saw you dodge behind that tree. Stand out, sir. Did you call me, Professor Ansmith? Yes, I did call you. Who are you? You probably won't recognize me, Professor Haines. Nevertheless, my friend, may I ask what your name is? Uh, my name is Wellman, Professor. George Wellman. Wellman, Wellman. I've heard that name. Maybe you have. I'm a builder by trade and a great friend of Dr. Norwood. Wait one moment. Aren't you the young man whose firm is putting up these air raid shelters along the seawall? And making such an unholy din with your riveting machines? That's me. And come to think of it, aren't you the one who first started this alarm about an invisible man? Yes, because I met him. You did not meet him, sir. This whole thesis is scientific nonsense. And I won't have it. Uh, you won't have what? I'm an old man, Mr. Wellman. I never did anybody the least harm. As God is my judge, I know nothing whatever about this, this... What's that? It looks like the Vicar's car, Professor. You'd better stand back. This is a pretty narrow lane. Ansmith! Professor Ansmith! Yes, Mr. Marley, I hear you. We thought you'd better drive over here straight away. I... I think you've met my daughter. And, of course, you know Dr. Norwood. Yes, but there's no time for any social formalities. Get into your house, Professor Ansmith. Get in quickly and close the shutters. But why should I do that? Because there's a mob coming, sir, and we can't stop them. Hurry, do hurry. A mob coming here? Why? Haven't you heard the news? I've heard nothing, my friend. The only person I've seen has been that young man there who chews a toothpick and hides behind the trees. George Wellman? What on earth are you doing here? Uh, watching, Janice. Watching and waiting, just as usual. Listen to me, Professor Ansmith. Henry Emmett, the head verger with St. Luke's, was thrown from the belfry window not 20 minutes ago. Not by me, sir, I assure you. I had nothing to do with it. No, not by you, but apparently 
by the invisible man. Oh, Father in heaven, will this never stop? Not till we catch the fellow. No, be quiet, Mr. Bowman, please. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Padre, I take it back. I myself can testify that no visible person laid hands on Emmett. He was struck, struck as though with a gigantic fist. Uh, what's the matter, Professor Ansmith? Is anything wrong? No, 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 no. I, I, I was just thinking. Is Emmett dead? Fortunately, no. I'm glad of that, my friend, for a certain person's sake. He's not even seriously hurt. The bell tower isn't high, and a tree broke the force of his fall. But he's badly shaken up, and that crowd of the coach and horses means trouble. If you haven't anything to say to us, if you haven't a word of explanation to utter... Listen, Padre, don't you hear anything? Yes, I thought I heard voices. Can't be that crowd from the village. We're too far ahead of them. It's a crowd, all right. And they've been here for hours. But where? I don't see anybody. Jim, look. Behind the trees. Look behind the trees. Look be beyond the hedgerows. Look for any place where a watcher can hide. And may I ask what they're doing here? They're watching you, Professor Ensmith. Uh, more of your spies, you mean. You can call them anything you please. But they're getting impatient and they want to show down. If I as much as hold my hand up like this... <laughs> Don't throw stones at the windows, you fool! You're only breaking the doctor's window! Gentlemen, I can't have any more of this. Be quiet, all of you, and listen to me. Well, sir, we're listening. I'm a peaceful man. I like to live in peace with my neighbors. I have nothing to do with this so-called reign of terror. But you don't believe that, do you? No. Then I must expose a fraud. Now, don't blame me if I expose the trickster, too. I have made preparations to show you the invisible man. The man without a body. Quiet, everybody. Mr. Morley, I believe you and your daughter walked through this lane last night uh, while I was away at the Berry St. Edmunds. I don't know about your being away, sir. My daughter and I were certainly here, yes. Good, good. Miss Janice Morley. Yes, Professor Ensmith. Will you look towards your right, please, at the house? What do you see? It's the same room. What room? The room with the little round table and the gramophone. It's a three-legged table, you notice. Yes, of course. But there's nobody in the room. No, nobody at all. Are conditions exactly as they were last night? Yes, except there aren't any gloves on the table. No, but the invisible man is there. Oh. A living presence, ready to act and breathe and even kill. Even kill. With your permission, I shall now address him. Hello in there. Hello in there. Hello in there. If anybody answers him, Father, I'm going to scream. Quiet, Janice, quiet. Father, look. The gloves are appearing on the table. I call out to him and I speak as follows. Hold the phonograph with your left glove. That's it. Turn the handle with your right. One turn... Two, three, four. That's enough. Touch the spring with your left hand. Push the record. Lower the needle with your right and... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the invisible man. Hold, hold him off. Hold, you fool. Let them throw all they like. Aim at the table, my friend. Aim at the table. Why at the table? Because then they'll see the trick. I don't follow you. What trick? The trick of the looking glasses. There. You see now, my friend? I think I do. The legs of the table form a triangle with its point towards you. Panels of looking glass are fitted in the two sides facing you. What do you know about that? You think you can see under the table, but what you actually see are the side walls of the room reflected in those two mirrors. Oh, wait a minute. You mean... I mean that my old servant, hidden behind the mirrors, has just been working the gloves to a panel in the tabletop. It's a very old trick, first shown by Colonel Stadare at the London Polytechnic. And that's what happened last night? Yes. 
And you had nothing to do with it? Nothing whatever. Nor had my servant. Then who did do it and why? What is the explanation of all this? Well, I can't tell you why. That's what beats me. But I can tell you everything else. This invisible man who's been scaring us all silly? My dear young lady, there's no invisible man. There never has been. I might believe that, Professor Ansmith, if I hadn't seen a church bell ringing where there was no hand to ring it. And poor old Emmett flung out of the tower as though a giant hand had got hold of him. You're not saying that was done with the looking glasses? No, my friend, not at all. That was really clever. Strings? Wires, ropes? No, they weren't necessary. But the thing's impossible. Oh, no. <clears throat> the same principle was used by my old friend J.N. Maskelin to make mechanical figures work. Psycho played whist, and Zoe drew pictures. I myself, I... Yes. Go on, sir. You yourself, what are you going to say? Uh, the secret I was about to say remains unknown even today. You were right, in a way, when you tell us that Emmett acted as though a giant had got hold of him. A giant had got hold of him. At least, a gigantic force. Oh, before we all go completely mad, would you mind telling us what this gigantic force was? Not at all. It was compressed air. Compressed air? Well, don't you see it even yet, any of you? No. A compressed air pipe with a thousand pounds pressure behind it was run up into the tower facing the bell. It could be operated from the ground outside. The pressure was turned on and off in bursts. It made that heavy bell swing like a toy. Emmett, don't you remember? Emmett rushed forwards towards the bell. And the air pressure? The air pressure struck him like a sledgehammer and flung him headlong out of the tower. There's your miracle, gentlemen. That's all there was to it. Sir, I can't doubt what you say. It's too circumstantial and too right. But, but what, my friend? The compressed air tanks. The mechanical apparatus to work this trick. Well, what about it? Well, where did it come from? Such things don't grow on bushes. No, but they do grow on riveting machines. Riveting machines? Yes, such as the riveting machine they're using on the air raid shelters along the seawall. Would you care to tell us, Dr. James Norwood, why you and your friend Wellman have been playing all these tricks? <laughs> Jim Norwood, is this true? Why, of course it's true, Mr. Morley. Don't be so gullible. Jim and George Wellman doing all this? I don't believe it. Take a look at their faces, young lady. Did you ever see a guiltier-looking pair? So we look guilty, do we? Frankly, you do. We played the whole game and convinced the village there was an invisible man. Is that it? Yes. You worked the glove trick in your own house. And Wellman worked the air trick with his own equipment. Everything else was nothing but a pack of lies and a lot of atmosphere. Playing conjurers and making a blasted hash of it. Is that all, Professor Ann Smith? Well, remember, you brought this on yourselves. I didn't want to expose you. No, Professor. I bet you didn't. Easy, George. Take it easy. Jim, is this true? Before you start pitching into me, Janice, let me have my word first. Do you remember what I said to you at the church tonight? At the church? Yes, I asked you to remember something, even if you didn't understand it. All right. Can you remember what it was? Oh, Jim, please. You're only trying to evade this. Oh, I, I'm so confused now, I don't remember anything. All I can think of is this horrible business and what's behind it. Father can't believe his ears, and I'm not much better. We've practically idolized you. All we want you to do is answer a straight question. Jim, are these accusations true? Yes, they are true. <laughs> Doubtless he had a good reason, Janice. Doubtless he had a good reason. Yes, we had a good reason. The very best reason in the world. You had a good reason for scaring people half to death and trying to kill poor old Henry Emmett? We didn't mean any harm against Emmett. That was an accident. But you dare to defend yourself now? Yes, just that. Before we go home, Father... Shall we apologize to Professor Ann Smith? I hope he'll try to think better of English hospitality. Good, Janice, good. I hope he will, too. You hope he will. Listen, Janice, before you act on any belief, you have to be absolutely sure in your own mind. George and I have to prove something. And now I'm glad to say we have proved it. Oh, I can't stand this any longer. If you have anything to say, go on and say it straight out. 
What was it you had to prove? We had to prove to our own satisfaction that this pretended American who calls himself Professor Ann Smith... Pretended American? Who calls himself Professor Ann Smith? We had to prove that this pretended American was no other than Karl Heinrich von Keist, the celebrated what? stage magician from the Winter Garden Theater in Berlin. What? Whose real job is to find the camouflage aerodrome near Berry St. Edmund. No. He explained his own tricks very nicely, George. We'll swear out a warrant in the morning. And so closes The Man Without a Body, starring John Sutton and George Zuko. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, The Man in Black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when the distinguished actress, Miss Agnes Moorhead, will be heard in one of her many brilliant characterizations. Starring with Miss Moorhead will be Miss Ellen Drew, who as Carol Linden tells the amazing story of... Uncle Henry's Rosebush. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, with Ted Bliss, the director, Bernard Herman, and Lucian Mahowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Presents Cry in the Night. Otto, you have got to speak to the landlord. I think we should get a new refrigerator. Yes, Bessie. Nineteen years. The first thing, Monday morning, yeah? It still runs good. Yeah, for how long? And it's old-fashioned. Nineteen years. We are entitled to a new one. You speak to Morrison. Speak, why should I? Morrison has enough troubles. They are no trouble. They are good tenants. Too good. You tell Morrison either he gives us a new refrigerator or we move out. He won't give and we won't move. With rent control, he can't give. And I can't move from my store. Ah, store. You support it. It don't support you. Twenty-seven years. We've never starved. It's made a living. Not starving isn't living. Otto, two things. First, the refrigerator. And I want a new one like my brother Carl got for his kitchen. Uh, Second, we got to move out of this neighborhood. Please hand me my hairbrush. Uh, uh, here. Yeah. Bessie, you're talking nonsense. If you get a refrigerator, why do you want to get out of the neighborhood? And if you're moving out of the neighborhood, which you ain't, why bother Morrison because your brother Carl has a new refrigerator? Don't be smart, Alec, about my brother. Otto, let me tell you, this neighborhood, it's not fit anymore. Twenty-five years ago, it was different. Now, I'm telling you, deterioration has set in. New people are moving in every day. New people? People are people. I don't recognize a face no more. New people. Uh, I, I meet them in the store, Bessie. And I tell you, the only difference between the new people and the old people is that their names sound different. All they want is to live nice, bring up their children the best they can. Children? Yeah. Let them bring up their children here. 
But I ain't going to let Erica stay. A girl who is going on 20 don't belong in this crummy neighborhood just because her papa ain't got gumption to pick himself up. Oh, Bessie. Ah, so let me tell you, this isn't the only weekend that Erica's going to spend at my brother Carl's in Forest Hills. Every weekend from now on, she will be away. I'll never see her. My daughter. Ah, when she brings home a nice fella from Forest Hills, you will see her. But Bessie, I... won't I've... have her hanging around with that, that Gloria Pallucci. Everything that Pallucci girl does, Erica thinks is so smart. Last week she bought a dress like Gloria's, so tight around here and here that she could hardly breathe. With the... the coat, the hat, the shoes. Now she wants to blonde her hair like Gloria. Otto, my daughter is not going to look like a chick. Bessie, don't say what you don't know. All oh, the women all tell me that Gloria... All oh, the women me... are jealous because they all look like beer barrels with hair. Ah, she talks too free, that one. A disgrace to the neighborhood. Coming home every night with a different man. And how do you know who she comes home with? Oh, don't worry. I know. And don't think I don't know how she hangs around your store, Otto. I got a few friends, too. Uh, a lonely girl, Gloria. Lonely. As far as I am concerned, she can stay lonely. If Erica copycats her anymore, I am going to send her to my sister in Buffalo. Bessie, Bessie, uh, listen. Did you hear? Hear? Hear what? Bessie, uh, you heard that. This neighborhood. I told what did I tell you. Every day it gets worse. Now maybe you will believe me and get us out of here. You think it's nice for me to sit here and listen to such terrible goings on? Uh, uh, Bessie, uh, shouldn't we do something about it? Why? They bring these things on themselves, the new people. <laughs> Let them deal with it. I, I don't understand. How do you know that this hollering and shrieking comes from the new people and not from the old people? Arthur, use your head. That's what I'm using. And it makes no sense. Of course it does. Explain. How do you know it's new people? There was never any trouble like this in the old days. Huh? Oh, poor girl. Bessie, she needs help. And you are going to give it to her? Otto Schrader galloping on his horse down Delwood Avenue to rescue the maiden. How can you joke? And how can you be so ridiculous? Uh, but I must do something. Sure. I tell you what to do. Mind your own business and go to bed. Oh, Bessie. Don't get involved. Oh, go on. Go have a bite in the kitchen. Um, I don't know if I feel like it tonight. I left the chicken leg for you. <sighs> All right, then. I'll eat. Eat and don't leave me a mess. Yes, Bessie. I, I forgot to wind up the clock. I'll wind up the clock. A double bolt the door. I'll double bolt the door. Yeah, put out the garbage first. I'll... I'll put out the, the garbage. <laughs> You found the kitchen, Vanna. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you heard that girl? Uh, I haven't been listening. I've been reading. Uh, the police came, an ambulance maybe? I, I couldn't hear in the back. I told you. I was reading. No. Mm. Then I'll, I'll put out the light. Yeah, okay. I am beat. Good night. Yeah. If you snore, I will give you a shove and you shut up. If I sleep. Uh, Why shouldn't you sleep? Uh, I'm worried about that screaming. You better worry about your own family. Yeah. I'll, um... I'll speak to Morrison Monday morning. Maybe I can make a deal. I'll get you a refrigerator. Bessie, how can you sleep? I can't sleep. Another human being. The world is full of human beings. Well, I can't sleep when I know someone is suffering and is being hurt. So never sleep. All over the world, every minute, every day, people are suffering. I know, I know, but it hurts me. And this is in Brooklyn. This is here. This is right outside my bedroom window. I listen to the screaming. Then I listen to you, to what you say, and I, and I close my ears. 
I, I close my eyes. I close my heart. It's not right. Arto, you are getting yourself all worked up. It isn't good for you. I, I tell you, Bessie, it's not in me to lie here and not look. Look, you are keeping me awake with your noble talk. You want to look? Get one good look and then come back to bed. Yeah, well, I think I will. Yeah, look with your eyes open. See what kind of a neighborhood you make your family live in. And thank heaven you got a brother-in-law rich enough to live in Forest Hills. So Erica don't have to be here tonight to listen to such frightfulness. Well, go ahead. Pull up the blind. I can't see very good, Bessie. Not out in the street. But the whole neighborhood is up. Uh, across the street, the Ryans are looking out the window. Where are they looking? I like can't tell, but Paddy and Margaret are both watching something. And the corner of the curtain, the Millers is pulled back. Yeah? I think it's the old lady. There's all the blinds pulled at the tailors, and, and those new people, I think their name is Richie. But you can't see nothing? No, no. Ah, yes, yes, I can. Now I can. What? What? Just over in the shadows near their private house way down the corner, there's a girl fighting a man. How do you know then? I, I can't see that good. Just the, the, the two figures struggling. Looks like there's something in the man's hand I, I can see by the streetlight when he turns. A knife, I bet. They don't stop at anything in this neighborhood the girl, now. The girl is kicking and scratching and, and biting Bessie. And there she goes. She's getting away, coming towards here again. <laughs> man's catching up with her now, right under the street. And I think I know who it is. Who? 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 The, the, the man? No, no, no. The, the girl. The blonde hair. Sometimes it's caught in the street light. Yeah, yeah. It must be. It is. It's Gloria Palucci. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson once said, freedom exists only where the people take care of the government. In our democratic society, the people are the voice of the government through freedom of speech, of the press, and through freedom to assemble, we know and make sure that our laws are just. The price for our freedom? The responsibilities we share to maintain it. But many people of the world do not enjoy either freedom or personal rights, and they too must pay a price. In obedience to a dictatorship, acceptance of the demands of their government, and subjection to slavery. So it becomes the duty of each of us who are members of a free society to spread the word of freedom throughout the world, wherever it is needed. We can do this best by maintaining our example of a people's government, a people's freedom. I can't see her no more. But that blonde hair, it could only be Gloria Pellucci, Bessie. Otto, what are you doing? What do I look like I'm doing? I'm, I'm getting dressed. You are going up there? No, I'm getting dressed to get a drink of water in the bathroom. What do you think? Don't be ridiculous, Otto. You are looking for trouble. That man out there, who knows who he is? You say he has a knife? You are going to challenge him? The girl's being hurt, perhaps killed. I read in the paper about another Badinsky like you. He stopped the fight, Otto. And you know what? He landed in jail because he hurt the man on the West Coast. Now be smart. Don't get involved. How can I not get involved? But why involve your family? Did I say anything about my family? Otto... How can you not involve your family? You get hurt, who takes care of you? The Red Cross? No, I do. Who else? It's Gloria Pellucci. She's not your wife, not your daughter, and she's not your business. Nobody asked Gloria Pellucci to move into this neighborhood. We were better off before she came, and we'll be better off when she goes. She's no relative of ours. You go to church on Sunday, Bessie. You hear the minister say we are all God's children. Well, we are God's children on Saturday night as well as on Sunday morning. Uh, at least I'm going to call the police. Over my dead body. You know what happens when you call the police? Questions. Lots of questions. I have nothing to hide. I just want to help that poor girl. Sure, sure, Mr. Hero. They will ask your name and you will tell them. They'll ask you the girl's name and you tell them. What's wrong with that? How do you know the girl's name? A stranger? Uh, see, she's my daughter's friend. Bessie, please, now out of my now, way. Otto. Some father. You let your daughter's name get into the papers with a girl like that? Bessie. You will do no such thing. And don't think you can say she's your friend either. 
The women have already told me how she makes up to you in the store. Like you've earned twice her age and a respectable married man. Gloria is a good girl. Maybe she talks wild, but what is talk? Should she be killed for talk? How do you know she's good? Otto! Oh, stop it. No, no, get out of my way. Otto! You told me the whole block is up. Let them call the police. Maybe somebody did already. Old Lady Miller, let her be the busybody. But maybe they haven't. Maybe everybody is saying like you, don't get involved. And all the while, the girl is fighting off a wild man with maybe a knife. Bessie, don't you have any feeling for humanity? Sure I have, for my humanity. You with your ideals and your feelings and your highfalutin sentiments. Where has it got now, you? Bessie, please. A shabby little store in a crummy old neighborhood that you can die in. At all. Do you know what it means if you call the police? Hours of questioning. Who, what, when, where. So. Not only now, not only now, but later in court. And sometimes there's a second and a third trial. And sometimes it might be a gangster involved. And they don't like you so good if you testify against them. Ha <laughs> ha, what they could do to your store. How can you weigh these petty things against a human life? These petty things ain't so petty to me. Who takes care of the store while you are in court, at the police station, or thrown in the East River? Me. Yes, 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 me. Mr. Idealist. You are not volunteering yourself. You are volunteering me. Oh, Bessie. You. You think you have a great concern for humanity. Well, what you have is no concern for your own family. Ah. I'm going to call the police. Otto, I warn you. Bessie, take your hand off the chair. Otto. So, help me, Otto. If you dial again, I will pull the wire from the wall. You are hurting me. Hurting me for that girl. Take your hand off, Bessie. Don't think I don't know. If it was me, you wouldn't raise a finger just because he's a floozy with our short skirts, peroxide hair, and her blouse cut all the way down to here. You are just like all the other men. That's all you care about. Coming home every night with a different man. Well, hell, she's not getting anything she didn't ask for. For the last time, Bessie, take your hand off the phone. No, no, I won't fight. <laughs> Fighting with your own wife? How can you be so selfish? With me and my and mine, the world will come to no good end. Fine bards don't make a living. <sighs> take care of your own and let everybody else take care of his own. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> Tell, tell the phone. There. You've done it. Me? What are you blaming me for you, now? You pulled the telephone wire. You must have made a short circuit. Nobody asked you to grab the telephone. Well, maybe it's for us. Take, take your hands off and I will answer it. Nobody calls us in the middle of a Saturday night. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Smarty. Now we'll... Never know who it was. It was nobody. You you just made a short circuit. Ah, uh, Otto, I know who it was. It was Erica. Maybe she met a nice, rich fella at her Uncle Carl's, so she called to tell her mama and papa. <laughs> Otto, this time, answer. Sure, answer a short circuit. Ah, oh, well. Hello? Hello? Bessie, it's nobody. Hello, Otto. Yeah. It's Carl. Don't answer your telephone. Well, we were asleep, Carl. Then it stopped ringing. Carl? Let me talk to uh, you. Carl, your sister wants to talk to you. Hello? Hello, Carl. How come you are calling so late? I was expecting a call from you, Bessie. From me, Carl? I didn't promise. Uh, of course you didn't promise. Erica did. Erica? Yeah, sure, Erica. You know, I, I gave her a little present when she came here. A, pr a present? Oh, not very much. Ten or fifteen bucks. Oh, Carl, you're very nice to your niece. Otto, my brother gave Erica fifteen dollars. The next thing uh, I know, she tells uh, Irma and me that she changed her mind. She don't want to stay with us this weekend. I apologize for Erica, Carl. She should be nicer to you and Irma. Oh, no, 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 that's not what I mean. 
I mean, she said she was going home. Home? Home? Then! Eric is coming home. She, she left about nine. I said, call here when you get home. So right away she forgets. No, Carl, no. She's not here. She didn't come in. Are you sure she said she was coming home? Straight home? Uh, not straight home. She said she was going to uh, an all-night uh, beauty parlor first. A beauty parlor? How? What? Where? Uh, she was going to use my present to surprise you, Bessie. Surprise? What kind of a surprise? You don't know? Carl, I don't know anything except Erica ain't here. Erica ain't here. Erica ain't here. Funny, she, she said she'd be home around midnight. She was going to this beauty parlor in Manhattan that keeps open all night. A, a beauty parlor on a Saturday night? Bye, Carl. Bye. She was going to have the color of her hair changed to blonde. Oh, my God. No, Carl, no. Not blonde. Not blonde. Oh, why not, Bessie? She's a smart girl. She knows that the really up-and-coming guys go for blondes. Oh, hold it, Carl. Th there's the door. Otto, go yeah. let Erica in. Coming. Coming. Bessie. Bessie, it's, it's Gloria Pellucci. She's all right. She's all right. Oh, Mr. Schroeder. Mrs. Schroeder. Something terrible has happened to you and Erica. Something terrible. She's... Yes. She's... I know. Hello. Gloria. Hello. I know. The blonde here. I saw it. I know. I saw it. I know. I know. Hello, this is Hans Conry. On a dark night in 1818, three people sat talking. They were the poet, Shelley, Mary, his wife, and another poet, Lord Byron. As their conversation turned to subjects more and more mysterious, they decided that each would write a ghost story. Later, as Mary Shelley lay sleeping, she had a terrifying dream in which she saw a monstrous-looking creature bending over the bed of a man who might have been his creator. Suddenly she had the idea for her ghost story and set to work writing it. Soon she'd finished a tale about a young scientist who collected the parts of a human body from graveyards and dissecting laboratories, put them together according to his own recipe, and brought this hideous assemblage to life. Later, the young scientist was to regret that he'd not turned his endeavors toward something more acceptable, for the being he had created was too hideous for polite society and eventually turned on his creator. The young scientist was, of course, Dr. Frankenstein, and his name is now applied to creations which backfire. Purists will point out that Frankenstein is used incorrectly to refer to the monster instead of his creator, but that causes me no concern. After all, what is in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell it. <laughs> Theater 5 has presented Cry in the Night, written by Raphael David Blau and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Vicki Vola, Louis Van Ruten, Marilyn Moore, and Ben Yaffe. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking.
the fascination of the eerie. Weird, blood-chilling tales told by old Nancy, the witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. They are waiting. Waiting for you. Now. Today, yes, sir, a hundred and thirteen year old. <laughs> well, Satan, if you'll pass the word to douse all lights, we'll be getting down to business. No! No! That's it. Make it nice and dark. Sitting amongst the gloomy shadows is the way to hear our perky tales. I'll draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Gaze into them deep, and soon you'll see inside a little shop across the seas in Paris, France. A little curiosity shop it is, full of odd and old and funny things for sale. And there begins our story of the mannequin. <laughs> the mannequin! <laughs> Look, monsieur, the powder box of Marie Antoinette for 2,000 francs. I haven't the slightest use for a lady's powder box. No? I show monsieur the pistol of Maximilien Robespierre. I'm not interested in pistols. Uh, I show monsieur the sword of the Marquis de Lafayette. Please, please, I don't want that either. You do not desire the sword of Lafayette? No, all monsieur desires is to get out of here. Wait, Paul. I owe Henri an explanation after looking at everything in this place. Monsieur, I regret that I must leave your excellent shop without making a purchase. But you see, I came here in search of a particular something which I have not found. Oh, what is it, Monsieur Seek, you have not found? I, I don't know. Comma? <laughs> All I know is that I became convinced that there was something in your shop that, well, crazy as it may sound... Something that wanted me to have it. I always knew a man had to be insane before he chose painting as a career. But that notion proves that you're even madder than the average artist. Something that wanted me to have it. Bah. Monsieur, do I understand you are an artist? Uh, why, yes. Uh, an artist who paint picture? <laughs> Guilty. Oh, monsieur, come quick, this way. What for? I have something you will buy. Something only for the artist. What on earth? Must be something precious if he keeps it behind all these locks. <laughs> Wait until you see. Uh, Andre, you want us to go down in that cellar? Oh, oui, monsieur. Uh, follow me. I turn on the light. What the... Ah, come, monsieur. Please come, please come. All right. See but... nothing down there but crates and broken junk. He's unlocking another door. Please come, monsieur. Too sweet. Come on, Paul. I'm with you. What the deuce does he want you to see? I think it's the thing I came here to find. I feel its call again. Whatever wants me to have it lies behind that door. Oh, bank. You'll soon find out. He's drawing the last bolt. I may guard. That's a buffet. She can't. He says he's afraid. Now the door's unlocked, he doesn't pull it open. What's wrong with you, Henri? You're trembling like a frightened child. What are you afraid of? I... What's behind that door? I... I open the door, monsieur. Regarde. Good Lord. There's a woman in that closet. She's hanging by the neck. Her hands and feet are bound with ropes. This man's a murderer. They've killed her. No, 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 no. She is not a woman. She is a mannequin. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God. What? It's only a mannequin, Paul. A lay figure. You mean a <laughs> dummy? Yes, yes. Every artist has one in his studio. You've seen mine. I drape costumes on it instead of using a live model. And the figure in your studio isn't anything like this one. I should say it isn't. This is a work of art. It's positively lifelike. To me, it still looks like a woman hanging there. Why have you got to trust up, Henri? As though it were some dangerous animal. Take that rope from around the neck and bring it under the light so that I can see it properly. Oh, oui, monsieur. Monty, he's frightened to death of the thing. I can see that. But why? 
merely a big doll made of wooden cloth and cotton stuffing. Bring it out, Henri. Oh, yes, yeah, Two, three. That's right. Cut the rope from its neck. Hurry up, she isn't going to bite you. Oh, oui, monsieur. Well, aren't you going to cut those cords that bind the hands and feet? I want to see how the joints work. Mm, monsieur, you perhaps will cut the cords? Oh, give me the knife. Easy. I don't wonder they don't like to touch the thing, Monty. It seems living, human. It's the most remarkable mannequin I've ever seen. Mm, its covering is of the finest silk. Look how it's padded. Every muscle, every feature is perfection. The face is almost beautiful. It's lovely. A master artist did this job. He was a crackerjack mechanic, too. Listen, as I move these joints about, you don't hear the slightest squeak. How's the hair fastened on? It actually seems to be growing from the head. Say, the hair isn't an ordinary wig. Hmm, sounds like a wooden base underneath. Tiny holes must have been drilled in the head and the hairs inserted one by one. Who could have gone to all that trouble? Search me. The maker has given a glass eyes, too. Yes, I've already noted that. And they stare at us as though that dummy understood every word we're saying. Funny. Those eyes do convey an illusion of intelligence. Monsieur. Do you find the, the mannequin good? Good? She's perfect. Then you will buy... You will take her away? Well, I'd like to, Henri, but I can't afford anything so fine. My price is very low, miss. Yes, I've already heard some examples of what you call low. How much? Ah, monsieur, we wish to be rid of her. The price, it do not matter so long you take her from the shop. Monty, wait. There's something funny about this figure. They're too anxious to get rid of it. You're sure this isn't stolen goods, are oh, No, 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 monsieur. We are honest people. We prove we buy this mannequin from place in Lyon. We buy a sheep. That is our reason. We sell sheep to you. Well, I don't know what this mystery is. But if you can prove you bought her legally in Lyons, I'll take her. You... You buy her, monsieur? Pack her up, and I'll tell you where to send her. Oh, oui, oui. Now, here is the box in which she came, monsieur. It looks like a coffin. Monty, you won't have it delivered to your door in that. It'll frighten your wife to death. <laughs> it probably would give Florette a turn. But I'll warn her what to expect. No, better than that. We'll take it home with us on top of a cab. And now, monsieur, you will place my purchase in its box. I'll pay you and be on my way. Uh, would monsieur mind if I, if I do not touch the mannequin again? You, monsieur, will lift on the box? You don't like her a little bit, do you? Now that I've removed the cords with which you had a bound, you probably think her hands will throttle you or something. Well, I'm not afraid of her. Come, pretty lady, prepare to turn... Monty! Monsieur! Monty, I just saw that figure's arms curl about your shoulders. It looked as though she were embracing you. Now that we're nearly home, Paul, please wipe that look of superstitious gloom from your face. Aren't you yet convinced that my new mannequin is just a mannequin? Naturally, your explanation of the thing's weird movements is the only reasonable one. Of course. Hanging in the damp cellar of that shop, its wooden frame became warped and out of adjustment. That's what made its limbs perform those eerie contortions. <laughs> I confess I was considerably startled, though, when his arms wrapped themselves so lovingly around my neck. I mustn't tell Florette I've purchased such an amorous lady. You know how jealous she is. Ah, oh, here we are. I'm glad. And that figure's coffin-like box above us on the roof of this cab, I felt as though I were riding with a corpse. <laughs> I'd better assure Florette that that's not what I'm bringing home before she sees the box and starts to wonder. Oh, darn, it's too late. There she is at the window. Now, Raymond's with her. Well, thank heaven he's here. I'll have a brother artist to help me gloat over my new purchase. He won't share your dislike of her. Hmm. They've left the window. They must be coming to the door. Yes. Take down that box, Cabby. Oui, monsieur. I'll send Potter over to help him carry it inside. Monty! Hello, Florette. Hello, Raymond. I say, old chap. What have you got in that beastly-looking box? We saw you arriving in the wonder. Just wait until you see her. Wait till we see her? Yes, darling. I'm bringing home my new sweetheart. <laughs> 
Your new sweetheart. Don't be jealous yet. Is Potter around? Oh, we left him standing at the door. Potter, oh, Potter. It's Mrs. Montague. Come here and help the cabbie with his box. Good to it. What is inside that box, Bonte? You'll soon find out. Now, how do you fellows? Bring her in. I'll open the door for you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, here we are. Here we are. Uh, you can lay her down here in the hallway. That's right. Now, get me a hammer, Potter. There's one in my studio. Oh, will you pay the cabbie, Paul? Monty, tell us what you have in that box immediately, Amor. Yes, don't keep us in suspense, old chap. You'll see for yourselves in a moment. Potter, hurry up. Here's the hammer, sir. Here's the hammer. Shall I, uh, shall I give it the work, sir? No, I'll open it. There's only a single nail at each end holding the boards. Behold. <gasps> Good Lord. Mr. Montague. Take her away. She's a corpse. No, 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 Florette. It's just a wax figure. You're both wrong. It's my new mannequin. New mannequin, Monty? Wait till I lift her out and show you. <gasps> oh, she puts her arms on your neck. <laughs> you explain that, Paul, while I place her in this chair. The framework inside is warped, Florette, which makes the limbs spring into queer positions. At least that's what Monty says. The thing's an absolute work of art. I knew you would appreciate her, Ray, but... Monty, these joints aren't warped in any way. Are they, they move in my hands without the slightest effort. Because walking is not the reason why her arms move just like light. She's more than just a mannequin. She's not good. I do not like her. You're jealous of my new sweetheart. For that's what she is. My newfound love. She's certainly lovely, isn't she, Florette? <gasps> what was it? I heard it too. Heard what, Monty? That figure sighed. You're crazy. No, I heard her. So did I. Me too, sir. Then the four of you are batty. Monty, take this thing away. I will not have it here. I'm afraid. Dear, you're not going to become hysterical over a big stuffed doll. Here, let me hold you in my arms. <gasps> the figure made a hissing sound. It did. Um, look at its eyes. They stab me with hate. Why, oh, they do. Have you all become raving lunatics? She or I must leave this house, Monty. I would not stay here with her. Nor I, sir. Oh, I give notice. Oh, this is becoming ridiculous. Now, Monty's right. We're making fools of ourselves. Because this figure is so lifelike, we're imagining things that can't possibly be so. You certainly are. Potter, stop trembling like a frightened puppy and mix everyone a scotch and soda. Yourself included. It's apparently needed to steady such flighty nerves. Uh, yes, sir. Serve it in the studio. Go on in, fellas. Come on, Paul. All right. I come too. Uh, wait, Florette. Before we leave here, I want you to take a good look at this mannequin and convince yourself it's no more than cloth and cotton stuffing. I do not wish to look. Her eyes stare at me with hate. How can eyes made of glass show any emotion? Monty, I'm afraid of her. No matter what you say, I know she is more than what she seems. And I know she do not like me. Florette, dear, you should be ashamed of the way you're acting. Come now, snap out of it. I... I am very silly, I suppose. That thing, it can be nothing more than just a great big doll. You know it can't. Yes, I know. And I'm afraid of her no longer. I prove to you she cannot fight me, shall I? Regarde, I slap her face. No, don't. You might knock her off that chair and break her. Very well. But because I meant to slap her face, you see, I am not afraid of her anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Your courage is proven. Now let's go in and join the others. Wait. Beth, kiss me, mon petit. You did not kiss me when you arrived. I was too excited over my purchase, I guess. Now I'll make up for lost time. Yes, kiss me. Kiss me much. Oh! Dear, what's the matter? Paul, Raymond, come here. Oh, oh, yes, what's the matter? Look at Florette. She suddenly collapsed in my arms as though she'd been struck. Struck? Yes, Paul. You're a doctor. See what's wrong with her. Blood oozing from her head. She's not badly hurt. No, merely a flesh wound. Just enough to knock her out. What did it? I don't know. There's a hammer lying at her feet. Someone must have thrown it at her. But we were alone here. You were not alone. I tell you... Monty, we... that mannequin was here. And when you opened the case in which you brought her here... You left this hammer lying beside her hand.
I find what you call a natural explanation for everything, Raymond. Even say she did not throw that hammer at my head last month. Ray, will you try to talk some sense into this poor deluded child? My dear Florette, Monty is right in insisting that your accident was due to some normal cause. It's impossible to believe that an inanimate lay figure threw a hammer at you. That mannequin is not the thing it seemed, I tell you. She tried to cause my death because she loved my husband. My dear child, you can't believe such arrogant nonsense as that. Oh, you are like Monty. You take me just a fool. Paul is the only one who do not say that I am crazy when I speak about that mannequin. But he is gone away from Paris now. Hmm. Thank heaven for that. I couldn't stand both him and you talking madness day and night. Oh, Raymond, I must make you believe what I say for Monty's sake. Since that figure come here, he have changed. I have not changed. You have. Ever since you know me, I have been your model. Now, no more you let me pose for you. You paint only from that mannequin. Oh, for the love of Ray. You know I'm working on a canvas depicting Abelard and Halwa. Florette posed for Halwa's and the face is finished. Now I'm simply painting in the costume. And she's sore because I draped it on the mannequin, instead of making her stand motionless for hours like a wooden clothes horse. All artists do that, you know, Florette. But he is not only painting in the costume. He have retouched the face for which I pose until now he looked like the mannequin. Well, what if I have? Have you, Monty? I... Uh, yes. Why? I will tell you. The face of hell was should be all love. I love Monty, but I am just a simple woman. The figure is more than woman. And she loves him more than I do. Oh, that rot. But, well, crazy as it may sound to you, Ray, I did catch an expression of absolute devotion from that mannequin's painted face. Because she know you. You told me that she called to you before you ever see her in that shop from which you buy her. I... Oh, I'm sick of this whole business. I know she's nothing but a jointed image. I'll never have a moment's peace while she remains inside the house. You win, Florette. You mean... To... I'll get rid of her. You've admired her, Ray. You'll take care of her. I've heard enough of your silly talk about a voice inside this box, Potter. Now that we reach my chambers, pour yourself a drink and forget it. But, dear, uh, there was a voice, Mr. Raymond. Mr. Montague heard it, and so did his missus. Well, I didn't. All I heard was a crash as you let your end of this case fall to the floor. And if I find the figure inside broken, I'll strangle you for it. Uh, find me something with which to pry this lid open. Uh, you're not going to take the figure out, sir? Naturally, naturally. Now, this heavy hunting knife will do the trick, I think. There we are, Potter. Lift the lid aside. Yes, sir. Ah. And now I lift the fair, inanimate cause of so much unreasoning terror from her most uncomfortable-looking casket. Out you come, pretty one. I'm not afraid of you. You're going to live with me now. Florette says you're in love with Monty, but he's given you to me. You won't see him anymore. Look! The figure's end! Huh? It's grabbed that hunting knife! Uh, her other hands at my throat, Potter! Father, get that knife. Ah, she stabbed him. Killed him. And now she's coming after me. Help! 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 Florette, will you please stop pacing the floor like a caged animal? Raymond has the figure safely inside his studio by this time, and it's not coming back here. <gasps> what was that? Mary, the doorbell did. It is she come back. Rot, it's probably Potter returning from Raymond's place. I'll let him in. Hello, Monty. Paul. Hello, Florette. Oh, Paul, I am glad to see you. You alone do not say I am a fool about that mannequin. You see, the lay figure is still the paramount topic of conversation, Paul. Just as when you went away from Paris. I'm not surprised. And I'm here to carry on the conversation, Monty. I've just returned from Lyons, where your big doll came from. What do you mean? I went there purposely to learn what I could about the figure, and I discovered some interesting things. Look at this photograph, but first let me colour half of it with my hand. Here. Why, it's a picture of the mannequin. No, Monty. It's a portrait of a living woman. Now look at the other half. A man stand beside her. Here's Monty. It 
That's my photograph. I never posed for such a picture. Those clothes we're wearing. I never saw them before. The costumes you see are those of a hundred years ago. The originals of this picture have been dead almost that long. I do not understand. Where did you get this picture? I had it photographed from a painting in the Lions Museum, which bore the date of 1840. 1840? Why do the dead man in this picture look so much like Monty? I can't explain their resemblance except by supposing it's one of nature's duplications. The man you see here was a sculptor named Marcel Valmont. The woman was his wife. They were greatly in love with one another, so much so that when she died, he lost his reason. He is reputed to have made a life-size figure that resembled her, which he kept always at his side until his death. You think my mannequin... Yes. That is why she loved my Monty then. Because he looked like her husband. But the mannequin is only a copy of the woman. From what we have seen, I think she's something more than that. Something more? Yes. I wish to examine your mannequin carefully. It is gone. Gone? Where? I gave it to Raymond about an hour ago. Oh, that's all right. He'll keep it safe. Oh, that bell. I'll answer it. She said she would return. Stop that, Tourette. Miss Montague! Miss Montague! What the? Oh, it is only he. Why are you wearing handcuffs? Eh? And who are these men with you? Pardon moi, monsieur. I'm Sergeant Grosjean of the Surete. Police? What are you doing with my servant? He is under arrest because there have been attempt at murder. But I didn't do it. She stabbed him with a knife. I saw her do it. Who stabbed who? The figure stabbed Mr. Raymond, and then she got away. The figure. You're lying. That's impossible. His story is insane, monsieur. That is why we bring him here for question in your presence. The wounded man cannot yet talk. His story is not insane. She tried to kill Raymond because he'd take her away from you, Monty. Florette. And she will come back here just like she said. She's only cloth and wood, I tell you. She can't be anything else. Quiet. Listen. I hear footsteps. Of a woman. In my studio. Come, we're going in there. We oui. Open quick that door. I have it. <gasps> a mannequin. Oh, she has entered through the window. A bloodstained knife is in her hand. It is the one she used on Mr. Raymond. She's coming for me. Oh, Monty, save me. I won't let her harm you. Stop that thing. Quick, quick. I've got a knife. Now, I've knocked her down. She's just a padded figure. She couldn't walk as we've seen her. She couldn't try to kill anyone. We're all of us mad and seeing things that can't be true. No, we won't see things anymore. Paul, don't slash her with that knife. I'm going to find the infernal mechanics that make her run. Oh! Oh, you ripped her body. You spoiled the thing of beauty. Are you satisfied now? Now when you see she's nothing but cloth and wallet stuffing on a wooden frame? The framework isn't wooden. It's a human skeleton. Oh, my oh. Oh. oh, the head is a skull. The air is growing from a human scalp. Oh. It's, it's the skeleton of Marcel Valmont's wife. He put her bones inside the figure that he made. It seems so. He put bones denied rest in the grave. I've been lonely, Monty. She found and loved you. Because you look like the man she loved in life. I think that's the explanation of all that's happened, Monty. Perhaps it is. Where, where is her husband's grave, Paul? At Lyons, in the Cemetery de Loyes. As soon as you police have finished, Sergeant Grosjean, uh, I'll see these poor, restless bones are buried beside the man she truly loved. Monty. Florette, I, I wonder if I... if I was him a hundred years ago. We'll have another 30 yarn to spin you folks when we comes back from our vacation.
have sailed. I have moved about this world of ours, and ever in search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. <laughs> Manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King cigarettes take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5 today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. Off, honey. Donna, I'm so scared. Oh, no need to be. Like the song says, fly me to the moon. <laughs> Jane, you're going to have the most famous husband in the whole world. By tonight, I'm going to be the first man on the moon. How do you like it? Huh? I don't like it, Don. I'm scared. You're scared? <laughs> How do you think I feel? I know you're never scared, Don. You're brave and I'm just, well, I'm just your wife. Can't you guess how it feels? Anything can go wrong. Anything. Oh, Donna... I'm sorry if I make you ashamed of me. Uh, kiss me, honey. Come on. There we are. The first man on the moon kisses his wife. There's no danger, June, honey. Unless I'm riding a streetcar. The eggheads are not scientists. They've got it all buttoned up. I, I just ride the capsule, that's all. Promise. Well, anyway, I'd better get down to Cape Kennedy for the briefing, I guess. Text, General, same as yesterday. Sutton, have you checked the pulse weight? Yes, sir. Normal as indicated. Respiration normal, no significant change. Well, General Miller, looks like I get to go to the moon, huh? Yeah, except that you uh, aren't bound for the moon. Uh, how's that again? 
Well, uh, the general... The is agree. not your objective, Winston. Oh, I know you've been led to believe that this was the culmination of our moon trials, but it isn't. Now, look. Oh, look I, I, I was promised. They told me I'll be the first man on the moon, and now you're cheating me out of it. Oh, that, 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 that's not fair, General. No, no matter what you say, this is the biggest day of my life, and you're used to... Your stand there. objective is not the moon, Winston. Your objective is... Mars. <laughs> Utmost secrecy was essential, you realize that. Oh, yeah, sure, General, sure I do. Now, I want to introduce you to Professor Killifer, who will give you the true briefing for what your assignment is going to be. Uh, come this way. Oh, uh, Professor, this is Major Donald Winston, the cosmonaut chosen for this great and historic flight. What? Oh, yes, sir. How to do, young man? Oh, I feel fine, thanks, Professor. Good. Then let me put it to you simply. We have decided that the time has come for one of you young men to demonstrate that we lead the world in space travel. We have decided to make a manned space landing on the red planet, Mars. Uh, is that possible, Professor? Oh, yes, I mean, yes, 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 of course. But, you see, you will not merely be traveling through space. You will be traveling through time. Time? I don't get it. No, no, no. We, we are using a new technique. We have experimented exhaustively with it, and it shows no signs of possible failure. If it is as successful as we hope, then the galaxies are open to us, and we may travel in the spaces between the stars. Uh, time travel, huh? Well, I've speculated about it, sir. I suppose yes. we all have, but... Under some pretty rough snags? Ah, uh, well, uh, as a matter of fact, that is exactly what we want to discover. We are using uh, Reinhold's theory of the time slip. And once your ship has passed beyond the Earth's orbit, then the special gear will come into operation that will launch you through the fourth dimension. Are you willing to be the first man to undertake this great experiment? Willing? Oh, this will be the, the greatest thing ever tried. Yes. Uh, your permission to mention this to my wife, sir? Uh, uh, well, all right. I suppose human feelings must be taken into consideration. <sighs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll speak to her and see you at the launching pad. <laughs> Tell you it isn't dangerous. I you know. Travel through time? Who had that crazy idea? Oh, Professor Killifer. Oh, I know he looks like an old nut, but he's a great, great scientist. Uh, he wouldn't uh, let a man run any unnecessary risk, honey. Oh, before, I could think of you flying to the moon or the stars, but where will you be now, Don? Between the minutes and the hours? Between the centuries? How can I know? Oh, Don, please, please tell him you refuse to go. I can't do that, Jane. It's a chance of a lifetime. I can't do that. Then I know you won't come back. You'll never come back to me, Don. Because you've signed your own death warrant. You have a check on uptime for 50 centuries. And downtime? Back as far as the Second Ice Age. Ah, good, excellent. The power required will be 2,008 sun units, and the slip will be of a mere 50 years. Uh, Professor, uh, do you know for sure that this is safe? Time travel has never been tried before. How can I possibly answer that? Rockets control. Function appears normal, sir. Check airlines and fuel ballasting. Check by instruments, all normal. Are you ready for countdown? 
Already? I'm handing you over to Professor Killifer, who will complete this briefing. Winston? I'm receiving you, Professor. When the time slip takes place in orbit, you'll feel nothing. There will be merely a singing in your ears. Do you understand? I understand. Good. The countdown will start now. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Blast off! Professor, are you ready with a comma card? Yes, I am completely ready. The capsule has established a steady orbit. Now, switches. Are you receiving me, Earth? Are you reading me? We are receiving you, Winston. Where? I'm in the dark. The dark? Where am I? You are passing through the dust of passing time. You are in the darkness of old time. Soon you will emerge. There's a sense of falling light. Falling light... Relax completely, Winston. Be perfectly still. Breathe deeply. Think of traveling through the spaces between the stars. Between the stars. Light years. Do you check, Miller? Yeah, that checks. But there's no word from him. Even at this distance, we ought to hear the signal. No, 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 no. He's moving in time. Moving in time, Killifer. Or last in time. <laughs> Mrs. Winston. Shh, Professor. My baby's asleep. Oh, I simply have to talk to you. And I know exactly what you have to say. My husband isn't coming back. Is that it? Oh, how can you say such a thing? How can you remain so calm if you suspect but that... Look, I've looked into your eyes, Professor. And I know you're mad. You may fool the others, General Miller and Don and the rest, but I know your secret. You're stark raving mad. There has been a technical interference with the radio transmission from the capsule. That's all. You know it as well as I do. You're stark raving mad. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. Poor 
were done. To be lost beyond the stars is serious, isn't it? But what is it like to be lost in time? It must be like living two minutes away from sanity. Earth? Earth, are you reading me? Earth? It's dark. It's dark. I, I'm moving into nowhere. Earth? Earth, you're reading me? Try the micro adjustment on the chroma card. Yes, I'll put it at a microsecond. With the automatic time slip counter, that should give us contact at any minute. How do we know? How do we know any longer than a minute means to Don Winston? Or a million years come to that? He's lost. Lost in time. <laughs> I have no means of knowing if this message is being received. I'll never go on broadcasting as long as it remains possible. Yeah, reading you, Winston, loud and clear. Contact reestablished, then good. Well, now get this. Mars, the red planet, is directly ahead of me. Estimated speed, 28,000 terrestrial knots. I can see the famous canals quite clearly. Two minutes exactly, I'll fire the retro rockets to slow my descent. Uh, understood. Mila, it's worked exactly as I knew it would. Succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. He's steering a direct course for Mars. Switch back. I am about to fire the retro rockets. Don Winston, are you still in contact? Winston, are you still in contact? Come in, Winston. General Miller, come in. Mrs. Winston, uh, we've established contact with your husband. He's alive and well. You know he isn't coming back. That's an absurd thing to say. Last night I had a dream of a planet with two moons and a sun. Please spare me your dreams, Mrs. Winston. I tell you, your husband is alive and well. I saw two men there, and they walked slowly to greet one another. And one turned to me. I saw it was Don. His face was terrible. It, he looked mad driven out of his mind by horror. Now, this is ridiculous. In the first place, it's only a dream. No, it, it was more than that. In any case, how could there be two men? Mars is uninhabited, so far as we know. So far away out there, and lonely in the immensity of space, terrified, lost. My main reason in calling on you was to ask you to come down to the control room and talk to your husband. Uh, perhaps that will convince you. Will you come with me? Yes. Yes, I must come up. I have to hear it all, right to the very end. In here, Mrs. Winston. Thank you. Uh, hello, Mrs. Winston. Please, come and sit down by me here. Have you heard anything further from Don? Uh, we lost contact on the landing, but that was to be expected. He hasn't been in touch for some 15 minutes, but there's no cause for alarm. Well, listen to the monitor speaker there, Mrs. Winston. There, that slight crackle means he switched on his transmitter. Calling Earth. Calling Earth. You're receiving me. I'm reading you, Winston. The capsule has landed safely. I am standing. 
on the surface of the planet Mars. This is a historic moment, Winston. A journey safely made through space and time. Your wife is here, Winston. She wants to speak to you. Then I shall contact the president himself. I want to speak to June, please. Here, speak into the microphone. Don? Don, are you all right? Sure. Sure. Muzzy, I guess. I feel different, honey. It isn't easy to explain. Now look out yourself. I'll be back soon, huh? Don, I need you here. Hurry back. Now, Winston, I want to run down on your physical symptoms. Well, I, I feel okay, I guess. Just lonely. And as if, uh, I don't know how to say it, as if I'd lost some part of me. Some part of me that's uh, got away during those lonely miles in space and time. I haven't any way of saying it properly. I... I may have changed in some way. What is the reading on the chrono cord? Well, let's see. Uh, 70,209. Vincent, check that last figure. Did you say nine? Check nine. We read seven. Is that important? Two-second displacement. I can't understand. Although the instruments may be faulty... Never mind, Winston. Now, tell us what you see around you. Well, just this great red planet. Treeless and lifeless. Rocks everywhere. Blue rocks with lines of strata. Straw yellow as if uh, molded by great heat. We'll need samples, Winston. I'll bring them. And Winston... There is no sign of life at all? No, none. A little hill just to my right. I'm going to climb it. Then I'll have a much wider view of the landscape. I'll switch off for a few moments. Over and out. Oh, oh it's horrible. Mrs. Winston, it's an awe-inspiring and wonderful moment. Your husband has done something no other man has ever done. This is a magnificent feat, and you should be very proud of him. He said he'd lost some part of himself. Can't you imagine it out there on that red plane? Alone? Quite alone on an alien planet, locked away behind a time barrier? I just thought of something. Einstein pointed out that if a man on a distant planet could look at Earth, he wouldn't see today at all, but the past. He might see the Battle of Waterloo or something of the sort. But to Don, we aren't born yet. Mrs. Winston, you've talked to him. You've heard him. (laughs) He's getting in contact once more. I don't understand this. I don't think I like it very much. There's something wrong about this place. Something terribly wrong. Something's terribly wrong. It, it's impossible. I I climbed the little hill with the muscle assister. It was quite easy. I reached the top. I think I'm going mad. Because behind me and in front of me, it's, it's a mirror image. The rocks, red earth, everything like a mirror image. Identical. Even the little hill. I'm going to walk over to that hill, but how can I? It's, it's this hill. I'm standing on it. I think I must be going mad. Listen, he's coming in again. I walked across the landscape into the mirror. Very silent here. No birds, insects, no noise of any kind. Even my footsteps seem noiseless. There's a sense of desolation, and nothing lives here, nothing. Sky is yellow, landscape is double. It's, it's double. 
You must keep a firm hold of yourself, Winston. It's like a nightmare. Don, Don, come back to me. I'm, I'm lost in a nightmare. It doesn't sound much, just that the landscape is double, but I, I'm scared of what I may find and what I may meet up here. But, man, you just said there was no living thing to be seen or heard. I'm not scared of living things. Will it be alive? How can it be alive? Yet time has images. Time is like a great pile of pictures. Endless and... There he comes. Walking down from that little hill over there. Be more explicit, Winston. Who is coming? A cosmonaut in a spacesuit. Tall, young. You know that's impossible, Winston. There can be no other man on that planet. Unless the Russians... No, this isn't a Russian. Someone I know quite well. Hi, Don. Hello, Don. Seems there's two of us now. Wish we're twins, huh? I'm twins. This is the worst kind of horror. Do we, do we both exist? Yeah, we both exist in time. Different well, parts of time we exist, and, and we don't. I am... Oh, wait. I, I am Don Winston. Then, then who are you? Don Winston. Cousin. <laughs> no, you're not. You can't be. You just cut that out. Keep your head, you fool. It's possible, then. A man to meet himself in time. Can't be possible. I'm going back. got home. One thing I'm certain of. We've seen nothing of him here behind the creaking door. <laughs> Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. This is your host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? Through the creaking door, of course. <laughs> the manufacturers of State Express 3.5's Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present... Creaking door.
This is the house of mystery. Good evening. This is Roger Elliott, otherwise known as the Mystery Man, welcoming you to another storytelling session here at the House of Mystery. Today, we continue with the reading of Edward Bulwer-Lytton's famous ghost story, The Haunters and the Haunted. As Ruth told us yesterday, Mr. Bulwer-Lytton was not only a writer of ghost stories, but the author of The Last Days of Pompeii and a distinguished member of the British Parliament. Uh, well, uh, why did he write The uh, Haunters and the Haunted? Why, Johnny? Uh-huh. Well, I should say for the same reason that I spend a good deal of time investigating rumors of supernatural manifestations to prove, if possible, that ghosts and phantoms exist only in the imagination. Does he uh, prove it? In the story? Well, let's find out, shall we? Yeah. Down with the lights, Johnny. That's fine. As you know, this story is about a haunted house in the very heart of the city of London. A house no human being would occupy because of the weird and frightening creatures who were said to inhabit it. However, the man who tells the story decided to investigate the house. He and his secretary, Frank Carter, moved in. The first thing they noticed were mysterious footprints on the damp stones of the yard at the rear of the house. Footprints that formed before their very eyes. Then inside the house they saw a mysterious light fashioned in human shape. A light that ran up the stairway to the attic and disappeared. They decided to retire for the night and search the house in the morning. But no sooner was the man who tells the story in bed when a cold wind passed over his face and an invisible hand reached out and took his watch from the table beside the bed. Well, that's where I stopped yesterday. Now I'll continue from page 271, chapter 3 of The Haunters and the Haunted. I sprang out of bed, seizing my revolver in one hand and my dagger in the other. I was going to make sure that fiendishly invisible hand didn't get them, too. Then I started to search the floor for the watch. It was nowhere to be seen. Suddenly, I heard three loud, distinct knocks at the head of my bed. Frank heard them, too, and called out from his room. I warned him to be on guard. All my courage was disappearing fast. Now, my bull terrier, sleeping in front of the fireplace, roused himself and sat up on his haunches, his ears twitching. What had he heard? My attention was entirely directed toward him. I saw him get up slowly, his short hair bristling, and stand perfectly rigid. A few seconds later, Frank came into the room. And if I ever saw stark horror in a human face, I saw it then. I wouldn't have recognized him had I met him on the street. He rushed over to me, and when he spoke, his voice was a ghastly whisper. Run! Run, he said. It's after me! In a moment, he was at the door of the landing. He pulled it open and went bounding down the stairs, unheeding my cries to stop. I heard where I stood the street door open. Then I heard it slam. I was alone in the haunted house. I struggled with myself for a moment. Should I follow Frank, I decided against it. Yes, I was somewhat frightened. But at the same time, my mind refused to believe the incredible things my eyes had witnessed. If I could only keep my wits about me, I was certain nothing could go wrong. I went immediately to Frank's room... In spite of careful searching, I could find no door or even crack in the wall by which the invisible thing could have entered. My own room was the only possibility. I decided to return to my own chamber and wait for the thing to appear again. Once inside, I shut and locked the door to the hall. Then I stood by the fireplace, expectant and prepared. It was then I missed my dog. Horror seized me, for he was my only companion now. Looking around, I saw him slunk into an angle in the wall as if literally trying to force his way through it. I went over and spoke to him. The poor beast was beside himself with terror. His teeth were bared, foam dripped from his lips. And my favorite pet would certainly have bitten me had I dared touch him. And so, though I wanted badly to comfort him, and in fact needed comfort myself, I left him alone. 
Taking a deep breath, I put my weapons, gun and dagger, back on the table, lit my pipe, and seating myself near the fire, began to read. It was only a few minutes before I became aware of something standing between the page and the light. I had heard nothing. I'd seen nothing. Only a deep shadow on the printed page. I looked up and saw... How can I describe the horrible sight? It was a darkness shaping itself out of the air in an undefined outline. I cannot say it was a human form, and yet it looked more like a human form than anything else. Except that it was gigantic, stretching from the floor to the ceiling. While I gazed, the feeling of intense cold seized me. I couldn't have been chilled more by an iceberg. And to this I will swear. The cold I felt was not only the freezing chill of fear. At one moment, I thought I saw two eyes staring at me from that great height. I tried to speak, but my voice failed me. I could only think to myself, it is from fear like this that men die. I tried to get up, but I was held down by some invisible force. An immense and overpowering will was pitted against mine. A will that was as superior to mine as the strength of storm, fire, and flood are superior to man's. And now, as this impression grew on me, came horror. Horror to a degree impossible to convey in words. I knew if I surrendered to it now, I was lost. With a violent effort, I succeeded at last in stretching out my hand to the revolver on the table. As I did so, a heavy blow fell on my wrist and another on my shoulder. My arm fell to my side, powerless. Now, to my added horror, the flames of the candle suddenly flickered violently and went out. I was in total darkness. This was too much. I must break through this horror. With a supreme effort of will, I steeled myself and found voice. Yes, I found voice. Though that voice was but a scream of wingless terror. Yet it was enough to break the spell. I rushed to one of the windows, and tearing the curtains aside, I flung the shutters open. When I saw the moon, high, clear, and calm, some part of my fright vanished. I turned to look back into the room. The dark thing, whatever it was, had disappeared, except that I could still see a faint shadow against the opposite wall. My eye next rested on the table. Then it was that horror returned. As I saw from under the table, a hand rising. A hand seemingly cut off at the wrist. It was a human hand. An old woman's hand with skin that was parched and wrinkled. Slowly, the hand closed over the two letters that lay on the table. And in a flash, hand and letters vanished. Then once again, I heard on the headboard of my bed the three loud knocks. As these sounds ceased, I felt the whole room vibrate. And at the far end, sparks suddenly began to rise from the floor. Green, yellow, blue, and red sparks. A chair then moved itself away from the wall and placed itself at one end of the table. I blinked my eyes. This must be a delusion. When I opened them again, I'd see nothing. But I was wrong. The next time I looked at that chair, I saw, as if growing out of it, a woman's shape, ghastly as the shape of death. The face was that of a young girl, a girl with a strange, mournful beauty. Her throat and shoulders were bare. The rest of her form was enveloped in a gown of cloudy white. The figure began combing its long yellow hair, which fell over its shoulders. Its eyes weren't turned toward me, but toward the door. It seemed listening, watching, waiting. The shadow in the background grew darker. I thought I saw eyes gleaming from the top of it. Eyes that were now fixed on the shape of what had once been a girl. My ordeal of horror wasn't yet over. Coming through the locked door, I saw another shape take form. A shape equally distinct as the girl's and equally ghastly. It was the shape of a young man dressed in a costume of the 1700s. There was something terribly incongruous, grotesque, yes, even frightening in the contrast between the elaborate finery of his dress, with its ruffles and lace and buckles, and the corpse-like look and ghost-like stillness of the creature who wore it. Just as the shape of the young man approached the shape of the girl, the shadow suddenly darted from the wall, and for a moment all three were enveloped in darkness. 
When the pale light returned, the two phantoms were in the grasp of the shadow which towered above them and kept them separated. And there was a dark stain on the cloudy white garments of the girl, just where her heart might have been. The young man was leaning on his sword. Only a moment was given me to see this horrible sight. Then the shadow descended again, and they were gone. The closet door to the right of the fireplace now opened, and from it came the form of an old woman. In her hand she held letters, the very letters over which I'd seen the hand close, and behind her I heard a footstep. She turned as if to listen. Then she opened the letters and seemed to read, and over her shoulder I saw a livid face. The face of a man long drowned, with seaweed tangled in his dripping hair. And at her feet there was a child, a weeping child. Even as I stared with unbelieving eyes at this fantastic tableau, the wrinkles and lines in the old woman's face disappeared, and it became the face of a young girl. Then once more the gigantic shadow darted from the wall and blotted out the whole mad scene. Nothing now was left but the dark shadow, and on that my eyes remained fixed. Suddenly, bubbles of light began to dance once more, shooting from the floor, bubbles of every color and shape imaginable. Sometimes I felt myself touched, but not by them. Invisible hands touched me. Once I felt the clutch of cold, soft fingers at my throat. I was still conscious that if I gave way to fear, I might never emerge from that house alive. I knew that there was a will working against me, a will of intense evil which could easily crush my own. I determined not to surrender. Marshalling all my strength, I started to concentrate on fighting it out. But it was an unequal struggle. As the dark shadow started moving toward me, and a great burst of colored flame shot its terrifying bolt, I fell senseless to the floor. <laughs> Johnny, turn up the lights. Hey, uh, my. Hey, uh, this isn't a true story, is it, Mystery Man? <laughs> of course not, Johnny. But you said that uh, Mr. Bulwer Lytton had explanations for all the uh, supernatural things that happened. Well, I didn't quite say that, Ruth. What I did say, or at least what I meant to say, was that Bulwer Lytton tries to explain why the storyteller saw the ghostly manifestations. Well, uh, how can there be any explanation for people appearing and disappearing and hands reaching out for things in uh, black shadows? You uh, haven't a very good memory, Johnny. Remember the story of the haunted lighthouse? Sure. Remember how there seemed to be no logical explanation for the voice that said, You'll die too? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that was the wind. How's he going to explain the things he saw? Well, suppose we wait and see. Tomorrow we'll continue with Chapter 4 of The Haunters and the Haunted. Same time and for our radio listeners, the same station. I'll be waiting for you at The House of Mystery. This is Roger Elliott. Your mystery man saying good night. Lipton Soup presents Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you in through the squeaking door to another half hour of horror. Come in, won't you? Sit down. I hope you'll forgive me if I don't get up, but I'm terribly tired. 
I spent last night with a friend who's a book collector, specializes in bestsellers. He certainly showed me some interesting ones. In fact, he tried to bury me in one. Because all the very best sellers have corpses in them. <laughs> Why, that's downright silly. Most sellers do not have bodies in them. But of course they have, Mary. You know the old saying, even the walls have ears. Hmm? <laughs> you certainly don't make a house sound homey at all. Why don't you talk about the kitchen with its good, warm smells of homemade food? Yes, and while you're at it, you should mention Lipton tea, because Lipton's makes good food taste better. You see, folks, Lipton's has a brisk flavor. And brisk means that Lipton tea always tastes fresh and full-bodied, tangy and spirited, never flat or wishy-washy. That's why Lipton's is such a grand drink at mealtimes, and why it's the perfect beverage to serve when you're entertaining. That's right. That brisk flavor makes all the difference in the world. So, folks... Try Lipton's, won't you? And now, friends, if you're willing to gamble with your peace of mind, put out the lights and listen to Death by Scripture. It's an original radio play by that old gravedigger, Robert Newman. Yes, and our star tonight is Stefan Schnabel, who plays the role of Stefan. The place is China. Somewhere near the outskirts of Shanghai, a man-made wasteland ravaged and devastated by war. Driving through an abandoned village on his way to a camp for displaced persons is Major Roger Mason. Suddenly, the glare of his headlights picks out a strange, wild-eyed figure who stares and scuttles into the shelter of an alley. Mason hesitates for only a moment, then stops his jeep. Hello there. Come back here for a minute, will you? Hello. Okay, if you want to make a game out of it. There's Sally somewhere. Huh. Oh, there you are. Please. Please, Master, please. I mean no harm. Easy, uh, easy. Now, no one's going to hurt you. Certainly not me. I'm an American on my way to Camp 14. Camp 14? The camp for refugees, displaced persons. I know. I was there. Yes, I thought so. How was it they let you leave? They did not let me. I... I ran away. Oh? Why? Because to stay would have meant death. Seems to me it would be a lot more dangerous to go wandering around here. Suppose I take you back there with me. No. No, no, please. But I tell you, there's nothing to be afraid of. Huh? You think not? <laughs> Very well. What can man do against fate? I tried... You're a witness that I tried. But I warn you, if I go back, it will mean death. Not just for me, but for others. Many others. Tommy? Dr. Corner? Yes. I'm Major Mason. I... Major Mason. I'm very happy to meet you. Welcome to Camp 14. I'm very glad to meet you, too. I've heard a great deal about you. The job you've been doing here. Oh, Dad. There was not much I could do when we were all prisoners. But now that we have been freed and are beginning to get food and medical supplies, it is almost like a holiday. May I present Miss Mia Singh, who has been assisting me? Major Mason? Miss Singh? I brought someone here with me, someone I picked up on the road, and... Stefan. I did not want to come back. He made me. Well, then he does come from the camp here? Yes, of course. A curious case. We have never been able to discover his last name or even his nationality. We have many kinds here, you know. White Russians, Koreans, Siamese, Burmese. Stefan, why did you do it? Why did you run away? Because I, I was afraid. Because of this. Another one. That same paper. What is it? We found about a dozen of them scattered around the camp this afternoon. But read it. You have not escaped. There is no escape. Do you recognize this symbol here? Japanese Black Dragon Society. It says there is no escape. And it's true. I tried to escape, and what happened? He brought me back. Our benefactor. Our savior. 
I told you there was nothing to be afraid of, Stefan. Afraid? Is death something to be feared? It is the one escape they cannot take from us. Death. To sleep. To rest. Mm. To rest. He's really in a pretty bad state. Couldn't you put him up in the administration building? Mm. That might be exactly what they want. Uh, what do you mean? It is not like the Black Dragon Society to warn someone they mean to kill. But suppose they don't know exactly who they do want. Wouldn't they do what they seem to have done? Make a general threat and see who showed fear, who did run away? The war is over, Cornell. The Major is right, Doctor. Are we still living in the past? And we do have a room here where we can put Stefan. The one down the hall. Very well. But remember, I warned you. I, too, think it will mean death. Stefan! Stefan! The door is not locked, Major. Come in. I didn't know whether I'd be disturbing you. Whether you were asleep. Sleep? I never sleep. Never. You're feeling better, though, aren't you? Safer? It is at least quiet. A man can think. I was lying here... trying to remember. Trying to remember what? If I knew, I would know everything. But I don't know. There is much that I can remember. Such as what, Stan? The first one, the greatest one, many lifetimes ago. The garden with a wall around it. The torchlight bright on their breastplates and helmets. And his face. Then the hill. The place of skulls. The earth shaking. Stop it, Stefan. Whatever it is you're talking about, it. it's horrible. Horrible, yes. But true... Those I can remember, I can't ever forget. But what I can't remember is now who I am, what I must do, and why. It will be horrible, too. As bad as the others, but I... Look, Stephen, I... you're a sick man. Now, you've got to rest. You've got to stop thinking, brooding. I'm going to get you something, some medicine. That will help you to sleep. Then when you're strong again, we'll take you away from here. Sleep. I told you I do not sleep. I cannot sleep. No? We'll see about that. I'll be back in a few minutes. Sleep. He does not believe that it is not for me. Not even the final one, which is dreamless. What's that? Outside the door. This door. But who... Who is that? Who is there? No! No, no, no! Major Mason! Major Mason! Did you hear... Yes. Down at the end of the hall there. Stefan's room. Come on, quick. Major Mason! Here! This way, down here. It sounded like shots, as if... It was. Look. Dave. No, don't touch him. Let me see. Dead. Unless he's not flesh and blood. Three slugs right over the heart. Must have been fired right from the door there and... Good, Good Lord. What is it? His pulse. Still there. Where's your searcher? Right next to the office. What there is of it. Here, help me carry him in there. We'll operate immediately. <laughs> Another swap. That's it. Mm. Oh, I don't dare probe. Forceps. It, it is almost in the vena cava. No worse than the others. It's absolutely impossible. No one will believe it. But he's still alive. There. 
The last one. He does pull through. He even holds out for a couple of hours. I'll believe anything. How is he, Mia? I don't believe it either. But he's better. His pulse is still strong and there are no signs of shock. I'll stay with him for a while. You go get some sleep. No, I, I'm all right. I'd like to stay until we are sure that... <gasps> Major, look. He's coming to No. Don't make me come back. Don't make me do it again. Don't. Hello, Stephen. How are you feeling? What? Oh, yes. The American. Why are you looking at me like that? Because you have no right to be alive now. And you wouldn't be if it were not for him. I never had any right to be alive. But I am. I won't die. I told you I wouldn't. I couldn't. Until I do what I have to do. And what's that? It is coming to me. Slowly. I'm beginning to remember. I do not see it all yet. But I know what it will mean. Vultures and blood. Coffins and death. Well, now we're starting to get somewhere. But I wish our friend with a bad memory would stop talking about what he has to do and do it. Here we are halfway through our story with only one shooting and no corpses. Things don't pick up. I'm going to get in there myself and show them how to pour gore. My goodness, aren't you ever satisfied? I've had the creeps ever since this story started. I just refuse to think about what's going to happen next. Well, as the doctor said, as he sewed himself up, suit yourself. <laughs> what an awful pun. Brr. Why, Mary, did you say brisk? <laughs> I did not say brisk, and I'll thank you not to make fun of that word, because it's a mighty important word in the language of tea experts. Yes, brisk. B-R-I-S-K is the word they use to describe the flavor of Lipton tea, because Lipton's always taste fresh and tangy, never flat or insipid. That's why it's the largest selling brand of tea in the whole world. Well, folks, you just don't know how good tea can be till you know how good Lipton's is. Oh, don't say that, Mary. Not till you've tried some of my special brew, tea and tea. Uh, terror, nightmare, and trouble. <laughs> it is the next evening, about ten o'clock at night. The dust-laden wind still wails around the lonely camp. And the refugees from many nations sit huddled in their rooms. Stefan, his face gaunt and drawn, is sitting propped up in bed in the administration building. Are you sure you feel well enough to talk, Stefan? There is pain, but that does not matter. What is it you wish to know, Major? You were shot, Stefan. You know that. Did you see who it was that shot you? Yes, I saw. But that is not important. It does not matter. What do you mean, it does not matter? Just that, Doctor. You see, much has come back to me. Not who I am, but what I must do. And I know now that I have nothing more to fear. That I was shot by a mistake. Mistake? What the doctor said last night about the Black Dragon Society was quite true. There are... Two men here in the camp for whom the Japanese have been searching for years. Men who have been leading the resistance movement in their own countries. Even now, the Black Dragon Society feels that those two men must die. Do you know who they are? Yes. Do not mention their names. Do not even think them. You know who they are, don't you, Mia? One of them is your own father. Ram Singh. And the other is Pao Tung. Is that true? 
Yes. It is true. Then I think we ought to go see them at once. Make provisions to get them away from here. That, then, is the situation, gentlemen. And I should like to have you escorted to Shanghai as soon as possible. You are very kind, Major. We felt that our best protection lay in anonymity. We may have been wrong. As for the danger... Even though Japan has been beaten, not all the members of the Black Dragon nor their agents have been rounded up. So... Nonsense, Ram Singh. You always were too cautious. The Major is right. We should have declared ourselves, returned to our countries at once. I, for one, will be happy to do so now. Good. There are a few things in my room I would like to get first. It will not take but a moment. I will meet you back here. Fine. You still look worried, Father. Do I? Perhaps I am. After all these years, waiting, working, suffering, to be so close to what I waited and worked for. But what is there to be afraid of? The Major has promised you protection. I know, and I'm profoundly grateful. But I keep wondering how Stefan knew. Ah! What was that? Out on the compound, in the town of like Pautung... Stay here, both. No, wait, I'm coming with you. Father, you stay here. Lock this door and do not let in anyone unless you know who it is. Major Mason. Major Mason, where are you? Over here. This blasted dust is so thick. Who's that? Gone up. You heard it too? Yes. Sounded as if it came from. There he is. Parapum. Yes. Dead? Very. Throat cut from ear to ear. No. No, he... He just left us. He was only gone a minute. That minute was all somebody needed. Who is it? Dr. Kornov, Ramsey. Major Mason asked me to take you up to the administration building. Oh, uh, just a second. That... That scream out in the compound, uh, was it? Yes. Pao Tong. And, uh, and was he... Yes. Killed. That is why the Major wanted me to come and get you. To put you somewhere where you would be safe. You are ready? Yes. For Pao Tong to have lived through so much. Waited for so long. Then... Is it known who did it? No, not yet. But they are closing the gates. Whoever it was will find it difficult to get away. Will they? I wonder. In this dark, where the dust so thick you can hardly see. Besides, suppose it is not someone from outside. Suppose it is someone from the camp here. Someone who has been here for a long time. We are... Dr. Kunov! Dr. Kunov, where are you? Dr. Kunov! Huh. Must have lost him as we came through the alley. With this wind. Dr. Kunov! Is that you? Who is it? Answer me! Tell me who it is! Oh, 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 no! 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 Let me go! Let me go! Open the door for me, will you, Mia? Of course, Major. Where are you going to put him? Here. Right here, in the office. You told the guards at the gate? They are closed now. No one will get out. But... Stefan, what are you doing up? You should not be out of bed. I... I heard something outside. A cry, and I had to see. Which one is it? Partoon. Dead? Yes. His throat cut. And the other. Your father, Mia. Dr. Kronoff went to get him. He is bringing him here where he will be safe. Now go back inside to bed. Father? Dr. Kronoff? Kronoff. Where is your father? Isn't he here? Why, no. 
You were going Didn't to... you go get him? Yes, yes, I did. We started across the compound together, but it was so dark. The dust was so thick. I lost him. I called to him, looked for him, and when there was no answer, I thought he had gone on ahead. Now stay here, all of you. I'll go. I... I'm sorry, me. Why? Why are you looking at me that way? And what are you sorry about? I am sorry that we became separated, that I lost him. I am sorry that he's dead. Dead? How can you say that? Because he must be dead. Because it's part of the pattern, the cycle... That is enough, Stefan. Come on. I will take you back inside. You're a very sick man. Yes, you should be. Yes, I'm sick. Not as sick as some, but sick enough. I won't go back, though. Not yet. I must wait. I'm not sure for what, but... I know I must wait for something. Listen. Major Mason? Yes. You found him? Yes. Yes, I found him. Father. Father. I told you. I knew. He had to be dead. Yes. Yes, he had to be dead. I think I knew it, too. Knew it was hopeless from the very beginning. How? How did it happen? Strangled. Like this. Strangled. Dying out there in the darkness. Two of them killed within a few short minutes, and, and we still do not That's know... That's not completely true, Mia. You... You mean... You know... Your father and Pao Tung were around here for a long time. They died because Stefan revealed their identity. That means the murderer had to have access to that information. He had to know precisely where they were and when they were going to be alone. And he had to be able to get at the medical supplies here. The medical supplies? Because Pao Tung's throat was cut with a scalpel. And your father was strangled with a catcut suture. And that means... Don't I move, didn't... Connor! Had you covered since I came in? Dr. Kornoff. No, I, I do not believe it. Thank you, my dear. I am sure that there will be quite a few others who will feel that same way. Stefan, you saw who shot you. Who was it? He. Kornoff. You too, eh, Stefan? Well, I have a little something here I'd like to show all of you. Something... Major, that... look out! Oh! Oh! Quite fast enough, Kornoff. At least you saved us the trouble of a trial. As for you, Stefan... Do not blame him, Major. It was not his fault. Not his fault? It was he who exposed your father in Pao Tong. I know. But I think I also know why he did it. You know? Then tell me in heaven's name. Here. This should not come from me, but... Take it. Money? You are giving me money? Yes. Silver. The amount may not be exactly right, but... Now do you understand? Yes. Yes. Thank you. And bless you. I do understand everything... What I have done is what I must do. What does he understand? Why did you give him that money? There was once someone else who betrayed a friend and was paid for it with silver. Thirty pieces, to be exact. You mean? Yes. In the Bible. One Judas Iscariot. What that? That's mad, insane. Are you implying that he... That that's why he didn't die when he was shot? That he's eternal, immortal? I do not know. Perhaps he is not always the same. Perhaps in each crisis, in every period of history, there is always one who must play the role of the betrayer, even against his will. But this much I do know. That he is not immortal. Wait a minute. I just remembered the story of Judas in the Bible. 
Come on, quick. What's that? The money I gave him on the floor. And... Good heavens. Yes. Matthew 27, as I recall. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. And went and hanged himself. kind of character we like to have on this program. A little slow getting started, but he did deliver in the end. Ah, two corpses, plus his own. A nice down-to-earth sort of chap who uh, wound up high in the air with a rope round his neck. Yes, we'll have to see that he's back with us again next week. Rope and all. Hmm? Use the rope? Of course we will. You know our motto... No noose is bad news. <laughs> well, that's not my motto, Mr. Host. Is that so, Mary? Now, don't give me any of your lip tons. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly won't give you any of my Lipton's. If you want Lipton tea, you can get it at your grocer's, just like anyone else. And by the way, folks, you'll find that it pays to ask for Lipton's in the larger, more economical size packages. That way, you not only save money but you also make sure that you have a good supply on hand of that brisk-flavored Lipton tea. And you know, Lipton is always welcome. And now here's a word of advice, friend. If you should be invited to spend the weekend with a friend in the country, and he should wake you at midnight carrying a lantern and shovel and invite you to go burying with him, Make sure he doesn't mean burying with a you. And when I say you, I do mean you. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's sinner sanctum mystery novel is The Whistling Legs by Roman McDougall. Yes, the next week's inner sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about a honeymoon couple. Yeah, funny kind of character to be on this program, eh? Is that what you were thinking? Well, this couple finds a corpse right in the middle of their bed. And they can't ask the corpse to leave, not to its face anyway, because, you see, it has no face. <laughs> uh, now it's time to close the squeaking door, so... Good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Folks, here's a modern food with an old-fashioned, homemade flavor. Lipton's noodle soup. You see, Lipton's takes no time to prepare, and yet it's blessed with a real fresh-cooked chickeny taste. And what's more, it's swimming with tender golden egg noodles. That's why Lipton's is such a grand food to give your child when he comes home from school for lunch. Yes, it's quick and it's appetizing. You'll find that children enjoy Lipton's just as much as grown-ups do because it has the same good spices, the same rich, old-fashioned flavor as the chicken soup you'd make right at home. So, friends, don't forget to serve Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. <laughs> This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
to turn off your radio now. This is Mr. O. R. Jobler. What's ugly? What's beautiful? A red, wrinkled, newborn child to its mother is the most beautiful object in the world. Take a mushroom cloud raining down invisible death. To the victim, it's ugliness beyond statement. Yet to the scientist, that bright flash of atomic fission might represent ultimate beauty. What is ugly? What is beauty? Think about it as you listen to Mr. Freak after a message from your station. is your host, welcoming you through the squeaking door, not for a half hour of terror, but to tell you about Radio Nostalgia Magazine. Radio Nostalgia Magazine is a must for old-time radio fans. It's the magazine with many photos and stories of old-time radio and its stars. Our current issue features a 16-page article on The Shadow. All subscribers will get a free Captain Midnight decoder badge, a Captain Midnight Flight Patrol membership, and a Flight Commander Certificate from the Secret Squadron. To get your copy, send $1.50 in check or money order to Radio Nostalgia, Box 8007R, Union City, New Jersey, 07087. That's Radio Nostalgia, Box 8007R, Union City, New Jersey, Zip 07087. Send now and get a free 8x10 photo of the Lone Ranger in Tonto, boys and girls. And now, if you haven't already done so... Turn off your lights now and listen to Mr. Freak. Gun in my hand. Gun in my hand. In all my life, I've never had a gun in my hand. Smooth gun, hard gun, cold gun, cold in my hand. Bullet won't be cold. Warm bullet, hot bullet, burning hot, hot as the blood. No, can't think of that. Turn the muzzle up and press the trigger. Trigger cold against my finger. Cold is death, but life is colder. Rhythm to that. Poet dies with final rhythm. Poet dies who never wrote a poem. Headline for the tabloids. Poet dies with final rhythm. Ugliest man in the world is suicide. Poet dies with final rhythm. Ugliest man in the world is suicide. Poet dies in final rhythm. Ugliest man in the world is suicide. Poet dies in final rhythm. Ugliest man in the world is suicide. Poet dies in final rhythm. No, no, stop. Stop. Ugliest man in the world. All right. I'll think the things of the last time, tear the words around in my head over and over the way they've torn for 30 years. Ugliest man in the world. Ugliest man in the world. Ugliest man in the world. Press the trigger and stop it. Press the trigger. No. No, I can't. I've got to wait. Think it all out clearly for the first time in my life. How it started. Why it's ending this way. Think it all out clearly from the very start. Then, press the trigger. School today, Paul. There's a start. First day of school. How old was I? Nine or ten. She kept me home, away from others. I didn't know why until that day she said... School today, Paul. I said... All right, Mother. Row on row of children looking up at me, staring up at me, gaping up at me. And then... (laughs) One of them started laughing. (laughs) Another laughing. Another and another. Laughing, laughing. I stood there, a little boy looking down at their twisting mouths, my ears filled with the sound of them making fun of me. I knew, but why? Why? Ugliest boy in the world. Ugliest boy in the world. That's why you kept me away from children, Mother. Kept me away until you didn't dare to any longer. Oh, Mother. Mother. Before you let others see me, why didn't you close your hands around my neck, put a knife in my heart, drown me, bury me, put me away where eyes couldn't see me, laughter couldn't reach me? (laughs) But you didn't. (laughs) So this was my boyhood. Tears. Tears without end. A boyhood of tears. A boyhood of tears. 
took me out of school, kept me away from all the others. What good was it? I knew, I knew. There wasn't a mirror in the house. Not a mirror. I didn't dare. You didn't dare. Not a mirror. Until that day you died. Alone. So quiet in the house. I sat down. So quiet. And then suddenly, as if the clock were talking to me. Yes, I remember. Look at yourself. Look at yourself. Look at... Yes. Look at myself. A mirror. I had to find a mirror. Surely my mother kept one mirror somewhere. Drawer after drawer. A mirror. Surely there was a mirror. A mirror. Yes, there was one wrapped in hidden where she thought I'd never find it. Tore the paper off. I kept my eyes shut until the glass was clear, and then I looked. Oh! My face. Can I bear the memory of my face? Can I think of it even now? Gun in my hand. Yes, I will. I will. What did I see? What is my face? A brow? No brow. A thing that sloped away sharply, quickly, like a peak roof half fallen in. Nose, a thick wad of ugly flesh protruding out between two close-set eyes. My eyes. Oh, my eyes, mother of God, my eyes. Two tiny red-rimmed, green-flecked globes that stood far out beyond the lids. And twinkled like a fat, round pig's. My eyes, that was why they laughed at me, my eyes. Ugliest man in the world. Yes. I was that. No longer boy. Ugliest man in the world. Not even tears could help me now. The world outside. At last I had to go out into it. Make a living. Get a job. Get out. Sick a sideshow. Sick a sideshow. Get out. Sideshow. 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 Step up, ladies and gentlemen. Step up, the one and only, ladies and gentlemen. Step right up. Wasn't bad, there. The ugliest man. That's no. what I said. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I said. The ugliest man in the world, and only a dime. A very small part of a dollar. That should step closer, closer, closer. I didn't mind. After a while. Faces looking up at me again, staring, whispering, getting their dimes worth. Spieler talking faces, staring, whispers, snickers. I didn't mind. Why should I? I could get away from them. Yes, stand there in the noise and laughter and leave them far behind. Leave the smell of them and the noise of them and the twisting faces of them. Shut my eyes and leave them quickly, quickly. I'd be in a field, sun-drenched, face to the sky, the warm sun touching me. Soft dress cushioning me, my arms outstretched. All around me such peace and loveliness. I'd lie there so happy. And then a breeze touching my face. And a small white cloud in the sky. And then another... And all at once the clouds were like a woman's face looking down at me. A woman. There was a woman. Hello, big fella. Oh, hello. Hell of a day, huh? Gee, yes. She'll give you a big play. I mean the yokel, don't they? Yes? Me, I'm with Sammy Morton. You know, the grind show. I... uh, Not one of the strippers, you understand. I do a high-class number. You know, semi-classical. Sure been a long, hot day. It has. Nice walking out. In the dark. I mean, the the air's kind of different than on the midway. Yeah, nice in the dark. Awful nice. Do you like the moon? Moon? Oh, sure, sure. You've been working in Tencho's long, big fella? 
So complete, the moon. Boy, you sure pack them in. I had tell you sell more pictures than anybody in the show. I'm sure they add up, don't they? Your face. Did you ever look down from the clouds? <laughs> you mean have I ever been high? Boy, I'm high now. I like the dark, big fella. There was a woman talking. They were talking. Yeah, yeah, sure, Sam. What do you take me for, a chump? Well, what do you think? His face makes me sick just to look at him, but he's got a pocket full of dough. <laughs> so last week I got a telegram from Mama. Poor Mama and the mortgage. And yesterday, while he was looking at me up in the clouds, I got another handful of bucks, and maybe in a couple of weeks I could... You. All right, so you heard. So what? What are you staring at? I don't like your face. You heard me? I don't like your face. I gave you... You gave me a couple of laughs. Love. Love? <laughs> Do you hear that? Love. Do you think any woman can love a mug like yours? It ain't a face, it's a mug, a puss, a pan. Go on, beat it, get out of here. No more walks with me, big fella. I've had a belly full of laughs and I'm too... Hey, 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 what are you... No, stay away from me, don't... Go on, beat it, get out. Yeah, I'll get out as far as I could get out. Any place. Anywhere. Any place, any place, anywhere. Get away, 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 get away. Now we leave our The Devil and Mr. O's story of Mr. Freak for just a moment. So, Mr. President, what does it mean to say love makes all things new again? Love makes all things new again? Well, you see, if somebody's down in the dumps, that means they're very sad. I'd say, I care about you. And then they go, pew! Why is that? Well, when a person knows somebody cares about him, they just feel great. They go, go, pew! Oh, I see. No, that's the same thing as love. What's the same thing as love? Caring about people. Well, suppose there were two people down in the dumps, Mr. President. Oh, I just say, I care about you, I care about you, and go pew, pew. Suppose 200 million Americans were down in the dumps, Mr. President. I'd say, I care about you, 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 I care about you. Love makes all things new again. Hey, what was that? Another sound of love from the Franciscans. We return to our The Devil and Mr. O story of Mr. Freak. They didn't care what kind of a face. Just work hard. Work, work. Hour after hour, sweat salt on my lips. Work, keep working. And I couldn't think. I couldn't think it was good. I couldn't think. But I'm thinking now. Gun in my hand. Stop that thinking. Gun in my hand. No. Got to think out my life. Think it out clearly. Think of that day. She waved at me. was working, bent over, sun hot on my back, drain thick around me, filling the world, covering, hiding me. I straightened up, something moving through the grain on the road, climbing the hill. So far away, could hardly tell what it was. Shaded my eyes from the sun. I saw a woman on horseback. No, so small, must be a girl. I saw her arm... Wave at me. I dropped in the grain. I said, leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone. The next day again, standing in the grain, a tiny figure on horseback waved at me. I dropped in the grain again. No, no more. Just the sky and the grain and the work was all I wanted. The next day and the next, a girl on horseback riding far off there in the road 
waving at me in the green, waving at me day after day. And one day, I, I didn't drop in the green. I stood. I waved back at her. Waving at me because she couldn't see me. See my... This pan mug. In spite of myself one day, I, I was hiding in the grain at the edge of the road, waiting for her. Wanted to run, yet I stayed. Wanted to cover my eyes, yet I looked. Looked with eyes as big as all my loneliness. Horse knew I was there. She didn't. She started singing a little song as she passed... A song without meaning, but warm as the sun. And I saw, I saw her, young, lovely, young, lovely. The words tumbled over and over in my head as I watched her go by. Young, lovely, young, lovely, young, lovely. I began to see her face everywhere, in the green, in the sky. And at night in the dark. Ugliest man in the world. Thinking of the loveliest face in the world. I tried to stop it. I couldn't help it. I couldn't. The loneliness in me was a pain I couldn't endure anymore. Again and again, I hid in the grain and watched her go by me. Just a quick moment. And then she was gone. And I was left in loneliness again. If she couldn't see my face. Yes, if she were blind. I read a book like that somewhere. A woman never saw the man she loved. If she couldn't see me, only know me as I am, my voice, my thoughts, my dreams, ambitions. If she couldn't see dangerous daydreams that brought me to a gun in my hand. But I was lonely. I had nothing. So I had dreams of her, blind, not knowing my face. Mother in heaven, if she were only blind, if she were only blind... Wish, Father, to the deed. That day, working in the grain. Looked up. She was riding by. Why so early? Why so early? Her little hand waving at me. Then the rush of an auto. I ran. The grain tearing at me, holding me back. In a moment, she was in my arms. Help me. Please. Help me. I can't see. I can't see can't see. I dreamed it, prayed it, and now... I can't see. What have I done? What have I done? Concussion. Nerve block. No, no, I had nothing to do with it. Just a thought. I had only a thought. But now she couldn't see me as I was. Couldn't see me. Couldn't see me. You've been very kind to me, Mr. Martin. Poor. Oh. Everlasting music in my ears. Come here every day, won't you? It's so good having you to talk to. You've made these wonderful days, Paul. Everlasting music, her voice being with her, knowing her. And she knowing only that of me which had no ugliness. You've such a good mind, Paul. The best I've ever known. I needed a mind like yours. Paul, because you've made me happy again. You, Paul. And I bless you for it. Happy days, endless days, quicksilver days, then the day. Paul, I've been waiting for you. I wanted to be here sooner. The, the grain. The grain? It's a very tall and bold now, Paul. Very. <laughs> Remember how the grain used to keep us apart before I even knew you. I'd wave and the grain was between us. And I never knew you. Is knowing me important? Paul. Do you know me now? You're the only one I've wanted to be with. Do you know me now? Paul. Paul, listen to me. I know you now better than I could if my eyes were open. 
And twice as wise as they ever could have been. You're lovely. And so are you. I... You never... You've never seen me. Oh. When people have talked together as much as you and I, every little hope and hurt, dream and plan, don't they know more than if they looked at faces? And what do you look like, Paul? I... No, let me guess. I've sat here in the dark and seen your face so many times before me. My face? Yes. Let me tell you. It's a large, virile face. A face that matches up with all the strength of you. Uh. Strong, straight mouth. A firm chin. Skin brown. Yet soft. Straight nose that's... It's not too small, yet not too large. And then your eyes. Eyes? Oh, yes, your eyes. They're large and dark and gentle. Gentle as the way of you, Paul. Well, how close was I to knowing you? Give me your hand. Oh, no. No, I, I don't want to touch your face. You... Later, yes. Not now, Paul. I want you to read me something. Read? Yes. So strange we were talking about faces when I have this book for you to read to me. Look. Do you know the book, Paul? Cyrano de... Yes. Brave Cyrano de Bergerac. You've read the play, of course. I... I never have. Then I envy you. I wish I'd never read it so that I could read... Hear it all over again. Please read it for me. Here, start any place. Read, Paul. Thou lovest her. Tell her. For I do surmise thou art a hero in her eyes. That was Labray, Cyrano's friend. Now go on, read Cyrano's speech. Nay. Shall I woo the loveliest maid in France? Look at me, friend. With my poor big devil of a nose. I dream, even I, of walking neath that beam, loving, beloved. Oh, read it with your heart, Paul. He was ugly. Oh, the rest of him was beauty, just his nose. Read Cyrano's lines, and I'll try to remember Roxanne's. She was the woman he loved, and he never dared tell her of his love because of his ugliness. Read, Paul. The top of the page. Roxanne calls... Sister, oh sister, read, Paul. No, call no one here. Ere you come back, I should have gone away. I long for harmony to end my day. I love you, live. In fairy tales long since, the princess said that, and the ugly prince lost all his plainness. In that sudden sun. But see, I finish as I was begun. I made your grief. I, I. You made my bliss. I lacked all woman's kindness. Even this. My mother found me ugly. And I had no sister. Lest they mock an ugly lad, I shunned all women. You became my friend. One soft gown brushed my path before the end. Paul. Paul. You cried. Cry. What is there to cry about? It's true there's no reason to cry. It's just a play. In life, no man could be such a fool. Goodbye. Goodbye. No, Paul, don't. I... I haven't had a chance to tell you. My eyes. An operation, and I'll see you again. That's why I didn't want to see your face with my hands. I'll see you with my eyes, Paul. See you with my eyes. See you with my eyes. See you again. See you again. See what? <laughs> a face to laugh at. The ugliest man in the world. A face to jeer at. Put hand the mug. A face to shout at, but not to love. Not to love. Never will I, so long as I am master, let beauty so divine meet such disaster, ugliness, mark, affection, Cyrano. Read you a thousand times because she read you. 
The author gave you a paper nose, but my ugliness is flesh and blood. Flesh and blood to see, to hate. She'll never see me, never, never. Lift the muzzle. Press the trigger. Trigger cold against my finger, cold as death. But life is colder. Thoughts in my mind like a whirling circle. Ugliest man in the world. Ugliest man in the world. Press the trigger. Press the trigger. Press the trigger. Paul. Who is it? Paul. Paul, where's the light? You see. It's been weeks. I've been searching. Where's the light, Paul? Forget me. So dark. In your hand. Oh, Paul. I wasted too much time thinking. Oh, my dear. Forget me, I tell you. You knew me in the dark. Well, now it's light for you, and I'm not meant for the light. Forget me. I want to know you. In the light, your ugliness. Huh? Yes, Paul. I've known. First, when you cried with Cyrano. Then I asked the others, and they told me. But you don't know. My face, a thing... A thing apart as my blindness was apart from me. I love you. You... Love? Love you. Yes. I love you. You... Don't know. But I will know. Turn on the light, Paul. I'm not afraid. Turn on the light. I love you. Live. For me. In fairy tales, long since, the princess said that. And the ugly prince lost all his plainness in that sudden sun. The play has ended. The players, Raymond Edward Johnson and Ann Shepard. Uh, speaking of stories, I've written a novel titled House on Fire. You can get it, I hope, at your local bookstore. Its publisher is Bartholomew House. But now let's talk about our next The Devil and Mr. O story after this word. Hello, this is Greg Morris. You know, some of the cases we solve on Mission Impossible are like rolling off a log compared to the way things really are. Our courts are full of kids caught in the trap of the judicial system. Lack of understanding among ourselves has caused racial and cultural problems. And some say the traditional family structure is crumbling. But the YMCA is doing something about these issues. The Y has recently adopted five national goals dealing with the 1970s and the years beyond. These are goals dealing with eliminating personal and institutional racism, changing the conditions that foster alienation, delinquency, and crime, reducing health problems, strengthening family structures, and joining people from other countries in building international understanding. Learn about these projects for a better America and a better world at your local YMCA. Remember, you can't do it all and neither can the Y. But together, you can help build a bridge to a better tomorrow. This is Mr. O again. Has there ever been a poltergeist in your life? I sincerely hope not. You see, poltergeist is supposedly a restless ghost who tears and throws sometimes right at your own head. That's our play next time. It's titled simply Gravestone. But that's next time we meet. Marshall. Welcome to the terrifying world of your imagination. I have an unusual story for you about a crack in a cellar wall that resists all efforts to repair it. Despite all the learning through the ages, despite the world's great progress in physics, chemistry, biology, 
There are certain matters which cannot be explained by our computers or our wise men. Matters which may never have a logical explanation. Our mystery drama, The Crack in the Wall, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sidney Sloan and stars Celeste Holm. It was a cold, rainy, windy day when Paul and Nora Santfort laid their child to rest in Green Tree Cemetery. Despite all the soothing words of friends and relatives, Nora's despair was inconsolable. She felt that nothing could ease the pain in her heart caused by the loss of her only child. Our Father, which art in heaven, my darling, will be thy name. <laughs> My baby. Why did you have to die? Nora, darling, please. Our religion teaches us that God in his infinite wisdom decides. Oh, speak these empty words to me. I accepted that because it never touched me before. I never thought of it. But our daughter, our beautiful, innocent child, just 16. Why? One does not question these matters, Nora. I do question for the first time in my life, I question. I would do anything. Anything to bring my Ruth back to this world. Nora, please. Now you know that's impossible. Why? Why? Because our little girl Ruth is dead. Burnt to death. Nothing you can do or say or hope can change that. Oh. No. Well, I'm just reading the newspaper. First chance I've had to take a look at it today. The minister was here today, Dr. Fowler. Oh? Say you want to see our new house. New? This house is over a hundred years old. Well, new for us, he meant. It was just an excuse to come here, actually. He wanted to know why I hadn't been to church in the last several months. What did you tell him? Oh, I don't know. It was awkward. I said I'd be back next Sunday. Made some excuse about... Not having felt well lately. Well, I'm glad. About my going back to church? Yes. But more important than that, it means that you're getting over this depression, getting out into the world again, beginning to forget. No. No, you're wrong, Paul. I'll never get over wanting my little girl back with me. I'll never forget. Please believe me, Nora. I loved Ruth, too. But I accept the fact that she's gone from us forever. Oh. Uh I'll never accept that. Oh, by the way, now I remember what I wanted to remind you about. What? It's about that crack in the cellar wall right in front of the washer and dryer. There's a terrible draft that comes from it. There's no crack there, Nora. No crack? I thought I'd get rheumatism in the cold draft when I did the washing today. It hits you right in the back. I, I had that repaired. I paid for it. It's on the general bill for the repairs we had to make on the old house before we could move in. Well, then they cheated you. Charged you and never did the job. You sure? Seems to me that I remember. Never it. been done. Those contractors will try. You know, it's Mr. Carroll, isn't it? His number's on the telephone stand. Why don't you call him? Oh, it's 7.30, Nora. Well, come to think of it, it's the only time I could possibly reach him would be at night. He'd be busy all day out on the job. Hello, Miss Carroll? Paul Sanford. I'm sorry to bother you, but one of the items on your bill to me for repairs on my house, uh, item 28, repair crack in cellar wall, north side interior, $45.60. You never closed up that crack. You what? Hold on a minute. Nora, he says he supervised that item himself, mixed the cement for it. Well, just tell him that he's got it wrong. Mr. Carroll, my wife says the crack is still there. It hasn't been repaired. Okay, sometime tomorrow morning? Right, thank you. It's kind of funny. He said he's willing to bet $100 that he completed the work. Oh. 
Mrs. Sanford, I, I'm finished with the job, and I want your okay. I'll put on the pot and give you a cup of coffee. <laughs> Thanks, I'd appreciate that. Uh, come right down. I'm in a bit of a hurry. Won't be a minute. I'm coming, Mr. Carroll. Mrs. Sanford, the strangest thing. What did you say, Mr. Carroll? Oh, look at that wall. Oh, dear. Another crack? Uh, no, it's it's not another crack. What? It's the same crack. I, I just filled it with cement. But you couldn't have. It looks old and dry. Look at my hands. They're still covered with cement. Here are my tools, my trowel, my, my hammer and chisel. I, I, I could swear it was closed up not five minutes ago. And that cold dry. Going from it. Like from a, a tomb. Like from a tomb. Oh, Mr. Sanford. Come in, come in. Thank you, Dr. Fuller. We'll come into the study. You won't be disturbed there. There, right this way. Ah, you sit down, won't you? Thank you. Please forgive me for interrupting you at this hour. I don't quite know how to begin. As you know, we've been through a horrible experience. Yes, losing your daughter in that fire. It's our only child. Just 16. Uh, Mr. Sanford, you must get hold of yourself. Yes. You... You see, I've been holding my emotions back for months. I had to be strong for Nora's sake. She's taken this very hard, yes, I know. Yes, she hasn't gotten over it. It shook her to the very foundation of her belief. I gather that it's been only recently that you both came back into the church. She is... She's definitely twisted mentally. Her preoccupation is with a crack in the cellar wall, which she says cannot be repaired. What? Well, there's a long, jagged crack in the cellar wall. It's been there since we bought the house earlier this year, after our other house burned down. Have you tried to have this crack filled with cement? Oh, yes, yes, we tried. The way you say that is very strange. Well, I paid Carol the builder for repairs on the house. He was certain that he'd repaired the wall. However, he came back and patched up the crack again when he asked for my wife's okay on the job after he'd finished. They went down to the cellar and looked. The crack was open again. I, I don't understand. Neither do I. Carol said that he'd not left the cellar, that he'd called my wife to look at it. What's your explanation? I have none, Dr. Fowler, None. <laughs> in the cellar, Paul? Uh, yes, Nora. I'm I'm filling up the crack in the wall with cement. Do you think that's wise, Paul? Wise? Well, I thought you wanted the wall repaired. Kara won't come here anymore, so... Well, that's what I mean. Paul, there's some very good reason why that wall resists repair. Well, that's a strange way of putting it. Wall resists repair. So you thought the wall had... I don't quite know how to put this. It's as though the wall had... Had a will of its own? Nora, that's ridiculous. Is it? Mr. Carroll tried twice to fill that crack. He gave up. Yes, I know. I just received a check from him for $45.60, refunding the money I paid him for the job. Come on, let's go upstairs. This old cellar gives me the creeps. Look! My God. It's disappearing. The cement... It, the cement I just put into the cracks dissolving into thin air. Mr. Edmund, I'm, I'm calling about this house you sold us. No. No, no, no. It, it's a good, solid old house. It's just that my wife isn't happy here. We're all alone, as you know. It just isn't right for us. 
Y- yes, I know. I'll, I'll have to take a loss if I change now, but I'm prepared for that. Okay, I- I'll see you tomorrow, around five, okay? Good. Goodbye, Mr. Edmonds. Paul, who was that on the phone? Oh, no, I, I called Mr. Edmonds. The real estate man? That's right. You're thinking of selling? Well, I thought you'd want to get out of here too, Nora. Whatever gave you that idea? Now, that's a very strange attitude. Don't you know what this all means? No. No, I I don't understand it. Frankly, it scares me. Ruth is trying to reach us. What are you talking about? It was just two days ago. I was lying in bed. You were sound asleep. I heard the clock chime three. I felt something urging me to leave the bedroom and go down into the cellar. Nora... I've got to take you to a doctor. Paul, I'm not out of my mind. I tell you, our daughter is calling to me. She's trying to get me. Darling, Nora, listen to me. What you're saying doesn't make sense. Our child is dead, Nora. Burnt to death. I spoke to her. I spoke to her through the crack in the cellar wall. You what? I spoke to our roof. And she spoke to me. Pa! Wake up! Huh? Wake up! Uh, no. What time is it? Quiet. Now do you hear? Hear what? She's calling to me. Our little girl. She wants us. She needs us. No. Nora. Listen to me. You don't hear anything. You you just think you hear because listen, you want to hear. Listen. I don't hear anything. There it is again. It's very faint, but you can hear it. You try hard enough. Please, darling, try to rest. I've made an appointment for you with Dr. Cooper. I don't need a doctor. <laughs> Who's calling me? Yes. The cellar. I must go to her. No, no, don't. You mustn't. My little girl is calling. I must go to her. Was Ruth calling to her mother? Or was Paul Santfort falling into the clouded supernatural obsession that controlled Nora's life? He thought he heard the voice of his dead child calling to her mother. He couldn't be sure. But Nora's certainty was so strong that he was almost convinced that he heard it too. Everything that Paul and Ruth Sanford believed in is being drained away. They are living in a nightmare of twisted emotions, pulled farther and farther from the normal life they had known into a tangled, dreamlike world in which they hear the voice of their dead child calling to them. You're not going down into that cellar, Nora. It was Ruth's voice calling. Are you coming with me, Paul, or shall I go down alone? Nora, please. Now, we're dreaming this. It isn't happening. I heard her voice. You said you heard it. She was calling to me for help. Are you coming with me or shall I go alone? I'll come with you, dear. Just to prove to you that there's nothing there. Nothing. How could there be? I know there is something there. Come. Now, wait, wait. Don't try to go down those steep cellar stairs in the dark. Turn on the light. It's out. It's not working. Here, let me try. Oh, I'm not going down there in the dark. There's some candles in the cupboard just outside the door. Get them. Well, candles won't do any good. Get them. Uh, I just remembered. I, I've got a flashlight in the kitchen table drawer. Hurry! Here we are. Now stay right behind me. I'll go first. Flash the light around. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing but that crack in the wall. Let's go back upstairs, Nora. Good evening. <gasps> oh, what? Who are you? Oh, I'm sorry if I frightened you. What? Who are you? What are you doing in our house? Doing? 
I am inspecting the wall. The wall that needs repair. And who are you? Why, I'm the helper. What are you talking about, helper? Whom are you helping? You. I don't like this, Paul. Please make him go away. If, if you want me to, I'll go. But I thought you needed me. Now, I want you out of here. Or... I see you have a hammer in your hand. <laughs> You're afraid of me. Well, believe me, I came to help you. Who sent you? My, uh, employer. Who? Your friend. Your friend who knows of your sorrows. He sent me to seal up the crack in the wall. Well, I've tried. Several people have tried to do that. It won't stay closed. I can close it for you if you want me to. I repeat, if you want me to, you may not want it. Why? You will not hear the voice of your daughter ever again. No, no, no. Don't, don't seal it. Please, Nora. Now, maybe it would be better. No, no. No, this is insanity. No, our daughter is dead. Dead and buried. And you think that is the end? Of course. It's the end of mortal life. And do you share your husband's beliefs, Nora? No, no. Ruth was calling to me. I want her back. I, I want to hold her in my arms. Am I dreaming? This can't be happening. What are we doing standing here talking to this... Paul, please, don't. There's no one here. He was here? Where is he? He couldn't get past us up the stairs. Nora, where did he go? Who? Oh. D Nora, d die. What's happened to you? Speak to me, dear. Speak. Paul... Oh, what are we doing here in the cellar? Huh? How did we get here? And you say, Mr. Sanford, that you think you saw this uh, creature in the cellar of your house? No, it wasn't what you say. No, not a creature. It, it was a man, small was like he said he'd come to repair the wall at three o'clock in the morning uh you saw this man too mrs sanford no i don't know what paul's talking about i didn't see anything i was fast asleep paul woke me and told the story mm, i see your daughter's death was a terrible shock to you both it's it's preying on your thoughts your grief pushed the normal day-to-day -day living from your minds you began to I imagine... heard her voice, Doctor. I heard Ruth's voice calling to me. Of course you did. But try to think rationally, Mrs. Sanford. You know it's impossible for you to have actually heard the voice of your dead daughter. Seriously, you can't believe you did. But can I... you? Seriously, can you believe that? I, I don't know. <laughs> so simple that you will recognize the true authority. Who are you? I am merely a conveyor of ideas, a messenger. Then you are sent by the devil? Perhaps. Perhaps I'm your friend. Uh, call me the helper. Can you help me? Can you bring my daughter back to me? Under certain conditions... But you might find the cost too high. Oh, tell me, nothing, nothing is too costly, too terrible. I'll, I'll agree to anything. Even if it meant that you would lose everything? Everything you've been taught about life and death since you were a child? Oh, yes, 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 I agree. I agree to anything, anything just to help me save my child. Help me. Help me. Nora, Nora, wake up, Nora. You, you had a bad dream, darling. Anything, darling, anything. Darling, Nora. Oh, 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 Paul. You were crying out in oh. your sleep. 
I woke you. Oh, he came to see me and told me that I... Who, darling? That ugly little creature. I'd seen him before, but I can't remember where. The helper. That's what he calls himself. I heard Ruth calling to me. Then he appeared. I don't know what it is. I don't want to know. We're getting out of this house and we're not coming back. Oh, you go, Paul, but I can't. But don't you see what's happening to us here? Something evil is pursuing us either to destroy us or drive us insane. No. No, I can have my daughter back. He'll help me. You can't believe that. I believe it. What does he expect in exchange? I... I can't tell you, Paul. I... I just can't tell you. Oh, Dr. Fowler, right on time. Is um, Mrs. Sanford home? Uh, no. No, I called her sister and got her to make a date with Nora so she wouldn't be here. My work is suffering. We're not sleeping well. Nora's had terrible dreams, nightmares. You told your physician, Dr. Coombs? If anyone can help us, it's God. Dr. Fowler, we have seen the evil one. What? We have seen him. We have spoken with him. It's either the devil or one of his emissaries. He calls himself the helper. Oh, my good man, in this enlightened age, when we speak of Satan, it is usually, uh, well, what I mean to say is we think of the devil as the embodiment of all evil, but not as an actual being. I see. Well, Dr. Fowler, if you can't help us, we may have to go to someone who can. There are groups where they believe in the devil. Uh, Mr. Sanford, Paul, please understand. I cannot believe in the devil's being other than an abstract name for evil. If I can show him to you, will you believe me then? I saw him. I have seen the devil and the devil's work, and I'm frightened to death. <laughs> Yes? Uh, you know the two people I referred to you, the Sanfords? Yes. In your opinion, Dr. Coombs, would you say that they were insane? Well, I don't know, Dr. Fowler. The word insane is a legal one, not a medical one. Well, deranged and mentally ill. Well, I would say from a very cursory examination that they were both suffering from severe emotional stresses brought on by the untimely death of their only child. Well, would that explain in their hallucinations? Hallucination? Uh, to put it bluntly, Doctor, they think they have been speaking with the devil. Have seen him, in fact. Hmm. Not exactly a common delusion in this day and age. If they need medical help, they must come to me. I can't solicit Yes, this. yes, yes. I realize that, Doctor. Perhaps a sanitarium would be the best place for them. They could be taken care of and have a change of scene to get over the grief that they feel. An excellent idea, Fowler, but who's going to commit them? Can you get them to commit themselves voluntarily? I don't know. I'll try. Have you come to any decision? I've been thinking about it. I've heard you say you would do anything to have your daughter back. You had made up your mind. Yes. Oh, yes, but... But still, you hesitate. What? What you've asked of me is almost... Well, I'm almost afraid to think of it. It's been in my mind, awake and asleep. I, I can't tell the difference anymore. You hesitate thinking of yourself while your daughter suffers. Oh, no, no. I will leave you now, perhaps never to return. This is your last chance. Nora. Oh, no. 
Nora, no, darling, no, listen me, to me. Don't You're don't having bad dreams. I'll do anything. Wake, wake up, please. Me. Nora, Nora, it's me, Paul. Oh. What? Open your eyes. No. You're all no, right. No. You're safe with me. Darling, it's me, Paul. Yes, I'm just all right now. Paul, Nora. I've made my decision. What decision? About Ruth. I am going to bring her back. Bring her back? What are you saying? I'm going to bring her back, no matter what the cost, no matter what the consequences are. Nora and Paul have come far along a tortuous, a frightening path. Now Nora is determined to see the matter to the end, despite the consequences. Forces are tearing at the sanity of Paul and Nora Santfort. Nora's sleeping and waking worlds are so much the same that she can no longer differentiate between them. In her thoughts, in her ears, are the words of her dead daughter calling to her for help. Paul thinks he has heard the child, too, but is uncertain. He is not sure whether or not it is the driving influence of his wife's obsession or what he has actually heard and seen himself. I don't know, Doctor. I, I don't know anymore. Everything is so confused. I want you to sign commitment papers for your wife. You mean put her in... In a good sanitarium, in a place where she'll be safe and, and receive the proper treatment for her, uh, her, her problems. So I, I don't know. I... Now, I don't think she's crazy. You're not in any condition to judge her mental health, Mr. Sanford. What do you mean? Oh, well, I mean, I'm asking you to make a difficult decision. I'm also asking you to commit yourself. No! I won't think of it. Send him away. Send the doctor away. Paul, how can you do this to me? You know I'm not insane. You heard her. That night, we both went down into the cellar, and that little man, you remember, the helper, you saw him too. You know I'm not crazy. I won't go. I won't. You can't make me. She's gone into the bedroom, Dr. Coombs. Is there a lock on the door? No. Well, suppose I go in. Perhaps a sedative to quiet no, her. Please, doctor, let me speak to her first. She'll listen to me. Yeah, very well. I'll, I'll wait out in the car if you want me. Yes, yes, please go. I, I think she'll listen to me if you're not here. Nora? Nora? May I come in? Is that doctor still here? No, no, he's outside in his car. Paul, how could you do this to me? Deceive me. Try to put me away. But I explained everything to you. I will never consent. I'm going with you, dear. I'm going in, too. What? Why? Paul, why do you want to do such a thing? Because I'm frightened. I've never been afraid in my life before, but this is all beyond me, beyond any rational explanation. And you think you'll be away from your fear in that place? Oh, Paul, I'm not out of my mind, and neither are you. How much longer can we stand this? Listen to me. What? I can tell you. Only you. What? I've made a pact with the helper. Oh, Nora. He has given me the power to bring Ruth back. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, yes, I do. But that's impossible. Now, don't be foolish. Don't tell anyone else what you've told me. Now, you think I'm insane, too, don't you? Well, I don't know what to think. He has given me two wishes. Two wishes? Yes. He said that I would need two. Actually, all I need is one. To bring my dear child back. Yes. Yes, Nora, of course. Now, now, I want you to do something for me. What? Don't fight me now. Go along with me for a little while. 
Perhaps this nightmare will stop. We'll be able to get out when we want to. I have the doctor's promise. Can you trust him? Yes, darling. Since we're committing ourselves, we can get ourselves released merely by asking to be released. And our poor tortured child? Who will be here to hear her call? Who will be here to comfort her, Paul? We're running away. Deserting her. Darling, Nora. Our Ruth will be with us always. No matter where we are. Oh, oh, the phone. Oh. Hello? Hello, Mr. Sanford? Yes, Dr. Coon? I'm calling from the sanitarium. Is there anything wrong? Yes, your wife has disappeared. You mean walked out? Nobody saw her leave. As a matter of fact, it's a bit of a mystery. Her room was locked. Perhaps someone, one of the attendants or nurses unlocked the door for her. No, we've questioned the entire staff. At one o'clock, the nurse assigned to that section entered her room to administer a mild sedative. Your wife had complained she was worried because you weren't there. Well, I was just cleaning up a few urgent matters here. I was coming to commit myself tomorrow morning. I told her that, but it didn't seem to have any effect. When was Nora last seen? Not more than ten minutes before 1 a.m. Another nurse on the floor answered her ring... She told the nurse about her anxiety and her inability to sleep. She hasn't returned home, has she? No. What do you want me to do, Doctor? Stay where you are. She may come home. It's very likely that she will come there. Emily, I'm sorry to be calling you at this hour, but... Nora has disappeared. She walked out of the hospital. The fire, Ruth's death, it, it's been preying on our minds, and I thought that... Wait, Emily, I, uh, that's my doorbell. I'll call you back. I just wanted to know if Nora was with you. I'll call you back. Let me know if Nora shows up. Bye. Oh, Dr. Fowler. Come in. Oh, thank you. I got a call from Dr. Coombs about 20 minutes ago. Yes? He asked me to see you. He said you might need me. I came right over. Is there anything I can do to help? Nothing. Unless you can find Nora. She's been missing since about 1.30 a.m. About three hours. Where would she go? Where could she go? I don't know. What? What was that? I heard it, too. Do you have a cat, Paul? No. Sounds like a cat. It was Ruth. She's calling Nora. Ruth? My daughter. Oh, yes, yes, your daughter. But she's... She's dead. You hear your dead child's voice calling? You heard it, too. No. No, 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 it can't be. That's superstitious nonsense. That's what I thought. But I don't anymore. Ruth is calling to us from the grave. I hear it. I hear it. Paul, pray with me. Pray to God to make her go back. No. Nora will be here. She will come here and answer to her child's cries. Her mother's love is so strong that Ruth's outstretched hand will reach across the void of death and touch the hand of her mother. Yes? Fowler? Yes? I thought you were going to report back to me. I've just been through the most shattering experience of my life. No. I'm not a superstitious man, Dr. Coombs, but I heard the voice of Ruth Sanford calling to her mother from the grave. Oh, 
Dr. Coombs. I, I thought it was Nora. She hasn't returned yet, huh? I was talking with your minister, Dr. Fowler. He seemed quite upset. Any word from the police? Nothing. They've gotten several false telephone tips from cranks. Only one man identified himself by name, a, a Mr. Helper. Helper? You know him? Yes, I know him. The police asked him for his address. He gave them one, but it proved to be a phony. Do you know where to find him? You won't believe this, Doctor. But the last place I saw him was in my cellar. What? I don't know how he got there. I, I didn't see him leave, although I was standing talking to him at the moment. He, he vanished. Vanished? Disappeared. I see. Uh, disappeared right before your eyes. Oh, yes. I remember you telling me about that incident when you both came to my office. Hello. Who's there? Paul? I've come home. What is he doing here? I won't go back to that place. He can't make Nora, me go back. Nora, dear. Send him away, Paul. Paul, make him leave. We don't need him. Mrs. Sanford, as your doctor... You're I... not my doctor anymore. Please go. Leave us alone. Please, Dr. Coombs. Your being here will just make her worse. Very well, if you think you can manage. Yes, I can manage. I'm sorry you feel this way about me. Good morning. He was trying to do what he thought best for you, for us. He has no way of knowing what is best for us. He was just interfering, keeping us from Ruth. Nora, please give up that mad notion. Give it up? Oh, no. Paul, I will not give it up. Tonight, this morning before dawn, we will bring our child back to us. Nora, think what you're saying. I've thought, and I've made up my mind. Before daylight, he said. What time is it now? It's 20 after 4. It won't be light before 6. We must do it now. Come. We'll go together. We go where? To the place I first heard her voice, calling to me, the cellar. The crack in the wall. Are, are you sure you want to go through with this? I think, Nora. I've come too far to turn back now. I don't care what happens to me. It's Ruth we must think of. All right, Nora, I'll go along. I'd better get my flashlight. The light's still out in the cellar. No, Paul. What I must do must be done in darkness. No lights. Now, let's go down the stairs. Now, Paul, don't say anything. I must ask for her life from the master. Oh, master, listen to my plea. I have paid dearly for this boon. Heed my request and grant it to me in payment. I fear your presence, master, but I implore you, grant my wish. I, I wish my daughter were alive and with me now. My daughter, please give me back my daughter. Ruth, where are you? Come to me. Oh, 
Oh. Nora. Oh. It's over. Oh. It's all over. <laughs> Our child is gone. Uh, Forever. Oh, Paul. May our dear child rest in eternal oh. peace. And so Paul and Nora were left to pick up the fragments of their lives and go on. Strangely enough, the crack in the cellar wall was finally closed, and no human hand had a part in its repair. Our cast included Celeste Holm, Wes Addy, Robert Maxwell, Robert Dryden, and Anne Costello. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station. At the WOR time signal exactly 8 o'clock, here's John Scott with the news.